Simonon's Maigret, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simonon. With Maurice Denham as Jules Maigret and Michael Goff as Georges Simonon. Good evening, Monsieur Maigret. Good evening to you, Monsieur Simonon. You enjoyed your holiday. Hmm? Thank you, Jules. I did. Some Calvados, or perhaps a cognac. What, no slow gin, Georges? No, no slow gin, Jules. <laughs> Which one of us was it who made that mistake? According to Madame Maigret, it was you, old chap. Ah, Louise is right, I'm sure. Yeah, Calvados, thank you. I think I'll join you. It's the right sort of drink for the end of a summer's day. And a pipe, I think. Ah, yes, a pipe. I hoped you'd be first. Uh, thank you. Even if it was I myself who gave you the idea of smoking a pipe? Quite untrue, Chief Inspector. Whatever people say. I smoked a pipe before I met you. <laughs> of course, of course. Where did you go? Holiday? Yes. We took the boat round the coastline, all points north, yet again. You enjoy it. One thing I did do was to berth at Ostend for a few days, hire a car and drive home. Home, George? To where I grew up, Liège. Mm. It's always home, is it not, where one grew up? Oh, with me, I don't know. Home. You once had a case, a very strange case, wasn't it, in the village where you grew up? Oh, I did, very strange, yes. Going home. Maigret Goes Home, translated by Robert Baldick and adapted for radio by Frederick Bradnam. I noticed the sheet of paper quite by accident. Mind you, it had been floating around the Quai des Orfeurs for several days. It was from the municipal police at Moulin, if I remember rightly. You do? It was. It said, for information and possible action to HQ Paris. Beneath this was pinned a piece of squared paper on which was laboriously written, this is to tell you that a crime will be committed in the church of Saint-Fiacre during first mass on All Souls Day. <laughs> a rather ludicrous message on the face of it. <laughs> How long has this been here? What key? Oh, the uh, crime to be at Moulin. No, saint fiacre 20 kilometres from Moulin. Oh, is it? I think it arrived three days ago. Oh. When is All Souls Day, anybody know? Uh, is this coming Sunday, Chief, November the 2nd? Ah, I'm glad to know we have one godly copper. Thank you, Jean Vier. It's the day one offers prayers for the pious dead. Yes, I remember that. A crime will be committed in the church. Hmm? I think the Moulin lot think it's a poor joke. Do you take it seriously, Chief? Well, what sort of a crime can be committed in a small church at first mass, Luca? Perhaps a dozen people? Steal a handbag, lift a wallet? <laughs> one doesn't go to first mass with large amounts of money on one. At least so I found. Right, young jean -Vier. No, it'll be a crime against a person. Murder, Chief? I wonder. Are you thinking of going, Chief? It's in the back of the yard. Yeah, I know. I was born in Saint-Fiac. Grew up there. My father was steward to the old Comte de Saint-Fiac. I can see the great massive chateau now. It frightened the daylights out of me when I was a kid. Have you ever been back then? No, not even to visit the graves. My mother died when I was eight. I left Saint-Fiac when I was twelve. But I think I'll go back on Saturday, Luca, so I can attend the first mass on Sunday. Hmm, the priest and myself, the only man. Ah, there's Marie Tata. When will she remember me? So, 
I wouldn't have remembered her but for her cross eyes. Ten or eleven other women. And the Contest de Saint Fiacre in the chateau stalls alone. Praying hard enough. Perhaps she has reason. When I last saw her, she was under 30, so she must be almost 60 now. Three masses on All Souls Day. Choir boy Maigret used to have breakfast at the priest's house between second and third mass. Hard-boiled egg and goat's cheese. Do these boys? The young priest now looks a bit of a mystic. Does he fit? Deo gracias. Well, the mass is over, Maigre, and where's the crime? If nobody lies dead, the contest still at prayer, her head in her hands. Well, here's the priest to bow her out. She's very still. Oh, damn it! Monsieur le curé! Monsieur le curé! The Comtesse. The Comtesse. 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 No! Oh, my God. Lay her on the chairs. Yes, monsieur. All right. I think she's dead, Monsieur Le Curé. Excuse me, who are you? Uh, Chief Inspector Maigret from Paris, Monsieur. How is it that you are here? I was visiting. My parents are buried here. Uh, Maigret, of course. Mm. There's no sign of a wound. Monsieur Maigret, you can't mean that... Ah, this the... must be the doctor. Uh, sorry, I was uh, out shooting in the ponds. Dead, is she? I think so. Anyway, who are you? No, oh, Chief Inspector Maigret from Paris. Maigret? Well, I'll be the son of the steward. Yes. I'm Bouchardon. I can just remember you as a lanky uh, boy. Monsieur Bouchardon, is the Comtesse dead? Let's feel the heart. The famous Maigret never occurred to me. Now, I wasn't a regular doctor. She uh, went to a colleague in Moulin. Yes. Yes, she's dead. Heart failure, I imagine. She, oh. she had a very weak heart. But I have second mass at seven. Yes, yes, I know. Her car and chauffeur are outside. We'll uh, get her to the chateau. I'll examine her properly there, Maigret. But yes. can I say mass, monsieur? Are you sure there has been no... No crime, monsieur le curé? Indeed. No. The church can remain open. Only a very weak heart. You know, Maigret, this is going to create complications. Doesn't death always? The chateau looks uncared for, run down. Yes, it's not like it was in your father's day. The chateau is mortgaged. Huh? Three out of four farms sold. Antique dealers are, are in and out of the place. Mm. Complications. There's no sign of a wound. Nothing. Not even a prick of the skin. Well, see for yourself. Look, is it necessary? And it wasn't a poison. Sudden heart failure. Wouldn't have taken a lot to kill her. Only a slight shock at, at six in the morning. Oh, cover her up, please. A shock? Yes, a shock. Although I, I can't think what could have given her a shock at first mass. Just now, when we arrived, there was a youngish man in the hall, still in his pyjamas. <laughs> yes, his world has collapsed. I know. Jean Matellier. The Comtesse is, um, well, let's call him um, secretary. Tell me about things, Bouchardon. The Comtesse was one of those women who were models of good behaviour all their life. Then, suddenly... They change. When the comte died, she was, oh, 40 or so. Maurice, the son, went to Paris to study. She was alone. Since then, the young secretaries have come and gone. 
Matei is the latest. Mm. Oh, uh, will uh, will you answer it? That lot downstairs won't know what to do. Mm. Hello. Is that the chateau? Yes, the chateau. Who is he speaking? The Comte de Saint-Fiac. Will you ask my mother to come to the telephone? She must be back from mass by now. Where are you speaking from? What the devil's that to do with you? Who are you? No, you wouldn't know me, but where are you? Uh, I'm at Moulin. What is all this? It would be best if you came over here at once. I wonder when he got to Moulin. Well, well, well. Quite a reception committee. What is all this, Bouchardon? Good morning, Monsieur Maurice. Chief Inspector Maigret, the Comte de saint -Fiard. Good morning, Monsieur le Comte. Maigret? I've heard of you. <laughs> what have I done now? Ah, oh, hello. Look who's here. Up early for you, aren't you, Jean? How are you, you little skunk? I shall be staying at Madame Tapas. Been kicked out, have you? Well, use the side door, not the main one. Oh, uh, do you know my mother's secretary? Jean Mattei, Chief Inspector. No, I was hoping to meet him sooner or later. My name is Maigret. I shall be at the inn, should you want me, Chief Inspector. You won't leave saint Friac, will you? No. Good morning, gentlemen. And I have not been kicked out, Monsieur Maurice. Hmm. My mother... I'm afraid your mother died this morning, during First Mass. Poor old girl. What did she die of, Bouchardon? Her heart failed, Monsieur Maurice. I am sorry. A heart attack? It was never strong. Why are you here, Monsieur Maigret? I'm wondering who stands to benefit by her death. Sorry, I don't understand. Her heart failed, you say? Yes, yeah, something somebody foresaw ten days ago. See for yourself. Crime? In the church? First mass? I'll be damned. It's obscene. Take it back, Chief Inspector. Thank you. I was in church. I saw nothing. She didn't rise at the end of the mass, that was all. Poor old girl. I stand to reap some benefit from her death. And that is to be expected, monsieur. I have explained things to the Chief Inspector. I thought it best. Of course. Did you stay in Moulin last night? I needed to be here first thing this morning, and I didn't want to stay here with that awful little but him in the house. Mm. Uh, you see, I uh, I have a check being presented against me today for forty thousand francs, and there isn't a single franc in my account to cover it. Now I I was going to ask my mother for a loan this morning. Go up and see your mother, Monsieur Le Comte. She's in her room. Yes. Excuse me. Poor old girl. Poor mama. Forty thousand. God, what a mess. Mm, can it be raised here? Well, you can ask the steward, but I doubt it. As I said, it is not like it once was, Maigret, and Gautier, the steward, is not the easiest of men. No, I'm going to get some breakfast. Yes, I must snatch something and get off on my rounds. You know, Maigret, it, it must have been a heart attack. Perhaps she was tired. Perhaps Mateye was with her all night. And this message, somehow, she was given a shock. But in church... How, for heaven's sake? Oh, there's something she saw or read. A book. A prayer book. A missal, you mean? Yes, missal. It wasn't with her when we carried her to the sacristy. Must have left it behind in the store. No, let me think, let me think. I was watching her. She took communion, then she knelt with her face in her hands, like this. And then she opened her missal, read a moment, and then her face was in her hands again, as I found her. After breakfast, I must find that missile. Ah, Monsieur Le Curé, oh. there you are. Uh, yes, Monsieur Maigret? I've come looking for something. Perhaps you know where it is. Tell me what it is. A missile, Monsieur Le Curé, the dead woman's missile. It's in the sacristy. Good. Will you come with me? 
if I must. Perhaps you'll be so kind as to find it for me. It's there. Hmm? Behind the surfaces. Ah. ah. Thank you. I shouldn't have found it without your help. It would have been better. If I hadn't found it? And better for whom? One evil leads to another. Mm. Every morning she'd come back here, ready to return to the ways of the Lord. But every night at the chateau... Ah, see, here, at prayers after communion. Do you see what's inserted? Uh, Paris, November the 1st. A dramatic suicide took place yesterday in a flat in the Rue de Miromenil, which was occupied by the Comte de Saint-Fiacre. After telling a friend he was ashamed of the scandalous conduct of his mother, the Comte shot himself in the head and died a few minutes later without recovering consciousness. Hmm. It's printed, you see, as if from a newspaper. A spoof newspaper cutting, Monsieur le Curé, and done on a printing press, but badly done. She read it, and her heart stopped. You're silent, Monsieur le Curé. Did you know this was in the missile? Please do not question me, Chief Inspector. I am under the seal of the confessional. You know who the murderer is, don't you? God knows who he is. Uh, now you must excuse me. I have the sick to visit. Since I'm in the graveyard... The third grave after the cypresses. Flowers on every grave, almost. For all souls' day when you honor the dead. No flowers here. The stone is clean, at least. Here lies Anne Maigret, wife of Everest. And Everest Maigret, laid to rest. So long ago. So you've paid your respects. Back to work. There's the steward's house. I think it's time you paid a call on the man. Oh, kitchen hasn't changed all that much, Monsieur Gautier. Oh, you still remember it, eh, Monsieur Maigret? Mm, this polished floor. <laughs> I always had to wear my slippers in here. I keep this house as well as I can. But the chateau... Uh, you'll have a glass of brandy with me. No, oh, thank you. Money's been disappearing all over the place, in all directions. There have been Saturdays when there's not a franc in the safe. I've had to pay the workers myself, and I'm never paid back. You're owed a lot of money, are you? Seventy or seventy-five thousand. <laughs> Madame la Comtesse had no head for business. Your health, Monsieur Maigret. Ah, and yours, Monsieur Goodyear. Uh, Monsieur Maurice wanted 40,000 this morning. I've no way of raising it, I told him. No way at all. Try the priest, I told him. He will do it for the honour of the saint -Fiac. I told him. Was he successful? He will be. The priest will borrow from somebody for him. There'll be 40,000 in the bank tomorrow, and the comte will not be taken to court. You'll have to sell up here. The creditors will be descending like a flock of vultures. I can see no other way. And there's the mortgage. Oh, Emil. Chief Inspector, this is my son, Emil. How do you do, Emil? I'm honoured to meet you, Chief Inspector. Well, you look your father, son. Do you work on the estate? No, in Moulin. In the bank, monsieur. I'm a cashier. Emile is on his way up in the world. Well, uh, I went to the lycée there for a few months. I never settled. <laughs> Tell me, Emile, is the journal Le Moulin still going? Yes, monsieur, it is. As a boy, I recalled it as a small, friendly place. People going in and out of the printing shop as they liked. Uh, I don't suppose it's changed, is it? I don't have occasion to go there, monsieur, but I'm told it's an easy-going establishment. Uh, this is a bad business here, Chief Inspector. I'm told you received a warning that Madame la Comtesse was in danger. Well, no name was mentioned. The warning spoke of a crime, that was all. Uh, the crime was a joke played on the Comtesse, and she died of it. 
People who play such jokes should be punished. I doubt if this person ever will be. Tell me, what were Jean Metteille's duties at the Chateau? Oh, <laughs> that would be telling. Yeah, him. those duties I know of. The Jewish steward looked after everything on the estate, I'm sure, so Metteille spent his days... how? Oh, on one scheme or another to make money, with the Comtesse's money as his stake. The latest thing was some printing process. The steward and his son had the sort of eyes you could never meet. Do you know what I mean, Georges? Cold, unpleasant people. Actually, my dear Jules, there weren't many what one may call pleasant people in saint Fiat. <laughs> true, Georges, true. But the heart had gone out of the place. The way of death for the Comtesse was a symbol, was it not? Mm. I was finding it pointless. Nobody, it seemed, gained a sou by the poor old girl's death. Yet her death had been thought out carefully, with a peasant-like cunning and a peasant-like wish to attract attention and place the blame on somebody. On Jean Metteille, I imagine. On whom else? <laughs> that was obvious. And whoever did it knew the Comtesse pretty well, didn't they? Knew the agony of conscience she was gripped by when in church. And so chose his moment exactly. Did you show the Comte the account of his suicide? I did. I had the feeling that something clicked in his mind when he saw it. I discovered, by the way, that the cutting could have been printed in Moulin, although nobody there in the printing shop recalled it being done. You spoke to poor Jean Metteillet, finally, I presume? After a couple of days, yes. I went to the inn run by the cross-eyed Marie Tatin. <laughs> Many, many years. Ah, there you are, Monsieur Matei. I've expected you since Sunday. Oh, I'm sorry. Will you have a drink? No, thank you. I've just had some coffee. Uh, you won't mind if I do, I hope. Uh, waiter, rum, please, a little hot water. Uh, tell me, Jean. You don't mind if I call you Jean, do you? No. Well, tell me, Jean. When did you last visit Moulin? <coughs> oh, I don't know, last week sometime. No, no, Friday, the week before. Mm. There's your drink, Chief Inspector. Yes, I know. Mm. Not even the waiter you notice talks to me unless he has to. Did you know I was born here? Yes, yeah, so I've heard. Mm. Oh, your health. Mm. Oh, <laughs> the rum's pretty tasteless also. <laughs> You think it would help being born here? Eh? I don't know why you're here. Just stirring things up, they say. They're a suspicious lot. Yeah, so I've noticed, which means they have a lot to hide. No, oh, I'll tell you, Jean. I'm here because a crime has been committed. But she... the Comtesse died of a heart attack. No, well, true. There's no doubt about it. The autopsy has confirmed Bouchardon's diagnosis. There's no way of bringing the person responsible for her death to justice, you know. Or rather to judicial justice, but I'd like to discover who he is. Somebody caused her to have a heart attack, is that what you mean? Yes, yeah, sure. Somebody who knew her well, knew the state of her conscience, knew her heart wasn't strong, knew she felt a good deal of guilt. No, I did nothing. I swear I did nothing to her in any way. I was very fond of her. Good, yes. And now I'm sure I know who did it. Now I must... Oh. I almost forgot. You're invited to dinner tonight at the Chateau by the Comte. I think I'd rather not. Well, it's in order, really, Jean. I think you'll find it interesting. We'll all be there. The Comte, the Doctor, the Priest, the Steward, and Emile, the Steward's son. And, of course, myself, the policeman. And the dead woman laid out on her bed. Indeed, yes. The funeral is tomorrow. Well, then, until this evening... Albert, uh, we need some more bottles. With the help of the doctor, I found a will, you know, Monsieur le Curé. A recent one, Monsieur le Comte? Yes. Yes, Boucheron thinks it was made immediately after the heart attack the poor old girl had three months ago. That was after she had a telegram from you. From me, Gautier? From you in London, Comte. 
You wanted money, as ever. <laughs> well, you see, Maigret, wanting money is a perennial problem with me. Mm. <laughs> I do hope there's enough in the coffins, or coffers, I mean, to pay for the funeral. Mm. I think Emile Gautier will know that, won't you? I cannot possibly discuss a client's account. I me? wasn't asking you to. Just tell the corner sometime, that's all. I shall see that the funeral is paid for. Decent of you, Gautier, although it's probably my money. That's a slander. Did you hear that? Father, doctor... Oh, shut up, Gautier. You're an awful old crook, and you know it. The cellar is almost empty, monsieur. The creditors will be annoyed. Uh, the white border for monsieur le curé. Uh, now, your attention, please. Chief Inspector Maigret has a few things to say to us. Mm. Uh, but no. first, let me say this. Nobody has anything to fear. Monsieur Maigret can arrest no one. It's not a crime in the judicial sense to slip a phony newspaper cutting into a missile, obviously not. However, the Chief Inspector would like to be sure he's right about who did it. And so would I. And we are all suspects, are we not? Oh, we all of us knew that my mother had a very weak heart, that a sudden shock could kill her. I think, monsieur, that you have no idea of the opprobrium you are casting on us. What um, opprobrium? To place in disgrace, Gautier. Oh, oh. I think the Count knows what he's doing, Father. Let us see how it goes. <clears throat> now, let me begin uh, with you, Father. With me. You tried to hide the missile after the death, which is an admission of guilt of some sort, isn't it? Had you anything to gain by the death of the Countess? I don't mean financially, but say spiritually. And, and damn my soul for all eternity. Ah, not necessarily. The Countess's conduct was a perpetual scandal and a perpetual challenge to you. Here in the chateau, she was a sinner. The sins of the flesh were impossible to break from, even though she came to church burning with anguish. Now, you're a man of fierce faith, I think, Father. A sort of priest who would go to extremes for his faith. I warn you, the church will well, not... Take your crack of the whip like a good Christian, Father. <laughs> so, at Mass, after she had taken communion, when she is in a state of grace, which won't last, as you well know, you arrange that she receives a terrible shock and dies a holy death there on her knees. She did die in a state of grace, thank God. But I did not cause her death. Oh. Albert, fill Monsieur le Curé's glass. Yeah, and mine also, Albert, only I need another bottle. Uh, I'll take you next, Doctor. Uh, it's often the Doctor that did it in thrillers, <laughs> so I'm told. Yes, and in real life also. And let us assume... You are interested in the heart and its functions medically, not emotionally. And so to test a theory, you play the trick with the missile. Will a weak heart stand such a shock or not? Uh, poppy God, Maigret. I've never done any research since I was a student. I, I'm too lazy, as everybody knows. No, no, count me out. Shall we put the doctor to one side, monsieur? Uh, is this a... yeah. Now, Gautier, you... Huh? There are two possibilities with you. First, you are the model steward, devoting your life to the chateau and the family, and watching the family money and land disappear under the nose of the heir and the Comtesse growing less and less responsible. So you decided to save what is left, not for yourself, but for Monsieur Maurice and the family honor. <laughs> That's a pretty theory for a policeman. There's the other possibility is that you're a scoundrel of a steward who for years has taken advantage of the Countess's behavior. Mm. When a mortgage is raised, it's you who take it up and so on until you're practically the real owner of the estate. My father is... Quiet, Emile. Emile. Let him finish. Thank you. Now the time has come when the Countess has nothing. Everything will have to be sold and she will discover it's you who's profited from her stupidity and her trust all these years. Did you, Gautier? Think it would be better for the Countess to die before she discovered the truth about you and about poverty? Tomorrow, Monsieur Le Comte, 
I shall resign my stewardship. But of course. Have another drink. A bottle, Albert. Mm. After the father, the son. You, Emile. Mm -hmm. A serious-minded, hard-working chap, I'm told. <clears throat> Your job in the bank, giving you insight to the Saint-Fiac financial position, or, or non-position. It must have been an agony for you to watch the money that could have gone to your father, if not to yourself, being dissipated by the Countess's so-called secretaries. So you had to put a stop to it. Give the old girl a shock and kill off the Count at the same time. All good, clean fun, but you did have the opportunity, being in Moulin every day, of having the printing done, or doing it yourself. There is only one of us here who could have had that cutting printed. No, Emile. There is only one obvious person, not only one person, which is quite another story. Thank you, Chief Inspector. Why did you want to frame me, Emile? Yes, why did you, Emile? All right, I'll go on. You were very much the dead woman's protégé, were you not, Emile? In a sense, yes. And some years ago, you preceded Jean Metteillet and the others in the position of uh, secretary. Monsieur le Comte, it is sacrilege to speak so of the dead. Monsieur le Curé, sacrilege or not, it's true. That wretched bank clerk was once my mother's lover. Oh. Her first lover. There are no more secrets, Emile. Listen. You were never out of the Countess's affections. And recently you were making an effort yourself to resume your old role. I'm not sure why. Perhaps you grew jealous of the hold Jean now had over your Countess. Why kill your benefactress? Because you saw her affections being transferred to her secretary. And being hand in glove with your father... You knew you both stood to lose out badly if the situation was allowed to continue. So you decided to end it and place the blame on the man who had caused the trouble. May I borrow your matches, Bouchardon? Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, thanks. Albert, mm. now is the time. Do you know where it is? Yes. At once, monsieur. I thought the cellar was empty. Ah, you, Jean Mette. Yes? You were playing a not very amusing role, one which no young man is willing to play for very long. Are you insane? You had made some money from it, and you were. You had been told, mentioned kindly in your mistress's will. But the contest was sometimes cold to you, and eaten up by guilt. And there's the steward's son lurking in the wings. Things could change for the worse at any moment in your prospect. So you thought of a brilliant way to kill. You must admit, Jean, it was the sort of idea an inventive chap such as yourself would have more likely to have had than a bank cashier. Thank you. Yes, only put yourself in my shoes and maybe you think as I do, but you'd be wrong. What's that mean when it's a tone? Oh, I'm sure Chief Inspector Maigret will explain. Mm -hmm. You won't, you know. Finally... We come to the heir to these ramshackle fortunes. Your glass is empty, Monsieur Maigret. Ah, I know, Monsieur Maurice. I'll wait until Albert returns. Ah. Now, once before, the Count had used a trick to obtain money from his mother. The telegram from London saying he was ill, which he wasn't, and needed money, which he did. That worked, so why not try another trick? He got the cutting printed, easy enough in Paris. He came to Moulin on Saturday... And late that night he drove over here, and knowing where his mother kept her things, including her missile, the rest was easy. He didn't mean to kill, of course, only to frighten and soften up. That is why he rang up immediately after first mass on Sunday last, hoping to speak to a, a thoroughly frightened woman, who, when she hears her dead son's voice, is so relieved she promises all the money she can lay her hands on. Bravo, Maigret. I haven't finished yet, Monsieur Le Comte. There is also the possibility that he decided to speed his mother's end with the shock of reading of his death, and such a poignant death, and thereby salvage what was left of things before the Gautier and the secretary gents really made off with the lot. Oh. Ah, thank you, Albert. 
Place it in the middle of the table, please. Oh, oh God. Oh, grief, it's, it's your father's old revolver. Do you see it, make eye? Yes, I'm not blind, Bouchardon. I'll have some more wine now, please, Albert. Well, Monsieur Maurice, what do you make of my theories? Ah, you've made out a very good case against five of us. Myself, Jean Matelier, old Gauthier, young Gauthier, uh, and the father. We, any of us, could have done it. And it would be nice to know which of us it was. No, thank you, Albert. Well, does anybody want to own up? Huh? Nobody does, I'm afraid, Maigret. So we come to the revolver. There it is, loaded and in the centre of the table where any one of us can reach out and take it. It is now uh, five minutes to midnight. By midnight, whoever killed my mother will be dead. I know who it is, and I am not excluding myself. And by midnight, I foretell the murderer will have either taken his own life or have had his life taken from him. Albert, leave just one candle burning. We sat in a sort of drunken tension, with just the one candle and the smoke from my pipe. It was all but dark. I tried unsuccessfully to see how each man was taking it. Silence. But for the wine being drunk from trembling hands and the priest's nervous cough. Then a hand reached out and took the revolver and fired it. <laughs> Albert at once but calmly turned the electric light. Maurice Saint Fiacre lay slumped on the floor. The man who had fired the gun was Emile Gauthier. He placed the smoking revolver back on the table and melodramatically held out his wrists to me. He said the murderer would die, didn't he? He wouldn't have had the courage to take his own life. I did what I considered to be my duty. You fired point blank at him. I suppose I shall have to arrest you. Do so. I know he killed his mother. I saw him prowling round the chateau on Saturday night. Yes, Emile. <gasps> Sir, we God. had quite a meeting, didn't we? Good. And you haven't said what you were doing in the chateau. <laughs> the dead man's on his feet. <laughs> Am I that drunk? You're dead. I shot you. I shot you dead. It was a kid's game, Emile. Bang, bang, you're dead. Only you didn't know it. Do you imagine I would let people shoot each other or themselves? The thing was loaded with black. You're not hurt, Monsieur Le Comte. No, father. I'm sorry to frighten you, but it was the only way. Oh. And with the chief inspector's assistance... I thought I heard somebody moving about on Saturday after midnight. Yes. I came from Moulin in the early hours with the idea of taking some of the family jewels, anything of value, to sell. I'm sorry, but I did. I met Emile face to face in the dark on the stairs. He told me he had just come from my mother's bedroom. He was so smug. He made me feel disgusted with myself. I saw myself as I really was. A man who creeps back to his family home in the dead of night to steal from it and meets on the stairs a man of his own age, the son of a servant, come from his mother's bed, who laughs at him. I took nothing. I turned and went back to Moulin. But after my mother's death, I understood who it was who put that foul cutting into a missile. Chief Inspector? Hmm. You knew everything, didn't you, Gautier? What? You and your son have been working together for years, cheating the Comtesse at every turn. One way or another, half the estate is yours. One thing worried you both. There was always the possibility that the Comte would come to his senses, return here, and take up the reins. Then he would discover what you were at, and see to it that the Comtesse revoked some, at least, of her foolish business deals, and get rid of you as steward. Jean Mattei worried you a bit also. His influence over your victim was quite strong and growing stronger. So you decided to stop the poor woman's weak heart and make it look as if Mattei did it. There's nothing you can do to us. Not a thing. I don't know, Gautier. I could arrest Emile for the attempted shooting of the court. 
Although it'd be difficult to explain my part in it. There's no bloody justice if they get off scot-free. Justice? I don't know. It's a rare commodity. Revenge, perhaps? Do you want revenge, Monsieur Maurice? No. All I want is to start afresh. Get out, Gautier, father and son! Get out! Clear out! If I ever see you again, it will be in the courts, for I intend to fight you for the estate where I can! Go on off of you! Good riddance to bad rubbish. Thank you, Monsieur Maigret. Thank you. Your very good health. And now, if you will excuse me, I shall go and watch over the dead woman. If you're not too tired, Monsieur le Curé, will you come with me? <laughs> if I am not too drunk, Monsieur le Comte. But of course. Thank you. Albert, look after my guests for me. After you, Father. No going home for me anymore, Georges. Do you blame me? No, Jules. I don't blame you. The parable of the good steward and the bad steward, wasn't it? For me, yes. I remember my father and the respect people had for him and his honesty. He died worth only a few thousand francs. And I compared him to that greedy old devil who by then owned half the estate. And I felt very old and sour. Did you stay for the funeral? I did. It was next morning, and it poured with rain. The priest had a hangover, as did the count and the doctor, and Maigret, the policeman. Gautier and son cheats to the chateau of Saint-Fiacre. They cleared off, did they? Mm. As the funeral procession went past the steward's house, we could see them packing. Oh, it was an impressive ceremony, hangover or not. I remember thinking, as the coffin was placed in the family vaults, that's my past also being put away. From now on, Saint-Fiacre is nothing but history. An important decision. Tell me, Jules, who was it who wrote the letter? Hmm? The one that took you to Saint-Fiacre? I never found out. Not that I tried very hard. Uh, Gautier's wife was dead. He was looked after by a plump servant girl. Probably she overheard the plot. Perhaps the old devil talked in his sleep, or the cold fish of a son did, but I think it was her who wrote. Yes, you're probably right. Mm. Another Calvados, Jules. Thank you, Georges. In Maigret Goes Home by Georges Simonon, translated by Robert Baldick and adapted for radio by Frederick Bradnam, Maurice Denham played Jules Maigret and Michael Goff, Georges Simonon. Luca was played by Brian Haynes and Jean Vier, Sean Barrett. Maurice Saint Fiacre, Michael Spice, Gauthier, Cyril Shapps. Emile Gautier, Anthony Daniels. Jean Metayer, Clifford Norgate, Dr. Bouchardon, Hector Ross, and the priest, Michael Deacon. The play was produced and directed by Glyn Dearman. Simonon's Maigret, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simonon.
with Maurice Denham as Jules Maigret and Michael Goff as Georges Simenon. Thank you. Your health, Jules. It was a good party, I think. Yes. Oh, yes, sure. Well, it was La Pointe's first baby. We had to push the boat out a bit. Your health, George. How long has he been married? Oh, well, two years. At one time we thought he'd stay a bachelor the rest of his life. Unlike you. I've never thought of you as anything but a married man. Oh, I was single once. Before I knew you, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, can I interest you in a little club for later this evening? Hmm? Entertainment, drinks, girls, strip tease, all the way down to the... Oh, I beg your pardon, I didn't realise it was you, Chief Inspector. Yeah. Excuse me. Oh, good evening. No offence. <laughs> <laughs> Who was that? The grasshopper. At least that's what they call him around Montmartre. Touts for a club by the name of... Uh, oh, um, wait a minute, um... Le Street Hot. No, that's not it. Well, that's what he says on this card. Hmm? Well, then he must have changed jobs, or maybe the other place has closed down. Um, Picrats, that was it. I think. Now, La Pointe would remember, even if you and I can't. Why La Pointe? Oh, really, Georges, your memory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because his first real job with headquarters centered around Picrats. Or oh, whatever it was called. Mm. Mm. No, it was the first time young Lapointe actually worked on a case. Didn't just sit around in the office learning the ropes. And because. Mm -hmm. Do you really not remember, Georges? You tell me, Jules. <laughs> because it was the time young Lapointe grew up. All in the course of a week. Fell in love for the first time and kill someone for the first time. Ah, yes, in Montmartre. Maigret in Montmartre, translated by Daphne Woodward and adapted for radio by Aubrey Woods. Montmartre, that's right. On a Monday night, or to be strictly accurate, Tuesday morning. According to the report from the La Rochefoucauld police station. Inspector Lognan's district, wasn't it? <laughs> you are remembering. Is he still there? Yes, he'll die there. No mm. ambition, that was it. And no imagination. Plods doggedly on, never questions those placed in authority over him. A model policeman. Well, you might have thought so. If only he'd told me to keep my nose out of his cases, he'd have been a chief inspector years ago. But would you have taken any notice? Well, that's beside the point. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there was this young woman, fairly obviously drunk, who comes in to make a statement. Goes up to the sergeant at the desk. I want to make a statement. Go ahead. It's about a crime. Well, there's been a crime committed. I don't know whether it's been committed. Well, then... But it, it probably will be committed. In fact, it's certain to be. I see. <laughs> Who told you? These two men. Two men? Clients at the club. I, I work at Picrats. Ah, uh, yes. You do the nude act, don't you? Yes. So, some clients have been talking to you about a crime. Not to me. Who to, then? They were discussing it together. And... You were listening? Yes. They were at the next table on, on the other side of the petition. When was this? About two hours ago. And what exactly did you hear? Well, they didn't say much, and I couldn't hear at all. M music was going on. But one of them said he was going to kill the Countess. I did hear that. Which Countess? Don't know. Well, what did he say about killing her? Don't remember. I wasn't alone. Ah, you were with... A client. Someone you knew? Yes. Who? His first name's Albert. I don't know his other name. Go on. Well, the first thing I heard was something like, 
She's still got most of the jewellery, but at the rate she's going, it won't last long. What was the voice like? Man's voice. M Middle-aged. When they went out, I saw one of them with short and grey head. Must have been him. Why? Because the other one was younger and wasn't a young man's voice. What names did they use? I think one of them was called Oscar. Go and sit down. Can't I go home? Not yet. I'll make a report. What's your name? Arlette. Arlette. Yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and as Lanyon wasn't around and the statement seemed to involve a threat of murder, the sergeant had her brought over to us at the Quai des Orfèvres. It was about three o'clock in the morning when she arrived. By then, she decided she didn't want to tell us anything after all, so I sent her back to her flat. I went home myself for a few hours' sleep, returned to the office and was just about to phone Longyon to put him in the picture when... Yes? Mickey? Yeah. Longyon here. Hmm. I understand the girl who said she'd overheard some talk about murdering a countess was brought round to you by one of my sergeants last night. Yeah, she left here about four o'clock this morning. Why? She's dead. Just been found by her concierge. I've not been round there yet. Thought I'd better ring you first, as headquarters seem to have shown such an interest. Mm. Perhaps we should all have taken her more seriously. Looks as though she may have been talking sense. Mm, looks like it. Well, I assume I'll see you at the flat then. I take it you have the address. Ah, Megre, I haven't disturbed anything. The doctor's still in the bedroom. No, oh, thank you, Lionel. It's a nicely kept place, isn't it? Mm. <coughs> Morning, Doctor. Morning, Chief Inspector. Well, she was dead when we got here, of course. The fellow who did it held on to her till he made sure of that. Mm. Can you say when it happened? Not more than an hour and a half ago. There's no trace of a struggle. He's probably hiding in here, waiting for her. Grabbed her by the throat the moment she'd taken her coat off. Mm. You know this district, Lognon. Did you ever see her perform? No, no. I've heard about her act. And we found these photographs in a drawer. As you can see, it was a sort of striptease. Mm. She appears to have wriggled about, gradually taking off her dress. The only thing she had on. By the end, she was stark naked. Where was it she worked? Oh, one of these little Montmartre clubs. Picats off the Rue Pigalle. I see. Well, if anybody wants me, that's where I'll be. My husband will be down in a minute, Mr. McGray. Ah, oh, thank you. Did you tell him what I wanted to see him about? I asked him about the two men. He doesn't remember them. Mm. In fact, he's sure there wasn't anybody at the table next to Arlette's. There was an American over there who drank the best part of a bottle of whiskey. And there was a party of about six or so. They brought some girls in with them. But neither of us remember two men together. Oh, here he is. Fred, this yeah. is Chief Inspector Maygray. Oh, now your face. From the papers. Fred Alphonse. Ah, oh, ah. Oh. Ah. Oh, dear. Didn't the wife ask you to have a drink? Oh, oh, she did, thank you, but not at the moment. Now, you're sure there were no clients at the table next to Arlette's last night? Table eight? No, positive. It's a small place. I keep an eye on everything the whole time. And you never saw, at that table, two men by themselves, one of them older than the other? Look, I've said no. Chief Inspector, what's all this about? Arlette is dead. What? Oh, no. Hmm. She was strangled this morning in her bedroom. Good God. Who did it? Well, that's what I'm trying to find out. Now, she overheard a conversation here last night between two men who were talking about a countess. One of the men seems to have been called Oscar. Well, if there have been two men here, I'd have noticed. You know how this kind of place works. People don't come here to see first-class turns or dance to a good band. We mostly get foreigners. Imagine they're going to see something sensational. <laughs> the only sensational thing was Arlette undressing. Did she go to bed with the class? Well, she must have now and then. With the young man who was here last night? Oh, no. No, not with him, I'm sure. He just come in one evening with a friend and fell for her. Straight away, you could see it. Oh, yeah. He come again. Several times, but he never waited till we closed. Probably had to get up early, go to work. Well, did she have any other regulars? Oh, none of our clients are regulars. They're all alike, of course, but they're always different. Yeah. Mm. Well, thank you. Hey, 
Hmm? I suppose I can open as usual this evening. No, yes. No. Oh, good. Well, if you care to drop in, you're welcome. Yes, I'll do that. If you want to contact me in the meantime, I'll be at the KD's affair. Come in. Uh, yes, Lapont, what is it? Can, can I speak to you, sir? Yes, of course. Well, come in, come in, sit down. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> well? When I saw her here last night, I wondered why she'd been brought in. Jean Vier told me what she'd been saying, and then the next I know... she's dead. Hmm. I'd forgotten for the moment that your first name was Albert. After what I let told Luca, he shouldn't have let her go off by herself without any protection at all. No, I know you've not been here very long, Lapointe, but you must have realised by now that if we had to give police protection to everyone who comes in with an accusation, we'd none of us have time for anything else. Yes, Chief, but... <laughs> but what? She was different. Hmm. How did you get to know her? Oh, I was with a friend. We went up to Montmartre together. We walked into Picrat's. Why? Well, no particular reason. It was the first place we saw. How long ago was this? Three weeks. Hmm. That's all, three weeks. And that was how you met her? She came and sat at our table. My friend thought she was a whore. We had a row when we got outside. About her? Yes. And you went back there? Yeah, the following night. To apologise for the way my friend had spoken to her. What had he actually said? He offered her money to sleep with him. And she refused? Of course. Did she say anything to you about being in danger? Well, not in so many words. But I knew there were some mysteries in her life. Mm, such as? Oh, it, it's difficult to explain. No one will believe me because I was in love with her. Mm. Was she in love with you? Last night I felt sure she was. Why? What did you talk about? Same as usual. About her and me. Did you ever go to bed with her? No. Did you ever ask her? No. And she never suggested it? Never. What happened last night? Did... Did she say anything about it? No, she said you were with her, but she only mentioned your Christian name. I stayed at the club till... till half past two. At what table? Number six. Was there anybody at the next table to yours? No. Table eight? No, nobody. While you were talking to Arlette, she didn't seem as though she were listening to any other conversation. No, I'm sure she wasn't. Why? Mm. Would you like to work on the case with me, Lapointe? Yes, Chief, I would. Look, I'm not asking you because you were in love with her. No, sir. No, oh, Mary. Yeah. Well, the name? And the rest? Thank you. A Countess von Farnheim has been found strangled in a flat in the Rue Victor Massé. Come on, La Pointe. Let's get there. How anyone could live in a place like this, heaven alone knows. Uh, you'd think at least she'd get someone to take the bottles away. Where is she? In the bedroom. Through here. Fine. Come on, La Pointe. Yes, sir. Nothing's been touched, of course. I had a feeling headquarters might want to take over. Yes, well... <laughs> Good Lord. Exactly. We found two hypodermics on that wine crepe by the bed. She's about 60 or so. Doctor's not arrived as yet. Mattress cover's been slit open, so either the motive was robbery or someone wants us to think it was. Oh, mind out for that chamber pot. It's half full. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Oh, not at all. Uh, uh, this is the concierge, Madame Aubin. Madame Aubin, mm. Chief Inspector Maigret, and... Uh, uh, Inspector Lapointe. Oh, Madame. Inspector. Well, I'll leave you all to it, then. Don't suppose you'll need the local police hanging around? Uh, thank you, Laura. Oh, not at all, not at all. Uh, have a look around, Lapointe. Right, sir. Well, now, Madame, <clears throat> did the country live alone? She did. Did she have many visitors? Well, there was this young man... Young man? Nice-mannered, sickly-looking boy with long hair. He used to visit her. 
called her aunt. You don't know his name? Never concerned myself with her affairs. Well, this desk, sir, is full of papers. Huh? She must have got every letter she ever got. There are hundreds of them. All from her husband, by the look of them. Hmm. Love letters. Oh, why not? She can't always have been like this. Yeah, you better go through them. Do you want to do that here or take them back to headquarters? Well, I think I'd prefer to take them back, sir. Yeah, I don't blame you. Thank you, madame. Au revoir, monsieur. Come on, let's get a breath of fresh air. Oh, I told you. Do you want a beer, La Pointe? Someone's going down to the Brasserie Delphine. Thank you, yes. Sandwich? No, thanks. Oh, no, I'll finish going through these first. Two beers and one ham sandwich. Right. We'll Found anything? Well, according to these papers, she was living with her husband in Cannes up till 15 years ago in a house called the Oasis. Oh, there's a photo of it. Hmm, very pretty. And there's a photo of the husband, the Count von Farnheim. Hmm, not so pretty. How old was he? 65 when they married. She was about 35. Marriage only lasted three years, then he died. What of? Exhaustion? <laughs> I, I got under the police down there, and apparently there was an inquest. Well, you can see in that photo, the house is on the corniche, and beyond the terrace, there's a drop of about 300 feet or so. Well, the Count's body was found one morning lying at the foot of the precipice. The theory was that he'd gone outside for air and sat down on the balustrade, then just passed out and fallen. Oh, yes. There were no signs of violence on the body when it was found, and no trace of poison was discovered at the autopsy. And what happened to her after that? She lived on at the Oasis, entertained a great deal, gambled, drank. The local police say she had a string of gigolos, one after the other, and they got away with a good deal of her money. Mm -hmm. Then, four years after the Count died, she suddenly sold up and disappeared. Never been seen on the Riviera again. Uh, is the Chief Inspector in? He's in his office, sir. Right. You, in here. Yes, all right. Keep an eye on this young man, will you? Yes, of course. Who is he? I have reason to believe he may be a material witness in the case of the Countess von Farnheim. Mm. Where did you pick him up? At the guard you know of. When? This morning, half past six. When you were both still in bed, I shouldn't wonder. Yeah, well, I'd better go in. Come in! I'm sorry to disturb you, Chief Inspector. No, not at all, Long John. What can I do for you? The young man you said you wished to interview, friend of the late Countess. Yeah? He's outside. Oh, well, that was quick. Easy when you know the district, as we local police do. And this is the eighth time I've arrested him. Name of Mortemar, mm. Philippe Mortemar. He's a drug addict. Where does he live? Block of flats on the Boulevard Rochechouart. He wasn't there, though. He packed his bag, so I followed him. I know his haunts. He needed money to get away, and he was looking for someone to borrow from. How did you find him? The concierge saw him take the first bus for the guard you know. I found him in the waiting room and questioned him on the way over here. And? Hey, he either knows nothing or won't say anything. Mm. Was he the one who supplied the Countess with drugs? Unless it was she who kept him supplied... Anyway, they've been seen around together for several months. If you don't need me any more... No, thank you, Long. You've done a good job. Then I'm not suggesting he killed the old woman. Well, neither am I. You're going to hold him? Yeah, perhaps. Uh, tell him to come in, will you? Right. He's all yours, then. You, Mortema, come in here. What do you want with me? A few questions. Thank you, Long. Yeah. Now, then, was the Countess von Farnheim your mistress? She was my protectress. Mm. In other words, you didn't go to bed with her? She was interested in my writing. And gave you money? She helped me to get along. And drugs? Sometimes. Why? She was lonely. Hadn't she any friends? She was always alone. Can I sit down? No. Did you make love to her? I tried to give her pleasure. In her flat? Yes. How old are you? 28. When did you begin taking drugs? Three or four years ago. Why? I don't know. Mm. Tell me about the Countess. I don't know anything. But tell me what you do know. 
She used to be very rich. She was married to a man she didn't love. An old fellow who never gave her a moment's peace. And had her trailed by a private detective. Is that what she told you? Yes. He used to get a report every day, describing all she had said and done, almost minute by minute. Was she already taking drugs by then? I don't think so. He died, and everybody tried to grab the money he had left her. Uh, who was everybody? Uh, all the gigolos on the Riviera. Professional gamblers. Her women friends. Did she ever mention any names? Well, I don't remember any. Did you ever hear the name Oscar mentioned? I don't know anybody of that name. Mm. She never seemed to be afraid of anyone? She was only afraid of dying all alone. When did you last see her? Well, the day before yesterday, in the morning. Are you sure it wasn't yesterday morning? Yesterday morning I was ill and stayed in bed. Well, what was the matter with you? I'd been out of dope for two days. Wouldn't she give you any? She swore she hadn't any. And you haven't been back there since? No. Now, listen, the Countess's body was found yesterday afternoon about five o'clock. The evening papers were out already, so the news didn't appear till this morning. But you spent the night looking for money so you could get away from Paris. How did you know the Countess was dead? Well, I went along her street and saw a crowd on the pavement. What time was that? About half past six. Yeah, you thought she'd be suspected, did you, when you heard she'd been strangled? <laughs> It's always like that. So you decided to go away. Who gave you the money? A friend. A man. But who? I don't know his name. Look, you'd better tell me. I don't know. All right. Tell me it's your own way. The new car. Yes, sir. Look, take this fellow out to the confessional and keep him there until he decides to come clean. Look, I don't care whether it takes 24 hours or three days. When you're tired, hand over to someone else. Right. This way. But I've told you all I know. All right. This isn't fair. I can't tell you what I don't know. Excuse me, sir. Yes, Lapointe. There's an old girl in black sitting out there. Mm -hmm. Yes, what about her? She's our let's aunt. Hmm? Saw a report of her murder in the papers and came straight here from Monsieur this morning. Yeah. She's... She's identified our let. He wants to have a word with you. Oh, I see. Well, let's hope it doesn't take too long. I want my lunch. You'd better show her in. Right, sir. Will you come this way, please, madame? Well, thank you. Chief Inspector Maigret? Mm, yes, madame. Uh, please take a seat. Uh, thank you. I believe you've identified the body. Indeed, I have. I'm afraid there is no doubt it is the remains of my poor, unfortunate brother's child. He died, you know, when she was two years old. No, I didn't know. Now, your sister-in-law lives in Lisieux? Never left the place. Do you but... think she will have seen the newspaper with her daughter's photograph? Really? Undoubtedly. The photograph was on the front page. Well, don't you find it strange that she's not got in touch with it? Not in the least. She would certainly not do so. She's too proud. Mm. In fact, I'm convinced that if she were confronted with the body, she would swear it was not her daughter. I know she has heard nothing from the girl for the last four years. Mm, yes. I would say nobody could live under the same roof as my sister-in-law. But there was another reason. A woman in whom I have every confidence and who goes once a week to Caen, where she is part owner of a shop, swore to me on her husband's life that not long before my niece left home, she met her at Caen, just going into a doctor's house. Yes. And not just an ordinary doctor, Chief Inspector, a gynaecologist. Uh, in other words, you suspect your niece of having left the town because she was pregnant? Frankly, yes. Mm. Earlier that year, I remember, my sister-in-law decided to take her to La Bouboule for a holiday. Yeah. But she left Lisieux for good three or four months later. And she couldn't have been more than three or four months pregnant then because it didn't show. Well, that exactly fits in with her visit to La Bouboule. Mm. And I'm perfectly certain it was there that she met the man by whom she became pregnant. And she most likely went off to join him. If it had been a Lisieux man, he would have either arranged for an abortion or gone away with her. Yes, I see. Well, thank you for coming to see us, madame. You're going back to Lisieux, I suppose? Oh, no, not today. I have friends in Paris, and I shall probably spend a few days with them. Mm. Now, don't hesitate to ring, Inspector, if you need me. Oh, thank you. I shall always be ready to help. Yes, I'm sure you will. Good day. Good day, Chief Inspector. Oh. Inspector? Hmm? Now, look, you're not going to let me get any lunch, are you, Lapointe? I was looking forward to a nice cold beer. I've just been on the phone to Nice. Uh -huh. They found the report on von Farnheim's death? Yes. Nothing obviously suspicious, but they give me the names of the servants who were employed at the house, which you may find interesting. Huh? 
Uh, now, there were five of them. Antoinette Mejra, age 19, housemaid. Rosalie Moncoeur, 42, cook. Maria Pinaco, 23, kitchen maid. Angelino Lupin, 38, butler. And Oscar Bonvoisin, 35, valet chauffeur. Oscar, at last. Hmm. I suppose nobody knows what's become of all these people. Oh, the police at Nice have found an employment bureau which specialises in staffing big houses. It's kept by an old lady who's been there for over 20 years. She doesn't remember Count von Farnheim or the Countess or Oscar Bonvoisin, but not more than a year ago, she found a job for Rosalie Moncoeur, the cook. It's with some South Americans in Paris. Uh, now, I had their address. Yeah. 132 Avenue Diena. Anything known about the others? Well, they're following that up. Shall I go and see her, sir? Mm, no, sorry, La Pointe. I think it's better if I go. Yes, sir. Get myself that beer on the way. I'm sorry to have to ask you into the kitchen, but we have a lunch party in half an hour to prepare for. No, not at all. It's very kind of you to see me, Madame Moncoeur. I'll try not to take up too much of your time. Now, I believe you once worked for the Count and Countess von Farnheim in the south of France. Huh? You don't mean to tell me you're digging up that old story. Uh, not exactly. Did you know the Countess was dead? It happens to everyone. No, I didn't know. She was murdered. Who killed her? Well, we don't know yet. That's what I'm trying to find out. Do you remember an Oscar Bonvoisin who worked with you for the von Farnheims? Him? <laughs> oh, yes. You didn't like him? He was a valet. I don't like valets. They're all bone idle, especially when their chauffeurs as well believe they're cock of the walk. Do you think he may have killed the Countess? Oh, well, it's possible. Can you give me a description of him? As he was in those days, yes. But I don't know what he looks like now. At least... Uh, yes? Yeah. A few weeks ago, I went to see my brother in Montmartre. He has a cafe in the Rue Colancourt. On my way there, I passed a man in the street I thought I knew. Uh, he looked at me, too, as if he was trying to place me, and then suddenly he began to walk very fast, turning his head away. And you thought it was Oscar? I'd almost swear it was. Hmm. Tell me, what kind of a man was he? I don't like giving people away. You'd rather let a murderer go free? If he's only killed the Countess, he's done no great harm. Look, if he has killed her, he's killed at least one other woman. And there's no reason to suppose that he'll stop there. He wasn't tall. Rather on the small side. He used to wear high heels to make himself look taller. I used to tease him about it. He was very dark. Very thick hair. Black eyebrows. Some women thought him irresistible. Not me. Anyhow, he had all the women he wanted, and not only the servants. No, you think he had an affair with the Countess? Before the Count had been dead two days. Uh, how do you know? Because I saw him come out of her room at six in the morning. That was partly why I left. And when the servants begin to share the best bedroom, that's it. Did it ever occur to you that the Count might have been murdered? It was none of my business. But it did occur to you? It occurred to the police, too, didn't it? Else why did they ask all those questions? Could it have been Oscar? I don't say that. She was probably just as capable of doing it herself. How was she killed? Strangled. And who was the other woman? A girl, 20 years old, came from Lisieux. Nothing to suggest she ever lived on the Riviera. All we know is that she once visited La Bourboule. In the Auvergne? Yes. Oscar came from the Auvergne. Did he, indeed? I don't know exactly what part, but he had a bit of an accent. Mm. Had he changed much when you saw him a few weeks ago? He was fatter, and his hair was beginning to go grey at the temple, but I'm sure it was him. Anything else? He was very smartly dressed, I remember that. Look at the time. You'll have to excuse me, but I need the kitchen to myself. Of course, Madame Moncur, I understand. And thank you. Le point. Yes, sir. Is Lucas still in the confessional with Philippe? Yes. Well, get him in here. Yes, sir. jean -Vier. Yes, sir. Get on to the press. Tell them we've questioned Philippe Montgomery for several hours with no result. And uh, that we... chap's like a wet rag, hmm? but I've got nothing out of him so far. Sorry, Chief. We're letting him go. What? Nah. 
If Oscar Bonvoisin did kill those two women, we'll get him eventually, but it'll take time. And before we catch him, he may bump off someone else for knowing too much. And you think we could use Philly as bait? Because if he does know something, which I'm convinced he does, Oscar must be feeling very uneasy. A drug addict can't be trusted. Philippe said nothing yet, but that doesn't mean he'll keep quiet forever, and Oscar knows it. And if the press publishes the fact that we've released him, Oscar may try to get rid of him. Exactly. But I realise there's the risk we may be landed with another corpse, but I intend that we keep a very close eye on the boy. He must be needing dope badly by now, and Oscar may be his only means of getting it. We'll let him go at dusk. It'll be easier to tail him then. Uh, Luca, uh, La Pointe, uh, I'll leave that to you. All right, Chief. Oh, and get Longyon and some of his men on it, too. Yes. He's always saying how well he knows Montmartre. Now's his chance to prove it. <laughs> I'm off to Picrats. This whole business started there, and I have the feeling it may well end there. If anything turns up, phone me. Evening, Chief Inspector. Evening. Thought you might come in. What the hell, Brandy? Oh, thank you. Is your wife not here? Yeah, yeah, she's upstairs. Giving a lesson to the girl who's replacing all that. Mm, doesn't it interest you? Uh, she's quite pretty. Yeah, good health. Oh, thank you. A better figure than all that. But uh, it's not the same thing. At least she's alive. Yeah. Uh, you were asking before about a fellow named Oscar. Yes. Well, I don't know how to explain it properly, and I don't know if there is such a person, but what I do know is that there was somebody... I had old over her. What sort of old and why, I don't know. But if there was somebody, do you suppose she suddenly got sick of him and decided to give him away? Well, when she went to the police station, she knew a crime was to be committed and that it involved a countess. Yeah, but why did she pretend she'd found it out here listening to a conversation between these two men? To begin with, she was drunk. Perhaps she drank to screw up her courage. Perhaps young Albert had more effect on her than he realised. Oh, by the way, I've discovered... He's one of your fellows. Yes, I didn't realise it was Lapointe who was with her until he told me. He wasn't on duty. No, he was genuinely in love with her, you know. Yeah, but I did tell you. He wanted her to change her way of life. Wanted to marry her. Poor Lapointe. Excuse me. No, that may be for me. Big rats. Yeah, he is. You were right. It's for you. Oh, thanks. Yes. Luca here, Chief. Hmm? I'm in the Rue Le Pique. When Philippe Mortemar left headquarters, he came straight here to the cafe on the corner. He's been round all the tables asking for someone called Bernard. Uh, who's Bernard? Drug pusher. No luck, though. He left a few minutes ago. La Pointe's tailing him. Fine. Thanks, Luca. Hey, it's all right if Rose and a girl run over the act down here, Chief Inspector. Huh? Oh, oh yes, of course. Good. You might even enjoy it. Right. Hmm? Remember what I told you? You come in through there. No, no, wait a minute, dear. There's a fanfare first. I'll put the record on. Now. Oh, dear, 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 dear. <laughs> Rose knows how to teach the girls what to do. But this one... <laughs> Never be a patch on our leg. Now the shoulder strap. No, slowly. You'll never last the music out of you as fast as that. That. Now go right around the floor. Mm, shall I? Yeah, that will be for you. Uh, me, Graham. The point here, sir. He's got as far as the cafe in the Place Constantin Pecqueur. Uh, what's he doing? Still seems to be looking for someone. Uh, nobody following him? Nobody, except us. Just take it off. That's Inspector Lognon myself. Uh, where's Lognon? Over the road, outside the cafe. Well, ask him to have a word with the cafe proprietor. Uh, not in front of the customers, if he can help it. Uh, tell him to ask if he knows Oscar Bonvoisin. And tell him to ring me as soon as he's done it. Right, sir. Done the best I can with her. Well, how's it 
going, Monsieur Maigret? Hmm. Slowly. Maigret. Long on here. The cafe proprietor knew Oscar and where he lives. Oh, where? A house called Chez Manier, Rue Coulancourt. Uh, what's Philippe up to? Getting very drunk at the moment. Right. Get one of your men to keep an eye on him, collect La Pointe, and I'll meet you both outside Chez Manier in five minutes. Right, Chief Inspector. In the bag. Perhaps. Well, you'll come back here when it's over, won't you? We'll have a bottle of champagne. Celebrate. Where's La Pointe? Checking if there's a way out of the back. Mm. But I doubt there will be. Right. As soon as he gets back, we're going in there. There's no one upstairs, Chief. Oh. Shall we warn the railway station? Well, judging by the fire in the stove, I'd say Oscar left here three or four hours ago. If he meant to make a run for it, he'll be away by now. He had plenty of trains to choose from. He could be waiting for Philippe somewhere. That's more than possible. Have you got Philippe's address? Yes, uh, Boulevard Rochechoir. Right, Longyear, you keep an eye on this place from the other side of the road. Keep out of sight. You think Oscar will come back? I don't think anything. All I know is that the Countess was killed in her own flat, and so was Arlette. If Oscar was responsible for those two murders, and he wants to silence Philippe, he could well be waiting at the Boulevard Rochechoir. Right, La Pointe, you come with me. Chief. Well, La Pointe, what did the concierge say? Philippe's room is on the first floor. Door on the left. She didn't think he'd come in yet. Uh, hardly surprising if he's getting drunk in a cafe in the Place Constantin Pecqueur. Any other inquiries for him? Not as far as she knew, but she hadn't been in for very long. So, she wouldn't know if anyone else had gone up to his room. Got your gun, La Pointe? Well, yes, sir, but uh, I... Right, come on. Let's go up. But quietly, right. There's someone moving about in there. Yes. You... Shh. Ah, Monsieur Bonvoisin. I am Chief Inspector Major. Take him apart! I've killed him. Let's have a look. I've, I've killed him. Your first, you see. I don't forget, he killed our leg. It... It is him. Oscar Bonvoisin? Yes, that's him. Description fits perfectly. I'm sorry, sir. I think I'm going to be sick. No, you're not, young Lapointe. What you're going to do is to go and ring up headquarters, and after that, if you can find a bistro that's still open, you're going to have a large drink. Oh, but I... I... And that's an order. And that Georges was when young Lapointe, as I've always called him, grew up. Yes, I remember it all now. Oh, but did you ever get your free bottle of champagne at Picrat's? Oh, yes. <laughs> that night, I took La Pointe back there after all the details had been cleared up. What was the new girl's act like? Terrible. <laughs> Fred left all the lights on at the end. She had to scuffle off as best she could, not to mm. stitch on. <laughs> did he do it on purpose? Yeah, probably. He'd got a laugh from some of the clientele. Mm. Then I looked at La Pointe, and he was crying. He'd buried his first love and killed his first man. Who's to blame him? He got very drunk. With a little help from usual. Perhaps. 
So I took him to his rooms, put him to bed. You're a very thoughtful man. Well, not really. I completely forgot to send someone to tell Long Long he could go home. He was still there under the trees opposite Oscar's house when I drove to work the next morning. <laughs> he caught a terrible cold. Poor Long Long. Poor La Pointe. In Maigret in Montmartre by Georges Simenon, translated by Daphne Woodward and adapted for radio by Aubrey Woods, Maurice Denham played Jules Maigret and Michael Goff, Georges Simenon. Luca was Brian Haynes, La Pointe, John Rye, and Jean Vier, Sean Barrett. Inspector Lognon, Garrard Green, Fred Alfonsi, Hayden Jones, Rose, Maddie Head, and Philippe, Michael Burlington. Other parts were played by Catherine Parr, Nicolette Mackenzie, Kathleen Helm, and Peter Craze. The play was produced and directed by Glyn Dearman. Maigret, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simenon. With Maurice Denham as Jules Maigret and Michael Goff as Georges Simenon. What will you have to eat? Oh. Why so gloomy? Well, I'm supposed to be on a diet, George, and I'm very hungry. Order as you please. You are my guest. Mm. The lamb here is very good. Oh, God, no. <laughs> no, i better have a plain tornado and salade de tomate. No dressing. No pommes frites. No. Are you trying to get me divorced? <laughs> Being a friend, I'll have the same. Hmm. It's not only your diet that is making you so gloomy, is it, George? You've been quiet ever since we left the toy shop. No, take no notice. I was only... Ruminating? Well, I suppose so. Why should buying a Christmas present for a child... And thank you for your advice. I think the train set an admirable idea. Mm. But why should a toy shop cause such depression? Oh, yes, of course. You once had a case. Yes, that in a way began with a toy shop, a train set. One of your more difficult cases, Rue. Oh, certainly one of my more complex, George. One that caused me... Oh, it was a disturbing case. May Gray has scruples. Translated by Robert Egglesfield and adapted for radio by Edward Bruce. I can't blame myself for what happened yet. It's difficult not to. <laughs> Do you remember how cold it was that winter? Mm -hmm. uh, the damn central heating in my office started to play up. But did I say it was cold? It was like a furnace in my office. I couldn't turn the wretched thing down, nor could you, Clark. I can't shift it, Chief. Oh, I hate central heating. Makes the atmosphere heavy. Why couldn't they leave me my old stove? I could work there. I think they took it away because it was installed before you were born. Oh, I'm still functioning. 
although I may keel over in this heat. Well, we could open a window. But then I'd catch my death of cold. Which is it to be, then? Uh, well, I shall continue to work without further complaint. Good, because there's a man waiting to see you. Mm? Purpose of call, personal and urgent. Uh, Will you see me ask for you specifically? Well, I not. We're certainly slack at the moment. A lot of influenza about. Seems even criminals take to their beds when they get a little cough. I'll show him in, then. What's his name? Uh, Monsieur Xavier Martin. I must apologise for troubling you, Chief Inspector. Uh, please sit down. Uh, you must have lots of calls, like uh, well, people with their little troubles, convinced mm. they're, they're interesting. And, and uh, well, I, I, I hesitated a long time before bothering a man as busy as you. Let, let me assure you of that. Uh, um, well, now, I've repeated to myself many times uh, uh, what, what I was going to say, but n now it's all getting muddled up. Look, if you would sit down uh, and, and try to... to stand, look, try to be a little calmer. I might be uh, able to just follow Just because you. I've been to Dr Steiner. Well, that doesn't mean... But just a visit for less than an hour, that couldn't mean that, that, that I am mad. Look, I'm sorry, monsieur, but you must explain. Perhaps I'm a little dull-witted today, the heat in this office. Uh, Dr Steiner, yes, I know him, one of our best psychiatrists. He's very thorough. I assure you, he found nothing wrong with me. Now, I want to make that quite clear. I'm perfectly sane. But my wife... Well, um, may I smoke? Yes, of course. No, not for me, thank you. Uh, Yes, of course. You you smoke a pipe. Uh, I know quite a lot about you. Uh, oh, oh I'm, I'm sorry. I, I ought to control myself better, but... Oh, well... Uh, allow me. Uh, thank you. Splendid lighter. Yes, yeah, present from one of my inspectors. Well, please go on. Uh, I've forgotten what I was saying. It would be better if you asked me some questions. Oh, hmm? no, <laughs> you can't do that, of course, because you, you don't know what it's all about. Look, I'm listening. I work at the uh, Grand Magasin de Lourdes in the uh, toy department. Trains. You're quite famous, Inspector. In my own way, I'm quite famous too. Mm. I'm considered the greatest expert in toy trains in the whole of Paris. Why, we have an exact reconstruction of the Saint-Lazare stations, which I built myself. And don't, don't imagine that our customers are just children. <laughs> uh. If you saw... Am I, am I boring you? No, I said I was listening. <laughs> In any case, it wasn't about electric trains that I came to see you. <laughs> no, my, um, my wife. I live at 17 Avenue du Châtillon. I've lived there ever since I was married. That's why I went to see Dr Steiner. Uh, because of my wife. Well, well, I don't want to make any wild accusations, but... Um, uh, yes? I think she has been meaning to kill me. Oh, I see. Mind you, I haven't any positive proof. Just a kind of, uh, a moral proof. Trifles which are unimportant in themselves, but which, taken together, end up meaning something. Mm. Yeah, well, now, now, I'm not very well educated, but I've been to various libraries to read books on uh, mental disorders, on neurosis and psychosis, things like that. I couldn't understand them properly, but, but they've made me think. Uh, you're not being very coherent, Monsieur Martin. But if I understand you correctly, you suspect that your wife is not in a normal condition. Uh, something like that. But this... Is more tangible. I think you'll find it to be zinc phosphate. I've had it analysed by a friend. Could you have it checked? Uh, I, I've looked it up. I've read quite a lot about poisons, how to use them, things like that. I think you'll find that it is very lethal if given in large doses. Once it was used for medical purposes, but proved too dangerous. Where did you find it? In the house. In a cupboard behind the detergents. Not just a few grams, a whole bottle full. But as, as I said, a few grams wouldn't kill you, although you could get very bad stomach pains. And that's what I've been getting for the last few months. Hmm. Which means that if this is zinc phosphate, you think your wife has been using it to try and poison you. Ah, uh, just then the phone rang. It was the chief of police demanding my immediate presence to discuss the details of another case. I asked Martin to wait, expecting only to be away for a few minutes, but it took me longer than expected. No doubt your superior was a very talkative man. <laughs> Correct. When I got back to my office, my nutty pigeon had vanished. Walked out without a word to anybody. Wasn't he free to go? No charge had been laid. Uh, perfectly free, but I was worried about what he'd told me. If his wife was trying to kill him... Well, in the end, I decided he was probably a crank. We get a lot of them in the course of a year. 
Well, I wasn't at my best in that steaming office that morning, so I shoved on my hat and went home for lunch. Hmm, boiled fish again. And a nice salad. Uh, salad. That's the third day running. Oh, well, I... I thought... uh, Louise, are you on a diet? Oh, I'm bursting out of my dresses. I should lose a little weight. Well, I'm not on a diet. Well, you should be. Uh, Louise, is there any reason for this? Mm, losing a little weight is always a good thing. Yesterday I noticed you paused for breath coming up the stairs. I thought you were out of breath. That's why I stopped. Mm. Oh, we should have a maid save you doing the heavy work. You think I'm growing old? No, I didn't say that. It sounded like it. Oh. What could that be at this time of day? Oh, girl. Oh. Well, well. Come in, Raoul. Jewel. What are you doing here? I, uh, I said I'd drop in on Louise if I was passing. And uh, you were passing at this time of day? Oh, why not? Oh, if I've disturbed your lunch, please carry on. Uh, what's happened? In what way? Oh, come on, pardon. You're not only a close friend, Louise, and myself. You're also our doctor. I certainly don't suspect you of having an affair with my wife. Yet you arrive at this extraordinary hour and... Louise, the diet... She's ill. Uh, there's nothing to worry about, Jewel. She didn't want you to know, that's all. But uh, she's been a bit off colour. I didn't realise you'd be here for lunch. I should have come later. Look, she's been to see you and didn't tell me. Is it serious? I just told you. She's a bit overweight. And her circulation isn't all it should be. We're all getting older. Minor repairs are necessary. And that's why she looks so flushed sometimes. Uh, yes, yes, sir. I've given her some pills. Look, I've disturbed you. Why don't you finish your meal? No, no, I... I think I shall have a glass of wine instead. Will you, will you join me? I better not. I have a couple of patients to visit later. Ah. But you are free at the moment? Why? Well, I'd like you to spare me half an hour. A sort of consultation, if you like. Yeah. Uh, something that came up this morning in the office. I tried not to let it worry me, but it has. It's not exactly in your field, but you might be able to help me unofficially. Megary, you realise what you're asking me? An opinion about a man whom I've never seen, whom you don't really know. You're not going by the book. Well, oh, to hell with the book. There isn't a book for this case. No complaint has been made, no crime has been committed, but something is wrong. I feel it in my bones. Now, what I really want to know is why this man, Martin, came to see me. And secondly, why he disappeared without finishing his story. He suggested that his wife is going mad. Oh, not in so many words. Uh, why? Well, that could be an indication that he wasn't exactly stable. A sense of persecution, an unfounded one. I, I don't know. I'm a family doctor, not a psychiatrist. The barrier between a man of sound mind and a psychopath is a fragile one. Mm. The psychiatrist he went to, Steiner, he might help us? Steiner's a tricky customer. Ah, oh, yes, I know. I've watched him as witness in the size court. All right, Jules. <laughs> I'll phone him. Mm. Better I than you. As a doctor, I might get something out of him. I'll let you know later if I have any luck. Oh, I'm going past the Quai des Orfèvres. Uh, do you want a lift? I'll just tell Louise I expect to be in for... <laughs> dinner <laughs> the usual time. Uh, Jean Vier, Chief, uh, did you see that man who came to see me this morning, Martin? Yes. Did he see you? I don't think so. Good. Now, I want you to go to the magazine du Louvre, go to the toy department. Martin seems to be top dog there. His speciality is trains. Find out all you can about him, right. and try not to look like a policeman. Why not? Because we are investigating a non-existent crime. And because I don't want his superiors to know that Martin is being investigated. Why not? Because I don't want to run the risk of doing him any unnecessary harm. What do you want me to ask him? Uh, oh, hanged if I know. Mm. General inquiries? Mm, yes. The lights are all right, Chief. Mm, well, thank you, jean -Vier. Beautiful present. Now, next, I want you to go to 17 Avenue de Châtillon, where Martin lives. Question the concierge and the neighbours. Uh, and once again, be discreet. 
You might do a bit of door-to-door salesmanship with a, a vacuum cleaner or something. Chief, without being rude, door-to-door vacuum salesmen no longer exist. I know they did years ago, but... No, if anybody else... Sorry, Chief, to... I'm on my way. Huh. There's a personal call for you in your office, Chief. No, thank you. Why is it so cold in here? Yeah. Uh, uh, great. Jules, it's Raoul Pardon. Ah. I phoned Steiner. Yeah. No luck, except a carefully guarded statement that he considered Martin sane. Uh. Professional oath prevented him saying any more. Yeah, I understand. I found a book that might be useful. Would you like me to drop it off at the Cadiz office? Well, I'd be grateful, Raoul. Uh, and when I've finished dieting, <laughs> come to dinner. <laughs> I, I should love to. Uh. Chief. Yes, Luca. There's someone outside. You'll want to see him. Oh, will I? Who is it? <laughs> Why is it so cold in here? Well, I had the maintenance men over here while you were at lunch. They turned the radiator down. Well, then turn it up again. Who will I want to see? Madame Martin. A personal matter, she said. Hmm? Madame Martin. Well, what's she like? Elegant, expensively dressed. Different to her husband. Oh, show her in, Luca. Right, Chief. <sighs> Madame. Thank you. Chief Inspector Maigret. Ah, uh, that is correct. Uh, come in, Madame Martin. Uh, thank you, Luca. Uh, right, sir. Uh, will you sit down, Madame? <sighs> I expect you know why I am here. Mm, should I, Madame? I, too, have been to Dr. Steiner. No doubt my husband told you that when he came to see you this morning. Well, you must excuse me, madame. I followed him here. I saw him come into the building. Did it surprise you, seeing him here? You know what he came to see me about? I can easily guess. His mental condition, his despondency, his fear of my trying to kill him, his fear that he's going mad. If only he knew it. Xavier has no need of an interview with a policeman. He needs treatment from a psychiatrist. I've told him that. You've suggested to him that he might be uh, neurotic. Of course. When you consider his behaviour, what else could I do? He's always been a little odd, but lately... First, he came home complaining about his superiors in the store. Next, about a new salesman whom he accused of trying to worm secrets out of him. About toy trains, of all things. Don't you find that ridiculous? You think I'm being uncharitable. People don't make fun of me because I design and sell brassiers and corsets. Yet that is my work, and I do it successfully. There will always be a market with the middle-aged and the very... Yes, madame, I'm, I'm sure you're right. But to get back to Xavier's behaviour. For example, one evening he told me, you'd make a beautiful widow, wouldn't you? Then he went on to say that without him I should have a brilliant career that he was an obstacle to my success. That's when I suggested he should see a psychiatrist. I thought I was being helpful. Do you know his reply? He said I was trying to persuade him he was mad. Can you believe that? Another oddity of behaviour. At meals, he waits until I've swallowed my first mouthful of food before he will taste his own. Is that the action of a rational human being? Madame Martin, when your husband went to Dr. Steiner, did he tell you the result of his consultation? He told me nothing. I went to see Dr. Steiner myself. But he refused to comment about Xavier. What more could I do? Yes. After my visit, I found Xavier even more difficult, more secretive than ever. Then yesterday, he suddenly said to me, Whatever you do, no matter how cunning you are, there will be somebody who will know about it. I was afraid. That's why I followed him here this morning. Well, I've tried to give you some idea of the situation. Now I'm ready for any questions you may care to ask me. Exactly why did you come to tell me all this, Madame Martin? Do you want your husband certified? I don't remember saying anything which would entitle Look, you've just admitted you are afraid of your husband. I'm afraid for him, not of him. Because whatever happens, I am capable of defending myself. Yes, I'm sure you are. Then what do you want me to do? 
Do you want me to make a formal application for him to be examined by a mental specialist? Certainly not. I've never suggested such a thing. You work all day, ma'am? Yes. Selling um, foundation garments? I work with Monsieur Haris of the Rue Saint-Honoré. I receive a fairly high percentage of the profits from the business, although I have no share in it. Uh, nonetheless, you're in a good position. No better say than your husband's, right? Huh? Well, I hadn't thought about it. I suppose so. Why? Well, sometimes a man doesn't like a situation like that. Uh, did you always have your present job? No, I was once a sales girl in the Magasin du Louvre. Uh, that's where I met Xavier. But about five years ago, Monsieur Harris was looking for someone to run his lingerie business. I thought it could be interesting. Mm. It is now one of the best three in Paris. Mm. Is your husband jealous of your success? Well, I suppose it's possible. Or perhaps of Monsieur Harris? I find that an unnecessary question. Maurice and I have a very happy relationship. Mm. There seems to be nothing else I can tell you. Perhaps I've been rather foolish. I came here, I suppose, with the vague idea of confiding in you, of expecting some help. As you don't believe me, as you think I'm imagining things unnecessarily. Now, madame, do you use zinc phosphate? Yes. Oh, good heavens! Xavier's found it! I use it to get rid of the rats, both at the Rue Saint-Honoré and at home. It's very effective. Is he suggesting I'm trying to poison him with it? Uh, something like that. Then I must explain it to him tonight. I told you, Chief Inspector, he needs treatment. Only her hands betrayed her nervousness. It was curious in view of her outward calm, but somehow it made me uneasy. I'd had two extraordinary interviews that day that added up to nothing. Innuendos, no facts, nothing tangible that I could get hold of, except a little bag of powder which the laboratory had correctly analyzed as being zinc phosphate. Used to kill rats. Exactly. That evening, I took home the book on psychiatry that Raoul Pardon had delivered to the Quai des Alphères. Hardly part of your job. No, but I needed all the help I could get to try and understand these two extraordinary people. To understand their real reason for coming to see me. I looked for phrases, for attitudes, anything which might explain them. Ah, neuroses. In Adler's opinion, the starting point of neuroses is an alarming feeling of inferiority and insecurity. A defensive reaction. Mental syndrome, the feeling of incapacity is dominant. Oh, that sounds possible, Martin. Neither do they consider themselves blameworthy or at fault. Their pride is characteristic. Arrogance. They bring it into the home. Does that apply to Martin and his wife? Could apply to both of them. Could describe half the population of Paris. What, dear? Mm, oh, just thinking aloud. <laughs> Do you find me arrogant, dominating? Never arrogant, dear. Sometimes a little firm. Mm. You give the impression of being very sure of yourself. Oh, do I? But I know it isn't true. Uh, 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 You've got a cold. Mm, uh, mm, the patient considers himself to be the victim of an injustice. Mm, Madame or Monsieur Martin. Or both. So many symptoms which could apply to them both. Ah, too much study confuses the issue. Pardon is right. The difference between insanity and normality is a fragile one. A difficult case? Look, I don't even know if I have a case. Now, you'll join me in a prunelle, and then we shall go to bed. I must look after my cold. <laughs> Good morning, Chief. I thought you'd overslept. Good morning, sir. How's your cold? I haven't got a cold. Well, jean uh, Not a lot to report. Look, have you got a match? But you're lighter, Chief. Hmm? Oh, oh, yes, of course. Uh, uh, mm. Mm. Uh, go on, jean -Vier. 
Well, to start with, I obviously look more like a policeman than I thought. Oh. Martin recognised me at once. Mm. I went up to the toy department of the Magasin de Louvre, and I'd only asked him a few questions about the trains. A marvellous display he's laid out. Yes, yes, yes. And when he said, tell Chief Inspector Megre that it's a pretty shabby trick sending you here, he could get me the sack. Oh. So I left. I did better at the Avenue de Châtillon, though. Oh, good. The Martins don't live in the apartment house proper. They have a small cottage at the end of the courtyard. The ground floor is almost entirely a kind of studio come living room. How did you find that out? I used the insurance gimmick. I knocked at the door. A young woman answered. Madame Martin, I asked. Uh, no, she said. My sister won't be back until about seven. Uh, uh, Giselle Martin has a sister. Hmm? Mm. What's she like? She isn't a beauty, but there is something very feminine about her. Mm. It's difficult to describe, but... <laughs> a kind of woman you'd like to protect. Uh, she wasn't interested in insurance, thank heaven, and she told me that both her sister and brother-in-law were already heavily insured. She lives with them? Yes. That's about all. Right. Uh, Le Pointe. Chief. Uh, listen, my lad, I want you to go to the magasin du Louvre for lunchtime and follow Martin when he comes out. Yep. Get the details from Jean Vier. Right. And then I want you to go to a lingerie shop in the Rue Saint-Honoré, name of Harris. Oh, me? I, I, I couldn't go into a place like that. Oh, why not? You might have just become engaged. Why are you blushing? Well, I, uh, it's just possible, Chief, that I... Good. <laughs> Congratulations, La Pointe. So, you could be wanting to buy a nightdress for your proposed fiancée. Me, sir? Go on, she'd love one. Now, jean -Vier. Oh, La Pointe, you don't have to buy one. I just want you to find out all you can about the place. Did what you told me, Chief. Mm. I had no trouble in picking Martin out. He never knew who was being followed. Well, I should hope not. Oh. Well, he didn't lunch anywhere near the shop. Instead, he walked to a little cafe about half a kilometre away. That's where he met her. His wife? Oh, no, Chief. Hmm? Well, who then? I think it was the sister. The one Janvier described this morning. Well, the age and appearance, Tally. They didn't kiss, but I think they're lovers. They look so sad. Oh, ever the romantic La Pointe. Well, I was just trying to give you an impression. Of... Yeah, I understand. You think they're in love? Oh, I'm certain of it. I'm sure they aren't unhappy because... Oh, you can't be really unhappy when... You... La Pointe, a moment ago you said they looked sad. Well... Yes. Sad in a way. Like lovers who aren't free to show their love. <sighs> One day, La Pointe, you're going to learn that we can only investigate, charge and prosecute on substance and fact. Never on impression, on supposition, on conjecture, which may be false. But, Chief, you've got to go through supposition and conjecture until you uncover a fact. You taught me that. Oh. Did I? Well, get on with it. But this time, let me draw my own conclusions, hmm? Well... After lunch, they separated. I didn't follow either of them, but went to the Rue Saint-Honoré. I, I confess I was scared of going into the shop, but eventually I went in and asked for a nightdress. Mm. The woman who served me, or should I say attempted to serve me, was Madame Marton. She offered me a beautiful one, a model created for Princess Hélène of Greece. Yes. Do you know how much it was? Mm. Four thousand francs. So I asked for something in nylon. But uh, you what? But <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Oh, that, that, that's quite all right, sir. Mm. Her reaction was somewhat similar to yours. Yeah, yes, we quite. don't stock nylon here, she said. Only pure silk and batiste. Mm. So I thought it was time to leave. Just as I was going, a well-dressed man came in and went straight into the office at the back of the shop. Madame Martin followed him. As I went out, I heard them laughing and looked back. Madame Martin reached up and smoothed his hair and then kissed him on the cheek. Mm. They were completely at ease with each other. I... I won't swear that they are lovers, but... No, I said I'd draw my own conclusions. So, Martin doesn't lunch with his wife, who works within a few hundred metres of him, but with his sister-in-law, and his wife... Uh, Maigret. Uh, C'est vieille Martin. Mm. 
Chief Inspector. Ah. Uh, I, I must apologize about yesterday, but I had to get back to the store. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder if I could see you again mm. today. I, I can get to you before six. Yes, I'll be waiting for you. I hope you understand about yesterday, uh, Chief Inspector. Mm. Discipline at the store is very strict, and in my position... Be quiet, it, yeah. My uh, wife has been to see you, hasn't she? What makes you say that? Uh, nothing tangible. Her manner. Has she been here? Uh, yesterday you came to see me and told me that you were afraid for your life. I suppose you're here today to give me further details, or do you wish to lodge a complaint against your wife? No. It wouldn't do any good. No, well, why have you come, then? So that you will know that if anything happens to me, that I haven't killed myself, and that I haven't died of natural causes. Huh? No, no, I'm not mad. I told you about Dr Steiner, but I'm still convinced that my wife will try and kill me. It was zinc phosphate, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> so, you see, I do know a lot about poisons, how they can go undetected. But I don't intend to go quietly. Well, what exactly does that mean? Oh, I'm taking precautions. I'm not going to rely on the law. And if I have enough time... Monsieur, I'm confused. Am I mistaken in thinking that you intend to kill your wife in advance, so to speak? Only if she has succeeded in poisoning me. I shall know. I shall be capable of action. Death by poisoning is really instantaneous. If I feel a pain in my stomach... Oh, uh, don't worry, Chief Inspector. I'll be able to tell the difference between poison symptoms and indigestion. And uh, I have a revolver at home. So, if you think uh, you've been... No, not think. Feel. Feel that I've been poisoned, then I shan't hesitate. I'll shoot her. Oh, you made a very serious admission, Monsieur Martin. Not sure that I shouldn't send you to the special infirmary for examination. Is that really necessary? You can check with Dr. Steiner. Well... Oh, I see. You have already? Uh, up to a point. Mm. Look, would you submit willingly to an examination by another doctor? No, of course. When? I, I have to get time off from the shop. Uh, well, tomorrow, about 11, would that be too early? That would be fine. Huh. You are a curious fellow, Monsieur Martin. Do you... Uh, Love your wife? I did, once. Well, how does your sister-in-law fit into all this? <laughs> oh, you have been making inquiries. Uh, she came to live with us about two years ago. That's when I began to realise what Giselle was really like, when my eyes were opened. Uh, how do you mean? Her dislike for her sister. I found it uh, unnatural. Uh, and Jenny's so different, so, so gentle. Well, sisters don't always like each other. Oh, it's much stronger than dislike. She puts up with Jenny because she's useful. Jenny keeps house for us as a way of contributing to the rent. It's convenient for Giselle. She can pursue her business career and her affair with her employer without interference. Hmm? Oh, you think she and Monsieur Harris are lovers? I know they are. Then why hasn't she asked you for a divorce? Monsieur Harris is married to a very wealthy woman. Uh, well, what about you? What would you like? You said your eyes were open when your sister-in-law came to live with you. In what way? Oh, uh, well, when I realised that there were other sorts of, um... You love her? Yes. She's your mistress? No. Does she love you? I think she's beginning to. Hmm. Well, is there anything else you want to tell me? There's an insurance policy. A joint one. It's been arranged so that the surviving partner benefits. Then you have as much financial interest in your wife's death as she would have in yours. That's why I mentioned it. It would enable her to buy an equal share in the Saint Honore shop. Well, if there's nothing else, Chief Inspector. Well, I hated to let him go. If anything was going to happen... No, I had to do something about it. Lapointe and Luca were the unlucky ones. I arranged they should spend the night observing the house in the Avenue de Châtillon. Luca agreed to take over from La Pointe around midnight. What did you do? Oh, I went home to bed, of course. I had to look after my cold. I thought you said you didn't have one. <laughs> no, I had to keep up the morale of the office, didn't I? <laughs> well, I went to bed early, just as well. The phone rang at 6.30. 
you? Hmm. Uh, the poor Luca. Chief Inspector Migret. Yeah. Uh, oh, this is the emergency service, Inspector Joffre. Oh, uh, what is it? We had a phone call from a woman a few moments ago. A woman? Huh. She asked me to get in touch with you and to tell you to go to the Avenue de Châtillon straight away. Huh? Says you know all about it. Uh, did she give her name? No. Well, thanks. <sighs> Which woman? Giselle Martin, my sister. I, I've done what I could to prevent it. Seems I haven't done enough. I'll get you some coffee. It took me about 20 minutes to get to the Avenue de Châtillon. I didn't find what I expected. Luca had called the criminal records office and Dr. Paul was examining the body. Of Xavier Martin. Oh, yes. It had to be. If the sister-in-law had phoned, there would have been two bodies. Giselle Martin shot and Xavier Martin poisoned as he had predicted might happen. Mm. So it had to be Giselle who phoned and the victim Martin. Well, that's logical enough, I suppose. I confess I hadn't reasoned it out. I was upset that a crime which I had anticipated had happened and I'd been unable to prevent it. Xavier Martin had been poisoned. Yeah. He was lying on the floor of the studio come living room. One got the impression that he'd collapsed while crawling on all fours. His right hand was stretched out as if he'd tried to reach a revolver, which was also lying on the floor, about eight inches away from the fingers. I couldn't understand why Luca hadn't contacted me instead of Giselle Martin phoning the emergency service. Later he told me that she'd phoned before he discovered anything was wrong. He'd been watching the cottage from the road quite a distance away. It was only when most of the lights were turned on that he knocked at the door to find out if anything had happened. Oh, my crime prevention methods have proved to be very futile. There was nothing more you could have done. Well, I might have detained Martin at the Quai des Orfaires the previous night. But he was so willing to be examined. Hadn't any real reason for that kind of action. Anyway, after making a pretty thorough investigation of the cottage, I took the two women to headquarters. Uh, I ordered coffee and croissant and went to the cloakroom to shave. To shave? Yes. And I took my time. I wanted to give the women time to think, time to decide on their attitude and the statements they would make. I decided to question Giselle Martin first. You think I poisoned my husband, don't you? I don't think anything. Just tell me what happened. As I heard the doctor say he believed Xavier was poisoned, you'll want to know what we ate last night. Uh, who prepared the meal? My sister, as usual. Do you hate her? Is that what Xavier told you? Something like that. Hmm. He was quite wrong. I'm merely indifferent. She's a very spoiled young woman. Mm. What did you eat? Soup, ham and salad, cheese and pears. Coffee? Yes. Jenny prepared that also. She brought it from the kitchen on a tray. You don't help in the kitchen? Seldom. And no, it wasn't I who put poison in the cups. Uh, you think there was poison in the coffee? Hmm? And why do you say cups? Only your husband died, yet you all drank your coffee, I presume? Yes. You'll find out I'm right when you get a report from your experts. So I'm going to save you time. Last night... All I did was to take a precaution I've been taking for some months. When Jenny brought in the tray with the coffee, I switched the cups around so that the cup that was meant for me became my husband's. That's the one he drank. Hmm. And what conclusion does that bring you to? Xavier went into the kitchen for a moment. He could have put poison in my cup if he wanted to. But that doesn't explain the poison in the other cup. What? You see, I was poisoned, too. You? I've surprised you, Chief Inspector. I woke up in the middle of the night with burning stomach pains. I forced myself to be sick in the bathroom. Oh, didn't you call your sister, your husband? <laughs> when one of them had tried to murder me. No, oh, what about the police? I thought of that, and perhaps I would have, but I was going back to my bedroom when I heard Xavier cry out from downstairs. I started down, and I watched him die. He was lying on the floor as you found him, but he was still alive then. When he heard me coming, he tried to reach the pistol. 
I realized then that he'd been coming towards the stairs when he fell, weakened by the poison, and the gun had slipped from his hands. Yes, he said he'd try and... Yes? <clears throat> it doesn't matter. He raised his head and tried to speak. I've never seen a face so full of hatred. You didn't go down to him? Why take that risk? I couldn't be sure that he didn't still have enough strength to use the pistol. Then he had several spasms and went still. So your husband drank from the cup that was meant for you, yet you were still poisoned. Do you know what this means? No. It means that you are accusing your sister of trying to murder both of you. I'm not accusing anyone. Xavier was so unstable he could have poisoned both cups to commit suicide and kill me at the same time. No, Madame Martin. Your husband's behaviour might have appeared somewhat incoherent, but it followed a more or less logical pattern. He would never have committed suicide until he was sure that you were dead. There is another explanation. Oh, there wasn't any point in going on questioning her. I would have liked to charge her, but I had nothing to charge her with. I wanted her out of my office as soon as I could, so I let her go to open her shop. I don't understand. Why should the sister try and kill them both? Well, she never tried to. No, I had her sent to my office. And as I knew more or less what had happened, I didn't beat about the bush. You admit that you intended to poison your sister? I, 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 I don't know. I don't know anymore. I suppose so. She, she didn't understand him. She was driving him out of his mind, suggesting continuously that he was unbalanced. She's very cunning. I think she left the poison around knowing that Xavier would do something foolish in the end. Mm. Did he tell you that he was coming for an examination this morning? Yes. That's what frightened him. I tried to reassure him, but it was no use. He was convinced that after he saw your doctor, you wouldn't let him go free again. No, it wouldn't have come to that. It looks as if he needed treatment. But... Anyway, that's what he thought. That she had won. And he only had one evening left. To free himself of your sister? Yes. So he decided to... Oh, go on. I'd made the coffee when he came into the kitchen. I had my back to him. He, he was only there for a few seconds. And you thought he hadn't had the courage to go through with it, so you put the poison in your sister's cup? Yes. I felt sorry for him. How did Xavier die? Your sister switched the cups. Oh, my God. I killed him. Well, it's a pity he didn't tell you exactly what he intended, and then you wouldn't have been so... so deeply involved. Xavier didn't intend to get rid of your sister by poisoning her. You didn't put any poison in his cup, did you? No. But Xavier did. During those few seconds, he was in the kitchen. He calculated the dose so that he would make himself ill enough to justify the action he was going to take, but not ill enough to die. You see, he intended to shoot her. It was not for nothing that he made a study of poisons. Mm, for me, it was all over. The rest was up to the judges. Oh, I need a pipe. Try some of my tobacco. It's a different blend. Look, all your blends are disgusting, Georges. I'll use my own, thank you. Have you got a match? What happened to your lighter? Mm -hmm. Oh, my lighter. Oh, I've lost it. No idea where. Jombier was none too pleased. Offered to buy me another, but I prefer my matches. Yes, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Ah, thank you, mm -hmm. Georges. In Maigret Has Scruples by Georges Simonon, translated by Robert Egglesfield and adapted for radio by Edward Bruce, Maurice Denham played Jules Maigret and Michael Goff, Georges Simonon.
Luca was Brian Haynes, La Pointe, John Rye, and Jean Vier, Sean Barrett. Louise Maigret, Irene Sutcliffe, Xavier Martin, Malcolm Reed, Giselle Martin, Pamela Lane, Jenny, Jill Schilling, and Dr. Pardon, Douglas Blackwell. The play was produced and directed by Glyn Dearman. Simonon's Maigret, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simonon. With Maurice Denham as Jules Maigret and Michael Goff as Georges Simonon. George, you fuck my queen. Then you should resign. Oh, should I? Yes. Oh, all right, then. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many games of chess you and I have played over the years, Jules, and yet you obstinately remain an atrocious player. Well, I don't like playing out of doors. But in this weather... Well... Would you like another game? Indoors. I should like another beer. Then you shall have one. George... Yes, Jules? Do you remember the Princess de Verre? What on earth makes you ask a question like that? Oh, I don't know. Losing my queen to you, perhaps. <laughs> oh, thank you. You know, it made me think of the royal families of Europe for some reason, and high society in general. Mm -hmm. Not that I've ever been that involved in high society. I don't move in those exalted circles, but once, if you remember, I was very much involved in them. And all because of the princess. Maigret and Society. Translated by Robert Egglesfield and adapted for radio by Edward Bruce. She was a remarkable old woman. The Princess de Verre. Yes. Yeah. Do you remember how it all started? I was clearing up my desk in the Quai des Orfèvres for one morning. Clearing up the work you should have done. Yeah, the paperwork, yes. When I got a message from the director instructing me to go to the Quai d'Orsay, the foreign office wished to see an inspector capable of assuming responsibilities. I took Jean Vier with me. Chief Inspector Maigret. Mm, how do you do? This is Inspector Jean Vier. Ah, yes. Take a seat, please. Oh, thank you. This is a... A somewhat exceptional situation. Uh, may I introduce Mademoiselle Jacquette Larieux? Oh, how do you do? Monsieur. Mademoiselle Larieux is, or rather was, the housekeeper of one of the most distinguished of our former ambassadors, the Count de Saint-Hilaire. You've probably heard of him. Uh, She's what? been in his service for over 40 years. 42, monsieur. Uh, this morning, Mademoiselle Larieux discovered him in his study. Dead. He seems to have been... Murdered. Shot several times. Hmm. You called the local police? Uh, no. Mademoiselle Larieux thought it better to come directly here. She has spent a large part of her life in the diplomatic world and considered that although the Count was no longer engaged in active service, some discretion was necessary. Uh, she felt she should approach a responsible official first. I see. A <laughs> well-known diplomat, the newspapers you know. Although I am authorised to inform you that the Count de Saint-Hilaire was not in the possession of any state secrets 
and that you must not look for any political reason for his death. Must not? I suggest that you accompany Mademoiselle Larieux to the Count's residence in the Rue Saint-Dominique. I will come with you. Well, I... Uh, don't worry. I shall not interfere. I am coming simply to make sure that there is nothing there which might embarrass you. Uh, you are right, mademoiselle. The Count was shot several times. As I told you. Quite. At Jean-Vier, the local police should be informed. Right, Chief. And get onto the criminal records office. Try and get Mers. He's a good man. And Dr. Paul, we need his report. Right. Mademoiselle... Uh... Can you tell me where the phone is, please? In the hall. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Ah, this is interesting. Huh? It would appear the Count was busy collecting proofs of his memoirs. Uh, really? Uh, two volumes have already appeared. I'm sure there is nothing to worry about. He was the most discreet of men. Uh, however... Now, what are you doing now, Monsieur Cromier? It is my duty to make quite sure that there aren't any papers here, the divulgation of which would be inopportune. Divulgation? Ah, yes. Here are the letters. Uh, yeah, but they should prove harmless. Or letters from whom? It's an old story which everybody knows at the Quai d'Orsay. Uh, they can have nothing to do with this affair. But there are hundreds of them. Hardly surprising. It's a correspondence stretching over 50 years. In correspondence? Yeah, from the Princess de Verre to the Count de Saint-Hilaire. Mm. Uh, however, there seems to be nothing else of importance. Look, I must ask you to remove nothing from this flat at present. I do not think that will be necessary, Chief Inspector. However, once again, I must recommend prudence and discretion. Listen, prudence oh, and... Oh, hmm? his men are on their way, Chief. Ah, good. Would you show Monsieur Cromier out, Jean ah. Vier? <laughs> right, Chief. Sir, uh, I shall ring you, if you don't mind, uh, to, to find out how this things way, are sir. Uh, going. We'll get in touch if we need to. Good. If you will excuse me, Chief Inspector, I would like to get on with my housework. Go in a moment, mademoiselle. First, I should like a word with you. Well? Uh, do you sleep in this flat? I have a room of my own. There are no other servants. It has not been necessary. I have tended the Count's every need for 42 years. Yeah, as you remarked earlier. How old are you? As if that is of importance. Seventy-one. And the Count? He was a little older. Mm. When did you last see him alive? Last night, at ten o'clock, just before I went to bed. Was he expecting anyone? It's unlikely. Although his nephew sometimes calls late in the evening, he lives quite near. Uh, his name? Mazarin. Alain Mazarin. You don't like him? Oh, this morning, what happened? I got up as usual at six o'clock and washed. I had my breakfast, cleaned the kitchen, prepared coffee for the Count, and discovered his body as you find it now. I went straight to the Quai d'Orsay, as you know. Oh, she was a stiff-necked old girl. I didn't know what to make of her. I went on questioning her, but I didn't get very far. No, of course not. But I did ascertain that the windows were locked when she found the Count in his study. There were no signs of any forced entry. Nothing appeared to be missing. And uh, most importantly, that she and the Count were the only people to possess keys to the flat. Moyers and Dr. Pole arrived while I was still questioning her. Morning, Chief Inspector. Ah, glad we got you, Moyers. And you, Dr. Pole. Uh, morning, Megre. Well, let's have a look at him. Here he is. <clears throat> I should like to go out. I should like to go to church. Uh, later, perhaps. Then may I at least be permitted to go to my room? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Thank you. I understand this is the Count de Saint-Hilaire. Yes. Hmm. He's been shot four times. Oh. All right, Mars, it's all yours. Right. jean Chief. I'm going to have a talk with the Count's nephew, Mazarin, Alain Mazarin. If I can worm his address out of Mademoiselle Larrieux... <laughs> When Moyes is finished, send the body to the morgue, will you? Yes, Chief. Dead? Good God. Mm, when did you last see your uncle, Monsieur Mazarin? The, um, day before yesterday. For any particular reason? To be frank, I was a little short of ready cash. He's been very generous to me in the past. Mm. Was he a wealthy man? He had a small private income, and he owns the block of flats in which he lives. He was comfortably off, but not what you would call a wealthy man. And do you know who will benefit from his death? I understand that I will inherit the bulk of the estate. I see. 
Have you any idea why he was killed? I know next to nothing. Robbery, perhaps? Well, I doubt it. The windows were locked from the inside and there was no sign of a forced entry. What does Jacquette think? Oh, that is proving rather hard to discover. She doesn't seem to like you. She doesn't like anybody except my uncle. If she'd had her way, nobody would ever have been allowed near him. Do you think she might have been capable of killing him? Killing him? Jacquette. Do you hesitate? It's just... Oh, you made me wonder. It's uh, possible, I suppose. She could be jealous. A old lady like that, jealous. <laughs> you mean to say she was in love with him? It's more than possible they once had an affair. She was very attractive when she was young. I wonder, with the prince's death... The prince? The prince de Verrey. He died on Sunday. Did he now? Have you read the letters yet? I don't follow you. Oh, the letters from the princess de Verrey, no. Not yet. But how could Jacquette be connected with them? You'll understand when you've read them. If you like, I'll come to the flat with you. Uh, there might be some way in which I could help. Thank you. Morris and his men are finished, Chief. Dr. Paul will let you have his report later. The body's on the way to the morgue. Uh, thank you, Jean. Yeah, this is Monsieur Mazarin, the Count's nephew. How do you do? How do you do? Where's the old lady? Uh, sulking in her room because you wouldn't let her go out. Oh, well, ask her to come in here, will you? Right, Chief. Now... Let's have a look at those letters we were talking about, Monsieur Mazarin. Good Lord, there are thousands of them. How is it you know who wrote them, Mazarin? Everybody knows in diplomatic circles. In society, I mean. I believe the princess and my uncle wrote to each other nearly every day. Mm. I know it's none of my business, but a person's letters are sacred. Ah, mademoiselle. Uh, can you tell me if the Count owned any firearms? Nor is that any of my business. Nevertheless, did he own a pistol or a revolver? No, did you hear my question? I think he had a revolver of some kind. Mm. Where did he keep it? I don't know. I haven't seen it for a long time. It used to be kept in the chest of drawers in his bedroom. And did Morris find one, Jovier? No, Chief. Mm. You should leave those letters alone. It is private correspondence. Look, perhaps, mademoiselle, you would care to go back to your bedroom or to the kitchen, if you prefer. I expect you want to prepare yourself some lunch. As if I could eat on a day like this. <sighs> it's incredible. Fifty years of letters. About that. I understand they met and fell in love when my uncle was 26, and after her marriage to the prince, they never met again. Now, why didn't they marry? As was the practice in those days, an arrangement was made between two great families, and, if I may use this word, the princess was obliged to marry the Prince de Verrey. Mm. After all, she was the daughter of the Duc de Sac. And she wasn't in love with the prince? No, she was not in love with the prince. Did the prince know about this correspondence? Of course. Isabel would never have conducted such a relationship behind his back. Mm. Hubert understood and agreed not to consummate the marriage. You bear, I take it, is the prince? Correct. So they had no children? They had a son. Huh? Philippe. Now Prince Philippe, since his father's death. An unconsummated marriage at a son. You will no doubt find many of the answers to your questions in the letters. Well, we have a lot of reading to do, haven't we, jean -Vier? Hmm? Uh, well, thank you, Monsieur Mazarin. I don't think we need to detain you any longer. You've been most helpful. Well, if there's uh, Jean Vier, else... get La Pointe over here and show Monsieur Mazarin out. Yes, Chief. In the meantime, I'll start on these letters. When La Pointe arrives, you and I shall have lunch. I'm not only hungry, I'm very, very thirsty. You're quiet, Chief? Hmm. I'm thinking about these people. The Count, the Princess, even Mazarin. I'm not used to them, to their way of life, to their habits, their way of thinking. But the answer to the Count's death lies there somewhere, I'm sure of it, and it's a world I know nothing about. <laughs> Nor me. Now, those letters, you've read some of them. What do you think? I felt like a voyeur. Jacquette's right. They're private. Nothing to do with the case. Or everything. Hmm? Hmm. Well, what facts do they offer? The prince was 84 when he died. Fact. 
The letters indicate that the princess and the count intended to marry if the prince predeceased them. Fact. The princess and the count never met after her marriage to the prince. Oh, that's not a fact, chief. Mm? That's conjecture. Well, uh, something I'm prepared to bet on. Oh, if I remember correctly, she wrote in one letter, um, I, uh, I saw you across the opera house. How distinguished you looked. How I wish that we could be together again. So close and yet so far away it's been so long. The marriage will not be consummated. Fact, the princess had a son. Yeah. Explained in one of the letters, as Mazarin said it would be. Oh? Yeah, uh, my brother-in-law is dead. Um, oh, my dear Armand, the family name cannot be carried on as we hoped through him. I've had a long conversation with you there. I've been to my confessor. I've wept a great deal. So she bore him a son, Philippe. Fact and duty. I've wept a great deal. And after that? Well, from the letters, the princess seemed to have preserved a most peculiar kind of chastity. A fidelity to the Count which everybody in those circles appeared to have condoned and respected, including, surprisingly, the prince. Chastity and fidelity from the princess, but <laughs> not so much from the Count. That was extraordinary. I think this is the most open, secret love affair I've ever come across. <laughs> Oh, come on, jean we better get back to the Count's flat. Lapointe, we brought you back a beer. Oh, thanks, Chief. Anything new? Any phone calls? Oh, mostly from the press and Monsieur Cremier from the Foreign Office. Oh, I'm glad I was at lunch. Oh, and Dr. Paul rang. Mm -hmm. and he said the first shot was fired from the front of the desk at point-blank range. And he's certain that that is the shot which killed the Count. Ah. After that, the body fell forward and slipped onto the carpet. How does he know that? Well, because the other shots, three in all, were fired from above, uh, from less than two feet. And to do this, the killer had to walk around to the other side of the desk after the first shot had been fired. Do you see what this means, Chief? Uh, no, you tell me, Lapointe, uh, uh, calmly. Uh, well, it looks to me like an act of vengeance or an exceptional amount of hate. I mean, why go on firing if the Count was already dead? And why only four shots? Dr. Paul said a Browning 301 was used, and that holds six cartridges. Yeah, perhaps the gun jammed. Hmm. point. borrow a Browning from the constable on duty and ask Mademoiselle Larieux to come in here. Right, Chief. Do you think it was an act of vengeance, Chief? An act of vengeance? Oh, perhaps. Now, what I find strange is that not only haven't we managed to find a pistol, we haven't managed to find any other cartridge cases. Cartridge cases from a Browning 301 should scatter quite a distance. So the killer had the presence of mind to pick them up after he or she had killed the Count. Um, mm. Here's the Browning, Chief. Oh, good. And Mademoiselle Larrier? Where did you... Come in, Mademoiselle Larrier. You recognise this gun, hmm? Why should I recognise it? Well, it is the type of gun the Count possessed, though, hmm? I suppose so. Yes, yeah, the same size, the same weight. Hold it. I most certainly will not. It wouldn't be any use anyway. I never touched the one in the drawer. Uh, you can take it back to the constable, Laporte. Uh, yes, Chief. Now, Mademoiselle, the letters. You knew the Count was in love. Hmm? I used to post his letters to the Princess, if that is what you mean. Are you jealous? I find that an offensive remark. I am 71. My confessor... You're a pious woman. Were you ever the Count's mistress? But were you jealous of his affairs? It would seem he had several. I wouldn't know. If he did, they were none of my business. And anyway, he had a right to have affairs if he wished, hadn't he? Hmm. Has the Princess de Verre ever been to this flat? Never. Did you think of ringing the Princess when you discovered the Count was dead? Why not? Because today is the day of the Prince's funeral. Hmm. Well, thank you, mademoiselle. You may go out now, if you wish. Monsieur. Getting her to say anything is like squeezing a dried-out lemon. <laughs> well, I'm going round to the Count's solicitors. You trot off and see if you can find out anything more about Mazarin. I don't like that man. There's something about him I distrust. Ah, uh, Le Point. Uh, yes, Chief? Go on questioning the old lady, but gently. Don't press her too hard. You may appeal to her more than Jean Vier or I do. You have a reputation for charming elderly ladies. Me, Chief? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Jean Vier, let's get going. 
It's very sad, Chief Inspector. I first met Armand, oh, over sixty years ago. Uh, we were together in the sixth form. Tragic. Mm. I suppose he left a will with you? Indeed, yes. I drew it up myself. I've just been looking at it. Uh, does the nephew, Mazarin, inherit everything? Uh, broadly speaking, yes. Uh, that's what he told me. The housekeeper, um, uh, Jacquette Larieux, receives a pension which will enable her to end her days in comfort. As for furniture, pictures, personal belongings, they are bequeathed uh, uh, to an old friend. Isabelle de Verre. Oh, you obviously know all about it. Oh, it isn't everybody. Had the Count any enemies that you know of? How could he? He never jostled anyone out of position. He waited his turn in the Foreign Office. His memoirs have proved most circumspect. No, the Count was a man of tremendous distinction. Always a, a man of honour. Hmm. I suppose Jacquette Larrier was his mistress. But that is not the word I would choose. Amon was a bon vivant. He rarely let a pretty girl come near him without trying his luck. I told Jacquette was very attractive when young. Oh, indeed, yes. And it is likely that if the opportunity occurred... Um, need I go on? Mm. But, Mistress, no, I think not. Well, thank you, Major. You've been most helpful. Ah, yes, I suppose you're in a hurry. Mm. Everybody's in a hurry these days. Don't forget, I'm entirely at your service. Mm, thank you. Uh, yes, in entirely... Uh, uh, goodbye. I left the old solicitor's office nonplussed. I had the impression of being immersed in a distant past, in a world which had, so to speak, vanished. It's a long time since I've heard the phrase, man of honour. <laughs> the world has changed, you. Well, I was utterly confused. I went into a cafe, ordered a beer. No motive for the Count's murder? Well, there had to be one. People don't commit murder without a motive. All these old people, a crime of passion? God, this seemed to be a ridiculous idea. Two old ladies, one a princess, one a maidservant. Two old men, a prince and a count. Both dead within four days of each other. A coincidence or something more? Where did the nephew, Mazarin, fit in? A matter of money? Mm, it was possible. Anyway, I drank my beer and went back to the Rue Saint-Dominique. Jean Vier had arrived back before me. Did you know that Mazarin is married, Chief? Eh? Well, there was no wife about when I saw him. Hardly surprising. They've been separated for the past eight years. I managed to track her down, though. And? Well, um, Mazarin's not a very pleasant man, if I can believe her. And I think I can. Mm. Uh, Petty-minded to the point of sadism. Not violent. He appears to have favoured mental cruelty. So she left him. For a while, he supported her and their two children. Not at the moment, however. Mm, very concise, jean uh, Why doesn't he support her now? Shortage of money, I suppose. Ah. Which means he could have murdered his uncle to hasten his inheritance. Mm. Uh, coffee, Chief. Uh. With the compliments of Mademoiselle Larieux. What? Not as gracious as it would seem. She wanted me out of her kitchen. Mm. <laughs> Did you get any more out of her Lapointe? Nothing. You were wrong about my charms, Chief. At least as far as this elderly lady is concerned. I started a question, very gently as instructed, and was more or less told that I couldn't teach my grandmother to suck eggs. Ah, <laughs> uh, here. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, there's one person in this case I haven't seen yet, and it's one interview I'm not looking forward to. Who's that with? The Princess de Valais. I thought, um, madame, that I should get in touch with you, if only to give you a few details. Of course. You have read the letters. Uh, <coughs> well... Hmm. I am most grateful to you for coming, Chief Inspector. My first impulse was to go over to the Rue Saint-Dominique when I heard of Armand's death. I would have liked to have seen him just once more. How did you find out about his death? From my son, Philippe. He's staying with me at the moment, together with my daughter-in-law and my two grandchildren. He read of it in the newspapers. Ah, uh, see, I thought perhaps Mademoiselle Larrier might have phoned you. Oh, it wasn't possible. My son has disconnected the telephones. Hmm. We've had so many calls since my husband died. What I would like to know... 
Did Armand die in pain? No, madame. He died instantly. In his study, next to the bedroom. What, you've been there? Once, long ago, with Jacquette's connivance, when Armand was absent. Jacquette lied. It is understandable, is it not? For years, I've been accustomed to living in imagination with him. Much he told me in his letters. But Jacquette arranged matters so that I was able just once to look inside his home. Mm. Now, you and the Count intended to marry if the Prince predeceased you? Hmm? Most certainly. Was Jacquette jealous? Oh, of his mistresses in the old days. Yes, I think she was. But not of me. Do you think she was once the Count's mistress? There can be no doubt of it. Armand never attempted to conceal anything from me. I remember he wrote once, Jacquette is nervy today. I must remember to pleasure her tonight. Uh, mm. <clears throat> Does it surprise you? Yet it is so natural. Are you aware of the terms of the will? Armand insisted on leaving me his furniture so that if he happened to die before me, I would have an impression to some extent of having been his wife. With his furniture, I shall have his flat reconstructed here. An old woman's whim, no doubt. I haven't long to live, but no matter how little time may be left, I shall live it in his setting as if I were his widow. Your late husband knew of your plans? But of course. We had nothing to hide. Armand was a very old friend. And your son? We made no attempt at concealment. The whole family knows about my feelings for Armand. And Jacquette knew of your plans to marry? She looked forward to my doing so. Oh, I see. Is there anything else you would like to ask me, Chief Inspector? Is there any other way in which I might help you? Mm, uh, yes, I would like to speak to your son, if that's possible. But of course. Will you come this way? Philippe? Uh, yes, Mama? This is Chief Inspector Maigret. He would like a word with you. Oh, of course. Uh, how do you do, Chief Inspector? Yeah, Please, do do? come in. Uh, thank you, now, if there is nothing more I can do for you, I... I should like to be left alone. Uh, thank you, madame. You've been most kind. <clears throat> uh, my mother is more upset than she pretends. Uh, do sit down. Yeah. Uh, a cigarette? Thank you. No, 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 thank you. I smoke a pipe. <laughs> so do I, usually, but uh, not in this house. My mother hates it. Yeah, I, I thought she might. I suppose you want to talk about Saint-Hilaire. Well, a few questions, that's all. It's curious coincidence, you must admit. Oh, you mean he and my father dying within four days of each other? Oh, there's a thought. Oh, no more than that. Uh, I suppose that suicide is out of the question. Hmm? Well, why do you ask that? Had the Count any reason for suicide? You never know what's going on in people's heads. Look at Mother's romance. The unreality of it. The impossibility. All her life she's kept up this mystic love for a man she only saw occasionally from a distance. Oh, I suppose it was harmless enough. Indeed, my father was the first to smile at it. Now, how did you feel about it? It was no concern of mine. <sighs> I suppose not. Well, as a matter of form, I must ask you one particular question. Where was I last night? <laughs> At what time, Chief Inspector? Well, let's say between ten o'clock and midnight. Hmm? I uh, dined with the family and then went for a stroll along the Champs-Élysées at about uh, ten o'clock. Until midnight? <laughs> well, uh, no. Uh, <clears throat> this uh, might strike you as a little peculiar in view of my bereavement, but uh, whenever I come to Paris, I I'm in the habit of spending an hour or two with a pretty woman. And mm. This is not possible where I live. And you found one and went to her home? Uh, we went to the hotel in the Rue de Berry. It appears to be her home. There were clothes in the bedroom, personal belongings in the bathroom. Uh, forgive my insistence, but mm. I... Well, she was uh, a brunette, not very tall, 
she was wearing a green dress, and, uh, and uh, she has a beauty spot under one breast. I, I think it was the left one. You should be able to verify. <laughs> yes, of course. Well, thank you. I didn't go back to the Rue Saint-Dominique after leaving the De Verre home. No. Oh, you went to the nearest cafe for a drink instead. Well, <laughs> yes. I needed to sort things out. Of course. It was all so confusing. A man had been killed, but who had killed him and why? Was Jacquette jealous? Was Mazarin, whom his wife accused of mental cruelty, unbalanced? Was the princess telling me the truth? Was she, Jules? I believe so. She was a very... Charming lady. Mm. And Philippe? Mm -hmm. How did he really feel about his mother's ridiculous romantic love affair? Was the bitterness in his mind whenever he considered the situation of his conception? You know, the more I thought about them, all the more confused and angry I got. I'm afraid both Lapointe and Louise had to suffer my ill temper that night. Lapointe? I want you to stay in the Count's flat overnight. Uh, well, she can wait. Put Janvier on. Uh, Janvier, I want you to check on Philippe de Verre's statement. And, but of course you don't know what it was. I haven't told you yet. Uh, you got a pencil? Yeah, I know your memory is excellent. Look, I want you to go to the hotel in the Rue de Berry. I want you to question the proprietor. Then I went home. Louise suggested the cinema, but instead of going out, I sat grumpily in my corner, puffing at my pipe. <laughs> I'm afraid I drank too much. You can be very bad-tempered. Oh, thanks. <laughs> mm. The next morning, I waited at the Quai des Orfèvres for jean Vier's report. He arrived about eleven, looking fresh as a daisy. Absolutely clean, Chief. What de Verre said was true. I found the woman, he accosted her about ten to eleven, stayed about half an hour. Hmm. That means he left her before half past eleven. Yes, Chief. All right, so he wasn't lying. Right. Come in. Morning, Chief Inspector. Ah, Morris, sit down. All right, Jean Vier, I'll show you plenty to do. Oh, uh, yes, Chief. <sighs> You read my report? Mm, not yet. Uh, what about the fingerprints in the flat? Well, the counts, of course, uh, Jacques et Larieux, a few of yours, or oh, many of Cromier. Oh. I've made an inventory of everything we found. Any money? A few thousand francs in a wallet and some change in a drawer in a kitchen. <sighs> it doesn't make sense. Mm. Mm. I've had an idea, Mars. Have you submitted Jacquet to the paraffin test? I wouldn't do that without your permission. Well, you've got it. Go over there. Explain gently. Don't frighten her. How do I explain gently to an old lady that I'm trying to find out if she's fired a pistol during the last 48 hours? No, oh, you all think of something. Tell her it's a formality. Well, I'll phone you with the results. If you can't get me here, I'll be in the examining magistrate's office. Right. Chief, hmm? there's a young man to see you. Julien de Verre. Philippe de Verre's son. Oh. Well, show him in, Jean Vier. Right, Chief. Will you go in, please? Thank you. Ah, Monsieur, mm -hmm. I saw you at my grandmother's house yesterday. I, I wanted to talk to you then, but I couldn't. Not in front of my father. Uh, why not? Uh, sit down. Uh, thank you. Well, it's about my relationship with the Count de Saint-Hilaire. You knew him? Oh, yes. Did your father know about this? He knew. I'm not sure he approved. How did you come to meet him? At a friend's place. I'd wanted to meet him for a long time. I'd heard so much about him, you see, from my grandmother. Mm. And when I told him I was going into the diplomatic service, he was interested and, and very helpful. He invited me to the Rue Saint-Dominique and we talked about my studies and, and my ambitions. After that, I used to see him there occasionally, about once a month. And your grandmother knew about these visits? Oh, yes. Well, the Count insisted that both she and my father should know. Otherwise, I could not have gone. My grandmother and I are very close. We often discussed my visits. She would ask me for details. It was she, in fact, who suggested that I go and see him on the afternoon of the day he was murdered. Really? She wanted to know how he was reacting to the death of my grandfather. I was curious, too. I knew they'd sworn to marry if it ever became possible. The idea appealed to you, huh? It did, rather. 
those two old people in love for so long. Anyway, what I wanted to tell you, I don't know whether it will be helpful or not, was that the Count didn't seem himself when I saw him. He looked worried and upset. I brought up the question of his possible marriage to my grandmother. It seemed only natural. And he said, um, oh, I wish I could remember his exact words, but it was something like, it won't be possible. Uh -huh. But what was extraordinary was that, well, that he looked afraid when he said it. I'd swear that he thought his life was in danger. Hmm. Well, th that's all, really. It doesn't tell you much, does it? Perhaps I oughtn't to have come. No, you did right to come. Thank you. I'd swear he thought his life was in danger. <laughs> Young Julien de Beret had worried me so. So what did you do? Well, as I always do when I'm worried. I moped around the Quai des Orfèvres, putting my spoke into everyone's work. <laughs> well, then in the afternoon, Moyers came to see me. Well, Moyers? It's positive. Hmm? The paraffin test on Jacquette Larrier's hands. My God. She's definitely fired a gun in the last 24 hours. Huh. Well, what are you going to do? Tell me, Moyers, how does one arrest an old woman of over 70? You've recently used a firearm, mademoiselle. The test we carried out showed that. Now, particles of powder and chemical substances are ingrained in a person's skin and remain for some time when that person has used a firearm. How did it happen? I have nothing to say. What have you done with the gun? I don't know what your motive was, but I can hazard a guess. You've lived with the Count for a very long time. You've been as intimate with him as any two human beings can be. If he hadn't been killed, he would have married the princess. Would you have kept your position in the household? Mademoiselle, I have been questioning you for over an hour. Your silence is not helping you. It's possible that this is a case of diminished responsibility. Your lawyer will certainly argue that this was a crime of passion. If you plead guilty, you will have every chance of moving the jury. I have nothing to say. Look, you're entitled to a lawyer. Do you want me to give you a list of lawyers? It would be of no use. Well, shall I choose one There for isn't you? any point. You admit you shot your employer? I have nothing to say. Is there anybody you would like to see? The princess, perhaps? Mademoiselle, we have material evidence that you fired one or more of those shots. Will you please tell me why? Am I entitled to see a priest? You want a confessor? I am simply asking permission to talk to a priest for a few minutes, that is all. The Abbe Barrow, he should be at the St. Clotilde Presbytery. Very well. How long has the Abbe been with her now, Chief? Hmm? No, 25 minutes. Do you think it's going to help? I don't know. I feel the solution is somewhere near, but I distrust the evidence. A crime of passion <laughs> has a ridiculous sound. Now we're faced on this case with people whose very existence I never suspected. Their way of life is so unfamiliar to me that I, I can't... Oh. Will you come in now, Chief Inspector? I must apologize for keeping you so long, but Mademoiselle Larrière has asked me a very difficult question, and I have had to consider it most carefully. Yes, not at all, Abbe Barrow. Oh, you look tired, mademoiselle. May I stay? I may be able to help. Yes, of course. Mademoiselle, as you are aware, is extremely devout, and it is her party which has led her to adopt an attitude which I have felt it my duty to persuade her to abandon. 
What has been worrying her is the thought that the Count might not be given a Christian burial. She intended to wait until after the funeral before saying anything. The Count committed suicide. I'm afraid that is the truth of the matter. But I have told Mademoiselle Lario we have no proof that he didn't repent in his last few moments. No death is as instantaneous in the eyes of the Church as your medical files might suggest. Tell the Chief Inspector what you told me, Mademoiselle. I was in bed when I heard a single shot. I rushed into the study. Armand, the Count was sprawled on the carpet as you found him. The pistol was on his desk. There was no doubt that he was... My first impulse was to telephone the Princess, but it was nearly midnight. I, I didn't want to disturb her. How long before you used the pistol yourself? I... I don't know. Ten minutes, perhaps. I knelt down beside him, and I said a prayer. I couldn't let it be known that he had... I had to make it look like murder. So I stood up, took hold of the pistol, and I fired without looking, and asked him and heaven to forgive me. I pulled the trigger until it wouldn't work anymore. I don't know anything about guns. The next morning, before I went to the foreign office, I threw the gun and the... The cartridge cases? ...into the Seine, from the Pont de la Concorde. Do you know why the Count committed suicide? He believed he had cancer of the stomach. And he was a very healthy man, according to the police report. I spoke to his doctor once, and he seemed unworried. A little too much wine, he suggested, a touch of indigestion. Nothing more serious. But I know that the Count didn't believe him because he consulted several other doctors. For confirmation of his fears? I suppose so. An old friend of his died of cancer after two years' illness. I remember him saying then, why don't they let him die? If I were in his place, I should ask them to help me go. He was obsessed by the idea that he was suffering in the same way, so that when he heard of the prince's death... I'm beginning to understand. The Count expected to be bedridden, like his friend, just when there was the possibility of his entering into a real life, no matter how short, with the woman he'd loved for 50 years. He could see no future for her except as a sick nurse, and that he could not accept. Well, I must make a phone call, mademoiselle, and then I think you'll be free to go. Armand will be given a Christian burial. I don't believe the church will refuse its last blessing to the Count de saint -Hilaire. It's a case I'll never forget, you know. It's a long time ago now, and I've had time to think about it. Yes? So much of what I've had to do is sordid, harsh, disturbing. But that time... That time was different. When I cleaned up the paperwork, I went home earlier than usual. I kissed Louise, and... And I remember holding her for a long time without saying anything. In Maigret and Society by Georges Simenon, translated by Robert Egglesfield and adapted for radio by Edward Bruce, Maurice Denham played Jules Maigret and Michael Goff, Georges Simenon. La Pointe was John Rye, Janvier, Sean Barrett. The Princess de Verre, Joyce Carey, Jacquette Lariot, Marjorie Westbury, 
Philippe de Verre, Michael Tudor Barnes, Julien de Verre, Steve Hudson, Mazarin, Leslie Heritage, Moès, Patrick Barr, Cromier, Paul Meyer, Aubonnet, James Thomason, and the Abbe, Rafe Truman. The play was produced and directed by Glyn Dearman. Simonon's Maigret, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simonon. With Maurice Denham as Jules Maigret and Michael Goff as Georges Simonon. What is it? Now read that, Georges. Just read it. Latest positions in the Tour de France. What? After the first stage of the race, the Belgians. No, 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 not that. The report of the killing at the Porte d'Orléans. They got everything wrong. The name of the victim, the name of the street, even the name of the police inspector in charge of the case. You don't like crime reporters? Well, bad ones, no. The good ones, yeah. Rougeau now. Rouge, ah, yes. 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 There was a man worth his salt. Never printed anything unless he was certain of his facts. Or thought he was. Are you thinking of any particular case when you say that, Jules? You know exactly what case I'm thinking of, George. Maigret sets a trap. Translated by Daphne Woodward and adapted for radio by Aubrey Woods. Now, he was the reporter who scooped the story of the Montmartre killing. Yes, and deserved to. It was a sweltering hot August, if you remember, and most of the reporters preferred to stay in the Brasserie Dauphine rather than hang around the Quai des Orfèvres. But Rougin thought he was onto something and stuck at it, sitting outside my office, sweating like a pig, with nothing to drink except lukewarm water from the tap down the corridor. But at least he was there when La Pointe came to see me. When he brought in... Suspect number one. Uh, uh, <laughs> with La Pointe's jacket over his head to hide him from anyone who might be curious. Well, that was about four o'clock in the afternoon. Rougin was straight on to him. Ah, uh, who is he, Inspector? I'm sorry, and I'm not at liberty to say. Oh, come off it, La Pointe. Where does he come from? Where did you pick him up? It's far too hot to be bothered with your questions, Rougin. Ask Chief Inspector Maigret. Ah, so that's where you're taking him. Thank you. Is he a suspect? As I said before, I don't know. How many murders have there been in Montmartre? Oh, five over the course of six months. All women, all stabbed to death. All of them had their clothes torn methodically. All of them had superficial lacerations. Nothing stolen? No. Well, it must have been about... At 11 o'clock at night, when I finally sent Paul Lapointe and the other chap, uh, still with Lapointe's coat over his head, <laughs> off in a car. <laughs> but when I left the office, there was Rougeon, still waiting, still sweating, refusing to let up while he thought there was a story around. Ah, evening, Chief Inspector. Are you still here, Rougeon? Who was it? Uh, who? The chap with Lapointe. Ah, uh, sorry, I can't help you. Uh, try again tomorrow. It may be cooler, then. Will you make a statement tomorrow? Mm, I don't know. Has he got something to do with the Montmartre killings? Um... Uh, no. Sorry. No statement. Thank you, Chief Inspector. Good night. 
And uh, what did he print? <laughs> Killer caught at last. Is this the Montmartre maniac? And of course it wasn't. No. <laughs> he was a delightful fellow called Mazet. I needed a man whose description would be as unimpressive as possible and whose face wouldn't be known to the public or the press. I was setting a trap for the real killer, and I needed bait. What gave you the idea in the first place? Well, the previous evening, Madame Maigre and I had been out to dinner with Raoul Pardon and his wife. And afterwards, I was talking with a fellow guest, Professor Tissot, who was the director of the mental hospital in the Rue Cabanis. Ah, yes. Mm. He was a very interesting, intelligent man. Doesn't your responsibility frighten you sometimes, Chief Inspector? Hmm? Oh, you're referring to the Montmartre killings? Huh? Yes. I wouldn't like to be in your place, with the public getting panic-stricken, the newspapers doing nothing to reassure them, and high-placed persons with their own ideas of what you ought to do, all cancelling each other out. <laughs> that is the correct picture, I take it. Yes, it is. What makes you think they're all the work of one man? Well, when there's a series of crimes, as on this occasion, the first thing we do is to look for what they have in common. Such as? Well, the time, for one thing. Hmm. Now, in this case, the first attack took place at 8 o'clock in the evening, and it was February, so it was dark by then. Now, the crime on March the 3rd was committed a quarter of an hour later, and so on, until the last one in July, which took place a few minutes before 10 o'clock. Now, obviously, the murderer waits for darkness and then attacks. Uh, what about the dates? Ah, well, I've gone over them time and time again. First of all, people talked about the full moon. Oh, they always blame the moon when they can't think of anything else. Do you? As a doctor? No. As a man? <laughs> I don't know. Ah. <laughs> In any case, only one of the attacks took place when the moon was full. And there were no other common factors, not on any particular day of the week, nor during any particular part of the month. Mm. So we looked for something else, and, and the first constant that we hit upon was the district, Montmartre. Now, the murderer obviously knows that area well, and that's why everybody thinks he lives there. And that means everybody is suspicious of their neighbours. We've received hundreds of letters describing the strange behaviour of perfectly normal people. Uh, you said the district was the first constant. Yes, because the women all lived in Montmartre. They came from different parts of the country, and from the occupational point of view, there was no resemblance between them either. Prostitute, midwife, dressmaker, post office clerk, and a housewife. Uh, but they all lived in the district. Yes, but it's unlikely they knew one another. More than probably they'd never met. We checked to make sure they didn't all attend the same church, go to the same butcher, have the same doctor or dentist. No constant? None. So I looked at their photographs. Uh, you've seen them in the papers? Yes. Or mm. well, something suddenly struck me. Now, if you don't look at the women's faces, just their figures, you'll notice all five were shortish, rather plump, thick waists, broad hips. Well, it could be a coincidence, but... Uh, I think it's unlikely. Oh, you can't very well put a guard on every short, plump girl in Paris. Quite. <laughs> right. mm. Well, anyway, that's as far as we've got at present. You know the question that worries me most, Professor? Hmm? This man is no longer a child. He must have lived for quite a number of years, 20, 30 or more, without ever committing a crime. Yet, in the course of the past six months... He's killed five people. Now, how did it all begin? Why did he suddenly change from a, a harmless citizen into a dangerous maniac? You know, Monsieur Maigret, uh, a lot of lunatics or semi-lunatics are sent to me after they've committed crimes, and in nearly all of them I found a conscious or unconscious desire to assert themselves. Hmm. Well, nearly all of them, rightly or wrongly, had for a long time been regarded in their own circle as unstable, second-rate, mentally retarded, and felt humiliation as a result. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced that the majority of crimes, which are said to have no motive, and uh, repeated crimes in particular, are a manifestation of inadequacy, if you like. Oh, yes. Yes, that, that fits in with something I've noticed over the years. Oh? 
Well, if criminals didn't sooner or later feel the need to boast of what they'd done, there wouldn't be nearly so many of them in prison. Uh, it's a form of vanity, isn't it? Huh? No, I don't mean to say they give themselves away on purpose, but nearly always, as one crime follows another, they take fewer precautions, as though they were defying the police, defying fate. Uh, right. Some have admitted it came as a relief to them when they were finally arrested. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me, Professor Tissot, what would happen if someone else were arrested and took the place of our killer? as it were, usurping what he regards as his fame. Well, your killer would have a feeling of frustration. And might kill again? Almost certainly. Professor, you've given me an idea. The man's pride in the crimes he has committed may be our best chance of catching him. <laughs> Inspector's room, Luca speaking. Yes, that's right. What division are you from? Ah, yes. You're to cover the Rue Colancourt from the Place Clichy to the metro station. Dress as inconspicuously as possible and carry a gun. You've met the police women who are acting as decoys in that area? Good. Good. Well, just remember, they're to be protected at all costs. You're on duty from 8 o'clock, but uh, we're not expecting anything before dark. Good luck. Well, that's the last of them. How many does that make? Uh, 174 plainclothes officers, 20 short, fat policewomen acting as decoys. <laughs> God knows how many were standing by, and all on the off chance that our pet murderer might decide to have another go tonight. Yeah. So, now it's over to you, jean -Vier. I shall just sit here as befits an officer of my age and position while you and the rest of the youngsters dash up and down Montmartre trying to look like civilians. Well, let's hope you catch him. You sound doubtful. Never count your chickens, Lapointe. Where's Yobby? Oh, I'm with the chief inspector in a patrol car. No, oh, teacher's pet. Now look, jean -Vier, all right. it's all right. Still don't see how the chief can be sure this man will attack one of the police women. Or that he'll attack anyone at all. Well, his theory is that now all the papers have said we've caught the murderer, the real chap will be so furious he'll kill someone else, just to prove he's still on the loose. Well, it's a long shot, but it just might work. Pretty risky long shot. What happens if the man succeeds? Right, come on, Lapointe. Let's get started. Off you go, jean -Vier, and good luck. Chief. Got your gun? Uh, yes, sir. Look out for the shop, you can. Lapointe. Okay, Chief. Good luck, Chief. Uh, what's the time, Le Point? Uh, oh, it's half past ten, sir. Mm. I'm still as hot as ever. Yeah. So far, nothing. Back to the Place du Tap, driver, and then follow the same route again. Very good, sir. And when we get up there, Le Point, go into one of the cafes and telephone Luca. See if he has anything to report. Right, sir. Luca. No, Lapointe, nothing at all. Just a prostitute complaining a foreign sailor had knocked her about. From the sound of her voice, I don't blame him. Oh, uh, tell the chief that reporter's still here. Yes, Rouge. I think I'll move a bed in and charge him rent. Good hunting. What's the time now, driver? Four minutes to eleven, sir. Mm. He's probably not even in Paris. Probably on holiday. By the sea. Brittany. Cooler than it is here. Why did I start all this? No reason, just intuition. And talking to Professor Tiso. And conceit? So sure I was right. So many people risking their lives. And the man with a knife. Eleven o'clock. It's been dark for practically an hour. Nothing will happen. 
Just as well, perhaps. Well, that's no news, sir. Thank you, Lapointe. Off we go, driver. Same route, Yeah. No, wait. Switch that engine off. Where's that coming from? Far side of the square. Down towards the Avenue Juno. Step on it, driver. Right, sir. Stand back there. Stand back. Now, ah, you the one who was attacked? Yes, Chief Inspector. Name? Police from Jusserin. Ah, at least it was one of us. Are you hurt? No, sir. I'm, I'm all right. I'm just a bit shaken, that's all. What happened? Well, he came at me and... I just couldn't hold him. I'm sorry. Oh, it doesn't matter. They'll catch him. He can't get far. I've got this, sir. Oh, what is it? It's a button. I must have torn it off his coat when I was struggling with him. Oh, uh, something. Now, I want you to give me as accurate a description of the man as you can. Well, it was so quick, and as you can see, it's pretty dark. Yeah, but do the best you can. La Pointe. Yes, Chief. Listen carefully to this policewoman's description of the man and get it circulated as quickly as possible to everyone in the area. Yes, sir. And then, policewoman Jusserin, I'll take you back in my car to the Quai des Orfèvres. Megley. Jovier here, sir. Yeah? The chase is still going on. They surrounded a good part of the district. I'm in a cafe on the Place Constantin Pecqueur. And as I got here, I'm practically certain I saw the fellow running down the steps opposite. Well, you weren't able to catch up with him? No, sir. I got after him as fast as I could, but he had too much of a lead on me. Well, why didn't you shoot? I didn't dare, sir. Mm. There were too many people about. I might have hit one of them. But apparently, just before I got here, a man came into this cafe. He didn't stop for a drink, just made a telephone call and then went out. Oh, uh, well, nothing else? The barman said he was fair-haired, youngish, slender. His suit? Dark. Mm. My idea was that perhaps he rang up somebody who came with a car and picked him up. I don't think they're stopping cars with more than one person in them. Well, then tell him to. Right, sir. Well, there we are, Luca. The policewoman he attacked reckons he was about 30 years old, thin, looked like a gentleman, and she remembers when she grabbed his hand, there was a wedding ring on his finger. Now, Jean Vier's just chased and lost someone who fits that description. Apart from the button, that's the lot. Any report on that button yet? Uh, yes, sir, just come in. The lab says it's a good quality one, and from the piece of cloth still on it, the suit was of expensive material. Mm. Imported. Probably English. So, they've given me the lists of cloth importers and button makers. Quite a few of them. Hmm. That'll give La Pointe and Jean Vier a nice little outing tomorrow. If we haven't caught our man before then. So, after a late night, poor La Pointe and Jean Vier had to trail round hundreds of cloth importers and button makers the next morning. Well, not that many as it happened, Georges. For the first time in the case, luck was on our side. The second button maker La Pointe and Jean Vier visited recognized the button. Oh, yes. This comes from uh, Mullerbach's at Colmar. Colmar? Uh, Do uh, Mullerbach's have a Paris office? In this building, as a matter of fact. Two floors up. Thank you. Uh, what exactly did you want to know? Did your firm make that button? Yes. Have you a list of tailors to whom you sold buttons of that kind? Of course. Uh, Monsieur Jean Fils. Will you look up the reference for this button and bring me the list of the tailors to whom we sold that type? There were 28 of them, and that was only in Paris. A sizable number. Quite. So La Pointe and Jean Vier decided to split the list in half and tackle 13 apiece, each clutching a part of the cloth torn by the policewoman from her attacker's suit. Was luck still on their side? Well, not quite so speedily, but eventually Jean Vier came across a tailor who recognised the cloth. Yes, this is one of our materials. Why, do you want a suit? Uh, no, but I would like a list of the customers for whom you've made a suit in this material. Well, there's only been one recently, and well, even that was some time ago. How long? It was uh, last autumn. You remember the customer? Oh, yes, indeed. I made the suit for him myself. Who was it? Monsieur Monsin, uh, Marcel Monsin, a very nice gentleman. Oh, I've made his clothes for several years now. Does he live in the district? Yes, uh, I have the address somewhere. Chief, Jean Vier here. I found him. Yes. He lives in the Boulevard Saint-Germain. I'm just opposite the house now, in a cafe called the Solferino. What, Chief? 
Order you a beer. Very good, sir. Oh, thank you for the beer, jean -Bier. Never told you. And congratulations on finding him. You're always supposing it isn't one of the other customers on one of the other tailor's books. Well, sir, seems to be the only one in this area. Yeah, where well, the murders took place. Yeah. Well, we'll soon know. Yes? Is Monsieur Monsin at home? I don't know. If you wait a moment, I'll go and ask madame. What do you think, oh dear? Two gentlemen who wish to speak to Monsieur, madame. Yes? Is your husband in, madame? Yes. But he's asleep. I must ask you to wake him. May I ask who you are? Judicial police. I'm Chief Inspector Maigret. This is Inspector Janvier. Oh. You'd better come in. Uh, thank you, madame. That will be all, Odile. Yes, madame. This way. Uh, thank you, madame. madame. I suppose your husband came home late last night. What do you mean? Does he usually sleep until this hour in the afternoon? Often. He likes to work in the evening, sometimes late into the night. He is an artist. Uh, then he didn't go out last night? Not that I know of. If you'll wait here, I'll go and tell him. Uh, thank you, madame. Cool. I wouldn't mind a flat like this, mm. chief. Work hard at your job and never question your superior, Jean Vier, and who knows. Yes, Chief. And on the other hand, you could marry a rich woman. I don't know any. Hmm. He'll be here in a moment. Marcel is curiously shy in some ways. I sometimes tease him about it. He hates to be seen when he's just out of bed. You have separate rooms? They do a lot of married couples, don't they? Your husband works here? Yes, his office is through there, overlooking the boulevard. Hmm. He works a lot? Too much for his health. He's never been strong. We should have been on holiday in the mountains now. We always go at this time of the year. But he's accepted a commission that will prevent us taking any holiday at all. Ah, mm. oh, here he is. I will leave you gentlemen alone. Thank you, madame. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, gentlemen. I was working very hard last night on an absolutely vast house a friend of mine is building on the Normandy coast. Otherwise, I would have been up to receive you. I must apologise for being obliged to ask you some personal questions, Monsieur Monsin. If I can be of any help. To begin with, I should like to see the suit you were wearing yesterday. My suit? How extraordinary. Well, if you would care to come through into my dressing room... Thank you. Uh, you must excuse the rather untidy state of the room. I was working until two o'clock this morning. That was why I was asleep when you arrived. The maid hasn't had a chance to clear up as yet. No, please don't worry, monsieur. Now, Chief Inspector, that is my entire wardrobe. The uh, grey suit is the one I was wearing yesterday. I see. Mm. Have you got that bit of cloth, jean -Vier? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, now, last autumn, your tailor made you a suit in this material. Do you remember it? Yes, indeed. Well, what has become of it? Someone standing on a bus platform burnt the lapel with a cigarette. You had it mended? No. I gave it away. I hate anything that's not perfect. Always have. <laughs> Even as a child. I took it out with me one evening when I was going for a walk by the Seine and gave it to a tramp. Was this long ago? The evening before last. I see. Have you been married long, Monsieur Monsin? Twelve years. I got married when I was twenty. You're an architect. Architect decorator. Uh, that means, I suppose, that you're an architect who specialises in interior decorating. Not exactly. Uh, do you mind explaining? I'm not allowed to draw up the plans of a building because I haven't actually a degree in architecture. And you don't need a degree to become a decorator. Mm -hmm. Do you have a great many clients? I prefer having a few clients who trust me and give me a free hand, rather than a great many who would demand concessions. You were born in Paris? Yes. Whereabouts? At the corner of the Rue Coulancourt and the Rue de Maistre. In Montmartre? Did you live there long? Until I got married. Are your parents both alive? My mother only. 
You're on good terms with her? My mother and I have always got on well. What was your father's occupation? He was a butcher. In Montmartre? At the address I gave you. And he died? When I was 14. And your mother sold the business, huh? She put a manager in for a time and then sold the shop, but kept the rest of the house. Mm. She has a flat on the fourth floor. Well, Simon, sir, I'm afraid I have to ask you to accompany my inspector here to the Cady's affair. Is that necessary? I'm afraid so, Jean Vier. Sir? I'll be back there as soon as I've had a word with Monsieur Monsin's mother. Right, Chief. Now, Chief Inspector, what exactly do you want with me? You saw your son yesterday evening, madame. What have the police to do with my son? Please be good enough to answer my questions. Why should I have seen him? I imagine he does visit you now and then. Often. With his wife? I fail to see what that has to do with you. No, did your son come here yesterday evening? No. Nor during the night? He is not in the habit of coming to see me at night. Are you or are you not going to explain the meaning of these questions? I warn you, I shall answer no more of them. I am in my own home and I can remain silent if I choose. Uh, Madame Monsin. I regret to inform you that your son is suspected of having committed five murders in the past few months. What did you say? We have good reason to believe that the five murders committed here in Montmartre were his work. How dare you? Your son has not been here within the last 24 hours. No. When did you last see him? I don't know. You don't remember his visit? No. Tell me, madame, when he got married, was it with your approval? Yes. I was fool enough to... To arrange the marriage? Oh, what does it matter now? You're no longer on good terms with your daughter-in-law. Oh, what has it to do with you? That concerns my son's private life, which is nobody else's business, neither mine nor yours. Have you arrested Marcel? He's in my office at the Quai des Affaires. I want to see him. Of course, Madame Monsin. Monsieur Monsin, you have a visitor. Don't be frightened, Marcel. I'm here. Mama, they shouldn't have Did brought you, like you here. Oh, no, they didn't. I chose to come. What are they doing to you? Just asking questions, Mama. But they're mad. I tell you, they're mad. But I shall get the best lawyer in Paris. I don't care how no. much he wants. I'll spend my last penny if necessary. I'll sell the house. Beg on the Hush, streets. Hush, Mama. Yvonne knows you're here? She knows, Mama. Then where is she? What did she say? So if you'll please sit down, madame. I don't want to sit down. What I want is to have my son back. Come, Marcel. We'll soon see if they dare to keep you. I'm sorry, madame. So, you're arresting him? I'm keeping him at the disposal of the law. Now, will you be good enough to sit down and answer a few questions? I shall answer nothing. Don't be afraid, Marcel. I shall take care of you. <laughs> Your mother seems to be very fond of you. I'm all she has left. Come in. Yes, jean -Vier. Sorry, sir, I didn't realize you had someone with you. Oh, that's all right. Uh, call Lapointe. Lapointe? Yes? The chief wants you. Yes, chief? You take Monsieur Monsin to the cells, see that he's comfortable and has anything he wants. Right. Uh, this way, monsieur. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Now, young jean We We found that fellow's suit, chief. Huh? Or at least the jacket. Well, we picked up a tramp who was wearing it down by the Seine near the Pont d'Ostolitz. Says he found it on the river bank. When? This morning at six o'clock. Mm -hmm. And the trousers? Uh, they were there too, but he was with the pal. They divided the suit between them. We've not got the one with the trousers yet, but it won't take long. Is there a cigarette burn on the lapel? Yes, but I took it up to the lab, and Moet says that burn isn't more than 12 hours old. Mm. So, Monsin's story about it happening on a bus a couple of days ago is a lie. Mm hmm. Ring Madame Maigret and tell her I'll be in for dinner tonight. Right, Chief. I'm just going to call in on Monsin's wife. Haven't you brought him back? No. You really believe it was Marcel, don't you? One day you'll see you were mistaken, then you'll be sorry for the harm you're doing him. You love him? He's my husband. 
Have you arrested him? Uh, not yet. We're going to question him again tomorrow. What does he say? He refuses to answer. And you're sure you have nothing to tell me, Madame Monsin? Nothing. You realise, don't you, that even if your husband is guilty, as I have every reason to suppose, he will neither go to the guillotine nor to hard labour? I have no doubt the doctors will say he's not responsible for his actions. But five women have died so far. As long as the killer, the maniac, call him what you like, remains at liberty, other lives are in danger. Perhaps tomorrow he may begin to attack the people around him. Aren't you afraid? No. You see, you believe he's guilty. I know he's innocent. Mm. Uh. Uh. Is that you, Chief? Uh, who, who's speaking? The point, sir. Hmm? I'm sorry to disturb you. Yeah, I'm sorry, too. I was fast asleep. What's the time? Half past twelve, sir. Oh, the Lord. Where are you? In the Rue de Mestre. There's just been another killing. What? A woman. Stabbed several times, her hmm? dress slashed. When did it happen? About three quarters of an hour ago. I'll be there. So, another killing. Yes, and in a way, it was my fault. This time it couldn't have been Monsin, because he was safely tucked up in the cell. And as usual, no one saw the crime being committed. No one. But I had my own ideas about who might have done it. But it shouldn't have happened. Anyway, I made certain arrangements and was in early at the Quai des Orfeaux for the next morning. Are they here? Uh, yes, Chief. We put them both in the interrogation room. Did the sparks fly? They just took one look at each other, sat down and shut up. Uh, what are we to do now, sir? Oh, well, for the moment, nothing. Now, you go and sit in the next door office, Jean Vier, near the communicating door. Mm -hmm. If they decide to talk, try to hear what they say. Right, Chief. And Luca, uh, Chief, have some of these newspapers taken into the two women. Let's put them on the desk, but make sure that from where they're sitting, they can both see the headlines about last night's murder. Right, Chief. La Pointe? Chief. Where's Monsa? I put him in your office, as you told me. Oh, uh, good. Now, don't disturb oh, no. us. No, I thought this kind of... Good morning, Monsieur Monsard. You've been informed of what happened last night? No one's told me a word. Then you'd better read this. As you can see, someone is doing their utmost to save you. It's a pity it's cost another innocent girl her life. Your mother and your wife are here. They'll be brought in presently and you can have it out among yourselves. Nothing to say. Nothing. Don't you think it's about time you put a stop to all this? Don't you think this makes at least one crime too many? If you talked yesterday, this one would never have been committed. It was nothing to do with me. Oh, yes, it was. It was everything to do with you. Which of them did it? I don't know what you mean. I've looked through all those photographs of you your mother has piously preserved in her flat. Dozens of you, hundreds, but none of your father. I don't even know what he looked like. He was a tradesman, wasn't he? A butcher. I suppose your mother was ashamed of him. Were you? How old did you say you were when he died? Fourteen. And after that, Mother took over. Didn't you ever have a desire to rebel against all the fussing and mollycoddling? No, I suppose not. You didn't rebel because you're lazy and vain. Some people are born with a title, money, servants. You were born with a mother that took the place of all that. Whatever might happen to you, Mother was there. And you knew it. You could do whatever you chose, and the only price you had to pay was obedience. You belonged to your mother. You were her property. You weren't allowed to grow up into a proper man. Why did she marry you off at the age of 20? The fear you'd begin having love affairs? I have nothing to say. Have you ever had anything to say off your own back, I mean? 
I don't imagine you married because you were in love. You're too self-centered for that. You married for the sake of peace and perhaps to get away from your mother's influence. And then your wife turned out to be as possessive as your mother. Why didn't you rebel against her? Both of them were preventing you from being a man. Oh, I'm going to send down for a beer. Do you want one? I don't drink. Oh, of course not. How many times have you wanted to kill them? I don't mean the poor girls you've been attacking in the street. I mean your mother and your wife. You were the prisoner of them both, weren't you? They fed you, looked after you, spoiled you, but at the same time they owned you. You were their creature, their property, something they fought over. So, how could you assert yourself? Not in your profession. You were an amateur. No one took you seriously. That's clear enough. So, how were you to assert yourself? You had to do something outstanding. Something everybody would talk about. Something to make you feel superior to the common herd. You couldn't kill the two of them. Although I imagine you'd have liked to. Because that would have been too dangerous. The search would automatically have led to you. And in any case, there would have been no one left to back you up, flatter you, encourage you. But it was them. The domineering females you resented. So it was females you turned on. In the street. In the dark. And then tore their clothes afterwards to prove what a man you were. You didn't rape them, of course. You weren't man enough for that. Luca, send down for a beer, will you? Very good, Chief. One or two. Just one. You know, Monsieur, I shall remember you all my life. Never before in the whole of my career has a case bothered me so much. When you were arrested yesterday, neither of those women thought you were innocent. And one of them decided to save you. If it was your mother, she had only a few steps to go to get to the ruler mast. If it was your wife, it means that on the assumption that we would release you, she was prepared to spend the rest of her life married to a killer. It could be either of them. The one who committed the murder knows what she did. The one who is innocent knows that the other is not. I wonder if she doesn't feel a certain jealousy. For years, they've been competing to prove which of them loved you most, which of them possessed you most completely. And how could either of them possess you more completely than by saving your neck? Come in. Yes, your beer, Chief. Oh, you'll drink it, new car. I'm going out for a breath of fresh air. When I get back, tell Jean Vier to bring the two women in here. You'll be glad to see them, won't you, Monsieur? You've been away from them both for a whole day. I don't know how you managed. Ah, come in, mesdames. Please sit down. Uh, shut the door, Jean Vier. Uh, don't go. I shall need you to take notes. Right, Chief. Please. Now, I'm not going to try and deceive you into thinking the Monsignor has confessed. Well, how could he? He is innocent. No, madame. Whether he confesses or not, he has committed five murders, and you know it. <sighs> Both of you. Because you know his weaknesses better than anyone. Sooner or later, it will be proved. Sooner or later, he'll end up in prison or in an asylum. Never! One of you took it into her head that by committing another murder, she could avert suspicion from him. All that remains for me to do is to find out which of you, last night, stabbed a certain Jeanne Laurent to death at the corner of the Rue de Maist. <laughs> You have no right to question us without a lawyer being present. It is our right to have legal advice. Now, kindly sit down, madame, unless you have a confession to make. How dare you? You're behaving like a boor, which is what you are, a boor. Please, mamma. Now, if you continue to make a scene, madame, I shall have you taken away by an inspector who will question you while I deal with your son and daughter-in-law. Oh. Thank you. I'm convinced. That not only did one of you hope to save Monsan by committing a crime similar to his while he was in custody, 
but that also one of you had known for a long while what was going on. The time this latest murder was committed, the stabbing, the slashing of the clothes, all that was identical with the other crimes. But there was one difference. The girl who was killed at the corner of the Rue de Mest was tall, slim, totally unlike the other victims. Did neither of you notice that every woman Monsin struck down was short, plump, similar to yourselves, Meda? Mm. Or were you unwilling to admit that every time he killed, he was, in his mind, killing one of you? <laughs> trying to assert his right to some sort of freedom, some existence apart from you. Do you still think it was worth either of you risking your necks to save such a man? Although I suppose you're regarded as preserving what you consider to be your property. I am perfectly willing to die for my son. He is my child. It doesn't matter to me what he has done. And it doesn't matter to me what becomes of the little tarts who walk the streets of Montmartre at night. You kill Jeanne Law? I do not know her name. You are responsible for the murder committed in the Rue de Mest last night? Yes. In that case, can you tell me the colour of the victim's dress? I... It was too dark to see. She was killed less than five yards from a street lamp. I didn't pay attention. But when you slash the material? The colour, madame? The dress was blue. Oh. Yes, your daughter-in-law is right, madame. Yes, it was blue. Yvonne Monsin, you admit to the murder of Jeanne Laurent? Yes. You finish it, Jean Vier. You know what to do. Right, Chief. I'm tired. I'm going home. Uh, wouldn't you prefer to use the other door, sir? That reporter's still out there waiting for you in the corridor. No, that's all right, Jean Vier. Rougeon. Rougeon, wake up. Uh, what? Oh, I'm sorry, I must have dropped off. Yes, I think you must. Oh, I didn't get much sleep last night. No, this corridor isn't the most comfortable of places. Any statement, Chief Inspector? Hmm? Oh, why not? Let's go down to the Brasserie Dauphine, Rougeon. The chairs are softer, the beer's cold, and I can tell you all about it in And that was how Rougeon scooped the story. Yes, I should have waited, of course, given an official release to all the papers at the same time, but after all, Rougeon was there, and I was tired. I'm not surprised. I don't think I've ever been so tired. <laughs> after I talked to him, I went home, lay down on the bed, and slept. Woke about six that evening, and took my wife to the pictures. To escape, relax... In a way, I just felt I wanted to rub shoulders with a few human beings again. Convince myself there were one or two still left. In Maigret Sets a Trap by Georges Simenon, translated by Daphne Woodward and adapted for radio by Aubrey Woods, Maurice Denham played Jules Maigret and Michael Goff, Georges Simenon. Luca was Brian Haynes, La Pointe, John Rye, and Jean Vier, Sean Barrett. Monsin, Malcolm Reed, his wife, Margaret Robertson, his mother, Gladys Spencer. Tissot, Patrick Barr, Policewoman, Francis Jeter, and Rougin, Christopher Bidmead. The play was produced and directed by Glyn Dearman.
Simenon's Maigre, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simenon. With Maurice Denham as Jules Maigret and Michael Goff as Georges Simenon. Jules, my friend, you look. What is it? Guilty. Well, I feel guilty, Georges. Very guilty. Although, what the hell about? I don't know. Something on the conscience? Or the liver? Uh, I have plenty on my conscience. And as for my liver. No, all it is is that I've been talking to a friend of my wife's who was a woman with a perpetual hard done by aura around her. You know the sort. And who doesn't? <laughs> she reminded me of Longyon. Yeah. Yes, of course. Inspector Longyon of the second Paris district. Mm, the very essence of the hard done by. Oh, yes, I remember him. Thin and hatchet faced. Poor Longyon. <laughs> Good policeman, you know, for all that. Wonderfully thorough. Maigret and the Young Girl, translated by Daphne Woodward and adapted for radio by Frederick Bradnam. Didn't you have one particular case where you and Lonya followed one another around? Oh, that happened more than once. But I think I know the case you mean. That poor young girl found in Longyon's district on the pavement of the Place Vintimille at three o'clock on a March morning. This is the Place Blanche. The Place Vintimille is the first on the right, Chief. Good. I should be in bed. Do you know that, young jean -Vier? Yes, Chief. Oh, so should you. Ah. Hmm. There they are. Oh, Lord. Of course. Chief? Inspector Longion. It's his patch. There he is, looking as happy as ever. Shall I drive on? No, he's seen us, was expecting us, probably. Have to face it. Good morning, Inspector Longion. Good morning, Chief Inspector. Did they ring you at home? No, I was still at the Quai des Affaires when the call came through. Just thought I'd take a look. Well, there she is. Very dead. Mm. Found about ten minutes ago. Uh, who is she? No handbag, no papers. One shoe's missing. Have you come across it? No. And she had no coat. Uh, an evening dress, isn't it? Uh, bring the light nearer, will you? Mm -hmm. uh, good. Ah. Uh. She's pathetic. Ah, poor kid. Poor little girl. Jean Vier. Yes, Chief? Get the photographer along, will you? The sooner we have a picture of her, the better. Right, Chief. Well, I'd say she wasn't killed here. Mm, you're probably right, Longyon. It's a funny place to dump a body, isn't it? Well, it's quiet here. I'd say she came by car. Yeah, but a body would soon be found. If there was a car, why not... Put her in the river, find some waste ground, hide her. Well, I've no idea. Oh. Uh, she breaks my heart, you know that? She's got the face of a... a sulky child. Do you know her? Well, if she's one of the street girls, she's very new. I know pretty well all of them, but I've not seen her. Well, we must find out who she is. I shall need your help. Yeah, I thought you'd be taking the case over. Mind you, I'm not complaining. I'm pretty well used to it. Look, I'll still need your help, and it's your patch. All right, if you say. Good. Uh, you'd better start by asking questions. Are the clubs still open? Most are. They don't close in general until about four. And I'll be on my way. All right. Good morning, Inspector Lognon. Good morning, Inspector Janvier. Yeah. Uh, the doctor's just arrived. The yeah. photographer's on his way, Chief. Good. Uh, I'm going to find some food. Meet me at the morgue at, say, half past four. Mm. Our good Dr. Paul should have something for us by then. 
Uh, she was between 19 and 22 years old, in good health, but I'd say rather undernourished. Uh, was she a sweet girl, would you say, Doctor? Oh, not this one, no. She'd never been to bed with anyone. Uh. Uh, how did she die? A uh, fracture of the skull. Uh, she was struck three violent blows by something heavy, a tool or a cosh. Mm. And before she was hit, she was slapped on the face quite hard a number of times. I think she fell on her knees first and tried to cling to someone. So she wasn't attacked from behind? Oh, no. Mm. What do her hands tell you? Her hands? Oh, yes. Um, I don't think she'd ever done any real work. No typing or dressmaking or working in a factory. And uh, well, she'd done very little housework to speak of. I see. Oh, you'll let me have your report later today, will you? Of course, Megre. Uh, but one thing you may like to know now. Hmm? Uh, she had her last meal at about seven last night. She died around two this morning, and sometime just before her death, she consumed a good deal of alcohol, hmm? enough to leave her fairly unsober, I'd say. So, we have a dead, drunken virgin on our hands. Perhaps she'd been to a party, Chief. Yeah, it's quite likely she had. Well, thanks, Dr. Paul. Uh, thank you, Megre. Uh, I'll find out what it was she drank and put it in my report. Right. Well, young jean Vier, what do her clothes tell us? Uh, something, Chief. The dress has a tag on it. Huh? Irene, 35, Rue de Douai. Just round the corner from the Place Vantimy. Well, that's something indeed. <laughs> oh, it'll soon be dawn. I'm going to get some sleep. Uh, you too. A photograph will appear in the second edition. Somebody will recognise her, I hope. I'll get hold of Longyon and visit Irene's in the afternoon. This is the shop, Chief Inspector. <laughs> Not exactly haute couture, is it? Mm -hmm. Irene, model gowns. She hires gowns out as well as selling. Now, you probably know, Lorient. Who is she? Elizabeth Kumar. Ah, <laughs> there's not much you don't know about this area, is there? I didn't know the dead girl. You know who did? I take it nobody knew her in the club. I would have told you if they had. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I shall go around them again before they close tonight with a picture of the girl this time. That's the stuff. So, let's have a word with Madame Mireille. Did you get some sleep? Not much. The wife's unwell, as usual. Madame Mireille? She's Mademoiselle. Who are you? The Chief Inspector Maigret. Are oh, you? Yeah. I know who you are, misery guts. Oh, shut up, you young cow. Where's Mademoiselle Kumar? Well, where do you think after lunch? Well, go and wake her up. It's important. She won't like it. Nice girl. Yeah, she's her usual sort. Kumar calls them protégé. Mm. Saves them from the streets, I suppose. Well, did you see the pictures of the dead girl in the morning papers? Yeah, she's got one here. It's very recognisable, even with the bruises. Somebody will know her. Ah, she's awake. <laughs> Drinks like a fish. Yes, yeah, so our dead girl had been drinking. Brum, Dr. Paul reckons. Uh, why, I wonder? And who would want to kill such a child? Why? I never think of it. What good does it do? Very little, usually, I know, but this girl... To know who she was... Ah, what are you after this time? This is Chief Inspector Megrain. Oh, I've heard of him. What's he doing with you? Inspector Longyon has a dress of yours. Mm. This one. Hired out, I'd say. Mm. Yes, I heard it out last night. I don't know her name, but I got a coat and dress because she had no money for the deposit. Vivian, my pet, get her clothes. Now, what time was this, mademoiselle? Oh, about nine. <laughs> You're a fine figure of a man, aren't you? <clears throat> <laughs> about nine. We don't close till ten. Eight till ten's our busiest time. <laughs> Surprising number of girls suddenly find they need a dress for the night then. These <laughs> are old things. Coat. <clears throat> Homemade dress, handbag. Ah, oh, give me the handbag. Mm, beside the dress, what else did you hire, mademoiselle? Oh, do you hear how polite he is, old long yeah. A velvet cape and a little silver evening bag with a chain to it. Uh, yeah, well, there's only a pencil and a pair of gloves in this well, one. Well, naturally, she transferred things to the evening bag. What's happened to the cape and the bag? They've gone missing. The girl who hired them was killed early this morning. Oh, silly girl getting killed. 
Have a look at her picture. Mm. You've no idea who she was? Oh, that's her. She got bashed up. Oh, I never knew who she was, but I remembered her, though, when she came in last night. So did Vivian, didn't she? The stuck-up thing she was, yeah. like when she'd come in about a month ago for a dress. She hired that one then. Oh, she came in in the evening that time, too. She had some money and paid the deposit and brought it back the next day. Now, last night, mademoiselle, oh. did she ask for that particular dress? She did. Oh, lucky I had it in. She changed here and left soon after nine. I watched her go down the street. Funny sort of girl. Well, was she nervous? Excited? Anything? Oh, in... she was like a girl in desperate need of a dress. You mean it was important to her? I mean, monsieur, it's always important to them. They're all the same. They must have a dress pronto or they'll die. She did. Come in. Ah, oh, good morning, jean -Vier. Anything? Morning, Chief. Nothing. Not a sausage. Hmm. Oh, somebody must have known her. She must have lived somewhere. Well, she hired an evening dress. She must have gone somewhere in it. Pictures of her, descriptions of her, have now appeared in... How many? Five morning papers yesterday and six this morning. Seen by millions, if we can believe the circulation figures. Well, God, she's been dead for over 24 hours. Somebody must have missed her. Chief. Mm, go on. I was thinking, if she was so hard up that she couldn't afford the deposit, even for a tatty old evening dress, yeah. she must have needed it to hire it for something really important, if you see what I mean. Mm, something important like borrowing money? Yes, that makes sense. Uh, so on the other hand, I asked Madame Maigret last night why a girl would behave like our girl. Uh, she said that a woman can have a sudden desire to dress up without a serious reason. Not like small girls do. <laughs> That's it. Our girl, did she look that type to you, Chief? No, no, she was a... a lost little creature. I have to try to know her, jean Vier, and then I shall know how and why she died. Mm. Maigret! I, I've something to tell you about the girl who's been murdered. Uh, have you? Uh, good, uh, what's your name? Well, where, Rose? 113 Rue de Clichy, mm -hmm. on the second floor, with old Madame Cremieux, who won't help you. But, Goodbye. But, what? Oh, well, come on, jean -Vier. we've got to lead at last. The Rue de Clichy and Madame Cremieux. Madame Cremieux, you do recognise the girl, don't you? Oh, yes, that's her, all right. And she was your lodger since when? Monsieur, she was not my lodger. She was a girl to whom I gave a room. Gave her room to? She paid me something, of course. Hmm. Oh, what's the use? You just sit there without any expression. You know perfectly well, monsieur, if I take a person in as a lodger, the inland revenue people want to know about it, so I call them friends, and they pay something. Uh, what goes on between the inland revenue and yourself has nothing to do with me, madame. Now, tell me about the girl. Her name? Louise Laboine was the name she gave me, but I never saw her identity card. She answered my discreet notice in the newsagent's shop in January. She seemed a nice, well-bred, quiet girl, so I said, do come and stay. Did you know where she worked? Worked? I have no idea. She never said. She never said anything, as I soon found out, monsieur. And she was the most unsociable, unfriendly girl you could ever come across. Small wonder she seemed to have no friends. Work. <laughs> At first, she left at 8.30 in the morning. Then after a few weeks, it was 9. Sometimes she'd stay in bed all morning. I asked her if she changed her job, but she wouldn't say. Wouldn't say? What did she say? She said nothing. That was her way. When she didn't want to answer a question, she would pretend not to have heard it and only look at one blankly and turn away. It was infuriating. Huh? Here's Rose, Chief. Ah, thank you, jean -Vier. Come in, Rose. Madame Cremier, this is Inspector jean -Vier. You're very young for an inspector, monsieur. Thank you, madame. Mm. And why is Rose with you? A rose, madame, was public-spirited enough to ring us and tell us where the dead girl lived. She had no right to interfere. It was no business of yours, Rose. Why not? Because you'd kicked her out. Because you didn't want anything more to do with her. When did you kick her out, madame Cremier? I asked her to leave three days ago. She hadn't paid. Uh, the rent. Did she take her things with her? As a matter of fact, she didn't. When I told her to leave as soon as possible, she said, very well. 
That was all. Then she went out and didn't come back. Mm. Will you take Inspector Janvier to her room, please? Janvier, put her things together. Yes, Chief. This way, Inspector. I'll show you what she left. Thank you, madame. <sighs> well, Rose, come here. Thank you for ringing us. Well, she wasn't going to. That's why I did. I overheard her talking to the concierge. Well, they must have been looking at the picture in the paper. And old Mother Cremier said that was the wretched girl, all right. And she wasn't surprised she met a bad end. But she wasn't going to ring. Well, she said the police were paid well enough without people doing their work for them. Mm. Well, so I rang. Uh, well, tell me, Rose, did you know Louise well? Oh, no. Well, she sometimes used to smile at me. I worked for a family on the first floor, see, and, well, we used to meet on the stairs, and I used to see her sitting in the gardens, and... Ah, was she waiting for somebody? Well, nobody ever came. Well, she'd get up and go, and half an hour later come back and sit down. But I never saw her with anybody. Mm. She was so pretty, like a film actress. But she always looked unhappy, as if she never laughed. Do you suppose she knew she was going to die? No, Rose, I... I think it was her life that was unhappy. It's all here in her suitcase. Mm. What there is of it? <laughs> Excuse me, Rose. Oh, yes. Here we are. Two slips, mm. two pants, pair of stockings, dressing gown, hairbrush, box of face powder, some aspirin. It's pathetic, Chief. Yes. No letters, postcards? Nothing. That's all she had except for one dress, a pair of shoes and an old coat. And she behaved as if she was worth a fortune. She didn't even have a nightdress. Look, did you discover anything about her, madame? Where she came from, if she had parents still alive? Once when I said something about the South, she implied that she knew Nice quite well. Nice? Hmm. And you never saw her with anybody and nobody came here? Nobody came or telephoned. She went out some evenings. Well, to the cinema, certainly, because I found the tickets. Well, thank you. We'll take her things. Uh, jean uh, when you get back to the quay, put through a call to Inspector Ferret at Nice. Get them to put the photos in their papers. Right, Chief. I must meet old Longion. See what he's dug up. A glass of the dry white, Pierre. Uh, at once, Chief Inspector. Oh, and uh, Chief Inspector, there's someone waiting for you over in the corner. Ah, uh, yes, thank you. Hello, you What'll you have? Whatever you choose, Chief Inspector. Of course. A cognac, then, Pierre. Uh, I'll bring them out, please. You? Thank you. Have you been here long? Oh, it doesn't matter. I managed a few hours sleep. Uh, out all night? Until five. Tell me about it. I did what I said I would. I went over the same ground as the night before, only more thoroughly. And this time I had the girls' pictures. Until three o'clock, oh, four minutes past to be precise, ah. I had no luck. Uh, white wine for you, Chief. Uh, uh, cognac, Monsieur. Uh, thank you, Pierre. Cognac? Probably goes straight to my head. Good. Ah, here's health. Here's hoping. Hmm. Now, four minutes past three to be precise. Yes. Outside the Le Grelo, I spoke with a taxi driver, Leon Zirk. I showed him the photos and he recognised her at once. On the night of her death, he was waiting opposite a new nightclub, the Romeo, in the Rue Comartin. And? That night, the Romeo was the scene of a wedding party. Ah, was it? Well, go on. I checked on it. Came across this newspaper cutting covering mm. the event. It tells us that one Marco Santoni, the representative in France for a brand of Italian vermouth, Married Janine Armagnier of Paris two days ago, and the wedding party was held at Romeo's. Mm, Santoni is not a member of the Italian mafia, I hope. I asked records, they've no trace of him. Oh. Oh, he's a rich man of 45, a member of the smart set, who's had many mistresses, but this is his first marriage. Right, uh, get back to the dead girl. Yeah, I was about to. The taxi driver, Leon Zirk, saw her leave Romeo's at a quarter past twelve. He asked her if she wanted a taxi, but she ignored him. Well, it was night. Is he sure it was her? There's enough neon to make it like day around Romeo's. Zirk also noticed that she was wearing a shabby blue evening dress. And there's something else. Ah, is her. Zirk was engaged a little later by a couple to go to the Etoile. And after he'd set them down on his way back, 
Much to his surprise, he saw the girl walking down the boulevard Ausmann, going towards the Champs-Élysées. He looked at his watch. It was almost one o'clock. Hmm? Oh, uh, good work, Lorient. Now, I'm sure you checked at Romeo. I spoke to the doorman and the head barman, and they both recalled her well. The doorman let her in just before 12. She'd no invitation card, but said she was a friend of the bride's and looked so harmless. And once inside? The head barman noticed her at once. She was different from the smart set the other guests belonged to. At first, she stood by the bar watching the dancing, and then during the interval, she caught the bride's eye and went up to her, and they talked for some minutes. What was the atmosphere like? And Madame Santoni, it seems, was pretty reserved. Cold, even, and shook her head, no, a number of times. But she did put something into the girl's hand, something from her handbag. Money? The man couldn't be sure, but he thought it was. And soon after that, the girl left. With enough money on her to be killed for it? Mm. What was Madame Santoni's maiden name? Jeanine Armenu. Do we know anything about her? She's no record. We must get hold of her. She's at present on her honeymoon in Italy. Ah, so you've made some inquiries? I went to Santoni's flat in the Rue du Berry this morning and spoke to his manservant. Apparently, Santoni met Jeanine four or five months ago. She didn't belong to the circles he moved in, and the fellow never has discovered where and how his master met her. I gather she's in her early twenties, hard-headed, attractive, with a temper, ah. and was living at the Hotel Washington before her marriage. Uh, Santoni paid for the hotel. Uh, did the manservant know Louise Labois? Louise Labois? Yeah. The dead girl. Ah. <laughs> I'm sorry, old chap. I, I should have said before. No. We found where she lived, up to three days ago, anyway, this morning. The girl recognised her picture and phoned us. She was known as Louise Labois, and it's possible she came from Nice, Jean Vier's chicken. And this girl who recognised her knew all about her, I suppose. No, she never spoke to her. Nobody knew a thing about her. Now, I can only hope that your Janine Armagnier will know something. Did the manservant know Louise? No. He was sure she'd never come to St. Tony's flat. Hmm. Well, thank you, Longyon. Fine work. Uh, another cognac. No, thank you, Chief Inspector. I have a few more inquiries I'd like to make about Janine Armagnier, where she lived before the hotel and so on. So, uh, if you'd excuse me... Yes. I remained there in the bar trying to understand... Do you understand, my dear George? What you were trying to understand? I think so. And I've seen you before when you're concentrating in that manner. Yeah, I know. My poor wife has suffered for years. But this girl, Louise, had somehow become very close to me. If I had a daughter, this sort of girl, why should she die? The way she did. A girl who came to Paris, is alone in Paris, knows not a soul but Janine Santoni. And Janine, by all accounts, is a very different sort of girl from Louise. So they probably knew each other before Paris. Could be. Louise has no money, no prospects, no job, and nowhere to live. She was kicked out by Madame Cremieux in the morning, surfaced in the evening at Irene's, went to a wedding party at midnight, was seen walking in Paris at one in the morning... And was dead by two... So there is an hour to fill in. And during that hour, she drank quite a bit of rum. Mm, so she went to a bar. I can't see her walking into a bar at that time of the morning alone. Can you? Perhaps somebody was with her. Well, according to Longyon's taxi driver, she was alone at one. Now, perhaps she had a reason for going into a bar. And what would that have been? I had no idea. Well, for a couple of days, old Longyon ploughed his way through Janine's immediate past. I didn't want to get the young lady back from her honeymoon unless all else failed, but then the police at Nice turned up trumps. So at last there was some background. Oh, there was of a bizarre variety. A mother. I went to Nice to see her. She was an addict. Mm -hmm. A gambling addict, hooked on the wheel. I had to interview her in the casino. <laughs> Dead, you say? Murdered? Well, I hope she didn't suffer too much. Oh, red again, and yesterday the black came up nine times out of ten. She left home four years ago. 
I never heard from her more than a couple of times. She once sent me an address, care of a Janine, somebody or other. I never knew her. Janine. No. I used to be a dancer, you know. Polly Berger, South America, Middle East. I met her father in Istanbul, a Dutchman, Julius van Kram. Ah, look, the black for once. I might break even today after all. Oh, yeah, later, I suddenly found myself pregnant. I decided to have it. Louise was born here in Nice. Two months after she was born, Van Kram walked out one afternoon to buy cigarettes and never came back. I never saw him again. Mm. <laughs> oh, yes. Sent me money over the years. Asked for news of Louise. I always wrote to him, poached restaurant, of course, to every city in the world. The last time I heard from him, about a year ago, sent a large money order and wanted to know Louise's address, so I sent her the one in care of Janine, whoever. Uh, he was in New York. <laughs> I don't know what he did, but I'm sure it wasn't honest. <laughs> ah, red again. You're bringing me poor luck, Monsieur Maigret. There was your sought for background, Jules. Mm. No wonder Louise left it as soon as she could. And no wonder it left her neurotically unsociable. It still didn't explain anything. What she could have been murdered for and who could have murdered her. No, but it gave you just the hint of a lead, surely. Oh, yes, yeah, sure, she did. Julius Van Kram. He took a bit of tracing, but within 24 hours, records had a dossier on him. Confidence trickster? Of some notoriety. Known under 20 different names in 20 different countries. The, the last name had been Donnelly, and under that name he'd been sentenced to eight years in the United States for fraud. And he died in prison nine months before his daughter was killed. He wrote asking for her address from prison, didn't he? Well, he wrote during the trial or just before. I spoke to the FBI, and they told me that the proceeds of Van Kram's last fraud were never recovered. Over $100,000. So what was your next step, Jules? A criminal connection had been discovered, and one that the girl knew nothing of, presumably. But it led nowhere. Right. Now I had to speak to Janine Santoni, bring her back from her honeymoon. I uh, thought she might be cross, so I sent Longion on ahead to see her first. I myself turned up half an hour later. She was an aggressive-looking redhead with a magnificent figure and a magnificent temper to match. Ah, so you finally condescended to make an appearance, Monsieur Maigret. I'm sorry, Madame Santoni. I'm sure Inspector Longon has explained. Oh, I have explained, Chief Inspector. Madame Santoni, however... Has refused to answer any questions. Now, why won't you answer Inspector Longon's questions, Madame? Have you something to hide? Of course I have. What woman hasn't? Well, my questions were not at all personal, I can assure you, Chief Inspector. They referred entirely to her relationship with the dead girl. I didn't answer his stupid questions because I felt that a woman of my social standing should be questioned by the leading Chief Inspector, not by a subordinate. A social standing, yes, of course. <laughs> Inspector Longyon is not strictly a subordinate of mine. He is from a different district. The district in which Louise Laboin was found dead. Well, the man looks like a subordinate. Well, the chief inspector was only being tactful. The chief inspector will become less tactful unless you both stop being ridiculous. Good. Now, madame, how old are you? Hardly a day over 20, I'd say. <laughs> 21, monsieur. And do you want the age of my grandmother? In a moment. I shall call you Jeanine, it suits you. Tell me about Louise, Jeanine. Have you known her long? Four years. She was 16, I was 17. We, we both left home. We met on the night train from Nice to Paris. We had to sit up all night, so we told each other our life stories. In Paris, at first, you stay with your aunt in the Rue de Chemin Vert. You left after a few months after a quarrel about a girl whom your aunt found under your bed. So, you've seen my aunt, have you? Well, you don't want to believe all she said about me. Look, I didn't come to Paris just to work in an office or a shop or to marry a clerk or a shop assistant. The girl under your bed, I take it, was Louise. Naturally. Everything connected with Louise was disaster. She lost the job she had in a shop in no time. 
she said the boss made a pass at her. <laughs> so she was slung out of her cheap hotel. She turned up at my place and asked to stay. I hid her in my room, and when my aunt came in, she went under the bed. <laughs> my aunt might have taken pity on her, but when she found Louise, huh, being Louise, she wasn't even apologetic or anything, just coldly matter-of-fact, huh, insolent almost. Mm, you then took a flat in the Rue de Pontieu. And Louise came too. I didn't want her. It wasn't always convenient for me to have her there. <laughs> She didn't seem to mind. She'd sit in the tiny kitchen for hours. Did she find another job? Oh, she had various jobs. None of them any good. None of them lasted more than a few weeks. Louise wasn't trained to do anything, and I honestly think she didn't want to do anything. Oh, she was pathetic, Monsieur Maigret. People said she was shy, but uh, that wasn't the truth. She had no love for life. Perhaps that was what it was. Mm. And how long did you stick together, Eugenie? Almost three years, and stick is the word as far as Louise was concerned. She never paid a penny towards the rent, and, oh, in the end, we were not speaking terms. Then I met Marco, my husband, and I moved out and went to a hotel. So she had to leave the flat. I don't know where she went, and I didn't care. Did you see her again before the night of the wedding? No, but she tried to see me. My husband took me to Maxime's a lot, and that got into the gossip columns. She turned up there one evening, the head waiter told us, you know, wearing a, a tatty old blue dress, oh, typically Louise, asked for us, and when she was told we weren't there, just walked out without a word. Uh, she came to your wedding party in the same dress. It was hired. And it looked like it. She wasn't invited, of course. Oh, she looked quite awful. Now, what did she want? Money, of course. I tried to tell her I couldn't help her. Now I was married. It was different, my... Husband didn't want me to have anything to do with her in future. But you gave her something, didn't you? What I had in my bag and... Oh, and I told her about the letter, which is why she left at once, I imagine. A letter from the United States, was it? I don't know. Uh, this one was left by a man. Uh, I was coming to the letter, Chief Inspector. You do dig around, don't you? <laughs> doesn't he? He's a good detective. <laughs> Go on, lawyer. A man with an American accent spoke to the receptionist at the Hotel Washington about Louise Laboin and Janine Armeneux. He'd been trying to trace Laboin for some weeks and got to the Washington about ten days ago. Two days later, he came back, said he had to leave Paris, and left a letter for Laboin, care of Mademoiselle Armeneux, as she then was. Did you give Louise the letter, Janine? How could I? I had no idea where she was, and I didn't have it with me at my wedding. But you do still have it. Somewhere in the flat. Look, I was preparing for my marriage, monsieur. <laughs> my husband made me open it, though. He was suspicious of it. Italian men are very jealous. Now, what did it say? Oh, roughly, uh, not word for word. Um, uh, I have a very important message for you. I must see you as soon as possible. Ask for me, um, uh, Jimmy, at Pickwick's bar in the Rue de l'Etoile. Oh, and then there was a sort of postscript. Uh, I have to leave Paris. I'm leaving the paper with a man who runs Pickwick's. Uh, Albert. Uh, he'll ask you to prove your identity. It's important. That was all. Ah, long, long ago to Pickwick's bar. I know Albert. He has a record. The bar is used by some of the Corsican fraternity. Get what you can out of him. I'll be along as soon as I can. I'll have a perno, Albert. Uh, yes, Monsieur Maigret, a uh, perno. Where is she? Oh, Lognon. Mm. Oh, we left ten minutes ago. Huh? Where did you send him? I sent him nowhere. A uh, perno, Monsieur. Uh, thanks. Now, did you recognise the dead girl from the photo in the papers? Oh, I don't often bother with the papers. When she came in here on the night of her death, was the place full? Monday? Oh, very full. At about one o'clock. I didn't look at my watch. Uh, what did she do? She sat down on the stool at the end of the bar. Mm. Did she order a drink? Yeah, I think it was uh, rum. And she asked if you had a letter for her? Yeah, that's right. Where did you keep the letter? Uh, there, between those bottles. Uh, nobody asks for them. And so you gave it to her? No, I asked to see her identity card. Ah, yes, those were your instructions. They were. From Jimmy? From Jimmy. Did you tell Inspector Longion this? Most of it, if he asked. So you gave her the letter once she'd identified herself? That's right. 
Her identity card was in her handbag, was it? Where else? A small silver evening bag with a chain. I don't remember. Did she open and read the letter in the bar? No, she went downstairs. Uh, where the toilets and the telephones are. Hmm. And then she came back. Yeah, uh, to the bar. Hmm. And ordered another drink. No, the American did for her. The American? Not Jimmy? Mm, not Jimmy. Uh, a tall, young chap uh, with a lot of red hair. Uh, did this tall, red-haired American have a name? Frank. He uh, used to follow Jimmy around. But when Jimmy went back to the States, Frank stayed here. Well, he was here that night. And he picked Louise up. Did she seem to mind? She let him buy her a couple of drinks and they talked. Did they leave together? Yeah. What time? Oh, I guess I'd say um, coming up to two. Mm. Have you seen this tall, red-haired American since that night? Oh, he hasn't been in this bar. Have you any idea where he is? I told old Lonyon. The American asked me about Brussels. He said he was going there. Mm. He wanted to know about an hotel. I told him I always stayed at the palace by the guard you know. I see. Get your coat, Albert. Lock up the bar. You're coming with me to the Quai des Orfèvres. Do you want Albert Falcone in now, Chief? Yes, Chambier. Have you traced Lonyon in Brussels? Yes, Chief. He's uh, at the Palace Hotel. <laughs> and he's not found the American? No, not one that fits the description, Chief. Mm. I didn't tell him there wasn't one, but I think he guesses. I only said you'd made an arrest. Oh, that went down like a lead balloon, I'm sure. <laughs> he, he didn't ask who, just said he'd get the night train back. <laughs> I'll bring our friend Albert in. Mm. Yes, it'll take me a long time to live this down in all your eyes. Well, she's own daft fault believing stories about tall, red-haired Americans rushing off to Brussels to find them. But it'll be me who'll feel responsible. And guilty. Here he is, Chief. Ah, uh, come and sit down, Aubert. No, you stay, jean -Vier, and shut the door. Right, Chief. Now, Aubert. The truth... How did you guess? I didn't guess. I knew at once. I would have swallowed your story. It was a good one. If I hadn't known the girl. You knew the girl? Knew Louise Labouin? After her death, Albert, I... got to know her. To know her well enough to be sure she would never have behaved in your bar as you said she did. No, Albert, Louise would not have sat at the bar as other girls do. She would never have considered going downstairs, fighting her way through the crowd to read the letter. She wouldn't even have thought to open it until she was outside. I nearly said home, but she didn't have a home to go to. And finally, she would never have allowed a man to pick her up, buy her drinks, take her off. Not even a tall, red-haired young American, Albert. No. She slipped into the bar, seeing nobody ordered a drink and took it to a table. Drank it slowly without paying attention to anybody. Then she went back to the bar, ordered another drink, asked you, Albert, for the letter, showing her identity card. You gave it to her and you probably said, don't open it here, although you had no need to. She took the letter and the drink back to the table. I think she felt something was wrong. She would. She felt threatened and she had to have one or two more drinks before she could find the courage to leave. So she was a little drunk. And her senses were not so prickly when she left. Probably to find a cheap hotel for the night. You know the rest. You must have been there. I have been since her death. What did the letter say, Albert? It was from her father. He asked her to forgive him for his neglect of her, and he said he'd be dead by the time she received this letter. He went on to tell her to get a passport, 
go to the United States to an address in New York where there was a great deal of money awaiting her in banknotes. But as nobody knew her, she must turn up with the letter and her passport. You had the letter? All you needed was her identity card to get a passport in her name. We didn't mean to kill her. No. I'm sure you didn't. Who were the others? Bianchi, the Corsican, and Tattoo Jack. Oh. Well, they were outside in a car. They let her get on a bit, drove past her, stopped, and waited for her to come up to them. Bianchi got out of the car and made a grab at her handbag, but the chain on it was around her wrist, so he tried to pull it free. She struggled, fell on her knees. Well, she looked as if she'd screamed, so Bianchi slapped her face. All she did was cling on to him and start moaning for help, so the fool lost his nerve and coshed him. But too hard. He didn't mean to kill her, but he's a big chap. I know he is. So they bundled her into the car got the handbag and dumped her out at the Place Fantimi. Why there? That's what I asked. They said, dressed like she was, she fitted the Montmartre district, fitted in with the girls. Yes. I suppose she did. Poor kid, she was always a loser. If that evening bag had not had a change. All right, take him away, jean -Bier. Yes, Chief. Oh, Albert, I nearly forgot. I owe you for the pair now. <laughs> Have it on the house. No, I'd rather not. Yeah. Keep the change. Oh, thank you, monsieur. The end of a sad case, George. Yes, indeed. I take it you tied it up at the American end? The FBI did, but only just in time. When the girl used to impersonate Louise turned up to collect, the FBI were waiting. There was a lot of money. Louise could have bought herself a new life. With a new dress? Yes, a new dress. Even crime didn't pay for Louise. I take it Longnon arrived back from Brussels in one piece. <laughs> I didn't wait around to see. Uh, what you mean is you were coward enough to keep out of the way. Well, I did have some leave owing, but Longnon's report was a joy. In what particular way? He never for a moment admitted he was sent on a fool's errand. Perhaps he still believes in the tall, red-haired American. Have you never asked him? Oh, you must be joking. You were quite right, of course. To discover how poor Louise died, you had to know how she lived. And if Longnon had understood that, he'd never have rushed off to Brussels. Mm. She's haunted me for a long time, as that girl. I walked past Romero's the other day, and her ghost was there, in that sad blue dress and badly fitting cape. Like a sulky child, out past her bedtime. In Maigret and the Young Girl by Georges Simenon, translated by Daphne Woodward and adapted for radio by Frederick Bradnam, Maurice Denham played Jules Maigret and Michael Goff, Georges Simenon. Janvier was Sean Barrett, Longnon, Garrard Green. Janine, Nicolette McKenzie, Albert, Michael Tudor Barnes, Madame Lavoie, Gudrun Yeur, Madame Cremieux, Noel Hood, and Rose, Anne Rosenfeld. Technical presentation for the series was by Peter Novis, Carol McShane, Jan Reeder, and Sue Templeman. The series was produced and directed by Glyn Dearman.
Simonon's Maigret, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simonon. There are times, my dear Georges, when a disappearance is more expected than unexpected. Indeed, you. If, for instance, a solicitor was known to be embezzling his client's money, you'd expect him to disappear. Mm, turn up again, somewhere like the Argentine, as Monsieur Dorf? Oh, don't say that happened once and we've both forgotten. Uh, Monsieur Dorf? I don't remember such a case. We wouldn't forget a case, would we, George? Of course not, George. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this chap, however, was a solicitor, and his wife expected him to vanish at times, only nothing was as it seemed to be. Morris Denham as Jules Maigret and Michael Goff as Georges Simenon in Maigret and Monsieur Charles, translated by Marianne Alexandre Sinclair and adapted for radio by Frederick Bradnam. Chief Inspector, hmm? there's a woman in my office who insists on seeing you personally. She won't tell me a thing. No, Paul LaPointe. Has she got a name? Well, she gave me a card. Uh, here. Ah, uh, Madame Sabin Levesque, 207 Boulevard Saint Germain. Oh, it's a good address. Mm. Well, she seems sort of peculiar to me. Sort of peculiar? Well, yes, Chief. She, she stares straight at you as if she had trouble in seeing you. Mm, well, I'll ask you to come in. And bring your shorthand pad, just in case. Eh? Yes, Chief. The Chief Inspector will see you now, Madame Sabin Levesque. <sighs> Mm, I'm sure she'll object to my pipe. Chief, this mm. is the lady. Oh. Oh, well, do sit down, please, madame. Thank you. Well, madame? Do you know who my husband is? Well, except that he has the same name as you, no. He's one of the best-known solicitors in Paris. Oh, do make a note of that, LaPointe. Uh, yes, chief. Mm. I suppose that young man has to stay here and write it all down. My husband has disappeared. Well, in that case, madame, you should have gone to the Missing Persons Bureau. Have you been drinking? I must say I expected you to be more understanding. Look, to understand, I must know... I had know two glasses you... of cognac to give me courage. Hmm. When did your husband disappear? On the 18th of February, over a month ago. What did he tell you? <laughs> Nothing. He never did. You see, I'm used to him clearing off for several days at a time. Good Lord. Huh? You have a question, Lebois? Oh, uh, well, yes, thank you, Chief. Mm. Uh, do you mean to say, madame, that your husband goes away on journeys and doesn't tell you where? He doesn't go away. He stays in Paris or sometimes the suburbs. I used to have him followed. It was always the same thing. How long has this been going on, madame? It began shortly after we were married, 15 years ago. And you see, my husband's like that. He has these fancies all of a sudden. He meets a woman he likes and he feels the need to live with her for a few days. Uh, where does he find these fancies? In the clubs, in the nightclubs. To, to which he doesn't take you? We've meant nothing to each other for years. And yet you're worried. For your own sake? For his sake. I don't love him anymore, monsieur, but I'm worried for him. Month is a long time. He took nothing with him, not even a small suitcase. He didn't even take one of the cars. I'm afraid something may have happened to him. Your husband is a successful solicitor, you say. What happens when he does his regular disappearance? He isn't at all like the usual solicitor. He inherited his father's firm, and the head clerk can run everything. How old is your husband? Forty-eight, monsieur. And as fit as a young man. Do you know if he had a lot of money on him the day he disappeared? Not for sure, but I doubt if he had much. He used his checkbook and his cards. Mm. What does the head clerk think? I don't know. I haven't asked him. 
We're not on good terms. Well, we'll ask him. And we should pick up a trail in the clubs. You find me complicated, don't you? <laughs> I don't know, madame. I haven't thought about you properly yet. Have you any money of your own? No. Oh, my husband gives me all I want. I couldn't swear to it, but I think he's very rich. Hmm. Well, you look tired. I am. I'm always tired. Perhaps I should get back. Yes, yes, perhaps you should. Look, if you don't mind, I'll come and see you at your flat this afternoon. I have a nap after lunch, so come at about four. Mm, that's fine. Tell me, what is your first name? Natalie. I have some Russian blood from my mother. Natalie. Have you ever been happy, Natalie? No, never. I don't know the meaning of the word. Good day, Monsieur Maigret. Oh, good day. You will come alone. Yes, I'll come alone. Oh, uh, allow me, madame. Shall I call a taxi for you? No, I have my chauffeur waiting. I remember the way out. Good morning, then, madame. Ah. Well, what do you think, Chief? Oh, I think she was badly in need of another drink. Do you believe her story? I mean, her husband going off the way she said. Why not? A strange woman. wonder if she's a little mad. Did you think she was a bit cracked, Jewel, or were you just satisfying La Pointe's curiosity? <laughs> it seemed the best thing to do. No, I thought she was intelligent, but... An alcoholic, for sure. When once she'd been very attractive. Her marriage sounds like a marriage of convenience, but it obviously wasn't. Let's assume there was love to start with. Mm, only after a while he had to revert to his bachelor habits. I needed to know his husband. Needed to see where he lived. Needed... But you had a feeling he was dead. No, not really, George. Only that uh, something strange was going on. I needed to see his office, too. It was on the floor beneath his flat. So, in the afternoon, I called in there and spoke to Le Cureur, the head clerk. The first day of spring, monsieur, and behaving as the first day should behave. Mm, true, monsieur Le Cureur. I walked here. It was positively warm. Nevertheless, I think I should close the window. The noise... Yes, monsieur. He sees all the clients personally. He never gives the impression of being a busy man, and yet he works harder than I do. Incredibly shrewd, too. I suppose you take over his work when he's away. It's my duty as his head clerk. Uh, there are, however, certain things I can't sign, so at the moment it's rather awkward. When he went away in the past, for a few days, he kept in touch with you. He always rang me to see if he was needed. Uh, Chief Inspector, I... I wonder if I have the right to go into things. Uh, professional etiquette, you understand. Look, he's been gone for a month. He could be dead. You think he could have been murdered? His wife seems to think so. Mm. The idea crossed my mind, too. Well, if you were worried, why didn't you go to the police? I began to get worried two weeks ago. I rang Madame sabin Levesque to tell her I was, and I advised her to get in touch with the police. Well, did you? What did she say? Oh, there was nothing to worry about yet, and... Uh, She'd take care of the matter in due course, whatever that meant. You don't get on well with Madame, I take it. No. But it's not just that. It's, um... I'm, I'm sure I shouldn't be letting these uh, cats out of the bag, as it were. Look, I know so much already, and we need to find your employer. So? Nobody here likes her. No one in this office or among her staff upstairs... Except for her maid, Claire. She, uh, she doesn't fit in. She's a sort of uh, discordant element in the place. Do you understand? I'm not sure how sane she is, and, uh, of course, she drinks like a fish. Well, there it is, Chief Inspector. We all should feel sorry for her, but we can't. Ah, thank you, monsieur. It's time. Just on four. I must have a few words with her in a moment. A couple of things before I go. 
Do you think your employer rented another flat uh, here in Paris, I mean? I'm sure he didn't. I would have known. So, when he vanished, he vanished to the place where the lady lived or to an hotel. Did any of his ladies ever ring him here, you know? I asked our switchboard girl about that when I first became worried at his absence. There never have been any calls. So, he must have used an assumed name. A different name for a different life. It's not unusual, of course. Oh, thank you, monsieur, and I'll take myself upstairs to our Natalie. Oh, I never knew her name was Natalie all these years. Will you have a brandy, monsieur Maigret? Not at the moment, madame. Tell me, does your husband have any enemies that you know of? <laughs> Only me. What do I know of his life, Chief Inspector? Nothing. We haven't shared a bedroom since three months after our marriage. They all love him. And you hate him? Well, not really. It was just the way he is. I made a bad mistake. Are you his heir? Yes, his sole heir. If he's dead, I'm a rich woman. But why didn't you ask him for a divorce? Too lazy. Too indifferent. You don't want to drink? Cheers. Now, these clubs he visits to pick up Shall we call them his girlfriends? Do you know any of them? He's left matchboxes with the names on them lying around. Let me try to remember. Chape Beauté. Belle Alain. <laughs> the Crick Crack. Hmm? Are you sure you won't have a drink? No. What I want, madame, is a photograph, a recent one, of your husband. There's some over there, on the desk. Oh. I've been looking them out. Do you forget faces so quickly, Natalie? <laughs> I never even let them register. Not anymore. I thought you might want a picture. Oh, this one of you. When was it taken? <laughs> that. <laughs> a few weeks after we were married. I've changed, haven't I? Where do you think your marriage went wrong, Natalie? I'll take these two of them if I may. Perhaps I never understood him, so I couldn't handle him. Perhaps he was mistaken about me. In what way? He took me for a different kind of person. What did you do before you met him? I was a secretary in a lawyer's office. Maître Bernard Dajon, Vue de Rivoli. That's how I met Gerard. Gerard? My husband's name. <laughs> Didn't you know? Oh, yes, of course, but I'm trying to think of him with his other name, the one he used when he went off on his little adventures. Oh. Yes, he must have had another name. I wonder what. Where are you going to start looking? Don't you want a drink? No, thank you, Natalie. I wonder what he took you for, apart from a lawyer's secretary. Lapointe's told you about the missing solicitor, eh, jean -Vier? He has, Chief, and about the wife. The wife, yes. Now, she told me that before her marriage, she'd worked for a lawyer in the Rue de Rivoli. I called her on my way back just now. Only one old concierge could recall the lawyer. He's been dead ten years. But he told me that the lawyer only ever had one secretary, an old lady, now living in the country. And she said that's how she met her husband. Yes. I wonder why she lied. It's an unnecessary lie, Chief. Unless she has something to hide. Yes, yeah, Chandrier, it is. You know, nobody seems to like the poor bloody woman. I saw Sabin Levesque's head clerk, who obviously loathes her. Unless he's a good actor. Meaning what, Chief? Well, they could be in it together. They've had lots of opportunity, and she stands to gain a small fortune, so I gather. You think he could be her lover and the whole thing's a vast con between them? Mm, well, just keep the idea in the back of our mind, shall we? Now, one other thing. The head clerk said he spoke to our Natalie two weeks ago about his boss's long absence. She told him there was nothing to worry about yet. Hmm. Did you ask her about the conversation, Chief? No, no. If they were in it together, there'd be no point, would there? If not... <laughs> now, what do you think, Lapointe? It's, it's as if she knew something. It is, isn't it? So we have to keep an eye on her. 
Jean Vier, I'd like you to go to the Boulevard Saint Germain as soon as you can. Follow her if she leaves the house and have a car handy. I'll get somebody to take over from you later. Yes, Chief. Uh, can you give me a description? Well, she's quite tall, dark, rather thin, with staring eyes. Good looking once, but now she looks as though she's been drinking. Well dressed, good furs. I'll be on my way. At least the weather's warm. Now, you and I will visit one or two clubs tonight, La Pointe. Oh. Pick me up at 11, will you? Go home, get some rest now. Oh, right, Chief. Oh, by the way, Madame Natalie phoned while you were out. Uh -huh. What did she want? Oh, she sounded as drunk as a newt. She said she just wanted to tell you to go to hell. <laughs> Good evening, monsieur. Oh, good evening, Marco. They let you out, have they? Oh, it's you, Chief Inspector. Mm. Oh, I do wish there was more light in the club. What can I get you? A beer would be acceptable. And uh, is this young man your son, monsieur? <laughs> Inspector Lapointe, Maurice Marco. Ah, how do you do? Uh, I'd like a beer too, please. <laughs> you are on business, I take it? Mm. You know uh, this chap, by any chance? Two beers, monsieur. Oh, oh, uh, oh, allow me to put my spectacles on. Uh, take the photographs over to the light. Here's help, Lapa. Huh? Oh. How many times is it you've been taken for my son? Oh, I've ceased to be embarrassed by it, Chief. Uh, here's help. Yes. We know this gentleman is uh, Monsieur Charles, Chief Inspector. Monsieur Charles? Mm. Now, when did you last see him? I've been away for a little while. Hmm? No, Chief Inspector, not where you think. I returned to Corsica to see my old mother for the last time. Oh, I'm sorry, Marco. Uh, what do you know of Monsieur Charles? Uh, I will tell you. Not a regular. We don't see him, perhaps, for a month. Very charming, cultivated, and obviously wealthy. Martine, one of our young ladies, was supported by him for a few days. She'll be in shortly. She can tell you herself. Now, last summer, we had a very pretty girl here, Leila. She did not go with the customers, not that any of the girls are required to, you understand? Mm. Monsieur Charles offered her 10,000 francs, and when she refused, he put the price up to 15 and then 20. She refused, being Leila, but he could hardly believe it. I was watching, of course. I thought he was going to burst into tears. 20,000 francs? This was for a few days? Oh, yes, the usual two to four days. Only with Leila, he wanted to take her to a country hotel, of all places. Oh. Ah, of all places. <laughs> That's interesting. Le Point. Mm. He could be sitting in some quiet country hotel. Holding hands with his latest conquest. It's oh, a pretty picture. Something has happened. You are looking for him? Uh, he's vanished, Marco. Ah. Hadn't been seen for over a month. I wonder what his real name was. Ah, there's Martine. Martine, do come over here, my dear. Oh, hello. <laughs> Ooh, I like the young one. I think I've seen the old one. Uh, the old one is Chief Inspector Maigret. Uh, <coughs> the young one Inspector is... Inspector Lapointe, Martine. Now come and sit down. Oh, thank you. <coughs> what can I get you to drink? Uh, I have a martini, of course. A martini for martini. Oh. <laughs> Yes, I see. <laughs> well, bottoms up. Yeah. Mm. Oh. So, you're the famous Maigret. You're going to ask me some questions? Oh, go on, do. Yes, I will, Martine. Do you remember Monsieur Charles? Oh, yes. Girl doesn't forget the Monsieur Charles of this world easily, believe you me. It wasn't his real name, was it? No, it wasn't. Mm. It isn't, I mean. And what's happened to him? Yeah, I liked him. What's he done? He's disappeared. So, so these questions are serious? You could help us, perhaps. Yeah, when did he do his vanishing act, then? Well, he left home on the evening of the 18th of February. The 18th? Uh, oh, look, that's funny. Look, you, you, you won't believe me. Oh, try us, Martine. What is it? Well, all right. The 18th is my birthday. Well, that's why I remember the day and the evening. You see, I, I have a girlfriend, or, or did have, she's gone to England now, called Doreen. She came in here to see me on the 18th, you know, wish me happy birthday, give me a present. She was all dressed up, and I asked her where she was going. And she said she'd met this man, Monsieur Charles, and he was taking her off for a few days, meeting her at her club, the Crick Crack, in an hour. Well, I didn't tell her I knew Charles. 
perhaps you guessed that I did a lot of this round here. Do you know him, of course. So he met Doreen in the creek crowd. Oh, well, that's just the point. He didn't. What? She rang me the next day, awfully upset she was. Really, she was. He never turned up. Now, she waited until the club closed, but he never turned up. And he never even sent a message. Now, it was the 18th. I'm quite sure of that. So, it seems he didn't go off with any girl on the 18th. Yes, yeah, only planned to. Mm. And another martini, martini? Mm-hmm. Thank you, Monsieur. Uh, two more beers, Marco. I remember one thing. Hmm? He used to uh, walk to the club so somebody could have waited for him. Yeah, that crazy wife of his could have done anything. Oh, he told you about her, did he? Your beers, Monsieur. Oh, thank you. Martini, Martini. Mm. <laughs> <Yeah. sighs> uh, oh, bottoms up. Mm. Oh, cheers. Mm. Oh, oh, poor Charles. If anything's happened to him... I'll... Where did you stay together, Martine? Oh, my little flat. That's what he wanted. He used to talk about himself in a vague sort of way and about his wife who drank. He thought she'd grown a bit mad, but it was as if he hardly knew her anymore. He spoke of her as you do of a stranger. Was he a lonely man with that many friends? Oh, he had friends, but not in Paris. He had a house on the coast somewhere. Oh. I don't think he was lonely, not really. <laughs> he was rather like a young chap. Someone who'd never grown up in some ways. <laughs> we were like a couple of newlyweds during those four days. He, he watched me, you know, having a bath, getting dressed. <laughs> as if he'd never seen a woman before. And he, he'd, he'd lean out of the window to see me leave when I went shopping. And when I got back, I'd find the table laid. I was very considerate, just like a real sweetheart. And left, he gave me some money. It was a lot of money to me. Morning, Chief. Oh, good morning, jean I hope you're feeling better than I am. Ah, yes, Chief. I feel up once. Anything to go by? He complained I was shouting when I was only saying... I that... thought you were shouting, too. Oh. Well, never mind. I'm growing too damned old for these nightclub sessions. Come sit down. Now, how did you get on outside the Sabin Lévesque residence? Uh, nothing much until 11. I was parked about 100 metres from the house, had a good view of the entrance. She came out just after 11, wearing a mink, and from what I could see of things, a nightdress underneath. Walking uh, very stiffly, like a guardsman. Well, where was she going, for God's sake? I got out of the car and followed. She went to the phone box on the corner. She had trouble getting through, but when she did, she had a long conversation. Seven and a half minutes, to be exact. Mm. Then she marched back, rang the bell, and was immediately let in. Well, did you see who opened the door? A man, medium height, swarthy, wearing the bottom half of a uniform, I'd say. Boots, grey trousers. Oh, that will be the chauffeur. I've got his name here somewhere. Oh, Vittorio Petrini. We need to talk to him, I think. La Pointe! Oh, God, my head. <coughs> you, you called, Chief? Yes. You look terrible. I've asked for some coffee to be sent out. Look, I think a walk would do you more good than coffee. Oh. Now, go and get the Sabin Levesque chauffeur in for a few questions, will you? Yes, Chief. The chauffeur. Yes, he's called Petrini. Don't be long. Mm. Get some sleep, jean Now doze here at my desk until Paul Lapointe rounds up the chauffeur. So, Signor Petrini, tell me why your mistress went out to phone last night. Inspector, I did not know she went to phone. She says she wants to breathe the air. Yes. She tell me to wait for her at the door. Do you look after her at night sometimes? Oh, when the maid has a night out, monsieur. A night off, Petrini. Off. Oh, off. Yes, yes, yes. I have to be around in case she needs support, you see, monsieur. Mm, to carry her if she's too drunk to walk, I know. Tell me, Petrini, do you drive madame out regularly to any particular place? Oh, two or three times a week she gets me to drive her to the English pub on the Rue de Pontu. Mm. The Pickwick, I think. That in the early evening. Well, doesn't she go out in the afternoon, shopping or visiting? She goes out many afternoons, but without the car, I do not take her. Well, where does she go? Have you any idea? She leaves about uh, four o'clock to go to the cinema, her maid tells me. She comes home by taxi about uh, seven. Well, when she arrives home from these afternoons, is she very drunk? No, monsieur. Then she is sober. But she needs a little drink. Does she speak to you about things, Petrini? Ah, summertimes, when she's not a real drunk. 
and she is a crying. She say, I wonder if I can bear this uh, sort of life much longer. She's a very unhappy woman, I think. Yes, I think she is also. And Monsieur Ch Sabin Levesque, what does she say about him? Oh, she say it is all his fault. But I will not answer because of my boss, he's a good man. Do you know what has happened to him, Monsieur? Because I worry that something bad make him vanish. Mm, so do I. And on the 18th of February, when he left the house, you didn't drive him? No, Monsieur. He did not ask for me. I drove him in the morning to a client, yes. Then I not see him again. Mm, well, thank you, Signor. That's all. You've been very helpful. Yes, uh, yes. One, one thing. Don't tell Madame Sabin Levesque about the things I've asked you. Oh, I understand? Uh, no, Monsieur. I will speak only silence to her. Somehow or another, Jules, I think you were going round in circles, one clue snapping at the tail of the other. Yes, it looked like it. I sat at my desk after the chauffeur had left, thinking precisely that. Anyhow, you had established that Monsieur Charles left for a rendezvous one evening and never arrived. So it was likely that some unpleasantness had taken place. Pity. I did see him for a moment as clearing off, leaving everything, and like Gauguin, finding a southern island. I wondered about that too, but what would he have done? He didn't paint, not even as a hobby. Now, his hobbies, so far as I could tell, were restricted to one thing. As his wife's were restricted to drink. Or were they? Lots of questions buzz around her behavior, don't they? Why give herself a false past? If she thought her telephone was being tapped, she must have had a reason for thinking so. Who did she have to telephone late at night? And where did she go those afternoons when she left the house at four? We needed to find out. I had two men watching the house with instructions to follow her at all costs. And then the phone rang. It was the commissioner for the 15th arrondissement. A man's body had been fished up out of the Seine at the Quai de Carnel. Credit cards, checkbook, wallet still on him. We had found Monsieur Charles. Yes, that's him. Oh, thank you, Monsieur Le Carreur. Now, come away now. The smell, I know, is always nauseous. Poor, poor Monsieur Gerard. Have you let his wife know? I've sent Inspector Lapointe to see her and tell her. I didn't want her down here, but I needed to be quite sure it was him, so I sent for you. Did he... did he throw himself in? I mean, the most unlikely people do. No, I think he was thrown in. Now, Dr. Paul's over there. He's had a look at the body. Uh, Paul, anything to tell me? Uh, found these keys on the body. If you want them, I'll have them sterilized and sent you in the morning. Oh, thank you. That could be helpful. <laughs> do you know how he died? Somebody hit him on the head with a blunt instrument. Car jack, perhaps. Many times. His ankles are bound very tightly with wire, and probably... Yeah, on the wire was a heavy weight, you can be sure, Le Carreur. Probably it was cut away by a ship's propeller. Oh, thanks, Paul. Do let me have the keys in the board. Yes, I will. Uh, first thing. I think I need a strong drink. I don't think my stomach likes the atmosphere one bit. I know how you feel, monsieur. Now, there's a bar around the corner. I'll come with you. I'll be at Bert's bar if you want me. All right. So he was murdered. Oh, it's unbelievable. Like a... like a bad dream. Yes, he wasn't the sort of man one expected it to happen to. Poor Monsieur Charles. Uh, Monsieur who? Well, in the clubs, the girls he picked up, they knew him as Monsieur Charles. Here's the bar. You need a brandy. Uh, Chief Inspector, those keys. They're for his desk, his large mahogany desk in the flat. Ah, I was hoping they were, monsieur. I need to unlock a few further secrets. I will, of course, get a search warrant and try to keep out of Madame Natalie's way. Hmm. It's an impressive desk, Chief, isn't it? Well, this seems only to have writing paper in it. Go pen. Not very helpful. Oh, there's photos in this one. Hmm? Oh, they look interesting. Let me see. Natalie, 20 or so, with Monsieur Charles. Looked pretty, wasn't she? Hmm. Well, tarty. No. 
Charter, you said. Well, what about this? What sort of a smile is that? And uh, <laughs> little else. Natalie? What? It looks like a high-class call girl. On the back, the name Krika. A good call girl name, eh? And we know where our solicitor looked for his lady friend. Having fun? Ah, it's you, is it? Trika? Your maid has told you I hope we have a search warrant. She didn't. Why do you call me Trika? One of your jokes, is it? <laughs> Not very funny. Not all that funny, Natalie. Ah, I didn't realise what a fine garden you have here. Show her the photo, Lapointe. What a fine garden. It has the name Trika on the back, madame. It was a part I was playing in some theatrical thing. I think you were once a hostess in a nightclub, and I propose to find out unless you save me the trouble. You can go to hell. Where do you go in the afternoons, Natalie? What afternoons? Look, I haven't had your phone tapped, you know. I don't care if you have copper. Don't you? Then you must have an odd liking for phone books. At least I can be alone in them, not have coppers all over the place. Look, I'm not giving up, you know, Natalie. Oh, it's not piss off. Your husband was brutally murdered. I don't like any murder, but what was done to him is something I dislike even more. He asked for it. God, he asked for it. Well, what do you mean, Natalie? What do you mean? I'm going to have another drink. Uh, stop her, Lebrun. Uh, look, just stay still, madame. Uh, pigs! Pigs! He asked for it because he mixed with the worst riffraff in those clubs. With those women. Some pimp killed him. Some do you know how he died, Natalie? I don't care how he died. I don't want to know. Oh, clear off. Clear off. He was hit on the head with a heavy, blunt instrument. Not just once, but over and over again, until his skull was in small pieces. <laughs> hello, loved ones. What can I do for you? Oh, hello, Perry. Well, the chief wondered if anyone in the vice squad but no other club still going run by the same person as 15 years ago. And who's the photo? Well, he wondered if anybody might recognise her. Uh, look, mm, he's got a hope. It's the Sabah Lavic woman, isn't it? When young. On the game, was she? Well, we think so, but we're not sure. Look, it'll take me a year to put that photo and the name Trika through all our records. It's something the computer can't do yet. Tell the chief to go and talk to Blanche Bonnard. She's 50 now and still as sexy as she was at 30. She's had two clubs for over 15 years, and there's not a soul she doesn't know and nobody she's forgotten. Blanche Bonnard, 107 Avenue de Vagran. I suppose you've come, Chief Inspector, because of the Sabal Levesque business. Mm. I was expecting you one of these days, but I'd no idea it'd be so quick. No, please go on, Madame Bonnard. It seems I've no need to ask a single question. Do you mind if I smoke my pipe? I should expect you to, Monsieur. Thank you. When I saw that picture of Madame Sabal Levesque, I thought I recognised her from somewhere, so I went through my albums. You knew her when she was Trika? Mm -hmm. I knew her when she was called Trika. Here you are, you see, in this album. Uh, thank you, madam. Mm. That photo was taken soon after they first met. Uh. You recognise him, I'm sure. Monsieur Charles, as we knew him, as everybody knew him until the other day. Did he first meet her in your club? Yes. She could look very innocent, and she was very young. Just the sort of girl for Charles. He noticed her the moment he came in that evening, went over to her table and asked her to go off with him, but she refused. But obviously he didn't give up. He came back every evening for a week before she finally agreed. She came back a few days later to fetch her things. I asked her, madly in love, Trika. I remember that she only looked at me in reply with that funny, almost not seeing you look. And a couple of months later, I saw the marriage splashed over the papers. Now, it wasn't a happy marriage, I'm told. Charles returned to his old tricks in no time. Sad. Sad, Madame Rahn. Worse for Monsieur Charles. Ah, but she's free now and rich. Is that what's bothering you, monsieur? Was it foul play? Very. He was bashed on the head. Oh. A lot more that was necessary to kill him. Hmm, but would a woman be capable of that? Well, some women, but not her, though. She didn't do it, of that, I'm sure. But she had a hand in it. I have no evidence. But you're looking for it. 
Well, what are you going to do next? Well, she doesn't live far from here. I think I'll visit the lady. Not that it'll do any good. Somehow I can't keep away from the wretched woman. Well, you must have a glass of port before you go. No, oh, thank you, madame. I shall enjoy that. Chief Inspector, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Petrini. I'd like a few words with madame, your mistress, please. Oh, monsieur, she's not in. She go out. <laughs> I don't think so, Petrini. Tell her I shan't keep her long. Oh, she go out, monsieur. I see her go 20 minutes back. Look, Petrini, I have two inspectors watching this building. I opened the door for her 20 minutes. Jean Vier, come over here, will you? Perhaps my inspector was asleep, so we'll ask him. What is it, Chief? Neither you or Lorty have seen Madame Nathalie leave the building in the last 20 minutes, right? Ah, uh, no. Uh, the only person to go in or out has been a junior clerk through the office door. Mm. Nobody in or out from the sub on Oh, no, 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 monsieur. She lived by the garden door, like always. There is a door out from the garden? See, see, a little door in the wall onto a passage at the back which go onto the Rue de Tivoli. Madame always has the key. Mm-hmm. You'd only noticed the garden 48 hours before, I believe. Yes, it's so, Georges. A real hidden garden, but quite large. And to one side of the building, you could only see it from two windows in the flat. When I first saw it, the thought did cross my mind, but not firmly enough, obviously. So while your chaps had dutifully watched the front, Natalie had come and gone as she wished by the back. Mm. We were soon to discover where she went, by the way. You put a watch on the garden door, of course? Yes, on the principal of the stable door and the horse. Now, they saw her come back about an hour after I left. And you rushed round to ask her where she'd been? No, not this time. We'd find out, I thought, when she flitted out next time. Now, that evening, she took an overdose of sleeping tablets. But her maid found her in time, and her doctor cleaned her out. Hmm. It sounds as if something had come to a crisis. I felt that, too. The next morning, I was called in on the death of a young man in his apartment in the Rue Jean Goujon. Five bullets in the chest had killed him. Joe Fazio was his name. A barman and a pimp who'd been living in Clover for two years. And when I arrived, Dr. Paul and Lapointe were already there. See the look on his face, Megre? Yes. Absolute astonishment. He was shot point-blank with a small caliber gun five times. By somebody he knew. Hence the astonishment. Mm. Has the weapon been found, Lapointe? No, Chief. The concierge is outside. I think she can help. She's a bright little woman. I'll have her in. Do come in, madame. Chief Inspector Magray? Mm, I'm working on a hunch, madame, so I'll keep my questions to the point. Did the dead man have many visitors? Oh, no. Uh, well, just one lady. Every day? Oh, most days, monsieur. In the afternoons. Describe her to me. Oh, well-dressed. A real lady. About 40. Oh, dark and thin. Well, show her Natalie's photo, Le Point. Oh. Is this her, madame? Oh, yes. Yes, most certainly it is. And was she here yesterday afternoon? Oh, yes, monsieur, but only for a short while. I've come from the Rue Jean Goujon, Natalie. Already? Did he threaten to denounce you as his accomplice if we picked him up? No. Worse than that. He wanted money to keep quiet. Blackmail. Mm. Did you love him? I had no illusions. He was my last chance. Uh, you had to get rid of Monsieur Charles. Have you got a light? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yes, it must have been rotten. You took to the bottle. I imagine you had lovers, too. One night stand. Men I met in bars. Hotel rooms. Some offered me money. Thought I was a common tart. And then you met Joe Fazio. Two years ago. That was different. I loved him. He wanted money to keep quiet, and he was going to leave me, go back to Marseille. I couldn't bear the thought. Whose idea was it to kill your husband? 
I think we both had the idea. Joe did it. It was easy. Gerard was on his way to some girl. It was a quiet street. Joe stole a car and took the body to the Seine. What sort of life would you have led with Joe? I don't know. I never thought about it. It wasn't out of love for him that you got him to kill your husband, was it? You just wanted him dead so you'd be the undisputed mistress of the household. The rich widow. I wanted him dead. That's true. He was so childish. So selfish. You mean he was king of the castle and you counted for very little? Every single one of them hated me. Well, in spite of everything, I feel sorry for you, Natalie. I suppose you're going to take me away with you. I am. And to be honest with you, I wish I didn't have to. I'm going to have another drink. It doesn't make me drunk today. They won't let me have any in there, will they? He's being buried tomorrow, isn't he? And I'm being buried today. I'm ready when you are, monsieur. A very enigmatic lady, Jules. Or do you think that, like so many people we call enigmatic, she was always playing one of many roles? The role of a murderess? For the fun of it? Oh, I can't believe it. But she'll always remain a mystery to me. <laughs> she led me a merry dance. Up the garden and through the garden gate. Well, not only that. Mm -hmm. oh, somehow the more I questioned her, the less I knew. I think she probably used her drinking to advantage, even. Giving herself time to think. Indeed. I wonder if she hadn't shot her lover, she might have got away with it. Do you think so? Well, I doubt if we'd have been Monsieur Charles' murder on her lover. It's unlikely we'd have found any hard evidence. And yet she knew that once her lover was found shot, you'd know where to look. So she didn't care anymore? Perhaps. But she was back in the cleft stick situation, wasn't she? He'd have blackmailed her more and more. So she chanced her arm. One has to feel sorry for her, as you did. That I understand. Yes, it all went wrong. She thought marriage would be a bed of roses. But she didn't understand that Monsieur Charles couldn't and wouldn't change. And she was the last woman who should have married him. You see, in her own way, she wasn't so very unlike him. In Maigret and Monsieur Charles by Georges Simenon, translated by Marianne Alexandre Sinclair, and adapted for radio by Frederick Bradnam, Maigret was played by Maurice Denham, and Simenon by Michael Goff. La Pointe, Jean Rye, Jean Vier, Sean Barrett, Nathalie, Sheila Grant, Le Cureur, Cyril Chaps, Blanche Bonnard, Pauline Letts, Martine, Nicolette Mackenzie, Mocco, Douglas Blackwell, Petrini, Michael Goldie, Dr. Paul, Jeffrey Siegel, and the concierge, Anne Rosenfeld. The play was produced and directed by Betty Davis. Simonon's Maigret, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simonon.
needed that. Trouble, Jules? Well, not exactly. I've just come from the mortuary. A body was fished out of the Seine last night. Straightforward suicide. He's hardly a first corpse. Hardly. But you know, Georges, however many times you meet it, death remains death. You must have seen many men die. Hundreds. Any policeman doing his job gets used to that. Up to a point. Yes, I've seen men die. There's one death I remember still if I wake in the small hours. One dead man I'll never forget. Why? Because I killed him. Maurice Denham as Jules Maigret and Michael Goff as Georges Simonon in Maigret and the Hundred Gibbets, translated by Tony White and adapted for radio by Betty Davis. half-starved down-and-out who died in a cheap hotel in Bremen a very long time ago. I'll never forget him. Of course. Louis Jeunet. Oh, that wasn't his real name. I know. You still blame yourself? If only I hadn't followed him. It was an impulse. I'd finished a job in Brussels and it was a beautiful day. There was this scruffy little man in the corner of the cafe packing thousand-franc notes into a brown paper parcel. At least 30 of them. I had nothing better to do, so I followed him to the post office. Watched him write the address. Louis Jeunet, 18 Rue de la Roquette, Paris. You even remember the number? I remember everything about him. The parcel said, Printed Matter. Printed Matter. It's an odd way to describe 30,000 francs. Well, I kept on shadowing him. He went into a shop in the Rue Neuve and bought a cheap fiver suitcase. I bought another one, identical. Where did you think you were going? Oh, God knows. It seemed a good idea at the time. I followed him to his hotel. I followed him to the station. We both caught the train to Amsterdam. And then the Amsterdam Bremen Express. Yes. I sat opposite him. I couldn't make him out. He was too... Nervous, too shabby to be an international crook, and yet, and yet there were those thirty thousand francs. He left the compartment for a few minutes to go to the WC. I changed our cases over. Mine was full of old newspapers. When we got to Bremen, he spent a bit of time looking for a hotel. Couldn't find one cheap enough, I suppose. And then he booked into this dump near the station. I got the room next door. There was a communicating door. I watched him through the keyhole. He opened the suitcase, my suitcase. He stared at the old newspapers. He took a revolver from his pocket and shot himself through the mouth. Louis Genet, mechanic. 33 years of age, born Aubervilliers. That is all we know. May I see that passport, Inspector? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm. Uh, no, we don't even know that. What? No, this passport is a forgery. So, he's a man without a name. Uh, the press already have these details. They will be in tomorrow's papers. Oh, it doesn't matter. He may well have been using the name Louis Genet for some time. Look, I'd like to send copies of your photographs to Paris. When they're published, someone may recognize it. Come forward. Why was he in Bremen? Oh, an appointment, perhaps. This suitcase might tell us. Mm. Just a moment. An old suit. Hmm. Anything in the pockets? Hmm? Nothing. A suit and some dirty linen, that's all. But it's much too big. It couldn't have belonged to the dead man. Oh. 
Somebody else's suit. Now, why should he kill himself for that? The suit had not been worn for several years, at least six, maybe more. It had a name tab, Roger Moissel, Taylor, Rue Haute Souvenir, Liège. It does not appear to be the property of the dead man who was too small to wear it. Unlike his own clothing, it had no grease spots, but various tears suggested that the wearer must have been in a struggle. Finally, the most important point. The suit was badly stained with blood, human blood. The man who wore it must have been drenched in it. Um, uh, Entschuldigung. Yeah. Uh, dieser Mann Louis Jeune, der Mann, der sich gestern Abend erschossen oh, yeah, hat. Ja, yeah, da drüben. Ah, danke. Ah. Did you know him? Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, you're, you're, you're French? Yes. Are you? Um... I'm, I'm Belgian, but I've, um, I've lived in Bremen for years. Uh, no, no, I don't know him. Uh, but I read in the paper that a Frenchman had committed suicide in Bremen, so I uh, thought I'd come to the mortuary and have a look. <laughs> um, are you um, fr from the police? Yes, police headquarters. And you came to Bremen on purpose? Well, no, no, of course you couldn't have done it. It only happened last night. Do you know anyone here? No. Oh, well, perhaps I can be of some help to you. <laughs> May I offer you an aperitif? No, oh, well, thank you, Monsieur... Uh, Van Damme. Uh, Joseph Van Damme. Well, this is pleasant. <laughs> yes, do you know, I sometimes go for a month without having a chance to speak my own language. <laughs> my staff and even my secretary are German. Well, it's essential, you see, for business reasons. Oh, it can be a strain. Mm, I imagine it can. <laughs> yes. You, um, you wouldn't believe how much money these people are worth. I mean, that man at the corner table, for instance, is selling a cargo of wool. He owns 30 or 40 ships. Yeah. <laughs> mm. This beer's good here, isn't it? Yeah, very good. Um, oh, by the way, what do you make of this suicide? Was he a down and out? It's possible. Mm. Are you making inquiries about him? No, that's up to the Germans. Oh. Yes, yes, of course. Yes. Well, I only asked because he was a Frenchman. Well, look, Inspector, it's almost midday. Will you um, lunch with me? I, I, I'll have to invite you to a restaurant because I'm a bachelor, you see. But I, I try and see you had a decent meal. It was five o'clock before he let me go. I looked him up. He was born in Liège. He lived in Bremen three years, and he was doing well. How long did you stay in Bremen? Oh, I left for Paris late that night. I took both suitcases, one still holding the suit. When did you get back? The next afternoon. The Paris press had the story by then, I imagine. Yes. Yeah. So? There was a woman waiting for me in the Quai des Orfèvres. You knew this man? He was my husband. <laughs> Madame, sit down. Oh, yes, monsieur. When did you last see him? He left me two years ago. How long have you been married? Six years. And he was already called Jeune? Of course. He was a driller in a workshop. You have a family? Mm -hmm. One little boy. We live with my mother. She has a herbalist shop in the Rue Picpus. We were very happy at first, but I always felt something was wrong. Why? Well, it was almost as if Louis wasn't really our sort. As if it all got too much for him. He, he was very loving sometimes. He'd take me in his arms suddenly and hold me so close it hurt me and, and just as suddenly it, it pushed me away I... now, how did your mother get on with him she didn't like him he was too different was there anything he owned that he kept especially carefully how did you know yeah an old suit 
An old suit, I see. Did he explain? No. I, I didn't understand it. I, I went to mend that suit once. It was torn, and, and he snatched it from me. He was angrier than he'd ever been. Was he often angry? M more and more as time went on. I, I think he was ill. He was suffering, I'm, I'm sure of it. After the baby was born, he started to drink. But didn't he want the child? He was like a madman when I told him we were going to have a baby. Oh, but he loved our little boy. I, I know he did. Mm. His past, his family... I suppose he talked to you about them. Not much. Said he was an orphan. All I know is he, he was an educated man. Too educated for the work he did. The woman next door always came to him if she had a difficult letter to write. <laughs> Inspector, will he be brought back to France? I'm not sure. I know my mother wouldn't pay to bring back his body. She wouldn't even give me the money to go and see him. So I don't well, don't do. worry, madame. I will arrange for your husband's body to be brought back home. Uh, this is 18 Rue de la Roquette. Yes. Uh, Louis Journey. Uh, not here. Has he still got his room? Yes. Any letters for him? Uh, who wants to know? The police. Oh. Well, this package came yesterday. Hmm? Uh, from Brussels, yes. Did he get many parcels like this? Oh, now and then. Well, what's he done? He seemed a quiet sort of chap. Where did he work? Up the road, when he worked. Then what do you mean? Well, he was a drunk. I mean, he'd be all right for a few weeks, then he'd go on a jag upstairs and drink till he passed out, for days at a time. 28, 29, 30. It's all there. The 30,000 francs that started me off following him. Better give the numbers to the Belgian police. Maigret. Greens for you, Chief Inspector Maigret. Now put them through. Chief Inspector Maigret. Yes? Yeah? I own the Café de Paris, Rue Carnot Reims. It's about the man who shot himself in Bremen. I saw his picture in the paper. Oh, do you know him? Well, no, uh, not exactly. But he was in here six days ago. I remember him because I refused to serve him. He was drunk. Ah, oh, thank you. I'd like to talk to you. I'll be in Reims tonight. Yes, yes, he was here. White as this tabletop. I didn't like the way he was staring. I told him I couldn't give him any more. He couldn't make a fuss. He had an old suitcase with him. When he went out... It burst open and some old clothes fell onto the floor. Anyone else here? Yes, sir. Uh, those people that playing billiards at the third table. The regulars. I'd better tell you the whole story, even though it doesn't sound very likely. The next day, a commercial traveller, another regular, told me he'd seen the drunk at one in the morning. It was Monsieur Belvoir. They both went into Monsieur Belvoir's house. Who's Monsieur Belvoir? Oh, uh, that's the tall, fair man playing billiards. Where does he live? Well, five minutes away. The Rue de Verne. He's vice chairman of the Banque de Crédit. Mm. I'm afraid I'm calling rather early, oh, but Oh, no. I... The other gentlemen are here. They're expecting you. Oh. This way, sir. What is it? Monsieur? Uh, well, 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 fancy meeting you here. Monsieur Van Damme. Uh, yes. Why didn't you tell me in Bremen that you knew Belois? <laughs> yes. 
You know, we, we could have travelled together. I had a, a telegram calling me to Paris on business, so I, I took the chance to come up here and say hello to Belois. Mm. Well, forgive me for disturbing you, <laughs> Monsieur Belois. I know you're expecting someone else. I am, but how did you know that? Well, your maid thought I was expected. I'm not, so somebody else must be. Who are you? The Chief Inspector Maigret, Police Headquarters. You may have seen me last night in the Café de Paris. I was making some inquiries about a case. Well, surely not the Bremen affair. That's precisely what it is. Monsieur Belois, would you look at this photograph? Hmm? Uh, did you bring that man here one night last week? No, I don't know. Or didn't he speak to you when you were coming back from the Café de Paris? What are you talking about? Uh, that evening a drunk left the Café de Paris shortly before you. Everyone noticed him. When you left, he came up to you in the street. Oh, I think I remember. He asked me for a light. And you came back here with him? <laughs> Certainly not. I'm not in the habit of picking up tramps. Then you came home alone? Of course. Was the drunk the man in the photograph? <laughs> I don't know. I didn't even look at him. Oh, well, then I'll apologise and go, Monsieur Belois. Oh, no, 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 just a minute. D don't rush off, Inspector. Um, uh, Belois has some splendid old liqueur brandy. But you, he and I have known each other for years. We were students together. Mm -hmm. In Liège? Uh, yes. Yes, well, it's nearly ten years since we met, and uh, now he's married, he's got a little boy. <laughs> Haven't you finished with your suicide yet? Well, my inquiries have only just begun. Ah, this must be your other guest. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Monsieur Benoit. It's all right. I know the way. Hello. Were you... Were you expecting me? Jeff Lombard, friend. Chief Inspector Maigret, police headquarters. Oh, good. Good. Fine. It's another Belgian inspector. It's a real Belgian reunion. Uh, Lombard is the only one who still lives in Liège. <laughs> well, look, you missed the dinner I wanted to give you in Bremen. How about lunching with us later on? Mm, no, thank you. There are some things I have to do. I won't ask you if you know this man, Monsieur Lombard, oh. because that would be too extraordinary a piece of luck. I... I don't know him. Mm. When are you going back to Paris, Inspector? I don't know yet. Well, my apologies, gentlemen. Good morning. Ah, Inspector! Mm. <laughs> Lunching here all on your own? So that's what you meant by things to do. Monsieur Van Damme. <laughs> yes, let me get you a liqueur. Um, oh, waiter? Sir? Uh, Armagnac, Inspector? No, thank you. Yes, uh, two, um, uh, let's see, uh, 1867 Armagnac. Uh, and balloon glasses, please. <laughs> Look, I've, um, I've hired a car to take me back to Paris. Let me give you a lift. Well, thank you, but I... Uh, Chief Inspector Magray. Hmm? Paris is on the line for you. Oh, uh, excuse me. Oh, certainly, certainly. It, it's settled then. I'll, I'll give you a lift back. Uh, delighted to be of help. Maigret speaking. Chief Inspector, we've heard from Brussels about those thousand franc notes. Yes? They were issued to Louis Genet by the Banque Générale de Belgique in payment of a cheque signed Maurice Belois. It's very odd. Meeting friends again after all these years. Mm, not for ten years, you say? Yes, yes. I don't want to run them down, but um, that stifling provincial atmosphere. <laughs> Mind you, Belois has done pretty well for himself. And Jeff Lombard? Oh, splendid chap. He wanted to be a painter, you know, but he, f he finished up a, a photo engraver. Married. Two children. One more on the way. <laughs> Hello. What, what's wrong? Hmm? Oh, dear me. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, monsieur, we've got a puncture. Oh, that's a nuisance. I do apologise, Inspector. Hope you didn't want to get back to Paris urgently. No, that's all right. Hmm. How long will it take? Oh, about a quarter of an hour. Oh, that's not too bad. Well, well let's go out and stretch our legs. Now, what river would that be? Uh, the Marne. It's in flood. Hmm. The waters are very high. Yes. We don't make enough use of water power, you know. There's a, a, a dam in the Ukraine. <laughs> look, look out, you nearly had me in. <laughs> what the hell? 
You push me, you try to kill me. Well, get up. I'll deny it. No, get back to the car. I'm taking you to police headquarters in Paris. Well, now, Monsieur Van Damme, how did you come to know the Bremen suicide? In what capacity am I here? You refuse to answer my question? I know the law as well as you. If you're charging me, I won't answer till I see the warrant for my arrest. And if you're not charging me, I don't have to say anything. Now, I told you, I'll deny everything that happened on the towpath. <laughs> what have you got against me? You showed me a photograph of a man I don't know. He killed himself. Now, everyone knows that. Why are you following it up? There's been no crime. You're quite free. What? You're free. I may add I'm prepared to return your kindness and invite you to dinner. Oh. Uh, can I go back to Bremen? Why not? What do I owe you for the car? <laughs> Nothing. Mm. Four. Four. Uh, Luca, that man who's just left me, follow him. To the ends of the earth, if necessary. Luca lost him, didn't he? Well, he couldn't help it. Van Damme went straight to the station and caught the 619 to Liège. Oh, I cursed. I'd just decided to go there myself. But I was pretty sure Van Damme knew it. He seemed to be getting under my feet on purpose. At this stage, you had no idea what was coming. Well, as far as I can remember, none. I had to find all the answers. It was a kind of... Expiation. Mm. If you like, yes. <laughs> Van Damme's transformation was almost funny. There wasn't a trace left of the effusive, confident businessman. You know, all the time I was talking to him, I was making a list in my mind, an odd sort of list. What was it? The children. There seemed to be so many children involved. The little boy in the Rue Picpus, for one. Yes. Another little boy in Belois' house in Reims. And Jeff Lombard's two children in Liège. With a third on the way. Yes, third on the way. I had to go to Liège and see Lombard. But before I left Paris, I found out something. I recognised the photograph in the paper at once. Uh, but his name isn't Louis Jeunet. He's my brother, Jean. Hmm. And you are... Uh... Armand Lecoq d'Anville. Um, I've brought my papers. Yeah. Or in the age, 35 years of age. Hmm. Mechanic, hmm? Uh, well, I, I, I'm a messenger now. Um, I've done a bit of everything. Including time, I see. Yes. I, I deserted from the army when I was serving abroad. I was only 16, and there was an amnesty later anyway. I haven't seen Jean for years. Uh, but that's him, all right. What was he like? Well, he was the steady sort. I'm the failure. I've been stupid. But Jean, he won a scholarship, went on to college and then university. I, I, I left home then. Have you heard from him recently? No. I was told he left the age ten years ago. Are you quite sure he killed himself? Quite sure. Oh, he had such promise. I can't believe he went the same way as me. He had the same meek, worried eyes as his brother. He sat there, screwing up his cap in his hands, anxious and defeated. I could hardly bear to look at him. I took the night train and arrived in Liège at six in the morning. By nine o'clock, I was ringing the bell of a house in the Rue Or Chateau. There was a zinc plaque on the wall. Central photo engraving. Jeff Lombard. Give it a push. It's open. Monsieur Lombard? He's um, in the office with the, with the gentleman. There, that way. First door on the left. Who is it? Oh. Uh, may I come in? 
Ah, good morning, Monsieur Van Damme. I thought I might find you here. Morning. What can I do for you? Well, I just want a little information, Monsieur Lombard. I'm sorry to disturb you. I'd like to know if a few years ago you knew a certain Jean Lecoq d'Anville. Well? I, I think I've heard the name before. He's from Liège, isn't he? Yes. I don't know what became of him so long ago. Jeff! Quick! Quick, Jeff! What? It's, it's arrived. What? A girl. Hurry. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, of course. We were left alone. And Dammer lit a cigar, tried to ignore me. I ignored him with less effort. The walls of that office were pretty remarkable. The hanging men. Yes, the hanging men. It comes straight out of Francois Villon. Mm. Ballad of the Hanging Man. There was a quotation from it written under one of the drawings. There must have been hundreds of them. Sketches, paintings, watercolours. And nearly all were variations on the same subject. A hanged man. One swung from a gibbet where an enormous crow perched and brooded. There was a forest landscape with a hanged man swinging from the branch of every tree. Some of the men were in 16th century costume. There was one hanged lunatic in top hat and tail swinging from a lamppost. But most of them hung from a church steeple. And the church was always the same. You must forgive me. I've just had a daughter. I'm so sorry to leave you. No, I had plenty to look at. Your paintings? Oh, Youthful indiscretions. They're very bad. But at the time, I thought I'd be a great artist. Uh, the church, is it in Liège? It's been gone for seven years. It was demolished to build a new one. What was its name? The Church of saint Folia. The new one has the same name. Were you married when you painted these? Oh, no, I was 19 and studying at the academy. It was ten years ago. Will you have a drink? Oh. Yes. Oh. Got some gin here. We must drink my daughter's health. Mm. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, Inspector. Thank you. Joseph. Yeah, thank well, you. to your daughter. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> forgive me for coming back to business, but you said you knew Jean Lecoq d'Anville. A casual acquaintance, nothing more. I'm sorry, I can't help you further. The suit had not been worn for several years. At least six, maybe more. It's nearly ten years since we last met. And now he's married and got a little boy. I was told he left Liège ten years ago. I was 19 and studying at the academy. It was ten years ago. These are the files you wanted, Inspector? Mm, all the ten-year-old issues of the paper. Hmm? Well, actually, I brought you all the copies of the Meuse News, nine, ten and eleven years old. Hmm. I hope you find what you want. Thank you. Hmm. That's odd. Something wrong? Oh, look, these pages have been torn out. How extraordinary. February the 15th, all the news for that day is gone. Did anyone call this morning before me? Well, uh, yes. Who? Only Monsieur Van Damme. You're the second visitor asking to see the police reports in 24 hours. Who else has been here? Oh, uh... Chap from here who's done all right for himself abroad. Joseph Van Damme. Oh, right. But he couldn't find what he wanted. Oh. Oh. There's a report missing. Oh? Hmm. Yeah, let me have a look. Oh, you're quite right. There's no report 240. Well, I'm damned. I should like to see the town clerk. It's urgent. Certainly, Chief Inspector. Ah, oh, good morning, Monsieur Van Damme. Can I help you? Um, it's nothing. I'll I'll come back. This way, Chief Inspector, maybe. The mayor's copies of the police report. Thank God I got here first, Holmes. And Damme must be cursing. Ah, February the 15th. Hmm. Hmm. Police Constable Lacasse of Number 6 Division was going on duty at 6 o'clock this morning. 
when he observed a body hanging from the door knocker of the main door to the church of Saint Folion. The dead man was Emile Klein, a house painter, twenty years of age, living at number seven, Rue Potonnoir. Yes, can I help you? Hmm, did someone called Klein once live here? Yeah, upstairs over the workshop. First floor, you can't miss it, it's the only door. A few steps up, the banisters were missing. There was no light and I could barely see. At the top, I struck a match. The door had no lock or handle. It was held to by a string tied to a rusty nail. I felt for my revolver and pushed open the door. I was dazzled by light streaming through a broken stained glass window. On the floor were new unfinished chairs, glue, broken saws and other bits and pieces from the workshop. But there were other things too. An incomplete skeleton had been flung down on an old mattress. There was a Bible with a damaged cover. And on the wall there was a painted slogan, The Companions of the Apocalypse. And there, in the corner, in the middle of all this rubbish, was that well-shaved, well-dressed businessman from Bremen, Joseph Van Damme. Well, we were bound to end up here, weren't we? Uh, how much? Hmm? What do you mean? F Fifty thousand francs. Hundred. Uh, Two hundred thousand. Well, there's still time. You're not on official business. Here, give me a month, Inspector, please. In other words, it happened in December, hmm? What? It's November now. In February, it'll be ten years since Klein hanged himself. But you're only asking for a month. I don't understand. Oh, you understand all right. If it were Klein's death that was worrying you. If, for instance, he'd been murdered, the time limit wouldn't come into force till February, ten years after his death. But you're only asking for a month. So it happened in December. You won't find anything. And why are you so frightened? Good evening, Monsieur Belvoir. You're alone. Jeff's coming. How is he? Like a madman. I tried to calm him down, but he got away. Has he got a gun? Did you all agree to offer me money? Yes, I see you did. And if I refused it, what were you going to do? Jeff! Drop that gun! No! Go away, damn you! Go away! Drop it! I can't! I can't! Oh, God, to come to this! Tell me about it. Destroyed in a few days. It took me ten years to build up my life. I married. I worked to give my family a decent life. You saw it, but you didn't see how I'd worked, how I'd tried. Now it's all gone. The Companions of the Apocalypse. Was that the name of your gang? Yes. Uh, tell me what happened ten years ago. I was at the academy. So was little Emil Klein. We all fancied ourselves in those days. Big hats, flowing cravats. We all thought we were Rembrandt. There were six of us. The others were students. Belois, Van Damme. And Lecoq d'Anville. Oh, that's only five. The sixth was Mortier. Who was Mortier? His father owned a butcher's shop. He had more money than the rest of us. We were all about twenty. Van Damme was the oldest of us. He was twenty-two. 
We used to talk our heads off and drink till we felt we were real geniuses. We used to plan the future. Lecoq d'Anville was to be a Tolstoy. Fandama was to revolutionise political thought. We were all poets, painters, future heads of state. And we drank our wine from that skull. Look at us now. I'm in business. Belois in a bank. Jeff's a photo engraver. Klein hanged himself on a church door. Lecoq shot himself in Bremen. And Mortier? Mortier was never really one of us. Why? Oh, he was rich and he was mean. He didn't drink, and when we got drunk he looked disgusted. He came here out of sheer curiosity. I think he loathed us, really. And we loathed him. When Klein got drunk, he used to attack Mortier. And what was Mortier's reaction? Contempt. I can't remember when we first began to talk about death. Somebody quoted the Mandarin problem. You know, if all you had to do was press a button and kill a rich Mandarin in China to become his heir, would you do it? It was just before Christmas. We had to be different, and we seized on this new idea. What is death, after all? If life's nothing but chance, a skin disease on the Earth's crust... Would you dare kill? When Klein was drunk, he yelled yes. We felt we were on the brink of the abyss. But it was all just talk. Nobody got killed that night. Then when? Christmas Eve. We'd been drinking and singing. We were all half tight. Klein, the worst of the lot. <laughs> Listen, all of you! L Listen to me! Shut up, Emil! Do you think I could kill? Let's get some more bottles. Good idea! You, you don't believe me! You, you don't think I could? I want another drink. Somebody's got to go out and get him! Oh, who's, who's going to get Ah, oh, Mortier! Good God, what a mess. Oh. Go and get us some drink. Ah, oh, you're yeah. drunk already, my friend. Who cares? Get us some more drink, damn you. I simply came in to say hello. You came to have a look. Yes. Uh, now you can fetch us some bottles. Yeah. You're yeah. a drunken pig, Klein. So? The pig says fetch some more bottles. <laughs> <laughs> it's all you're good for, parasite. <laughs> oh, you're being a bore. It was much more amusing with the stuffy crowd I left at home. Oh, oh, oh. Fetch oh, us oh, some oh, drink. Yes. Some drink! Get, get away, you wretched little sot! <laughs> hey, watch out! He's got a knife! <laughs> oh, my God! Blood was pouring from a hole in Mortier's shirt front. But he wouldn't die. And he had a gun in his pocket. He was trying to get at it. Someone tried to grab the gun. He slipped in the blood and they rolled together on the floor. The other fellow must have gripped Mortier's throat. In any case, he hadn't long to live. I got in an awful mess. Then it was you? Yes. I had my hands round his throat. I wore that suit. What did you do with the body? The Meuse was in flood. We threw it in the river and saw it swept away. It was never found. People thought Mortier had run away. Klein wanted to give himself up. We had to stop him. Two months later, he killed himself. The suit? Van Damme went and fetched me some clothes. I left the suit in the studio. Did you all meet again? No. One by one we left Liege, all except Jeff. I stayed on. Drawing hanged men and church steeples. When did you see Lecoq again? Two years ago. It was very unexpected. He turned up at the house. With the suit. To blackmail you? Yes, but not in the usual way. He demanded money, but he never used the notes. He burned them. Can you understand that? He burned them. He thought I'd forgotten, but he was wrong. I simply wanted to live. Had he changed? In many ways, no. He had stayed still. But his life had changed. He told me he hadn't opened a book since it happened. He'd changed his name. He'd become a manual worker. He'd married. He said he adored his wife. But he'd left her. Because when he was with her, he felt he was stealing. Stealing what? Happiness. It started as a game. A kid's game. But it wrecked our lives. I didn't understand at first why he'd come. And then I found out. He looked at my house, my family... My bank? He thought it his duty to destroy it all. He was the avenging angel. He went from one to another of us with that old suit. My house is mortgaged. 
My wife's dowry is gone. She doesn't know, but there isn't a penny left. And he burned the money. He burned it. Then the other day, Van Damme wired us that he was dead. We all arranged to meet. And then you walked in. Ten years ago, immediately after the thing, I could have accepted it. But ten years of life, of effort, of struggle. And now I've got a wife and children. I think I could have pushed you into the Marne, too. Because in less than a month, in 24 days, the time limit expires. And we're safe. It's getting dark. I must go. What? I'm expected in Paris. Goodbye, gentlemen. So you let them go? I let them go. There were five children involved. <sighs> you know, ten more cases like that and I'd have left the force because it would prove there's a god up there doing our job for us. Ten. I shouldn't worry. There won't even be one. In May Gray and the Hundred Gibbets, by Georges Simenon, translated by Tony White, and adapted for radio by Betty Davis. Maigret was played by Maurice Denham, and Simonon by Michael Goff. Joseph Van Damme, Andrew Sachs, Maurice Belloir, John Pullen, Jeff Lombard, Geoffrey Beavers, Madame Jeunet, Nicolette Mackenzie, Armand, Geoffrey Collins, Emile Klein, Michael Harbour, Willy Mortier, Paul Meyer. Other parts were played by Rod Beecham, Douglas Blackwell, Walter Hall, Bruce Beebe, Jonathan Scott, Michael Goldie, Irene Sutcliffe, and Anne Rosenfeld. The play was produced and directed by Betty Davis. Simonon's Maigret, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simonon. Georges, you've forgotten. Well, I certainly didn't go to St. Andre sur Mer for oysters. I have not forgotten. No, everybody forgets at our age. Without the possibility of stuffing yourself with oysters, would you have taken leave to investigate a minor petty affair? But the, the death of an old woman, a petty affair. Which could have been dealt with competently by the local police. And the white wine in that part of the country is very, very good. Oh, my God. Let's go over it. Let me tell you why I went. <laughs> Maurice Denham as Jules Maigret and Michael Goff as Georges Simonon in Maigret Goes to School, translated by Daphne Woodward and adapted for radio by Edward Bruce. Joseph Gaston was shown into my office. It was a wonderful day. You told me that before. Oh, good. Now, he was a grey-faced man with unnaturally bright eyes. He was in quite a state. For some reason, he expected me to know why he was there. So they must be thinking I ran away. But if I were guilty, I wouldn't be here now. Uh, I don't follow you. Uh, guilty of... Guilty of killing Leonie Birard. Mm. That's why I've come to you. 
I've read a lot about you. I, I know that you were born in the country. You'll understand these people. Although I've lived there for seven years, I'm the schoolmaster. I'm from Paris, still an outsider. That's why they don't like me. You understand? Yes, I do. Now, this woman, Leonie Bira. She used to be the postmistress. Saint Andre, that's the village I come from, is about nine miles northwest of La Rochelle. You'll need to know the layout. As in most villages, the school is just behind the mairie. I live on the other side of the courtyard, and beyond the school playground there are gardens and the backs of several houses, including Leonie Biraz. She was 66. Well, how do you know that? I'm secretary of the mairie, so I know everyone's exact age. She was a very unpleasant woman. In what way unpleasant? She hated everybody. Even her niece, who's married to Julien Cellier, the ironmonger, who is also the village policeman. When was she killed? It was on Tuesday. The police believe between 10 and 11 in the morning. But she wasn't discovered dead until early in the afternoon, about 2 o'clock, by Maria, a Polish woman who chars for her. We were in class at the time, and we heard her shrieks across the courtyard as she called for help. Did you go and help? No, no, I didn't leave the classroom. I didn't think it necessary. I saw people hurrying towards her house, and a few minutes later, Dr. Bressel's car. Some people are saying that I didn't go because I, I knew what they'd find. Well, please go on. Well, just as class was finishing, a police inspector from La Rochelle came to the school. He'd already questioned a number of people, and he told me that Mayor Bira had been... Uh, Killed with a point two two rifle. With that what? Yes, that is extraordinary, isn't it? I understand you'd be lucky to kill a sparrow with one of them. Oh, indeed you would. Do you own a weapon like that? No, but he'd been told that my son, Jean-Paul, did. He's 13. And quite a few of the other children have them, too. Unfortunately, I... Hmm? Unfortunately? When he asked me where it was, I, I said it was in my son's room. We went over to my house. It... It wasn't in Jean-Paul's room. It, it was in my tool shed. Mm. It appeared with what I said later that I'd, I'd lied. Uh, what did you say later? He asked me if I'd left the classroom that morning. I said no. And you had? Yes, for about ten minutes, just after the morning break. I, I'd answered without thinking. Now that'd be between ten and eleven. Yes, somewhere around the time when it's assumed Leonie Bira was killed. One of the farmers had come to the school to ask me to sign a paper he needed to draw his pension. It had to be stamped. The stamp was in the mairie. It was more or less routine. I didn't attach any importance to it. But it looked as if I'd lied intentionally. Now, I don't understand how a point two two could kill her. Could raise a flesh wound, perhaps, but no more than that. I understand the shot went into her head through her left eye and flattened against the skull. I see. Oh, is there anything else you want to tell me? No, I... Oh, yes, I, I keep forgetting the unimportant things. When I was coming back from the mairie, I went over to my house for a quick cup of coffee. I sometimes do that if I think the class is behaving itself. Mm. If I'm not mistaken, the oysters from your part of the world enjoy a very high reputation, hmm? Yes, yes, they do. And the white wine? It's very drinkable. Good. Ah, uh, I told you. You went to Saint-André for wine and oysters. Now, if it pleases you to think that, Georges, but you're quite wrong. Well, Gaston interested me. There was something about him which made me believe what he said. I rang the constabulary at La Rochelle. I got onto the inspector who'd questioned Gaston. A nice, cooperative man. An inspector, um... Daniel Lou. That's something else I remember. Uh, yes, yes, that was his name. Now, he was astounded when I told him I had the schoolmaster in my office. I told him that I was bringing Gaston back to Saint-André personally. You're bringing him back? Uh, yes, yeah, seems the best thing to do. Uh, oh, yes, of course. Um, I should tell you I'm holding a warrant for his arrest. Mm. I've just heard a damaging piece of evidence against him. Oh, who from? One of his pupils. Oh, then I'm right to bring him back. Mm. You may be sure that I shan't dream of interfering in any way in your investigation. Mm -hmm. Oh, is there an inn at St. Andre? Yes, the Bon Coin. The food's good, but the rooms don't have running water. Oh, that'll do. If you could book me a room. Yeah, of course. Ah. Delighted to see you, Chief Inspector. Uh, thank you, Inspector. 
I hope the examining magistrate doesn't object because I'm here in an unofficial capacity. On the contrary, he's delighted to have your help. Monsieur Joseph Gesta, whom you met. Yes. Huh. No, I don't think handcuffs will be necessary. Oh, um... Oh, yes, you're right. <clears throat> My apologies, monsieur, but uh, I think you'll be safer in the prison at La Rochelle. You know how people react in small towns and villages. And as things now stand, I can't do anything other than arrest you. Chief Inspector said you had some damaging evidence against me. Yeah. One of the boys? Uh, yes, you didn't tell me much on the phone, Inspector. What did the boy say? Uh, uh, should I tell you now? Why not? Well, this boy, Marcel Cellier, says that he saw Monsieur Gaston coming from his tool shed and not from his house, as he told us. What? I was never near my tool shed on Tuesday morning. He swears he saw you from the classroom window. But the boy's lying. Oh, that's something we've got to try and find out, isn't it? I'll do my best for you. I hope you won't be too uncomfortable in the La Rochelle prison. Oh, God. Did you book me a room, Inspector? The, uh... Uh, the bonquin, yes. Mm. Um, I'll see you in the morning at the mairie. I won't get back tonight. Fine. Oh, the sea air is marvellous after Paris. Mm. In a way, I feel I'm on holiday. <laughs> well, I'm damn sure I don't. <coughs> that was tactless of me. Will my wife be able to visit me? Oh, I'm sure she will. But who knows? You may be released by tomorrow. Now, shall I take a taxi or walk to the Bon Coin? Oh, you can see it from here. It's only about 400 metres. <laughs> oh, famous inspector. Hope the water wasn't too cold. Well, well, let me make amends. What would you like? Will you join me? No, thank you. I hear your local white wine is excellent. Uh, uh, Louis. Everybody calls me Louis. Uh, You're here because of the uh, Leonie business. Uh, I should have thought that was obvious. Uh, uh, thank you. Sunday. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the uh, schoolmaster. Is he guilty? I wouldn't know. Hmm. There's a man here who heard the shot. Yeah. You heard the shot, didn't you, Tao? What? Yes, he's a deputy mayor. <laughs> Not that anything he says is much good. He's usually half drunk by 10.30 in the morning. Hey, how are you now? What do you want, Louis? This is Chief Inspector Magre, a very bright inspector from the big city. She's come to pin the murder of that hag on one of us. Nastiest <laughs> bitch on earth. Ah, oh, she isn't on earth now. <laughs> She's the most unpleasant woman I've ever known. Uh, well, tell the inspector what you saw. Well, nothing, except Teo planting onions. I brought him a letter. Hmm? Oh, I've got to get back to me cars. Yeah, when was that? About ten o'clock. I don't remember. <laughs> Sociable fellow. <laughs> if Tao was planting onions, I'd be surprised. He keeps a keg of wine in his um, gardening shed. And when he says he's gardening, he's gone to tap the barrel. He's usually half cut by ten. And if he had seen anything, he probably wouldn't say so. Even if he saw someone firing the shot? All the more reason to keep quiet. <sighs> Afraid you don't understand country people, Inspector. I was born in the country. Now, can I get something to eat? Oysters, perhaps? I'm afraid not. There's a neap tide, so nobody goes out for mussels or oysters. Yes, I do know that. Uh, some fresh fish, perhaps. There's a splendid cook. Oh, well, yes. I'd have preferred... And fish will go well with your white wine. Fresh? Fish for the chief inspector? Sorry about the oysters. Mm. I said I was born in the country, I think. I hope I still understand village people there. Like a family. Joseph Gaston is... An outsider. Yes. You think he killed Leonie Birard? The villagers all want it to be him. And there's his wife. The villagers despise her. Oh, why? What has she done? Oh, nothing here. No, it was what happened in Courbevoie a few years ago. It appears that she and one of the local councillors, uh, Monsieur Chivassou, having fun and games together, and Madame Chivassou found out about it and shot Madame Gaston in the shoulder. Madame Chivassou was acquitted. After that, the Gastons developed a hankering for country air and came here. And for that she's despised. Extraordinary. Thought you said you understood country people. Gaston's a cuckold. 
Now, mind you, he's not the only one. The village is full of them. <laughs> now, who stood to benefit from the old lady's death? Mm, some charity, perhaps. They say she disinherited her niece when she married Celia. Or the village policeman. That's right. Or perhaps a char. Maria, the Polish woman, I don't know. Ah! Your fish, Chief Inspector. Hope you enjoy it. I'm sure I shall. And you're right, the white wine is excellent. So you see, Georges, no oysters. But the fish was good. I arranged to be woken at eight o'clock the next morning. <laughs> the coffee was filthy, but relief was at hand. An hour or two later, I went round to see the village doctor. And he offered you a very good bottle of red wine at ten o'clock in the morning. Mm. When you told me I was appalled, you drink too much, Jules. We all do. Another glass, Chief Inspector. No, I'm not going to refuse. <laughs> How did Madame Gaston get on with Leonie Bira? Oh, as far as I know, they never saw each other except through their windows. Leonie used to poke out her tongue at her now and then, as she did with everyone. A disgusting old woman. Yes, you're not a villager. You don't like them. Oh, don't be stupid. <laughs> I love them. They're all crazy. And although I'm a townsman, I'm accepted. I'm happy here. Yeah, unlike Joseph Gaston. Oh, he's a pathetic man. He's always trying to do his best. It's an odd remark. <laughs> oh, it seems reasonable to me. Do gooders are such boring people. And there's his wife, an insignificant little woman. <laughs> that affair in Courbevoie was the one moment of passion in her life. Mm. Do you think her affair has anything to do with the death of Leonie Bira? Oh, now you're the detective, not me. <laughs> now, uh, I have an exceptional little wine in my private bin. So I went to see Madame Gaston. She was, as Dr. Bressel suggested, an insignificant little woman. And she was riddled with guilt. I blame myself for what happened. If it hadn't been for... For what happened in Courbevoie? You know about it? Everybody knows about it, madame. Oh, I've ruined his life. I'm doing my best to make up for it. I, I try so hard. Joseph's an exceptional man. People thought so well of him in Courbevoie. But because of me, we had to come here. For the first few years, it, it seemed as if everything would be all right. And, and then they found out about... about... How did they find out? That dreadful old woman, I suppose. She spied on everybody, opened our mail, talked... Mm. Did your husband have any arguments with her? Oh, quite often. A secretary of the mairie. In our early days here as postmistress, she had often to consult him. Joseph's strict. He refuses to go beyond his duty. He'll never sign a certificate just to please someone. How did you get on with her? Oh, she made filthy remarks when I went past her house. And you resented that? Oh, naturally. And... And once... When she saw me near her window, she... She turned round and pulled up her skirts. Did your husband know that she'd insulted you in this way? Oh, yes. Ah, uh, no. I see what you mean, but he would never have thought of killing her. He's the most gentle person, thoughtful and considerate. Did you know that Jean-Paul should be head of the class? But Joseph always marks his papers low so that he's not accused of favouritism. Jean-Paul's an exceptionally talented boy. Oh, it's rather hard on Jean-Paul. Yes, I suppose it is, but he understands. How does he get on with the other boys? He used to play with them when we first came here. But not anymore. Not since the village became openly hostile towards us. So he knows about Corbois? As much as a boy of 13 could know and, and understand. How did he find out? The same way as the other villages, through gossip started by Leonie Bira. Mm. You seem to have had good reason for hating her. Yes. Is your son at home? Yes, he is. I thought it better not to send him to school for the moment. 
Although they've sent a relief teacher from La Rochelle. I'd like to have a word with him. Well, uh, yeah, yes. Uh, Jean-Paul? Yes, Maman? Coming! Uh, this is Chief Inspector Megre. He'd like a word with you. Uh, sit down, Jean-Paul. Well, uh, you're, uh, you're not frightened of me. I'm not frightened of anybody. Good. Now, uh, Tuesday morning, the day before yesterday, what happened after break? Nothing. Oh, think again. Your father left the schoolroom just after break. Did he come here? I don't know. And one of your school friends said he did. I haven't any friends. Haven't you? I'm the schoolmaster's son. Jean-Paul, I know your father left the classroom about 10.15. Did he come here? I don't know. When he leaves the classroom, do the boys begin jumping up, chattering, playing up? I don't know. Well, of course they do. All boys do. Then why did you ask if you know? Who went to look out of the window? I don't know. Now listen to me, young man, you... You want your father to come out of prison, don't you? Yes. Yes, then perhaps you could try and be more helpful. Oh, you mustn't be angry with him, Chief Inspector. Mm. Yesterday he was questioned for over an hour. I... I don't know anything. I, I didn't see anything. I have nothing to tell you. 13A. It's quite an ordeal for a youngster. I should probably call again, Madame Gaston. I left the Gaston house and walked over to the mairie. Daniel was questioning the Polish char. I listened. I didn't want to interfere. She had a baby in her arms. You say she promised to leave you all she had, including the house? Yes, she promised. When did she give you this promise? Oh, I don't know. A long time ago. After my second baby, I think. How many children have you? Oh, uh, five. Uh, uh, two at uh, school, is a baby here and two at home. <laughs> Who's looking after them? Nobody. No! No, shut up or I smack you! Here. Hmm. Um, did Leonie Bira sign a paper about you? I don't know. Why do you think she made you such a promise? Maybe to annoy her niece when she married Monsieur Cellier. She was furious about it. Mm. Monsieur Cellier was going to summon her for throwing rubbish out of the window, throwing things at the people passing mm. by. Uh, Cellier is the local policeman. Yes, so I understand. Uh, oh, smoke your famous pipe if you want to. Oh, perhaps not with the baby. Mm. Uh, do you mind if I ask you a question, Maria? Is Theo, the deputy mayor, the father of one of your children? I don't know. He could be. I, I'm not sure. And he knew that the old lady had promised to leave you something in her will. Well, of course, I told him. And he told me to ask her for a paper. And did you? Yes. But she said everything was arranged. I didn't find anything among her papers, oh. Chief Inspector. Mm. I knew she'd treat me. <coughs> oh. oh, do be quiet. <coughs> Uh, would you say that she was hated? Hated enough for someone to kill her? Well, somebody must have thought she's dead. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Maria. You've been very helpful. Now I think you should get back to your other children. Oh, I knew you cheat me. <sighs> now you can smoke your pipe. No paper, no will. Mm -hmm. I telephoned a solicitor in La Rochelle with whom Mademoiselle Bira deposited some securities. Mm. He told me she often talked of making a will, but hadn't done so. So, if nothing's found, her niece will get the lot. Mm, looks like it. But, oh, here, you'd better have a glance at these. Mm? Not that they'll provide any clues, as far as I can see. I found them in her house. None of these are addressed to Leonie Bira. <laughs> 
<laughs> Some of them ten or twelve years old. Yeah, heritage from her days as postmistress. It appears they were not always delivered. That's why she was detested by everyone in the village. She knew too much about them. Yeah, prying old busybody. Yeah. Ah, I see you've collected some point two twos. Yes, I think I got them all. Not that it helps much. It's no use looking for identifying marks on the bullet which hit Leonie Bira. Mm, I know the bullet squashes flat when it hits anything, unlike bullets from more lethal weapons. <laughs> My knowledge of a point or two is a bit rusty. They're not often used in Paris. <laughs> but if I remember correctly, they fire two kinds of cartridges. Yeah, the long and the short. The long can hit its target over 150 metres. That was the kind used on Mamsel Bira. And to complicate matters, all these guns have been recently fired. Was it just an accident? Somebody taking a pot shot at a bird in one of the gardens? Or somebody just firing towards her to scare her? Hmm? You see what I'm getting at? If she hadn't been hit in the eye, she'd be alive today. So murder implies... A crack shot. Hmm. It's worth a thought. Hmm. Oh, it's nearly lunchtime. Will you join me? I, oh, no. I have to go into La Rochelle. But I'll be back this afternoon. You'll find me here if you want me. Yeah, will you be eating here, Chief Inspector? Mm -hmm. Therese is cooking our rabbit. Oh, it sounds fine. Hey, and I'll, Louis. Uh, this is Chief Inspector Maigret. Marcelin. Marcelin Rato, our butcher. So. It's you who's going to dig out a secret, is it? I'm trying. Yeah, you try hard. If you find out anything, you'll deserve a medal. How's your boy getting on? Hmm? Oh, the doctor says it's time he began to walk. Hmm. That's easier said than done. Enjoy yourself, Inspector. Hmm. What's the matter with his boy? Young Joseph? Oh, he was knocked down by a motorbike a month ago. <laughs> Everything happens to Marcelin. Tough life. Sister in a sanatorium, two children stillborn. <laughs> he drinks too much. He'll have swallowed half a bottle of Perno before he's finished his round. You're not a bad chap, though. How long before lunch? Oh, about 50 minutes. I'll be back in time. I went over to the school. The children were just coming out for lunch. The relief teacher pointed out Marcel Cellier to me. We sat down under a tree. The smell of the sea so close was good. And tell me, Marcel, I suppose you've never told a lie. Oh, yes, sir, I have. But I've always confessed. Hmm. Important lies? Mm, pretty important. Would you give me an example? Oh, like the time I tore my trousers climbing a tree. I told my father that I'd caught them on a nail in Joseph Rato's garden. Hmm. He's my best friend. But you owned up in the end. Oh, yes, sir. I always do. Is the schoolmaster's son a friend of yours? No, sir. He doesn't seem to want friends. Maybe because his father's the teacher. Mm. Now, Tuesday morning, what happened after you got back to the classroom? Monsieur Gaston had to go over to the mairie. And you fool about while he's away, hmm? Oh, we throw rubbish and things at each other. Sometimes we pretend to fight. <laughs> now... As I understand it, you walked over to one of the windows overlooking the gardens and the courtyard, and you saw the schoolmaster going over to his tool shed. No, sir. He was walking away from his tool shed. I saw him shut the door behind him. <coughs> you know, has my pipe made you cough? Uh, no. Now, will you confess that little lie? <laughs> well, it is a bit strong, sir. Well, I shall put it out. You're quite right, you know. I shouldn't pollute this fresh sea air. Oh. Do you play a great deal with the other boys? Not much, no. No, I know. I'm too fat. Hmm. Now, Joseph Ratro is your best friend. He's the butcher's son, isn't he? The one who got knocked down by a motorbike. Yes. So he wasn't at school on the day of the crime? No, sir. You didn't like Leonie Bira? She used to shout rude things at me when I went past her house. You didn't tell your father what you saw from the window until the Wednesday evening. Why not? I suppose I didn't think it important until then. And he reported what you told him to the inspector? That's right. You haven't lied, have you, Marcel? 
You know what you said has put your schoolmaster in prison? No, sir. I told the truth. Oh, thank you for being so straightforward. You've been very helpful. Have I? Hmm? You've given me quite a lot to think about. Now, I think it's time we both had our lunch. I'm hungry. Me too. What do you think of the rabbit? Absolutely first class. My compliments to Therese. Yeah. Drop a mark to wash it down? Excellent idea. No, doctor, won't you join me? Uh, a mark? Oh, thank you. Uh, two marks, Louis. Uh, Sit down, doctor. Uh, oh, well. What do you think about it? Hmm? <laughs> about what? <laughs> about nothing. About everything. <laughs> do you think many of them think Gaston killed the old lady? Oh, about one in ten. Well, what about the other nine tenths? Whom do they suspect? <laughs> the person they'd like to be guilty. Oh, God, they're marvelous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Louis. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, would they let Gaston be convicted, knowing he was innocent? Without betting an eyelid. Mm. Now, I'd like to talk to you about that accident at the butcher's side. Oh, that can't have anything to do with Leonie's death. Although, oddly enough, it happened just near her house. Joseph's leg was broken in two places. Mm. Will his father get anything out of the insurance company? Oh, a fair amount, I should think. It seems it was the driver's fault. Do you think it was? Oh, uh, well, it's not for me to decide. That's up to the insurance company. Dr. Brassel, you've got more to tell me. <laughs> now I understand what's meant by the third degree. Okay, so I'll come clean. <laughs> Marceline's a sad case. If he goes on drinking, his will be the next funeral after our respected ex-postmistress. Well, the funeral's tomorrow, isn't it? Yes. The long and the short of it is, the driver was a local lad, and being insured, he had nothing to lose, so he took the blame. You made out the certificates, hmm? Mm, of course. And made them out so that Marcelin would get the biggest possible compensation. Uh, let's say I stressed the possibilities of complications. <laughs> After all, when a cow dies around here of a sudden illness, the vet certifies it was an accident. Mm. So, unless I'm mistaken, Marcelin's boy might have been up for the past week or two. Well, I haven't removed the plaster yet. Uh, he has to make a proper recovery. <laughs> That's my good doctor, you're a scoundrel. <laughs> no, no. It's just that... Oh, that I love them all. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I should like to have another drink with you. Ah. After lunch, I went back to the mairie. Inspector Danielou had got back from La Rochelle. He told me Gaston had been questioned extensively by the examining magistrate. Gaston thought it was, most likely, a practical joke that proved fatal. And that Marcel Cellier was lying. He swore that he'd never been in the tool shed that afternoon. Oh, well done, Georges. So, one of them was lying. But which one? Master or pupil? I took the file on the killing back with me to the hotel to study it. But it didn't seem to help. And I remember waking up the next morning with a weight on my mind, a feeling of tragedy. I went to the funeral, but there was no interest in her burial from the villagers beyond one of curiosity. And then, to my surprise, I saw that Jean-Paul had come to watch. Now, why? It was inconceivable, but suddenly... I was convinced that one of the boys was concerned in Leonie Biard's death. I walked after Jean-Paul as he left the cemetery. Jean-Paul, oh. I'll walk with you. Your mother didn't come to the funeral? No. Why did you come? I wanted to see. Why? Well, I don't know. Hmm. Why aren't you friends with Marcel? I'm not friends with anybody. Are you sorry your father's in prison? He didn't do it, you know. I suppose you knew something that would get him out of prison. Look, I'm only trying to understand. I know how difficult things are for you. Now, Marcel Cellier seems like a good boy, and he says he saw your father come out of the tool shed. He's telling a lie. Hmm? Why do you say that? Because I saw my father cross the yard from a mairie and go into our house for his coffee. 
like he often did. Well, if you're telling the truth, why didn't you say this before? Because I'm the schoolmaster's son. They would have thought I... Yes, I, I, I understand. Now, you're quite sure about this? Yes. Because Marcel was at the window on the right. And you can't see the tool shed from there. What? He... He couldn't have seen my father. Ask the other boys. See if they remember. Now, come on, come on, lad. Cheer up. Everything's going to be all right. We'll have your father out of prison before the end of the day. I've been to the school, Daniel Lou, and I've checked the windows. Marcel Cellier lie, all right. But why? Yes, why? Does he think his father killed Leonie Bira? Was he trying to protect him from suspicion? It's possible. I've had the feeling, right from the beginning, that this is some children's business in which grown-ups have been mixed up by accident. Hmm. Now, why did that boy lie? Perhaps he'll tell us the truth if we talk to him again. Oh, by the way, uh, another point two two turned up. It belongs to Marcelin's son, Joseph. His mother brought it in earlier. She found it in their stable, said she'd forgotten about it when the villagers were asked to turn in their rifles. Oh. Hmm. Let me see that map of the school building oh. the Mary and the houses. Uh, now, this is where the Rattos live. That's right. And Joseph is Marcel's best friend. You have an idea? No more than an idea. What are you going to do? If what I think is right, it won't be pleasant. That's when you decided to go over to the Ratto house and question Joseph. He was in his room on the first floor, his leg in plaster, and, oh yes... On the way upstairs, Marcel Cellier came scuttling down. He didn't stop to talk to you. He looked afraid. Oh, are you trying to score points off me, Georges? Not at all, old friend. Just giving you another example of my excellent memory. Mm. And then you interviewed the boy alone. His mother remained downstairs. Correct in every detail. I interviewed the boy alone. Ah, Joseph. I'm Chief Inspector Maigret. I'd like a word with you. No, 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 don't bother to get up. All that plaster. I know about you. Mm. I passed your friend on the stairs. He didn't seem to want to talk to me. Well, he was in a hurry to get home. Ah. Ah, Joseph, would you like me to take that plaster off? Must be very uncomfortable. Oh, you know. Mm. The doctor told me. What were you up to, you and Marcel, when you were knocked down? Now, you better tell me about it. Have you found the horseshoe? Oh, I see. You mean the one in Leonie Birard's house? Inspector Danielu found one there. We wondered about it. I put it there. Ah. Well, how did that happen? Well, Marcel and I found an old one when we were coming home, and we thought it would be a joke to throw it in the old lady's window. And then I thought it would be funnier to put it in her bed. <laughs> <laughs> really? So I climbed in her window to do that. But I knocked something over and she heard me. I got out as quick as I could, but I dropped the horseshoe in the house. And I'd only run a few yards to join Marcel when Zoom, I got run over. So, Mayor Bira saw the accident? Yes, I know she did, because of afterwards. Oh, go on. They took me to the doctor and they gave me something to sleep. And when I woke up, my father was there. And he began talking about insurance. He said if I told what really happened, he wouldn't get any money. So when Marcel came to see me, I made him promise not to say we were fooling about. Mm. You, know, well, you must have got bored staying up in this room all alone for nearly a month. Do you ever go over to the window? Well, I oughtn't to. Yeah, in case somebody finds out you can walk. Well, are you going to tell the insurance people? No, no, no. It's none of my business. I can see the old lady's house from here. Did she ever see you at the window? Yes, yes, she used to tease me by waving the horseshoe at me and poking out her tongue. So she knew the accident was your fault? Well, that's what I meant before. Otherwise, why should she do that? Mm. Did you tell your father? Yes, and wasn't he cross? He said I'd better keep quiet about it. He said we needed the insurance money. 
Why did Marcel come to see you just now? Well, he said he'd have to own up if they questioned him again. He'd been a confession. Hmm. And he'll say that he saw you at the window just before the old lady was killed. Well, how did you know that? Yes, I was there, hmm. just looking out, and she was waving the horseshoe at me. And Marcel could see both your house and the other house from one of the schoolroom windows. Now, tell me what exactly happened. Well, I've got to, have I? Yes. Well, I took my rifle... Do you usually keep your rifle in your bedroom? Uh, yes. And I went back to the window. I wanted to scare her. I thought she'd tell the insurance people, and then her father wouldn't be able to buy a new van. And you fired the gun. Did you aim it? Well, I was aiming at the window. I wanted to break a pane of glass. That's all. Well, they put me in prison for that? <laughs> Boys of your age aren't sent to prison. Where was your father when you fired your shot? Uh, I think in the shop. Yet he didn't hear anything. Oh, well, when he's had a few, he... Mm. Now, tell me, Joseph. Your rifle was found in the stable. Who took it down there? I did. But you're not supposed to be able to walk. Oh, uh, I forgot. It was my father. I asked him to take it down there. Uh, if this is true, why didn't you ever fire at the old lady before? On one of the other days when she was waving the horseshoe at you? I suppose you'd tell me what really happened. I'll help you. You were at the window. The old lady at hers. You could see down into your own yard. The stable door was open. Now, what was your father doing? He, he was quartering a lamb. Well, a moment ago, you said he was in the shop. You, 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 you're getting me confused. The rifle was not in your room. Now, from where your father was, he could see Leonie Bilar waving the horseshoe. Isn't that right? Nobody could have told you that. Did you just guess it? And your father hated this monstrous old woman just as much as everyone else in the village. So, what I think happened next is that he went into the stable and came out carrying your gun. What will they do to him? Mm, that depends. It'll be better for him if you tell the truth. Will it? Really? Yes. Well, it all happened so quickly. He did have my gun, and he pointed it towards her house, and then he fired, and I heard him mutter, that's one for you, you old louse. Did he aim carefully? No, no, he just lifted the gun to his shoulder and he fired. Anyway, it wouldn't do him any good to aim. He couldn't hit a bullock at 20 metres. Mm. I suppose it's because he drinks too much. And then... When he saw Mother Bira fall down, he stood quite still for a moment, and then he ran into the stable with a gun. And when he come out, he he was swigging at a bottle of... Perno? He hides one there, away from Mamo. Well, then he staggered off. He must have gone to the Bon Coin, because he came home that night drunker than I've ever seen him. Now, Marcel lied because he thought it was you who fired the shot. Yes, we're friends. Mm. Well, that's all, lad. Some people have to grow up quicker than others. Will he go to prison? He only wanted to give her a fright. I know. I'll get the doctor to come round. I think it's time he took that plaster off. I went back to the mairie and collected Inspector Danielou. It was market day, so it seemed most likely that Marcelin would be at the Bon Coin. He was, and he was very, very drunk. Ah, the clever inspector. <laughs> Have you dug deep? Shut up, Marcelin. You're drunk. I'll get drunk if I want to. I'm going to tell him. I'm not going to be spied on. Tell me what? About the insurance... No. Uh, you find out for yourself. I'm afraid it's more serious than that. Huh? Well, what have I done there? What was something? Leonie Bira. Ah. 
Oh. <laughs> ah, the, the clever inspector is clever. Oh, you've been pestering little kids, eh? Faint out. Give me a piano, Louis. Gentlemen. Yeah, that's all right, Louis. Hmm. Well, I'll pay for this one myself. I got her, didn't I? I got her, the lace. Are you coming? I don't want to handcuff you. Suppose I want to be handcuffed? As you please. See that, chaps? I got her, didn't I? Thank you, Chief Inspector. Mm. I'll see you before you leave. No, I don't think so. I'll get the next train. Unless, of course, there are any oysters to be had. Mm. Oh, I'm afraid not, Chief Inspector. Another few days, when the neat tide's finished. Mm, in that case, my bill. Aha, uh -huh. I told you. What did I say? You only went to Saint André sur Mer for the oysters. Nonsense. Poor Jules. Let's make up for it now. I know a little place not far from here where the oysters are superb and the white wine exquisite. In Maigret Goes to School by Georges Simenon, translated by Daphne Woodward, and adapted for radio by Edward Bruce, Maigret was played by Maurice Denham, and Simenon by Michael Goff. Joseph Gastin, Michael Spice, Madame Gastin, Maddie Head, Jean-Paul Gastin, Denise Breyer, Inspector Danielou, Geoffrey Collins, Dr. Pressel, Ronald Herdman, Marcel Cellier, Jean England, Marcelin Rateau, Michael Harbour, Joseph Rateau, Rosemary Miller, Louis, Michael Goldie, Maria, Shirley Dixon, Ferdinand, Gavin Campbell. The play was produced and directed by Betty Davis. Simenon's Maigret, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simenon. Take a look at this Georges. I found it at the bottom of a drawer. <laughs> Do you recognize anyone? Among these shining morning faces, no. I take it one of them is you. The Lycée Bonville, my old school. I'm uh, second from the left, third row. That rather solid, serious little boy. <laughs> yes, Jules, I can see the resemblance now. Who's that pulling a face at the back? Hmm? Oh, him. <laughs> the clown of the school. Léon Florentin. Not the man who... Yes, that one. Your old school friend. He was nothing of the sort. He thought he was, though. Oh, yes, he thought he was. The damn fool. Maurice Denham as Jules Maigret, Michael Goff as Georges Simenon, and John Moffat as Léon Florentin in Maigret's Boyhood Friend, translated by Eileen Ellenbogen and adapted for radio by Betty Davis. Léon Florentin, the confectioner's son from Moulin. Yes, the family had a nice little business. You didn't keep in touch with him after you left? No. I bumped into him once, 20 years on, looking very dashing with an elegant redhead on his arm. His wife, he said. I remember they had a pale green sports car. But that wasn't the last you saw of him. Unfortunately, no. 
On a sweltering summer day, twenty years later, he turned up again. Léon Florentin. Antique dealer? Yes, sir. How old is he? About your age. Tall and thin? That's right. Very tall and thin, uh, with a regular mop of grey hair. Ah, that's him. All right, send him in. Inspector Maybray will see you now. Oh, thank you. All right. Hello. How are you, Maybray? Oh, I'm well. <laughs> Do sit down. How's your wife? Um, my wife? Hmm. Oh, you mean Monique, the little redhead? Yeah. She wasn't my wife. No, we just lived together for a time. No, you're not married. Then. Well, what would be the point? I say, I like your office. <laughs> I didn't expect to see such good furniture at police headquarters. So you're an antique dealer now? In a manner of speaking, yes. I buy old furniture and do it up. You know how it is. Everyone's an antique dealer mm. these days. You're doing all right, are you? Oh, yes, yes. Everything's fine. At least it was fine until this afternoon. And what happened? The, the sky fell. Go on. It's hard to explain, that's the trouble. Um, look, I'd better tell you that I have a woman friend for four years now. Uh, you've lived together? Uh, not exactly, no. She has her own place. Her name is José. Well, actually, her name is Josephine Pape, but she prefers to be called José. She's 34, but you'd never think it. Mm. Whew, it's hot in here. Mm. Well? I'm not the only one. The only what? I'm not her only friend. Oh, she's a marvellous girl, really, and I'm everything to her. You know, lover, friend, confidant. Yeah, but has she many other friends? Well, there's Paré and Courcel, then there's a chap over the limp called Victor, and uh, Ginger, a youngster. Mm. So where do you come in? I go there when she's alone. You sleep there? Every night except Thursdays. What happens on Thursdays? That's Courcel's night. He lives in Rouen, but he's got business premises in Paris. Oh... Now you've despised them. I've never despised anyone in my life. It's a delicate situation. Mm, yes, I can see that. But you have my solemn word. José and I love each other. Or rather, I should say, loved each other. Are you saying you've broken with her? No. Is she dead? Yes. When? This afternoon. I swear it wasn't me. And how did she die? She was shot. By who? I don't know. Where did it happen? In her flat, in the bedroom. And where were you? In the cupboard. What? Well, well, you see, whenever I was there and the bell rang, I... You, oh, don't despise me. It wasn't like that. I, I work for my living. I earn... Lola, tell me exactly what happened. Well, we, we had lunch together. She's a marvellous cook. Yes, and, and she was expecting her Wednesday visitor, but not before 5.30 to 6. Mm, who was it? Francois Paré. He's a civil servant in his early 50s in charge of waterways at the Ministry of Works. Anyway, at half past three, the bell rang and I got into the cupboard. Mm. Well, no, no, it's a sort of closet, really, you know, in the bathroom, not the bedroom. And what then? I'd been in there about a quarter of an hour when I heard a sound like a shot. At the time, I thought it must have been a car backfiring. I waited for the man to go. You knew it was a man? Well, no, but I assumed it. Uh, how did you know when he'd gone? I heard footsteps leaving and the door shut. What time? About four. So the murderer stayed for about a quarter of an hour after he killed her. What? How'd you make that out? Well, you said the bell went at half past three. You heard the shot a quarter of an hour later. Oh, Oh, yes, I suppose he must have done. When you went into the bedroom, where did you find her? On the floor by the bed. Did you call a doctor? No, she was dead. Did you ring the local police? No. Well, look, it's well after five. What have you been doing for the last hour? I was stunned. I just sat there. Well, eventually, I pulled myself together. I, I went into a bistro and had three large brandies. And um, then there I remembered that you were the big white chief of the CID. Mm. So I came here. I... I thought you'd know what to do. Uh, did you keep any money in the flat? Oh, she may have done. She, she didn't trust banks. The Wednesday caller, Paré, is it? Yes. Well, normally he'd be arriving at the flat about now. That's right. Has he a key? None of them had keys. Had you a key? Oh, that's quite a different matter. My dear fellow. Now, don't call me your dear fellow. All right. I'd better have a look. Let's get going. So he landed his problem in your lap. Yes. The years hadn't been very kind to him, and though he irritated me, I couldn't help feeling sorry for him. I guessed that he'd lived off José for years. He was lucky to find her. Indeed he was. And now she was dead. And I'm pretty certain he was wondering what the hell was going to become of him. Where was the flat? Oh, in the Rue Notre-Dame de Lorette. Downstairs there was a mountainous concierge, a really enormous woman. 
She stared at us without expression and without any apparent interest. The flat itself wasn't what I expected. What did you expect? Oh, something less fussy, less old-fashioned. The dead woman was a plump little brunette. She had been quite attractive. Well, the doctor and the forensic boys arrived and started work. The examining magistrate came and went, and I slipped downstairs to talk to the concierge. I'd like to ask you some questions, madame. What about? Oh, I take it you haven't heard. Mademoiselle Pape is dead. Is that what all the coming and going's about? Yes. Now, may I have your name? Why? It's not your business. I have to include it in my report. Madame Blanc. Widow? No. Does your husband live here? No. Did he desert you? Yes. Nineteen years ago. I see. Now, did you see anyone go up to Mademoiselle Pape's flat between half past five and six? Yes. Who? Her Wednesday regular. Was he up there long? No. Did you see him or anyone else go up earlier in the day, about half past three? No. No one. Hmm. Did anyone come down? Not until half past four. Who? That fellow. The one who was with you. Do you know your tenant's other friends? <laughs> Is that what you call them? Oh, well, visitors, then. How many of them are there? Uh, one, two, four. Not counting that fellow. Did any of them ever meet? Not that I know of. I have to tell you that Mademoiselle Pape was murdered. Well, it was only to be expected, wasn't it? Well, have you seen our piece of monumental masonry? Huh? The concierge, that's what I call her. I shudder to think what she calls me. Uh, that fellow. Oh, so I'm that fellow, am I? She can't stand me, you know. Are you sure you told me everything? Why should I lie? Mm, you always were a liar. You lied for the fun of it. Oh, that was 40 years ago. You don't seem to have changed much. You surely don't imagine I killed her? Well, why not? But you know me. I've seen you once in the last 40 years. Why should I have killed her? What's that old witch downstairs been saying? She didn't see anyone else go upstairs. She's lying. Maybe. Well, come on. Where? I want to look at your flat. Where is it? Boulevard Rochechouart. I'm sorry about the mess. <laughs> All looks a bit sordid, doesn't it? But I was only here on Thursdays. Have you been in this business long? Three years. You surely didn't expect to sell any of this stuff. It isn't worth a sou. What did you do before? Uh, I was in exports. Exporting what? Oh, a little of everything. Chiefly to the emergent countries of Africa. Oh, I see. Now, who was José's Thursday caller, the one who stayed the night? Fernand Courcel. He and José were friends long before I met her. He can't get away as often as he no, used to... No, just a minute. What's that up there on the wardrobe? What? Oh, uh, uh biscuits. Uh, let's see. Oh, it's certainly a biscuit tin. Are you fond of biscuits? I like one occasionally. Huh. Hundred franc notes. Those are my savings. It's packed tight. I didn't know you were so thrifty. There were two biscuit tins of the same make in José's flat. Ah, I dare say that's where I got it. And I dare say that's why you waited an hour before coming to see me. You stole this money and came here. Oh, what was I to do? She had no family and I was on my beam ends. José would have wanted me to have it. But I didn't kill her. I swear it. I truly was hiding in the clothes closet. <sighs> Come along. Where, where now? Quai des Orfèvres. You're arresting me. No, I'm not arresting you. Move. It's a very odd feeling being in this situation with an old school friend. Mm, it certainly is. Uh, you, you think I'm a slob, don't you? No, I'm not judging you. I'm trying to understand. I loved her. Yes, you said so. Oh, I know we weren't Romeo and Juliet. Uh, I don't quite see Romeo skulking in the clothes closet. You don't understand. Look, did you know where she kept her money? She made no secret of it. She trusted me. Now, why should I kill her? I well, suppose she was tired of she it. She wasn't. We were saving to buy a house together. Look, put yourself in my place. God forbid. What? Hmm? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. 
Have you got a revolver? Jose had an old one. I found it three years ago in a chest I bought at an auction. She kept it in the drawer of her bedside table. Was it loaded? Yes, she was a nervous type. I thought it would reassure her. Well, it isn't there now. I know. I looked for it. Why? Well, oh, uh, yeah, it, it was stupid, I know. I, I behaved like an idiot. I just blurt everything out. That's my trouble. Now, answer my question. Why were you looking for the revolver? To get rid of it. It was my gun, you see. I thought it was bound to get me into trouble. Yeah. You don't believe me, do you? Am I under arrest now? No. Where are you going from here? I don't know. I suppose I'd better keep away from Jose's flat. Oh, good heavens, you won't think oh, you... No, 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 no. I, I suppose that w wouldn't be the thing. Mm. Oh, well. It'll have to be my own place. It isn't very comfortable. Mm. Excuse me, will you? I won't be a moment. Well, point. Yes, Chief. I've got a man in my office, tall and thin, my age, but rather the worse for wear. He lives at the end of a little alley in the Boulevard Rochechouart. Ah. I don't know what he'll do when he leaves here, but I don't want you to let him out of your sight. Hmm. Does it matter if he knows he's being followed? Well, it's not all that important. But he's as cunning as a wagon load of monkeys and he's sure to be on the lookout. Right, Chief. I'll see to it. Let me ask you something. At this point, if it had been anyone else, would you have arrested him? I'd rather not answer that. I won't pursue it. So you got on the track of the other lovers? Yes, obviously I had to interview them all. I wasn't looking forward to it. In fact, I wasn't looking forward to anything to do with this case. Oh, it's a wretched business. What is it, Jules? A murder? Yes, a shooting. Mm. The woman's dead. The trouble is, I was at school with the fellow who lived with her, and now he's up to his neck in this ghastly mess. Now, what motive? Jealousy? Mm, no, not if he did it. Did he? God knows. Ah, that may be La Pointe. I asked him to ring me at home. Megre. La Pointe here. Hmm. There have been developments. Yes? He spotted me before we were even out of the building. Turned round and winked at me when we were going downstairs. Oh, well. Where did he go? To the Place Dauphine. Then he actually came up to me and said he was going for a drink and would I like to join him. <laughs> what did you say? Oh, I said I didn't drink on duty. I felt a bit of a fool. Well, anyway, he downed four brandies, then he walked out into the Pont Neuf. I was quite close behind him, but I couldn't stop him. It all happened too quickly. What did he? We jumped into the Seine. Good oh, God. Oh, it's all right. He came up a couple of yards from a boat, and the boatman hauled him in. But by now, there was quite a crowd and one or two policemen, so I laid low. Uh, I hope I did the right thing. Absolutely the right thing. I may tell you that Florentin was far and away the best swimmer in the school. Mm. Now, what happened next? Oh, they marched him into the police station. He came out after a bit and took a taxi back to his place. Mm. Well, go on, keeping an eye on him, and uh, good luck. Sit down, Inspector. Oh, thank you. I, I was expecting you. You've seen the morning paper, Monsieur Parry? Yes. Uh, thank you for coming to the Ministry yourself and sparing me the indignity of a visit to police headquarters. Well, I was anxious as you are to avoid publicity. Uh, had you known Josephine Pape long? About three years. Are you married, Monsieur Parry? Yes. Uh, lately, my home hasn't been very happy. My wife is a sick woman. I, uh, she suffered from a psychiatric disorder. It strained our relationship a good deal. I see. What were the circumstances of your first meeting with Josephine Pape? It was in a brasserie in the Boulevard Saint-Germain. I often stopped there for a drink. There was this young woman at the next table. She was writing a letter and having trouble with the cafe pen, so I lent her mine. And then? But that was all. She wasn't there the following day. The day after that, I saw her again, and we chatted. Things went on like this for more than a month. I began to look on her as a friend. And at last, I went back to Jose's flat. On a Wednesday? Yes. I'm on the committee of a charitable organization which meets every Wednesday. It was the only day I could go home late without arousing my wife's suspicion. 
Did Mademoiselle Pape tell you anything about her family? Yes, she came from Poitiers. Her father was killed in the war when she was a child. He was an officer in the regular army. She had one brother. Did you ever see him? Yes, one Wednesday I arrived early and he happened to be at the flat. And was he tall and thin with light grey eyes and an unusually mobile face? Why, yes. Do you know him? Mm, I've met him. Did Mademoiselle Pape lead you to believe you were her only lover? It's not a word either of us would use. Yes, we were lovers. But that wasn't the real bond between us. We were both uh, lonely people. We opened our hearts to each other. In other words, we were friends. She was very important to me. You might say I, I lived for Wednesday evening. So you would have been shattered to find she had another lover. It would have been the end. Of what? The happiness I'd known for the last three years. A modest enough share in a lifetime. Mm. Did you never meet anyone else in the flat? Only once. Red-haired young man, an insurance agent. Josie told me he was pestering her to take out a life assurance policy. She showed me his card. Jean-Luc Baudard of the Continental. I take it you went to the flat yesterday? Yes. There was no reply, so I came away. You weren't at the flat between three and four? No, I never left the office. My staff will confirm that. Though, naturally, I, I prefer my name to be kept out of it. Realised you'd be bound to find out about me from the concierge or from her brother. Uh, she has no brother, Monsieur Parry. What? I'm very sorry to disillusion you, but you'll have to know sometime. His name is Léon Florentin. He practically lived in the flat. But he made himself scarce when visitors were expected. Uh, did you say visitors? And there were four of you, not counting Florentin. I, I, I don't believe it. You, you've made a mistake. No, I'm afraid there's no mistake. You didn't know her. She was so sane, so serene. I, I'd have trusted her with my life. No, no, Inspector, it's incredible. Did she... Did she suffer much? No. Death was instantaneous. God be thanked. I very much appreciate your discretion, Inspector. I only wish we'd met in happier circumstances. So do I, Monsieur Parry. Poor fellow. Yes, his Indian summer, with all it had meant to him, had come to a sudden shocking end. When I got back to the office, I saw there were two people in the waiting room. One was Léon Florentin, and the other was a small, rosy little man who looked like a chubby, middle-aged baby. Fernand Corcel, José's Thursday man. Come in, Monsieur Corcel. Uh, please sit down. Oh, thank you. Now, this must have come as a terrible shock. <laughs> yes. Why, well, I'm sorry. You see, she, she was much more than a friend. I know. Monsieur Corcel, did you know the man who was talking to you in the waiting room? Why, that's José's brother. Uh, didn't you know? When did you first meet him? Uh, three years ago, soon after he got back from Uruguay. Uruguay? I see. Had he been there long? Uh, some time. He, he's an architect. He went there on a government contract to build a new town. Mm. And you met him in Josephine Pape's flat? Yes, that's right. When you arrived unexpectedly early? Uh, I, I, I don't remember. W what are you getting at? Did you see him again? Uh, yes, he called on me at my office. He, he had a scheme for developing the coastline between Le Gros du Roi and Palava as a luxury seaside resort. But unfortunately, I couldn't help him. I have no capital of my own. My brother and I own the business jointly, but I gave him a few thousand francs to register the plans. Mm. What was he saying to you just now? Oh, well, it's, uh, it's rather a painful subject. Oh, well, I'd I, I better tell you. He's a bit in the dark about his sister's finances, and he's invested every penny he has in this project, so naturally he's short of ready cash. He asked me to help with the funeral expenses. Mm. <laughs> really, Inspector, I fail to see anything amusing in that. Well, forgive me. Now, I have to tell you that his name isn't Pape. Hmm? He's Léon Florentin, and he was a school. 
You, do you mean he isn't her brother? No, no relation. He was living with her. No, no, no but that, that, that's impossible. Jose was incapable of such a thing. Sit down, Monsieur Corcel. Oh, I've known her for ten years. Before I was married, we lived together. I found that flat. Where did you meet her? Well, I, uh, in a nightclub in Montmartre. She was a hostess, but she wasn't like the other girls. She wore a simple black dress and very little makeup. She seemed shy. You spent the evening with her? Yes, she told me about her childhood in La Rochelle. Where? La Rochelle. Hmm. Her father was a fisherman. He was drowned at sea. She had four young brothers and sisters to support. Yes, and what about her mother? Dead, too, I've no doubt. Yes. What do you mean? Well, I'm sorry, but it's all a pack of lies. Oh, I can't believe it. I, I, I was passionately in love with her. And yet you got married. Well, I, I married my cousin. It was expected. I meant to break off with Jose, but I found I couldn't. Oh, when I think of that man... Uh, he wasn't the only one. What? Three other men visited her regularly. No. Oh, no. Look, I, I'm sorry. I'd like to have spared you this, but oh. I have to find the man who killed her. That can't be done without bringing the truth out. Oh. Now, I must ask you to take a grip on yourself and tell me where you were between three and four yesterday afternoon. In my car on the way from Rouen. You can't mean... You suspect me. No, it's purely a routine question. I may tell you all you've said is in the strictest confidence, and if I can, I'll keep your name out of it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Florentin, you're more of a scoundrel than I thought. I know. <laughs> now, what are you doing here? Guess how much money I've got. Fifty centimes. Nothing else in the world. Now, what has that got... Have you come here to ask me for money? Who else can I turn to? Mm. I'm destitute. I'll have to try and get a job somehow. Now remember, you can't leave Paris. So I'm still under suspicion. Until we get the man who did it. Now, can you think of anything about the man with the limp? Oh, even José only knew his first name, Victor. Mm. He was prosperous looking. You know, good suits and handmade shirts. Oh, yes, I've remembered something. Oh, what? She once saw a railway season ticket in his wallet. Mm. Paris Bordeaux. Ah. You see, that's worth something, isn't it? A uh, hundred francs. And you'd better make it last. It took a hell of a time to trace him, and I hope to God I've got the right man. His name's Victor Lamotte. Mm, well done, jean -Vier. Who is he? He's a man of some standing in Bordeaux. <laughs> he took a very high-handed line with me at first but eventually he agreed to come and see you. He'll be here in a quarter of an hour. I'm sorry to have put you to the trouble of coming here, Monsieur Lamotte. You know what I want to see you about? Oh. You knew Josephine Papé. How did you find out? We have our sources of information. Josephine Papé was murdered in her flat yesterday afternoon. Where were you? Not there, at any rate. Were you in your office? No, I was taking a walk in the Grand Boulevard. Alone? Oh, what's so strange in that? My doctor has urged me to take regular exercise. You realise it leaves you without an alibi? Do I need one? As one of José's lovers, yes. I see. Were there many of us? Four. Not including the man who lived with her. So she had a man living with her, did she? I believe your day was Saturday. I'm a creature of habit. I visited Jersey on Saturday and then caught the Bordeaux Express. Are you married, Monsieur Lamont? Yes, the grown-up family. How long have you known Josephine Pape? Four years. What did she mean to you? Uh, she provided uh, relaxation. Had you any affection for her? That's too strong a word. Perhaps I should say liking. Uh, she was a pleasant companion, and I believed her to be discreet. I'm surprised you were able to track me down. We knew you had a limp and a railway season ticket. I see. Where did you first meet Jose? On the train, in the restaurant car. We sat at the same table. She, uh, she seemed a very respectable sort of woman. Had you a mistress at that time? What did you say your name was? Well, it's of no importance, but if you must know, it's Maigret. 
Well, Monsieur Maigret, I did have a mistress. Just a week before I met Jose, she announced that she was going to be married. In other words, there was a vacancy to be filled. I don't care for your tone. How long had you known Jose when you first went to her flat? Three weeks. Did she tell you where she came from? Yes, Grenoble. Hmm. Did you make her a generous allowance? That is a most indelicate question. Answer it, please. I gave her 2,000 francs a month in an envelope I left it on the mantelpiece. Did you know any of her other protectors? You had hardly expected to introduce us. No, no, I didn't. Were you distressed to learn of her death? Uh, to be honest, no. Millions of people die every day. Uh, you want a signed statement from me? No. If it should come to trial... It will. Always supposing you get the murderer. We'll get him. I'd better warn you, I shall take steps to keep my name out of it. I have influential friends. I don't doubt it. Goodbye, Monsieur Lamotte. Oh, I was glad to see the back of him. He disgusted me. A cold-blooded bastard, yes. So, three down and one to go. You still had to see Ginger. Yes, Jean-Luc Baudin at the Continental. I traced him through his firm. Jean Vier was keeping an eye on his hotel, and he reported that Baudin had just gone back to his room with a woman. So I went straight round. I'd like a word with Monsieur Baudin. It's urgent and private. Uh, who are you? Chief Inspector Maigret, police. Uh, uh, do I have to come with you? I, I mean, I'm, I'm not alone. I want to ask you a few questions. Yeah, all right. Come in. Thank you. <laughs> you want me to go, I suppose? Uh, yes, uh, you'd uh, better wait for me in the brasserie. Um, you have come about poor Jose. Yes. How long have you known her? Oh, about a couple of months. How did you meet her? I called at her flat. I'm an insurance agent. Was she alone? No, there was a man with her, a bit of a layabout, tall and thin. He made himself scarce. Mm. You sell life insurance, I believe. Accident policies as well, and other things. Were you able to interest Mademoiselle Pape? <laughs> Not in the sense you mean, but, uh, well... She was a tidy little armful, and uh, I had the feeling she fancied me, so I had to go. <laughs> well, sometimes you get your face slapped, but it's always worth a try. Mm, was it worth a try with her? <laughs> I'll say. How often did you see her afterwards? I wasn't counting. What do you know about her? She told me she was born in Dieppe. She told you the truth. Hmm? She was. Well, she uh, told me about the others. She was a bit scared of the one with the limp. And a bit irritated by the grey-haired one, he wanted to marry her. Did he? Yeah. She said, you'd think he owned me. If I'd wanted to, I could have stepped into his shoes, but I didn't. I wanted out. She was getting too keen. I was, I was trying to end it, gently. Do you think he killed her? I've no idea. Any one of them could have done it. What were you doing yesterday afternoon? Oh, you want to know if I've got an alibi? Sorry. I haven't. Well, thank you. That's all for the moment. Good. Oh, um, I say, would you mind uh, looking in on the brasserie on your way down, giving the dolly bird the green light? Hmm? <laughs> Tell her I'm waiting. I don't feel like getting dressed. <laughs> Did you? Yes, actually. She was so surprised she couldn't think of anything to say. I've never been given a job like that in my life. Why did you do it? Because I rather liked him. He was a refreshing change from Victor Lamotte. Anyway, I'd seen them all now and heard their stories. I thought about it for a long time. And I decided that the key to it all was with that woman. The concierge. That's right, the monolithic concierge. So, after interrogation... Confrontation. Yes. I summoned them all to my office. And the concierge. But Jean Vier held her in reserve. Gentlemen, you can be in no doubt why you're all assembled here. Josephine Pape is dead, and one of you killed her. I protest. Keep your protest till later. I have accused no one. 
All but one of you denies setting foot in the flat on Wednesday afternoon. But not one of you has an alibi. I have. No, Monsieur Paré, yours won't do. Your office has a second door. You could have got out that way without anyone seeing you. <clears throat> now, I have to tell you all that when Josephine Pape was killed, she was not alone in the flat. The murderer? The murderer, of course. But somebody else was there, too. When the bell rang at half past three that afternoon, Leon Florentin was there. He hid in the clothes closet, as he'd done in the past. After a quarter of an hour, he heard a shot. But he was too scared to come out till he heard the murderer leave the flat. A quarter of an hour later. Now, that's important. Why the delay? Perhaps he was looking for something. Yes, he was looking for something. Monsieur Paré, did you ever write to Mademoiselle Pape? Yes, when I was on holiday away from Paris. Your wife is a sick woman. I'm sure you would go to great lengths to spare her pain. And you, Monsieur Lamont, did you ever write to her? Yes. Your wife is rich, your family well known in Bordeaux. Monsieur Corsell? Uh, oh, well, I uh, may have scribbled a note or two. You too are married. Yeah, but I'm not. No. You could have an altogether different reason for killing her. What? Blackmail. The letters have vanished. There was nothing in her desk but bills. Now, I'm not inviting a confession, but one of you knows who killed José. I hope he will come and see me. Well, La Pointe? Sir? Fetch Jean Vier, will you? Yes, sir. You certainly don't pull your punches. This is an outrage. Ah, come in, Madame Blanc. I think you know all these gentlemen. I still have nothing to say. Let me go. Now, which of these men did you see going up to Josephine Pape's flat on Wednesday? You refuse to answer? I have nothing to say. You can't frighten me. Very well. Well, gentlemen, I'm grateful to you all. For those who are interested, Josephine Pape's funeral will take place tomorrow morning. The hearse will set out from the forensic laboratory at ten o'clock. So you left them to stew a bit? That's exactly what I did. For by now, Georges, an idea was stirring in my mind. I'd had another look at the photographs taken in José's flat, and something had struck me very forcibly. I thought I knew what had happened now, but I still didn't know who the murderer was. And then, on the Saturday of José's funeral, things started to come to a head. The concierge disappeared. Who was supposed to be shadowing her? Oh, Lordy, poor devil. She went shopping, and he waited outside an Italian grocer's for her. When she didn't come out, he went inside and found it had a back door. She'd been blackmailing the murderer, of course. Of course. And when I brought her face to face with them all in my office, she looked at one, and she saw in his face that she could get much more out of him. So she went to collect it. I got a search warrant. I reckon that might yield something. At one o'clock, Lorty telephoned to say that she was back at her post. So La Pointe and I went straight round. You won't find anything. Won't we? There's nothing to find. Hope you're tidying up after you. You're making a great deal of mess. No, your post office book, madam? Yes. Anything wrong in that? No, nothing that I can see. Any luck, Laporte? No, sir. Nothing. Mm, I haven't. Oh, just a moment. What are you doing? Leave that set alone. You'll upset the tuning. No, we're not doing any harm to your television, madam. What's in this magazine on top of it? What do you expect? Just the programme. Now, there's something inside. Yes. Huh. Two thousand francs. What is this, madame? I'm entitled to my savings, aren't I? You have a post office book. I've just looked at it. I might need ready cash. Well, that's quite a lot of ready cash. Well, that's my business. I'm not a thief. No, I'm not suggesting you are. I don't even think you asked for this money. I think the murderer offered it to you. You know who he is. I have nothing to say. Yesterday you realised he was a frightened man. You went to ask for more. I'm saying nothing. Beat me up if you like. Oh, thank you, but I'd rather not. Come on, Lebois. I'll see you again, madame. Damn her. 
damn her. How can I get that frightful woman to talk? Chief. Uh, I have a notion Florentine knows something too. And uh, he's much weaker than she is. I've been trying to put the pressure on him. Well, he's lying. I've known that for some time. Well, then. Yeah, you're right. I've been chipping away at a rock when there's something much more brittle available. This place is beginning to feel like home. <laughs> you didn't half rattle them yesterday. Why did you send for me? To show you this photograph. José's bedroom, just after the murder. What am I supposed to be looking at? The bed. There isn't a crease on the counterpane. Now, you said José and her murderer went into the bedroom and spent a quarter of an hour there. Well, obviously, it wasn't for the usual purpose, so what were they doing? Well, maybe they meant to go to bed and then quarrelled. Or he wanted his letters back. Florentin. Yes? There's something wrong with your story. Did you take those letters? No, I swear I didn't. Why did you take a sudden dive into the Seine? I... I, I, I my only thought was to end it all. No, rubbish. You're an excellent swimmer. I think you took the letters when you took the money. You still had them on you when you saw Le Pointe following you and you panicked. You realised you were going to be watched continuously. So you jumped into the Seine and ditched. I never had the letters. I give you my word. Mm. Your word's not worth much. You've got it in for me. Why should I have it in for you? Because you were always jealous of me. Because my family owned a nice little business in Moulin. And your father was just an upper servant on the Chateau de Saint Fiacre estate. You ba. <laughs> Gosh, you're despicable. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologise. Mm. No, I, I lost my head. Oh, Amigre, please, for, for old time's sake. For old time's sake, indeed. Oh, look at yourself, man. What's to become of you? You're a miserable wreck, Florentin. Well, everything went sour on me. I've been unlucky. But if I get a chance... You're still hoping, but what for, for heaven's sake? I don't know. Right, that's settled. And now the time's come to take a weight off your mind. I know you didn't kill José. Huh? But your story is a pack of lies. No, uh, I can't. Now explain. be quiet. The doorbell rang, certainly. But you didn't hide in the clothes closet. You bolted into the bedroom. José and her caller were in the sitting room. You heard his voice and you were terrified, because you knew he hadn't come to see José. He'd come to see you. Why? Why should he? Oh, she was say he was going to chuck you out. You knew she'd fallen in love with Boda. So, you looked around for another source of income. You tried to blackmail one of Jose's lovers. How did you know? I didn't. Till yesterday. Now, are you going to tell me the rest of the story? I suppose so. You know it all anyway. Oh, yes, I know it all. <laughs> he found me hiding in the bedroom and dragged me out, shouting abuse at me with her there, listening. He was furiously angry. I wouldn't give him back his letters. He opened the table drawer and pulled out the revolver. José screamed. I, I was terrified. So you hid behind her? Well, I, I hardly knew what I was doing. Now, I, I swear to you, it was an accident that the gun went off. I believe that. He, he didn't know anything about guns. I mean, you could see that. I was actually on the point of giving him back his blasted letters when the thing fired, and José fell dead. He panicked and rushed from the room. Has he still got the revolver? I suppose so. So you left with José's savings and the letters. You came to me because you're a coward and you thought I'd protect you. Will I be charged with anything? Well, that depends. On whom? On the examining magistrate. And, to some extent, on me. I could only survive a year or two in jail. I've got heart trouble as it is. He's here, Chief. Hmm? With his lawyer? No, send him up. Who? The murderer. What, you know which one it is? Yes, I know which one it is. The concierge talked? No, but she did the next best thing. What do you mean? On Saturday she disappeared. We knew she'd gone to blackmail the murderer. She turned up again later, but wouldn't say a word. And suddenly... I realised that I knew. How? How could you? Well, she went to find the murderer on a Saturday. Now, she wasn't the woman to forget the day. She wouldn't make that mistake. But on Saturdays, most offices are shut. Most men are home with their wives. 
On that particular day, there was only one of José's lovers she knew she could find. Yes. That's the one. Yeah. He wasn't at home with his wife. He was always in his Paris office on Saturday because he was José's Saturday caller. The man with the lip. Victor Lamotte. The concierge talked, didn't she, in the end? In the end, yes. Now, Lamotte got off lightly. After all, it was pretty much an accident. What happened to Florentin? Oh, God knows. Perhaps in twenty years' time, some shambling old wreck will wink at me from the gutter, and I'll recognize my old school friend. <laughs> Think of it, in forty years... I hadn't set eyes on a single one of the boys who'd been my schoolmates at the Lycée Bonville. And when at last I did, of all people, it had to be Florentin. In Maigret's Boyhood Friend by Georges Simenon, translated by Eileen Ellen Bogan and adapted for radio by Betty Davis, Maigret was played by Maurice Denham, Simenon by Michael Goff, and Léon Florentin by John Moffat. Jean Vier, Sean Barrett, La Pointe, John Rye, Francois Paré, Godfrey Kenton, Fernand Courcel, Peter Tottenham, Victor Lamotte, John Gabriel, Jean-Luc Baudard, Geoffrey Collins, Madame Blanc, Cécile Chevreau, and Madame Maigret, Irene Sutcliffe. The play was produced and directed by Betty Davis. Maigret, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simenon. Jules, tell me, what's the longest time you've ever spent interrogating someone? Hmm? <laughs> what an extraordinary question. Why do you want to know? I read a piece recently from the States. Some man was cross-examined for 23 hours. I wonder what your record was. Oh, I haven't the faintest idea. I do remember one 17-hour stint, though. A Dane, Carl Anderson. Yeah. I remember him, too. Wasn't that a murder case? It was, and a very strange one. A murder outside Paris at the Three Widows' Crossroad. Maurice Denham as Jules Maigret and Michael Goff as Georges Simenon in Maigret at the Crossroads, translated by Robert Baldick and adapted for radio by Aubrey Woods. Carl Anderson. He was the fellow with only one eye, wasn't he? That's right. He'd lost the other in a flying accident. He wore a black monocle. I'm not surprised that you remember him. Well, it wasn't only his appearance. It was his... his elegance and his dignity. He never lost it all through the 17 hours. And that's not easy. Though. I questioned him all afternoon. I went on through the six o'clock rush home while the offices emptied and the metro filled. I was still questioning him at dawn when the office cleaners came in to start another day. But at last it was all over. 
Now, you stand by everything you've told me. I do. You realise how improbable it sounds? Yes, but it's the truth. Mm. You hope to be set free in the absence of positive proof. Eh? I don't hope anything. Do you want me to read this to you before you sign it? As you please. Right. I'll summarise it for you. Uh, <clears throat> You're a Danish citizen. You arrived in France three years ago with your sister Elsa. You lived for a month in Paris, and then you rented a country house on the main road from Paris to Etampes, two miles from Afrajon, at a place known as the Three Widows' Crossroads. Yes, that's correct. For the past three years, you lived there in complete isolation. You bought a five-horsepower motor car of an obsolete make, which you used to do your shopping at the market at Arpajon. Once a month, you come to Paris. To deliver my work to the firm of Dumas and Son in the Rue des Quatre Septembre, I designed furnishing fabrics, as I told you. You're paid 500 francs for each design, and on average you produce four designs a month. On an average, yes. On Saturday night, you went to bed as usual at about 10 o'clock. And again, as usual, you locked your sister in her bedroom, which is next to yours. She is a very nervous girl, that is why. At seven o'clock on Sunday morning, Monsieur Emile Michonnet, an insurance agent who lives in a villa a hundred yards from your house, went into his garage and found that his car, a new six-cylinder, had disappeared. And its place had been taken by your old croc. Monsieur Michonnet went over to your house, found the gate locked and rang the bell. There was no reply. He told the police. They found the house empty. Monsieur Michonnet's car was in your garage. And in the front seat, slumped over the steering wheel, was a dead man. I knew nothing about it. He'd been shot at point-blank range. According to his papers, he was Isaac Goldberg, a diamond merchant from Antwerp. Now, you and your sister had taken the Paris train. You were picked up on your arrival at the Garde d'Orsay. I deny having killed anybody. Now, you also deny having known Isaac Goldberg. I saw him for the first time in my garage, dead, at the wheel of a car which doesn't belong to me. Mm, and instead of telephoning for the police, you and your sister ran for it. I was frightened. You have nothing to add? Nothing. And you heard nothing during Saturday night? I'm a very heavy sleeper. Mm, right. Sign here. Uh, thank you. Uh, one moment. Jean Vier, take Monsieur Anderson through to the office. He's free to leave. Right, sir. Uh, your things will be returned to you. You remain, of course, at the law's disposal. Any attempt to leave the country, and I'll have you taken to the Santé prison. What about my sister? Well, you'll find her at home. Thank you, Chief Inspector. Oh, don't make sure. I give you my word of honour that I'm innocent. I'm not asking you for anything. Now, Monsieur Michonnet, what can I do for you? I've come about my car, Inspector. I had a long talk last night with Madame Michonnet, whose acquaintance I hope you'll make before long, and she agrees with me. Uh, I can't do without a car. Monsieur Michelet... It's essential for business. You see, my area stretches 20 miles from Arpajon. Now, Madame Michonnet agrees with me. We don't want to keep a car in which a man has been killed. It's up to the law to do the necessary. Uh, to provide us with a new car of the same type as the other one. Yeah, but... Except that I want this one to be maroon, which makes no difference to the price. Uh, you have to remember that my car had been run in, and I shall have to... Look, is that all you have to say to me? It is a matter of urgency that a well, car... Well, very well. I shall come and see you at your house. Uh, and what about the car? When the investigation's over, your car will be returned to you. But I told you that Madame Michonnet and, and please I... please give my regards to Madame Michonnet. Uh, Good morning, monsieur. jean get me a taxi in a couple of hours' time. I'm joining new car down to the Three Widows Crossroads. Yes, Chief. It's not much of a room, I'm afraid, Chief, but it's the best I can manage. Oh, it'll do, new car. Anything to report? Not much. Garage proprietor gossips about a lot, though. Mayor hey, Oscar. Hasn't got much time for the Michonets. Thinks they're a stuck-up pair. What's Oscar himself like? Bit of a rough diamond. Except that he isn't a diamond. He doesn't seem to know much about the Andersons. He's only ever seen the sister twice. Village gossip says the house is like a pigsty inside. Junk all over the place. 
Lovely house, too. Uh, that's it. Over the wall on the far side of the square. Big country place. Gardeners, lodge, stables, a lot. But by the look of it, they only use two or three of the rooms in the main house. The rest looks derelict. Well, I'll go over and have a word with them. I take it Anderson's back. He got back about an hour before you arrived. Hmm. He walked up from the station. Quite a trek. Right, I'll see you later. Good evening, Chief Inspector. I had mentioned you'd be coming. I'd like to speak to your sister. Is she in? Yes. Come in. Thank you. Follow me. Please excuse our untidiness. Elsa, my dear. Uh. May I present Chief Inspector Maker? No, Miss <laughs> Please, uh, sit down, Inspector. Thank you. A cigarette, Carl. Of course. Hmm. You uh, wish to ask me questions? Yes. Your brother, mademoiselle, has told me that he heard nothing unusual during Saturday night. It seems he's a very heavy sleeper. Very. Uh, did you hear anything? Nothing particularly unusual, no. You know that we live on a main road. The traffic goes on through the night. Every day from uh, 8 o'clock in the evening, lorries go past on their way to the central market and make much noise. Our sleep is interrupted all the time. Uh, if the house were not so cheap... Had you ever heard of the dead man, Isaac Goldberg? Never. I'd like to look round the house, if I may. Certainly. I suppose you use this drawing room most of the time? Yes. It is here that I do my work. You haven't any servants? You know how much I earn. It isn't enough to allow me to pay a servant. Yeah, who does the cooking? I do. I suppose you want to see the garage, too. The police have put seals on it, but you must have authority to break them. You haven't offered the Chief Inspector a cup of tea, Carl. Oh, thank you, but I never drink tea. But I do, and I want some now. Uh, will you have some whiskey then, Inspector? Uh, Carl, please. I'm sorry. What can I offer you? No, nothing, thank you. Uh, it's all incredible, isn't it? My brother insisted that we'd be accused because the dead man was found in our garage. He wanted to run away. I wanted to stay. I was sure that the police would understand that if we had really committed the murder, it would not be in our interest. It... There's someone at the French windows. Yeah, uh, it's my inspector. Excuse me, may uh, I? Um... Of course. What is it, Luca? There's a telegram for you, sir. Madame Goldberg is arriving tonight by car. Ah. Now, um, excuse me, I'll come back again tomorrow. My respects, mademoiselle. Oh, you aren't going to look at the garage, then? Tomorrow. Good night. What's the time, Luca? Half past nine. What time was Madame Goldberg due here? Eight o'clock. Hmm. Shall I ring headquarters and check? No, I'll give them another five minutes. Evening, gentlemen. Good evening, Monsieur Oscar. Let me introduce Chief Inspector Maigret. Oh, pleased to meet you. Evening. Lovely night. If this keeps up, we'll have splendid weather for Easter. Um, tell me, does your garage stay open all night? No, but there's always a man on duty. Um, he's got a bed through the back. The door's locked after about ten. People who know the place ring the bell if they need anything. Is there much traffic on the road at night? Oh, not a lot. Lorries on their way to market, mainly. The drivers sometimes need petrol or minor repairs. Uh, will you come in and have a drink? No, thank you. Oh, pity. All right, I won't press you. Another time. I'd better get back. Uh, Zozo, uh, check the third pump, will you? It's broken down. Excuse me. Yeah? 
Is this the Three Widows Crossroads? Yes, it is. Thank you. It's the right place, madame. Thank you, Maurice. No, no, no. It's, it's all right, it's all right. Oh, I, I can manage. Oh! oh God, she's been shot. Mm. Stop! You! Stop! He got away, damn him. You'd better get a doctor. Yes, but I don't think he'll be able to do much. Is it? Uh... Yes, Madame Goldberg. Mm. I heard a shot. Has someone been hurt? Yes. Did you see anyone? Well, just a motorist to ask the way to Almby. Oh, there's a light on in the missionary house, Luca. I'm going there. Right, Chief. No, Chief Inspector Maigre. I'd like to speak to Monsieur Michonet. He isn't here. He went out for a moment. How long ago? Oh, I don't know. Perhaps half an hour? Someone's in your kitchen. Ah, good evening, Monsieur Michonet. Give me that gun. What? Your gun. What for? <laughs> yeah, it hasn't been fired. No, it hasn't. Well, where have you come from? I just came in the back door. I've been over there. What do you mean by over there? Don't be frightened, Emil. They wouldn't dare do anything to you. This really is too much. Do you realize that my brother-in-law is a justice of the peace in Kakasso? Mm, just a moment, madame. What were you doing? I've been at the Anderson's house. I wanted to keep an eye on them myself. You didn't go to the field? You didn't hear anything? Well, there was a shot, wasn't there? Uh, has somebody been killed? We don't know yet. I swear to you, Chief Inspector. Oh, it's absolutely monstrous. It's my car that's stolen. It's in my car that somebody leaves a corpse. And they refuse to let me have it back when I've slaved away for 15 years to buy it. And uh, now I'm accused of heaven knows what. Be quiet, Emil. I'll speak to him. There are no other weapons in the house? No, just this revolver. I bought it when we had the villa built. It, it's never been used. Mm. You've been to the Andersons' house. You saw them? Yes, through the window. They're both in the sitting room. Why were you there? Well, I was afraid my car might be stolen again. I wanted to carry out my own investigations. Had you left there when you heard the shot? Yes, but I wasn't sure that it was a shot. You saw nobody else? Nobody. Um, excuse me, Chief Inspector. Yes, Monsieur Oscar, what is it? Um, forgive me for walking through, madame. The door was open. Uh, your colleague sent me, Inspector, to tell you that the woman is dead. They took the body down to the morgue in Arpajan late last night, Chief. Then this morning I went over that field again. Nothing new. The footprints go in a circle, starting off and finishing up about halfway down the road from the Andersons to the garage. Mm, what were the shoes like? Oh, pretty ordinary. Smooth sole, average size. Uh, they would be. Oh, and Anderson's downstairs at reception. Wants to know if he can drive into Paris. Or straight away? Yes. Yeah. He says he has to collect his pay from that firm he designs for. On his own? Yes. Yeah. Hmm. All right. While he's away, I think I'll pay another call on that sister of his. The chief inspector, who was here yesterday. I'd like to have a word with you, mademoiselle. I'm listening. Well, perhaps you'd be good enough to open the door. You are asking me to do something very difficult, chief inspector. Well, why? Because 
I am uh, locked in. Well, who's locked you in? My brother, Carl. I ask him to uh, when he goes out. I'm afraid of prowlers. Uh, well, if I can open the door, would you allow me in, mademoiselle? Of course. Hmm. Ah. Hmm. Ah. How resourceful you are, uh, Chief Inspector. Well, I wanted to talk to you. Oh, uh, forgive me if I'm disturbing you. <laughs> no, you're not disturbing me. Um, but do forgive my negligee. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's charming. <laughs> Uh, why didn't you go to Paris with your brother? He says uh, it's embarrassing to have women around uh, when men are talking business. Do you ever leave this house? Oh, yes. Uh, to go for walks in the park. Just for that? Oh, it's eight acres. That's enough for stretching my legs, isn't it? Oh, but uh, do sit down, Chief Inspector. Mm. Here. Oh. <clears throat> Ah, it's uh, funny seeing you here on the sly. Uh, what do you mean? I mean that my brother will be furious uh, when he gets back. He's worse than a mother or a jealous lover. He looks after me and he takes his uh, responsibilities very seriously. Uh, I thought it was you who wanted to be locked up for fear of burglars. That comes into it, too. I've become so used to being on my own that I've ended up uh, frightened of people. Are you bored here? No. <laughs> yes. Oh, I, I don't know. Sometimes uh, I wish I were a child again. You spent your childhood in Denmark? Yes. In a big castle on the shores of the Baltic. A terrible, gloomy castle, all white in a grey-green uh, landscape. We were rich, but our parents were very strict, like most Protestants. For my part, I have no use for religion, but Carl is still a believer. We left the country... Three to... years ago. Yes. Just think of it. My brother, destined to become an important court official. As a boy, he had the same tutor as the crown prince. <laughs> now he prefers to bury himself here. And bury you at the same time. Yes. Your brother's a strange man. Oh, what do you expect me to say? He acts strangely sometimes. But that business of the car... Why should he have killed a man he, he doesn't know? You sure you've never seen Isaac Goldberg before? Quite sure. There must have been a mistake. It's because of that you let him go, isn't it? Perhaps. You will defend him, won't you? You, you will get him out of this mess. I should be so grateful to you. <clears throat> Um, and and now you you'd better go. If he finds you here, heaven knows what he'll think. Now, Lapointe, Anderson's employers confirmed there's some cash for him to pick up, but up till a quarter of an hour ago, he hadn't shown up. Hmm. I circulate the description of his car to all police stations and frontier posts. We'll let you know if he arrives back here. Any other news, your car? The doctor's taken the bullet out of Madame Goldberg, as we thought it's a rifle bullet. Mm, nothing else? Uh, yes. I checked with the Belgian police, and they say they'd suspected Goldberg for a long time of trafficking in stolen jewels. Ah. His visit down here came just after a theft of two million pounds worth of jewels in London. They think he brought them here to dispose of them. Do they? Mm -hmm. Well, if so, where are they? Nothing was found on the body. Where is my brother, Inspector? 
Why hasn't he come home? We have news of your brother, mademoiselle. That's why I called. Yes? His car has been found abandoned just this side of the Belgian frontier. What? Everything suggests he fled the country. Oh, no, that, that isn't true. It, it's impossible. He, he wouldn't have left me here alone. What would become of me with nobody to look after me? Mademoiselle... I hate this place. I want to get away. Away from this house. Away from the crossroads. I want to go to Paris where there are people. The country frightens me. Will they arrest Carl in Belgium? A warrant will be issued for his extradition. Oh, it's incredible. When I think that only three days ago... A great so... deal can happen in three days, mademoiselle. Come in. Yes, you got what is it? Nothing much, Chief. I just saw the garage proprietor in his Sunday best and asked him where he was going. It seems he's in the habit of taking his wife out to dinner in Paris once a week and afterwards going to the theatre. When that happens, he doesn't come back till the next day because he spends the night in a hotel. I just thought you ought to know where they all are. Mm, has he left? Must have done by now. Did you ask him where he has dinner? At the Escargo in the Rue de la Bastille. <laughs> then he goes to the Ambigu Theatre. He puts up at the Hotel Rambuteau in the Rue de Rivoli. Ah, all cut and dry. <laughs> And uh, Michonet sent a message by his wife that he'd like to talk to. Or rather have a chat with you, to use his own word. Right. It's still a girl that puzzles me. Sometimes I think that all the people round her, the garage proprietor, Michonet, the Dane, are all guilty, but not her. And sometimes I feel the exact opposite. <laughs> but then what about Anderson? A man like him. Well-bred, educated, intelligent, at the head of a gang. We'll see him tonight. What? But if he's crossed the frontier... Mm. You think that I he's... think the whole business is ten times more complicated than you imagine. Well, look at the facts. Michonet was the first to lodge a complaint, and he's asked me over to his house tonight. The very night when the garage proprietor is in Paris, very ostentatiously... And Anderson has skipped over the frontier. I wonder what Michonet wants. What I want to know is, when am I going to get another car? Are you ill, monsieur? Your wife indicated you couldn't come downstairs. I have an attack of gout. Who wouldn't be ill in my position? You think it's smart, I suppose, to, to take the bread and butter out of a man's mouth. I, I'm not going to mince my words. It doesn't matter about the murderer. It's much more important worrying ordinary, decent folk. Anything else apart from your car? I would have thought that was plenty. I'm in pain. I'm looking forward to three or four nights in this armchair without any sleep. And I can't carry out my business without a car. I warn you, Chief Inspector. I shall call you as a witness when I bring an action for damages. Oh, thank you for the warning. Is that all you have to say to me? That is all. Hmm. Good night, Inspector. Well, Yuka, uh, did you check what calls they'd been from Paris? Two calls to the garage, one at one o'clock, one at five, one to the Michonets at five past five. All right. Now get half a dozen inspectors over here and post them round the crossroads. Very good, Chief. And then get someone at headquarters to check that Oscar is still in Paris. They can phone the restaurant, the theatre, the hotel and let us know if he leaves. Or, uh, better still, follow him. Where will you be? At the Andersons. Will you think that Anderson's... I don't think anything at all. I've been thinking, thinking... About what? About Carl. He's been so strange these last years. Are you telling me you think he's guilty? N no. And even if he were, it would only mean he was mad. Mad? Oh, how can I explain... When we left Denmark, we were ruined. But my brother was convinced that with his background, he would find some splendid post in Paris. He didn't succeed. It was then it started. The fits of depression, his hatred of strangers. Then he decided to bury us here. And he insisted on locking me in my room every night on the pretext that we might be attacked. I was terrified. If there had been a fire, what could I have done? I should have been trapped. 
One day, when he was in Paris, I sent for a locksmith who made me a key. Did you? How did you manage that? I uh, had to climb out of the window, but I was desperate. Carl often spoke of destroying us both. I realized then he was seriously ill. I bought this revolver at Arpajon during another of my brother's trips to Paris. I keep it here, just in case. Mm. Is that all? Don't you believe me? Mm. Oh, oh, I felt something would happen. What's going on? It's Carl Anderson, Jeep. He's been shot. Uh, Elsa? Elsa? The doctor says he'll pull through unless there are any unforeseen complications. Mm. He's been shot twice. Once earlier on today. Probably early afternoon. In the back of point blank range. Browning automatic. Someone was probably holding the gun in his back and he must have moved suddenly and saved himself. The bullet was deflected and lodged between his ribs. And the other bullet? Fired from a rifle. It smashed his shoulder blade. The doctor's sending an ambulance over straight away. Elsa? He's conscious. Mm. No, don't move, Anderson. Elsa's in her room. I'll send her in in a minute. Did you see who shot at you? No. And the first time, where was that? I was on my way to deliver my work. You didn't show up there? No. At the Porte d'Orléans, a man flecked me down. He said he was the police. Yeah, let me have you. He got into the car and told me to take the road to Compiègne. The road goes through a forest, and as I was taking a bend, I was shot in the back. Yes? I came to in the ditch. The car had gone. What time was that? I don't know. Late morning, I think. I kept feeling faint. I could hear trains going by. I found a station. By five o'clock, I was in Paris. Finally, I came here. Did you meet anybody? No. I came through the park. Just as I got near the steps, somebody fired a shot. Oh. <laughs> Please, I'd like to see Elsa. Mm, I'll send her in. Uh, Luca. Yes, Jean. Make sure the garage proprietor hasn't left Paris. Right. What next? Hmm? I haven't the faintest idea. Where did you end up, Jules? Well, there weren't many places to choose from. I could see Michelet silhouetted against his window, still sitting in his armchair, so I popped my head into the garage. Had Oscar got back? No, but uh, one of his mechanics was there, loading a spare wheel onto the back of a lorry. Odd. I don't see anything odd in that. It was a garage, after all. Well, the wheel was the wrong size for the lorry. Hmm. Well, he could have been picking it up for another car. No, he wasn't. And there were dozens of spare wheels there. Far too many for a place that size. The mechanic seemed rather anxious to leave, so I handcuffed him to one of the workbenches and opened up the tyres. And what did you find? The diamonds? No. Drugs, mainly. Cocaine, heroin. But there were other things. Silverware, jewellery, money. <laughs> you name it, they'd got it. So all the lorry drivers had to do was pull up at the garage, change their spare wheel for one containing the loot, and drive on their way. Mm. And nobody any the wiser. Except you. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that nearly turned out nastily. How? Well, I heard a car slowing down outside. Someone shouted, Oscar. I went out, and as I did, whoever was in the car opened fire with a revolver. Well, I dived back inside, and they drove off. The police on guard at the Andersons heard the row and set off after them. Who was it? 
Oh, Oscar and some Italian he'd brought back from Paris. Name of Ferrari, Guido Ferrari. Our chaps caught up with them about twenty miles along the road. Lively little place, your three widows' crossroads. <laughs> Noisy, too. Guns going off all over the place. When I looked up at Michemet's window, there he was, still sitting in his armchair, hadn't moved. Well, he had gout, hadn't he? Yeah, but even with gout, you'd expect him to turn round, pull the curtains back, have a peep. So Luca and I went across and took a look round. No sign of Michonet. Just one of his wife's mops, propped up in the chair, and arranged to throw a shadow like a head on the curtain. So that anyone would think Michonet was still at home. Or so that I'd think he was still at home. And then the crossroads really started to get noisy. We were just leaving the house when we heard what sounded like a, a fight going on in the Anderson's garden. Devil of a row. We got there, and who do you think it was? Michonet and Elsa Anderson. How do you know? Everyone else was busy shooting or being shot at. She's got the gun, Chief. She's fired off five shots already. We can't get near them. Michonet. Mademoiselle Anderson, give yourselves up. Michonet, let her go. That's the last, is it? I think so. Oh, I hope you're right. Uh, come on, let her go, Michonet. Elsa, the gun's empty. Drop it. Oh, that's better. Oh, oh. Now, what the hell are you two up to? He was throttling me. That's a lie. Uh, he tried to strangle me. He's, he's insane. She's uh, lying. She's the one who's insane. Why had you got that revolver? Uh, I, I was afraid of a trap. It's a lie. You say you were attacked. Yes. She's lying. And you didn't scream for help? I couldn't. What stopped you? He, he did. She's lying. He's mad. Now take him inside, Yuka. <laughs> right, sir. Oh, come on, mademoiselle. It's all over. Oh. Oh. I suppose it is. <laughs> what gave you the tip-off? Did I make a mistake? Several. How long have you been Carl Anderson's mistress? <laughs> I'm not his mistress. I'm his wife. Mm. Where did you meet Isaac Goldberg? I'm not talking. Oh, well, most of the facts seem to have fallen into place already, so as for the rest, we'll see. All right, Yuka, let's have a look at them. In you come. Elsa, Oscar, Michonet. Who was this? Guido Ferrari. He was in the car with Oscar when they were picked up. Is he known? Yes. Right. Now... First crime. Isaac Goldberg is shot at point-blank range. Who brought Goldberg to the Three Widows' Crossroads? I have nothing at all to do Be with quiet, this, Inspector. Be quiet, Ferrari. I'll deal with you in a moment. Well? I'm waiting. Goldberg was in Antwerp. There was something like two million worth of diamonds to get rid of. Who started the ball rolling? I did. I met him in Copenhagen. I knew he specialised in stolen jewels. When I read about the London robbery and the papers said the diamonds were supposed to be in Antwerp, I, I guessed Goldberg was in on it. I spoke to Oscar about it. Who wrote to Goldberg? She did. And what was your part in all this, Oscar? I was the fence. I found markets for the stuff, that's all. So, Goldberg arrived during the night in his own car. There was a party waiting for him, because you weren't planning to buy the diamonds, however cheap they were, but to steal them. And to steal them from Goldberg, you had to kill him. Now, who was given the job? Anderson. Who? Anderson. <laughs> That's a lie. Elsa, how did you meet Anderson? It was in Copenhagen. I was living with a sailor, um, Hans. He belonged to a gang, and one night they decided to break into a bank, but somebody squealed and the cops surrounded us. I started to run, and then I saw the wall of a park. I pulled myself up and fell down the other side, and when I came to, there was this tall young man looking down at me. Anderson? Yes. He hid me in his parents' house and looked after me. He 
lost his eye in a flying accident. He wore a black monocle. He was convinced that no woman could ever love him uh, looking like that. But he fell in love with you? Yes. We got married in Holland. He taught me to uh, dress differently, how to lose my accent. Uh, he made me read books. And later we settled here because uh, Carl was always afraid of meeting some of my uh, old friends. To throw people off the scent, he passed me off as his sister. How did you get mixed up with Oscar? I spotted her, damn it. It was easy. I saw straight away that all her airs and graces were put on. I used to pray around the house when old one eye wasn't there. One day we got into conversation through the window. She called on straight away. I threw her a lump of wax to make an impression of a lock. Then we met outside and we talked. It was easy. She was fed up, anchored after the old life. Hmm. Now, every night there was a lot of suspicious activity at the crossroads. The vegetable lorries coming back empty from Paris, bringing the stolen good. There was no need to worry about the Andersons' house, but there uh, remained the Michonnets. We needed a respectable character to sell some of the stuff in the country. Mm. Elsa, I suppose, was given the job of fixing Michonnet. <laughs> well, what's the good of a cracker like that otherwise? He fell for us straight away, didn't you, Michonnet? So, you got the chance of a couple of millions worth of diamonds, but you're going to end up with a corpse as well. It was then you decided to frame Anderson, wasn't it? It was her idea. You. Yes, I know. Elsa had got to the point where she hated him. So, he was to be saddled with the crime. That's right, isn't it, Elsa? I'm not talking. Michonne is very scared. He's never been mixed up in anything like this before. So it's decided to take his car, as that's the best way to clear him. He'll be the first to complain to the police and make a fuss about its disappearance. And somebody has the bright idea of switching cars, so that the police would be led to Anderson's garage. But things started to go wrong. I didn't arrest Anderson. I let him go free. And to cap it all, Madame Goldberg turned up. Are you going to tell me who killed her? Never mind. I know the same man killed both the Goldbergs when it was he who posed as a police officer and shot Anderson. But Carl wasn't dead. The murderer, after he'd abandoned his car, went back to the ditch for the body and it was gone. He telephoned Oscar from Paris. Carl is bound to come back to his wife. He must be finished off. So... Now the moment has come to use poor, besotted Michonnet. You, you have no proof. I wouldn't rely on that. Oscar goes to Paris, very ostentatiously. Elsa tells Michonnet she'll go away with him once Carl is dead. So he shoots Carl. But once more, Carl survives. He would. Yes. Meanwhile, Oscar hears all isn't going to plan. He and Ferrari drive down from Paris and attempt to kill me. They take the road to Orléans. Why? You know so much, you tell us. Oh, thank you, I will. They go that way because a lorry is on that road with a spare wheel containing the diamonds. Why did you attack Elsa, Michonnet? I didn't. I loved her, but she tried to kill me. Yes, that fits. She knew your talk. You weren't a professional. So she decided to finish you off. And you, Oscar? I'm a fence, just that. I've never had anything to do with killing. He's a lying. He's not Ferrari. Because you're the one that fired the gun three times. First at Goldberg, then at his wife, and finally in the car at Carl. That's a lie. He gave all the orders. Him. Oscar, get them out you. of here, Luca. Thief, I didn't even get the money you promised Take them me. back to headquarters. Come along, you. You bloody walk. Come on. Well, Elsa. Well, what? It's Carl's fault, too. Really? You know yourself it's his fault. He's half mad. It excited him to know I belonged to a gang. That's why he fell in love with me. And if I'd become the virtuous young woman he wanted to make me, he'd soon have got bored. All the same... And Ferrari was the killer, wasn't he? <laughs> oh, no. 
You won't get me to squeal, Chief Inspector. Au revoir. Au no revoir, mademoiselle. <laughs> Madame. How long did she get? Three years. And Carl? Oh, he recovered. His family took him back. I saw him again just once, three months later, at the prison, waving his marriage contract and demanding to see Elsa. He stood by her in spite of everything. Yes. He even settled in Paris just to be able to visit her. But why? That's what I asked him. All he said was, she's my wife. In Maigre at the Crossroads by Georges Simenon, translated by Robert Baldick and adapted for radio by Aubrey Woods, Maigre was played by Maurice Denham and Simenon by Michael Goff. Luca, Brian Haynes, Carl Anderson, Wolf Carlo, Michonne, Lawrence Harrington, Elsa, Nicolette McKenzie, Oscar, Martin Matthews. Ferrari and the chauffeur David Kahn and Madame Michonnet Sheila Rayner. The play was produced and directed by Christopher Venning. Simenon's Maigret, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simenon. No, Georges, I haven't told you about the José case. Why not, Jules? Well, there are several cases I haven't told you about for... Um... Oh, personal reasons. For the part I played in them. And one of them was the José case. Here's the file on it. Which suggests to me that you're going to tell me about it now. That's right. But why now? It happened over four years ago, didn't it? Because it disturbed me then, and it continues to disturb me. And secondly, because of something that happened in my office a couple of days ago. It made me wonder more than ever about the outcome of the trial. Maurice Denham as Jules Maigret and Michael Goff as Georges Simenon in Maigret Has Doubts, translated by Lynn Moyer and adapted to radio by Edward Bruce. José presented himself at the Otoy police station at 2.30 in the morning, as you say, about four years ago. I've forgotten the exact date, but you'll find it in the file. Mm -hmm. And announced that his wife had been murdered. I first heard of it on my way to work. Terrible murder in Otay. Terrible murder in Otay. Oh, morning, Chief Inspector. Good morning, Pierre. Christine Josse murdered. Read all about it. Christine Josse. Oh, you knew her? Well, I knew of her. Give me a paper. You in charge, Inspector? Nice one, this. Throat cut. Oh, it's the husband done it, I reckon. Wealthy woman found dead with her throat cut. But must you be so specific? Sells papers. Christine Josse found dead. Wealthy woman found with throat cut. Read all about it. At the Quai des Orfèvres, I found that José had been sent from Auteuil for questioning. He was brought into my office. By this time, it was after 11. I ordered sandwiches and beer. I knew it was going to be a long session. I'm sorry that you should be questioned at such a time, monsieur, but it is necessary. Now, Inspector Jean Vier here would take down all you say. You'll be given a copy of it. And if you consider it accurate, I shall ask you to sign it. Are you ready, Jean? Yes, Chief. All right. 
I mean, let me start with the usual questions. Identity. Surname, Christian names, profession. Adrien Josse, aged 40. I'm a pharmacist, head of the firm of Virieux and Josse. I was born in the Aero region. And when did you come to Paris? About 15 years ago. I worked first in various jobs as a locum in chemist shops. You were um, ambitious? Is that why you came to Paris? Not particularly. Paris seemed to offer better opportunities than a provincial town. Is all this necessary? Well, every detail has some importance. Oh, I see. You're trying to find out what kind of person I am. Well, let me tell you, Chief Inspector, I'm a very ordinary person. No better, no worse than any other. And certainly ordinary in the eyes of Christine and her friends. Well, why was that, do you think? No, I was a provincial. Christine was a sophisticated Parisienne. I've not always been accepted by her circle. Mm, how did you come to meet her? I was working at one of the fashionable shops in the Faubourg Saint-Honoré. She was one of our best customers. She was a widow. And very wealthy, I understand. Very. When did you get married? Oh, you've missed a point, Chief Inspector. Mm? I became her lover first, although I wasn't the only one. She had other lovers? Certainly. We often quarrelled about them, but she'd always led a very free life. How long before you got married? About three years. We... I suppose you'll find this a rather ridiculous statement, but gradually we fell in love. I understood her and she seemed to need me, at least for the first few years of our marriage. But once married to her, I couldn't go on working at a chemist shop. So she bought out a small chemical laboratory and put me in charge. José and Virieux. Later, she gave me a full partnership. You sound bitter about it. Well, of course I am. You're thinking like our friends, like the Gigolo, that I married her for her money. Well, that isn't true. I worked hard. I made something of that firm. It was nothing when I started to manage it. Now it's one of the best known in Paris. Why am I being questioned like this anyway? I went to the police. I told them what I'd found. Now, please, monsieur, calm yourself. Sit down. Now, would you like a sandwich? Beer? I need a... I need a brandy. Perhaps I could oblige. Keep some in my office for a special occasion. Uh, Jean Vier, a uh, brandy for Monsieur José. Yes, of course. Look, let's get it straight. Strange as it may seem, I loved my wife, even though I knew she was a tramp. And she stopped taking lovers for the first few years of our marriage. We lived happily together for nearly ten years, no matter what her faults or mine. And for the last five years? Well, no. We, we fell into a moderately... Uh, comfortable acceptance of each other's behavior. She took more lovers, her protégé, as she called them. We even discussed them. I slept with her occasionally. Not often, and... You took a mistress? Your brandy, monsieur. Oh, thank you. Well, yes. Is, is that surprising? Asante. Asante. Do you drink a lot? Oh, yes. It appears you drank a lot last night. Not as much as Christine. She'd become an alcoholic. Her loyal friends wouldn't admit that. Although Christine was careful, so perhaps they didn't know. During the last few years, she's often slept into the afternoons, but when she woke up, she couldn't function without spirits. I and mean, sometimes, drugs. I'd like to know more about your mistress. What's her name? Annette Touche, my secretary. We've been lovers for about a year. She has a little flat in the Rue Colancourt. Do you pay for its upkeep? Not entirely. Let's say I subsidise it. And how often do you go there? Once or twice a week. She prepares a meal. Well, it's more intimate. We rarely eat out. It's a pleasant flat. Geraniums in the window boxes. And... As a matter of fact, I was there yesterday evening. Mm, we'll come to what you did yesterday in a moment. Now, is Mademoiselle Duchet a Paris girl? No. She comes from fontenay le comte her father is head clerk to the sous-prefecture there. Although he wasn't doing his job yesterday, he came to the Rue Colincourt while I was there. Oh? Why? Because he just found out about my affair with his daughter. Annette was only 20, so I suppose. Well, anyway, he was very upset and surprisingly quite drunk. Annette tells me he rarely drinks. Had you ever met him before? No. There was quite a scene in the flat. He wanted to know what I was going to do about it. I tried to placate him. Well, it was difficult. He was so drunk, almost incoherent. Then he asked if my wife knew about it, and when I said yes, he asked me if I was going to divorce her. I must admit I said yes without really thinking. You mean you didn't really want to divorce? It's difficult to answer that question. If I was less tired, I, well, I could explain more clearly. But I want you to know I'm trying to help you in every way I can. 
perhaps I had during the year with Annette considered a divorce, but not seriously. I was happy the way things were. I think I only wanted to pacify the old man. Now, you said your wife knew about your affair. Oh, yes. By this time, we never hid anything from each other. And how did she react? With contempt. She'd met Annette in my office, and later she asked, Oh, and how is the little girl? Not uh, pregnant yet. What will you do when that happens, will you? Ask for a divorce. No, excuse me. Uh, Magra. Dr. Paul, I thought you'd like a preliminary report. I sent you the final one when we finish checking. Good, thanks. There are 21 wounds inflicted by a sharp instrument, so sharp that the head was almost severed from the body. Uh, she'd not eaten. Uh, time of death, somewhere between 10 and 1. Oh, well, can't you be more precise? Uh, not at the moment. Uh, round 11 seems probable, however. Uh, one more detail which, which might interest you. She'd had sexual intercourse a few hours before her death. Uh, thank you, Doctor. You've been very helpful. I'll be in touch. Oh, I'm sorry about that interruption. Now, where were we? I'm damned if I know. You've treated everything I've said with mistrust and suspicion. No, that is not true. Look, the only thing clear to me is that I'm being questioned as if I were a guilty man. I'll tell you something. Just being here is beginning to make me feel guilty. Every time I open my mouth, I, I seem to be building up some motive for killing Christine. And I did not kill her. Monsieur, I'm trying... <clears throat> Monsieur, you must calm down for your own sake. Must? Must? Haven't I the right to behave like a normal human being to protect myself? Good God! I've hardly slept all night. I don't know what I'm saying. I've got... No, to... please, monsieur. Yes, what is it, Maigret speaking? Camellio here. Has he confessed? No, monsieur, I'm very busy. Has he confessed? Look, this is a very complex situation. The interrogation is in progress. Does he deny? I haven't got that far. Then you should read the papers. I want you to come to my office straight away. But I'm... But straight away. I seem to be ahead of your interrogation. Now, Megre, take a look at that. The midday edition. Look at it. Double life of Adrien Josse. A violent scene in Love Nest in the Rue Coulancourt. Yes, I know about that. Mm, you didn't say that on the phone. I didn't have the chance to, sir. The press seemed to be more on the ball than you. How did they get the story so quickly? It seems Anna Duchesne's concierge phoned the editorial office of Le Monde. Hmm? I wonder why. Wonder what? Why the concierge phoned? Oh, I can't see that it matters. Well, it may have an importance. I don't understand you, Magray. You should know that we deal in fact. That's our job. And we have facts. You just said so. The story is true. So don't you think Josse should be arrested? No, I think it's too early. I'd like to finish my interrogation before I finally make up my mind. Oh, well, get on with it. And don't waste any more time. Yes, sir. You've met Camelio, haven't you, Georges? One of your examining magistrates? Mm. Yes. An impatient man. His moustaches tremble. <laughs> I hadn't noticed. Mm. Oh, he's often called my dear enemy. He's not a bad man, but, as you say, impatient. A fact to him is a fact. And he'll act on it. But you like to consider what lies behind a fact. Hmm? Yes. Yes, I do. Anyway, I was in a temper that morning. When I went out of his office, I banged the door so hard that I nearly broke the glass. <laughs> Not for the first time. But, to be fair to him, I was more in a temper with myself. Because I didn't think I'd handled my interrogation of Jossé very well. And you'd missed your lunch. Oh, yes. <laughs> Louise had prepared me champignon à la grec and escalope de veau à la viennoise. Much better for you than beer and sandwiches from the Brasserie Dauphine. You're overweight, Jules. Oh, you're not sylph like yourself. <laughs> anyway, I went back to my office. Now, let's go over your movements from late yesterday evening, monsieur. All right. Well, uh, I left the office with Annette about six. We bought some food for the evening meal. Then we went to the Rue Colancourt. At about eight o'clock, I had my confrontation with her father, as you already know. We were halfway through our meal when he arrived. After our altercation, funny thing, we, we finished drinking each other's health with the remainder of the champagne. Hmm. And then? I left early. I was upset. 
After my promise to André Duché to marry Annette, I felt I'd betrayed Christine. Even though our life together wasn't idyllic, there was something about Christine that still excited me. Annette isn't the same as Christine is. Was. I wish I could explain. She was the first woman I'd ever known deeply and, and intimately. It's something I can never forget. Your first real passionate love. Have you, Chief Inspector? Have you? Oh, would it be possible for me to uh, have another brandy? Hmm? Sure, jean -Vier. Chief. Uh, would you like a sandwich? Uh, I, I couldn't eat anything. Uh, do you mind if I do? <laughs> no. Your drink, monsieur. Thank you. Do you get an allowance for supplying brandy to uh, uh, to suspects? Mm, it's my pleasure. Well, go on. You left through Collingor. I wandered from bar to bar for an hour or so. The select, the double scotch, an English bar, and the Café Robert. Well, you can check. I'm known there. I drink too much. I, I was getting maudlin. Thought about Christine. Knew she'd never give me a divorce. She used to say... As long as I have my money, I can buy friends. Money. <laughs> oh, another damaging remark. You'll find I will inherit her estate. But despite what I've said about her, there was good and bad in her. We understood each other. Oh. That's potent brandy, Chief Inspector, or is it that I'm a quick drunk? I drank an awful lot last night. You don't want any food? No, no. Mm. No, thank you. All right, then. I got back to the Rue Lopère. Oh, that's where I live. Mm, I know. At about five past ten. Uh, Georges, have a look at the appendix to the interrogation. I made a summary of José's movements until he presented himself to the police at Etoy. Yes, that's it. Back at ten, five, Christine's car parked outside. Realized that she was at home. Went into lounge, poured another drink, sat down in armchair and... Went to sleep. You mean passed out? Not surprising, considering the amount of liquor he'd consumed. Woke some time later. Says next few hours like a nightmare. Went upstairs, opened Christine's door. They slept in different rooms. Yes. Opened Christine's door and discovered body. Time about midnight, according to José. She... She was half out of her bed, her head hanging down onto a fur rug. There was blood everywhere. God, I've never seen anything so... so... so. What happened next? I went into the bathroom and vomited. Your men should find traces of it. As to why I vomited, I suppose you'll draw your own conclusions. Does a murderer vomit after he's committed a crime like this? I don't know. And then? I washed my face and shaved. Shaved? I'd begun to panic. My first reaction was to go away, to catch a plane from Orly Airport. I, I travel a lot. I'm quite well known there. I thought I should make myself presentable. I've always dressed well. Even in my early days in Paris, I spent more on clothes than on food. For a provincial, I had a certain style. I suppose that was one of the reasons why Christine first took me up. I was a presentable escort, almost good enough for her society friends. Didn't you think of phoning the police? Yes. I even went to the phone. But I didn't... I didn't ring. Why not? I... I'm not sure. It was the words, I'd have to say, I suppose. Someone has killed my wife. I wasn't thinking clearly. I was still half drunk. And afraid. Well, of course, I told you I was most dreadfully murdered. Yes, I see you do understand. You've grown quite pale, Chief Inspector. May we go on? You decided to catch a plane at Orby? Yes. But there was a complication. I didn't have much money on me. But there was about 30,000 francs in the safe in my office. Then I 
So what of my wife's jewels, the ones she kept into the house? They were worth quite a lot. They were in her bedroom. And you didn't want to go back in there? Well, of course I didn't. And did you go? Yes. I'd left the light on in there when I went to the bathroom. But I switched it off first, then I almost ran to her dressing table, snatched up the jewels that were lying on it, and then I went downstairs, let myself out of the house. Did you take a taxi? Yes, I caught one round the corner. I thought it would be unwise to use my own car. But I went to my office and let myself in. What time was this? Well, I had no idea then. Thinking back, it must have been about midnight. And then? I took the money from the safe. Then I sat down. I was numb, still in a state of shock. I had little time to think. That's when I began to realise that going to Orly Airport would be a futile thing to do. So I put the money back into the safe. Did you go back to your house then? No. By this time I needed a drink. There was a bar open near my office. They may remember me coming in. I had a large whiskey. Then I went back home. Mm, an important little detail we'll check. Oh, I'm bloody sure you will. And when you got back, did you return the jewels to your wife's dressing table? Yes, yes. Your men will find my fingerprints all over them. And you still didn't call the police? What did you do then? I went out again, wandered about the streets. Where? I don't remember. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, I, I do remember finding myself on the Pont Mirabeau. But I don't remember how I got there. Mm. And finally, you walked to the Utoy police station, arriving there at 2.30. Oh, well, was that the time? I don't know. No. Mm. May I? Cormelia. Has he confessed? No, he still denies it. I'd like to see you in my office. Look, there are other things I could be doing. Chief Inspector, I would like you to come to my office at once, please. Well, as quickly as I can. Sir. Well, that's all for now, Monsieur José. Sorry it's taken so long. Inspector Jean Vier will bring you a typed statement. Read it, and if you think it accurate, I'd be pleased if you'd sign it. And if there's anything you want, just ask the inspector for it. On the way to Comelio, I wandered into the inspector's office. Le Pont had just got back from José's house, where he'd been questioning the maid and Madame Siran, the housekeeper. He was typing out his report. How did you get on, Lapointe? Well, has he told you about the dagger? Hmm? What dagger? Ah, you don't know. Well, this should interest you. When I was questioning Madame Siran in Josse's study, I saw that she was looking for something, although she tried to hide it from me. I asked her what she was looking for. She said nothing at first. But she finally admitted that she was wondering what had happened to the dagger. What kind of dagger? German. One of those commando knives that people sometimes keep as a souvenir. Well, she said it was usually on José's desk. He used it as a letter opener. But it wasn't there. No. I searched the house from top to bottom. There was no sign of it. I thought it could be the murder weapon. A dagger of that type could be pretty lethal, couldn't it, sir? If it was an old commando knife, I think you're safe in making that assumption, my boy. Uh, is there anything wrong, Chief? Look, I've had to forego an excellent lunch, and our respected examining magistrate is driving me up the wall. Otherwise, I'm my normal, calm self. Look at that smirk of your face. I prefer your look of ingenuous innocence. Yes, sir. And let me have your report as soon as you've touched it out. <coughs> Why are you so reluctant to come to a conclusion? Am I? It's simply that I'd prefer to be sure. I will admit that José seems over-anxious to justify his statements, to be precise and truthful, but... But what? What, what, what? There's still a lot to check. Oh, for God's sake, Megrin, look at the facts. José promised that he would divorce his wife. That means he would have to give up his wealth and position, lose his share in his firm. And this... loveness... That's a cheap newspaper headline. Aren't you prejudging the case, condemning the man on moral grounds? Oh, absolute nonsense. We have here an unscrupulous man who took advantage of a vulnerable, wealthy woman and then took a mistress. It's a classic situation which often leads to tragedy. You've never understood these people, Megre. This society, I do. 
Uh, four or five of my friends who know Josse and his wife have been on the phone to me. Are they against her? Oh, they know what he is, an interloper, an intruder. And were they Josse's friends also? I didn't say that. I said that they were my friends, and I respect their opinion. <laughs> Rather tenuous grounds for a charge of murder, don't you think so? Oh, really, mate. Look, I said before I'd like to finish my interrogation before you take any action. All right. I'll wait until your final report before his committal. But you may take it. But my mind is made up. From the look on your face, it looks as if I'm going to be arrested. I think so. It was inevitable. I knew all along I should have gone to the airport. Well, that wouldn't have done you any good. Monsieur, why didn't you tell me about the dagger? What have you done with it? Oh. Yes, I... I should have told you. Mm. You threw it into the Seine from the Pont Mirabeau, didn't you? Well, they found it. Not yet. I've only just heard about it. Tomorrow the divers will go down. Did you kill your wife? No. Then why did you go to the trouble of disposing of the dagger by throwing it into the Seine? Because if it had been found in the house... It... I don't know. It could have been used to kill Christine. It was in my bedroom when I got home. I don't know how it got there. I suppose I took it there for some reason or other. I don't remember. If the police had found it, I I couldn't think what I would say to them. I, I know it's irrational. Were but there I... any bloodstains on it? No. Well, then why? Well, because if the dagger had been used, the murderer would have cleaned the weapon, wouldn't he? So, you see, if I'd killed her, I would have cleaned it. That's what the police would have thought. That's why I threw it into the same. Nobody would have believed me. I didn't get away from the Quai des Orfèvres until 6.30 that night. On the way home, I decided to go to the Rue Colincourt to see what kind of woman Annette Duchet was and to verify Josse's story. Somehow he'd given me the impression that the whole affair with her was a romantic one. Geraniums in the window, tete-a-tete meals, candlelight. Now, what I found was disappointing in a way. She turned out to be a very ordinary girl, who, although she'd obviously been crying, seemed hardly upset that her lover was facing a charge of murder. What about the geraniums? Well, they were half dead. <laughs> no, she confirmed the quarrel with her father. In fact, everything that Chasse had told me. One new fact that I didn't know was that her father had been drinking at the bar opposite before he came to the flat. Well, I was thirsty. I thought it worth a visit. Yes, I remember him well. A thin, gaunt man. Wasn't a drinkard. A sick man, if you ask me. Hey, wait a minute. You're Chief Inspector Magri, aren't you? Yes. So, uh, that pharmacist has confessed, has he? I didn't say anything about a farm, is it? Oh, you don't have to. I've read about it. He used to come in here with that girl quite often. I've had my eyes on him for quite a while. Bloody terrible, I call it. A mistress like that. Uh, very interesting. But I'm more interested in your customer. Was he angry in a temper? No, he was very quiet. Anything else you can tell me about him? No. I'd never seen him before or since. You didn't get far with that interview. No routine, necessary legwork. I didn't get home until nearly ten. Louise warmed up the escallop. <laughs> Needless to say, it was overcooked. I've got a very good recipe for escalop with sultanas and red wine. I'll mm. let Louise have it sometime. Mm, thanks. Well, I was late to bed that night. I sat up smoking, going over what Jose had told me, looking for any flaw in his statement. There's still a lot of checking to do. What worried me most was that he'd told me, or so it seemed at that time, the exact truth about his movements, yet he'd lied about the dagger. He doesn't seem to have lied, Jules. Wasn't it more a rather silly omission? You couldn't blame him for that. A frightened man, a weak man. I wonder what I would have done in similar circumstances. Well, in ten minutes, with your dexterous brain, you'd have persuaded your interrogator that he'd done it himself. <laughs> <laughs> now, what I had to consider was that Josse seemed to have told the truth about all his movements outside the house. But what happened inside between ten five and about eleven thirty? We only had Josse's statement, no witnesses. 
Since Christine died after ten, could anybody else have got into the house unnoticed while he was allegedly sleeping? Could they? Undoubtedly. It was something I checked up on the next morning. It's solidly built, heavy oak doors. The lounge room leads from the hallway, which in turn leads to the first floor. Now, if the door was closed, an intruder could have got up to Christine's room without being heard. But also, an intruder wouldn't have been aware that Chaucer was asleep in an armchair. What next? Comilio didn't make a committal for another three days. He waited for my final report, which simply verified Chaucer's statements. He considered there was enough circumstantial evidence for an arrest, and strong motives for murder. When he did make up his mind, José was taken from the Quai des Orfèvres in handcuffs. Handcuffs? Mm. The man had come to the police station of his own accord. Uh, <laughs> Comelio loves his publicity. Handcuffed, José made a better picture for the press. Now, the following morning, I got a nasty shock. And again, I didn't hear about it until I was on my way to my office. Second victim in Chaussee case. Second victim in Chaussee case. Andre Duchet suicides. Love nest sequel. Oh, stop yelling, Pierre. Give me a paper. You mean you don't know about it, you? Look, you're asking for a clip on the ear. Oh, no, Chief Inspector. I'm losing faith in you. I reckon Chaussee is for the chop. <laughs> Don't you, Jules? Go and sell your paper, or I'll run you in for vagrancy. Love their sequel. Death in Fontenay le Comte. Rather suicide. I would have liked to go to Fontenay le Comte myself, but it wasn't possible. So I sent Jean Vier instead. Ah, yes. This is his report. Hmm. Arrived Fontenay le Comte at 3.30. Question Questioned several, several of the local inhabitants. inhabitants. André Duché doesn't appear to have been a popular man, very reserved, but respected. Interviewed the local correspondent who sent in the report. Said Duché most upset when he heard of the murder of Christine Josse. Even more upset when Love Nest's story broke. Committed suicide on evening of Josse's arrest. No evidence of foul play. Discovered in armchair, his own pistol fallen to the floor nearby. On his knee there was an open photograph album opened at a page showing wife in wedding dress. He was a widower, by the way. And early pictures of Annette Duchet. Suicide attributed to shock and sense of disgrace on finding his daughter involved in sensational murder. But I'm not so sure that was the sole reason for suicide. We'll, we'll stay, stay on, on for a couple of days and knows about. about. Mm. The press had a field day after the report of Duchet's suicide. Dignified, lonely old widower shamed by daughter. But worse still, another victim in the Chaussée case. For Chaussée, that meant almost certain conviction. In the minds of the public, it was as if he had killed André Duchet with his own hands. Comelio was delighted with this new development. I don't understand. Why was Comelio so determined that Chaussée was guilty? I can see that there was a lot against him. The girl, his odd relationship with his wife, money, class... Was he guilty, Jules? No. Wait until I finish. You're my private jury. While I presented the evidence, you can decide for yourself. Now, you'll find another report from jean in the file. Uh, no, the next page. Uh, that's it. André Duchet had incurable cancer. Yes. You see what that means. What was the real reason for his suicide? Hmm, that's quite a question. I would say that he committed suicide because he had incurable cancer, and and that his daughter's involvement with José was the catalyst that made him do it. Yes. Yes, you're probably right. Unfortunately, it wasn't the view held by the public or the press. To use a familiar cliché, they were crying out for blood. Public feeling was so against him. And the jury couldn't help but be prejudiced, no matter how unconsciously. Now, let me tell you about Maître Lenin. I know quite a bit about him. I've seen him in the courts. He can be quite spectacular. Oh, he can, indeed. They're quite the wrong man with this case, in my opinion. No, this one should have passed through the courts as quietly as possible. But Maître Lenin had the capacity to attract attention which was perhaps prejudicial to his client. You'll find some newspaper cuttings there. You'll see what I mean. 
Just say accuses. My God, the man had read his own. Yes, it was delivered at one of his press conferences. He was very fond of press conferences. Up to now, Adrien Josse, who has been, as you know, accused wrongfully of the murder of his wife, has chivalrously kept silent on her private life and secret habits. <laughs> be patient with me, gentlemen. It will be shown that many people could have killed Christine Josse, a stealthy intruder, one of her protégés, for example. But the general public has been so busy accusing my client that her private life has been ignored. You mean she had a lover? Not a lover, gentlemen. Lovers? That's putting it too simply. Let us say that she had never lived according to the bourgeois moral code. She was a wealthy woman, and she had what many of her friends described as her protégés. They were also likened to stallions belonging to a well-known owner. If I may be so crude, she had, as her less charitable friends designated it, her own private stud. <laughs> it has been difficult for me to make that statement, but that was the situation. She took a great interest in unknown singers, artists, painters, musicians, whom she collected from, if you'll excuse me, God knows where. She was enamoured of the lower classes. One of her protégés was a mechanic whom she took under her wing, but she dropped him in a week or two. Need I add that these young men, when she tired of them, did not always become resigned to obscurity. Question yourselves, as I have done. You will find that several unsavoury incidents occurred in the life of Christine Josse. Some of them violent. Can you give names? Oh, you know better than that, young man. I leave the naming of names to the magistrates. Now, that press conference was most ill-advised. It created sympathy for the murdered woman rather than sympathy for the accused. But why? Well, I think it had a lot to do with the personality of Maitre Renard who was more concerned with his own publicity than the defence of his client. And the press were violently against Josse. Why? There were more Franks to be squeezed out of moral indignation. And that in itself was a byproduct of guilt there, but for the grace of God go I. I didn't realise you were such a cynic, Jules, and something of a philosopher. But why are you still worried about this case? I wonder if I might have done more for Josse. Why? Do you think he was innocent? I don't know now. I didn't know then. When I first joined the force, when I was less experienced, I might have said I thought he was innocent. But now I've learned that anything, even the improbable, is possible. One thing I'm certain of, José was unlucky. First, we didn't find the dagger in the Seine, and it was implied that José was lying when he said he couldn't remember from which part of the bridge he had thrown it. And then there were the anonymous letters. We got 53 altogether, and two of them, as you'll see, were very damaging. Hmm, yes. Chief Inspector Maigret, who thinks he's so clever, should question a certain Hortense Meletier de Roulepic, who is a filthy abortionist. She had a visit from the Duché girl and her lover two months ago. Was this woman an abortionist? Yes. Did you find out who sent this note? Again, the concierge at the Rue Collincourt. She hated Annette Douche for some reason or other, or wanted to get her picture in the papers. I sent for Mademoiselle Douche. I didn't beat about the bush. Mademoiselle, you've recently had an abortion, is that correct? I su suppose I must answer that. It would be wise to. Yes, I did. Who was the abortionist? Um, Madame Maletier. Who gave you her address? Adrien. Well, I'm afraid I'll be instructed to arrest you. <laughs> and Madame Maletier as well. But you should get bail. I'm sorry, but there'll be no way of keeping it out of the press. Jose and mistress accused of second crime. Abortionist arrested. Annette Duche arrested. Read all about it. Jose accused. With that revelation, public feeling reached its peak. It was difficult to find anyone who believed José was innocent. 
But there's that other anonymous letter I'd like you to read. Christine Josse liked low types. You will find a man called Popol at the Pas de la Lune in the Rue de Charon. She met him several times in a boarding house near the Saint-Martin Canal. Although she gave him money and bought him clothes, that didn't stop him beating her up. She was heard screaming several times. Josse doesn't deserve to be found guilty. He should have cut her throat years ago. Well, one person with sympathy for Josse. Uh, Did you find out anything? No, I went to the Bar de la Lune myself. It was a meeting place for a bunch of very unsavoury characters. Not a word could I get out of them. They said they'd never heard of a Papal. But I'm sure they had. Their answers were too casual, too innocent. Got no further at the boarding house. A very seedy establishment. And finally came the trial. You'll remember the outcome. José found guilty of killing his wife with premeditation. And there were no extenuating circumstances. He looked dreadful in the court. Must have lost three stone while waiting trial. He appealed. His appeal was turned down. And so, of course... You've given me the impression that you think José was innocent. Oh, have I? I hadn't meant to do that. I wanted an objective assessment. I still don't understand why you're telling me about José now. The last page in that file is missing, if indeed it belongs there. The last week I was questioning a man called Dupont, a drug pusher. <laughs> you might call him one of our regular clients. Oh, come off it, Dupont. You're no more a sailor than I'm your uncle. Well, I've been to South America on cargo boats. Uh, Venezuela, for example. Well, when were you last at sea? Oh, about four years ago, not long after the Jose case. The Jose case? <laughs> your ears are flapping. Well, I thought they might. I know something about it. So it might interest you. What? There's a bit of info I intend to sell. Oh, you know that's out of the question. No, 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 no not for money. For a favour. Well, I'm listening. Well, uh, I want you to go easy on my girlfriend. She don't know nothing about this drug charge. Honest to God. Well, I won't make any promises. Well, on this trip to Venezuela, I met a bloke in a bar one night called Pole. Pole, I think his name was. Uh, down on his luck. I bought him a few drinks. Well, by four o'clock he was well under the weather. And he started to ramble, something like that. Oh, the big boys don't believe me when I say I chopped a woman in Paris. Real bitch she was. She had diamonds dripping from her. They used to give me a hand out for favours received, and then she ditched me. And then, then he went real funny after that and said, Some things I... I just can't take. And I... I... <laughs> oh, if the boys only knew. You ever heard of the... Josse case? Then he gave a bit of a smirk and passed out. That's best as I can remember it. What did you say his name was? Mm, Poe. Something like that. He used to hang around the Bastille district when he was in Paris. In the Rue de Charonne? Uh, well, it could be. I, I, I don't remember. And could the man's name have been Papol? I don't remember that either. I'd had a skinful by then, too. Does it interest you? Mm. In a way, it does. I got in touch with the Venezuelan police, but they weren't helpful. Well, that's all, George. Is there any such person as Papal? I don't know. And if there was or is, was he angry enough, humiliated enough to murder Christine Josse? You get a lot of false confessions, don't you? Yes, for all kinds of reasons. Mostly cranks. Do you believe this Dupont? I don't know. I can't stop thinking about Josse. I suppose I told you about him because 
I want your assurance that we didn't execute an innocent man. Did we, Georges? In Maigret Has Doubts by Georges Simenon, translated by Lynn Moyer and adapted for radio by Edward Bruce, Maigret was played by Maurice Denham and Simenon by Michael Goff. Jean Vier, Sean Barrett, La Pointe, John Rye, The Newsboy and Maître Lenin, Robin Soames, José, Alan Rowe, Camelio, Richard Hampton, Pressman, Malcolm Edwards, Patron, David Strong, Dr. Paul, Geoffrey Siegel, Dupont, Bruce Beebe, and Annette, Nicolette McKenzie. The play was produced and directed by Christopher Venning. Simonon's Maigret, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simonon. Tell you who I heard from yesterday, Georges. Inspector Le Duc, that was. How is he enjoying his retirement? Mm, very much. Country life down in the Dordogne seems to suit him. He's asked Louise and me down there for a holiday. Will you go, Jules? Well, we might. Though, <laughs> the last time I tried to visit him, it was a bit of a fiasco. I landed up bedridden. You had only yourself to blame. Jumping out of a moving train is not the thing to do. Not at your age. Well, it was instinct. Police instinct. And imagine yourself trying to get to sleep in the lower bunk of a second-class couchette with the chap above you tossing and turning, moaning like anything... And then finally, after a couple of hours of that carry-on, putting his patent leather boots on and dashing off into the corridor. I just peeped out after him to see what he was up to. So would you have done if he had been in my shoes? Maybe, but I certainly wouldn't have jumped out of the train after him. <laughs> Not in the middle of a wood and in the middle of the night. No wonder he turned round and took a shot at you. Mm, and hit me. Next thing I knew, I was in a hospital bed in Bergerac. And the local police inspector, the doctor, the public prosecutor, and goodness knows who else, were all standing round accusing me of being a homicidal maniac. Maurice Denham as Jules Maigret, and Michael Goff as Georges Simonon in Maigret and the Madman of Bergerac. Translated by Geoffrey Sainsbury and adapted for radio by Aubrey Woods. A homicidal maniac. Mm. So that's the impression you made. Oh, the circumstances were unusual. I can understand you objecting to being thought homicidal, although I'm not sure the other half of the description wasn't pretty correct. Oh, thank you very much, George. Not at all. So... Poor old Leduc had to drive over and bail you out. Oh, he was very good about it. He knew I hated hospitals, so he got me shifted into the local hotel. Louise came down and looked after me. Not much of a holiday for her. Oh, nor for me. I was stuck in bed there for about two weeks. Not the best place from which to conduct an inquiry. You shouldn't have been conducting it at all. What do you think the local police inspector was there for? No, oh, he was useless. But Le Duc was quite informative. In a nutshell, please, I'll just sit up and I'll go careful. That's better. It, uh, it must have been about a month ago they found a woman's body on one of the main roads, mm. strangled. 
But that wasn't all. Having killed her that way, whoever did it, stuck a long needle right through her heart. Uh, was she robbed? No. Assaulted? No. She was a good-looking woman, too. About 30. The crime took place at nightfall as she was returning from her sister-in-law's. That's the first. Mm, there were two. Two and a half. The second was a girl of 16 who'd been out for a ride on her bicycle. She was found in the same state. At night? She wasn't found until next morning, but she'd been killed the evening before. Then lastly, there was one of the maids from this hotel, um, Rosalie. She was on foot. Suddenly someone seized her from behind and threw her down. She's a big, strapping girl. She caught hold of the man's wrist and uh, bit him. Mm. He swore and made off. She only saw his back as he ran into the bushes. And that's all? Well, so far. Mm. But the people here are convinced there's a maniac roaming about in the woods. They refuse to believe it could be one of themselves. So, when the news got around that you'd been found shot, everybody thought you were the murderer, and they won't get the idea out of their heads easily. Who's in charge of the case? Well, the local people in these little towns. Ah, but don't forget, my dear Le Duke, that this little town is different from any other. It's a little town with a madman, a madman at large. A madman who's only mad by fits and starts. Well, the rest of the time, he's walking about and talking to people just like anybody else. Yes, I suppose so. Now, something else I wanted to ask you, just between ourselves. Mm -hmm. What facilities are there in this part of the world for enjoying the charms of the fair sex? <laughs> really, Gilles? Now, don't get self-righteous, for heaven's sake. I'm a sick man. That is neither here nor there. Yeah, but the question is, mm -hmm. it's important. In the country, you don't have all the amenities of the town. How old is your cook? Sixty-five. Well, no so young it's... blood around the place? No little shepherdesses? Well, there's only the cook's niece who comes from time to time to lend her a hand. Sixteen? Eighteen? Nineteen. But really, I... The prosecutor, so he's a bachelor, I understand. Now, how does he manage? Do you think he relates his peccadillas to everyone he meets? This isn't Paris, you know. Yes, I have noticed. But everything gets round sooner or later. Well, I only know what people say. <laughs> there you are. <clears throat> they say he goes once or twice a week to Bordeaux, where he... Um... <clears throat> you know what you ought to do? Huh? Start a little investigation of your own. See if you can find who's away for better our class Tuesday. After all, you've been at the police yourself. Yeah, now, now look here, Jules. A uh, joke's all very well, but this one's gone far enough. Uh, are you seriously suggesting that in a little place like this, where the least thing will set tongues wagging, I should start nosing around like a... Uh, well, well, I won't, that's all. Mm. The local police have taken the case in hand. It's, it's nothing whatever to do with me. And if you want to get mixed up... In something which is no business of mine... Yeah. Well, perhaps you're right, but just imagine how you'd feel if in two or three days' time that little 19-year-old of yours is found with a needle through her heart. Come in. Have I interrupted you? Oh. Uh, no, my dear. I was uh, I was just leaving, Madame Aigret. I haven't yet done my marketing. Uh, au revoir, Jules. Mm. I'll pop my head in again tomorrow. Oh, thank you, Le Duc, and keep your ears open. Yes. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll see. Mm. Now, any news? Not really. But uh, Rosalie, the chambermaid, gossips a little. Your doctor, Dr. Rivo, apparently lives with his wife and his sister-in-law on the edge of town. They say the sister-in-law is just as much his wife as the real one. Ah. Now, anything about the prosecutor? Monsieur Durso? Not as yet. That I believe Rosalie used to work for him once upon a time. I'll have another chat with him. <laughs> we'll make an inspector of you yet. <laughs> no, thank you. Why didn't you use your free travelling pass? What do you mean? When? When you travelled down here. But I did. What have you got there? There's a mat in the passage just outside our door. I moved it just now and found this railway ticket. Under the mat? Well, just at the edge. It's second class... Paris to Bergerac, dated last Tuesday. Hmm. Get a pencil and paper. 
Now, who's been to see me here? Uh, make a list of them. Mm -hmm. First of all, the proprietor of the hotel. Mm -hmm. And then the doctor. doctor. And the prosecutor came to make his little apology. The local police inspector. Uh, who else? There's the Duke. Ah, quite right. Put him down. The Duke. And uh, get the station master on the phone. And then, of course, Could you give uh, the, me the servants, station master, and for that please? matter, anyone Thank staying you. here might Sorry, have dropped it. Hmm? You were saying? No, well, any visitor to the hotel might have dropped that as they went along the passage. But there's no reason for them to be in the passage. Well, why not? Because it only leads to this room. Oh, is that the station master? Just a moment. Uh, thank you, my dear. Uh, Chief Inspector Maigret here, uh, station master. Uh, tell me, did any passengers alight from the early Paris train on Wednesday last? Nobody. Oh, thank you very much. No, no, that's all. So, that ticket must have been used by the man who jumped from the train. And that must be one of the people who've been up here visiting me. How easy this morning, Doctor? Now, his temperature's up. 102. Oh. oh, what can you expect? It moves about too much. Well, I get fed up lying here. And I don't need to ask you if you've been smoking. The air's thick with it. Uh, let's open the window. You ought to forbid it altogether. Would that do any good? <laughs> no, I suppose not. No, oh, I shouldn't bother if I were you, Doctor. Tell me, at what intervals were our madman's crimes committed? Uh, now, let me see. The first was a month ago, the second a week later, and the one that miscarried was a week later still. Mm. You know what I think? That there's a good chance another body will be found in the next day or two. If not, it means the chap feels he's being watched. But if there is another... Well? Well, it might enable us to eliminate some people. Suppose, for instance, you were in this room at the time the crime was committed. Well, that would put you out of the running straight away. Hmm. Suppose the prosecutor was at Bordeaux, the police inspector in Paris, the landlord downstairs in his kitchen, and the duke, anywhere you like. You confine the suspects to the handful of people you've come into contact with? No, not even as many as that. My list is, in fact, restricted to the people who've been to see me here in the hotel who could have dropped... A railway ticket. As a matter of fact, where were you last Tuesday? Last Tuesday, I think... Uh, oh, wait a minute, yes. I, I drove over to La Rochelle for the... Am I to consider myself under examination? <laughs> In that case, I warn you... Now, take Inspector. it easy, Doctor. Don't forget that I've nothing to do all day long, and I'm used to living in a whirl of activity. So I've invented a little game to keep my mind busy. It's called Madman. And you'll admit there's nothing to prevent a doctor being a madman. Huh. Oh, a madman, a doctor, come to that. Oh, by the way, you haven't seen this. Hmm? What is it? Mm, uh, it's a notice. One of the hotel staff is out at this very moment posting copies at various vantage points in the town. I'll, I'll read it to you. At 9 a.m. on Thursday morning, that's tomorrow, at the Hotel Longueterre, Chief Inspector Maigret will give a hundred francs reward to anyone giving information concerning the murders that have recently been committed in the neighbourhood of Bergerac, apparently by some demented person. I don't know whether the murderer is demented, Chief Inspector, but I'm rapidly coming to the conclusion that you are. Hmm? Do you honestly expect anyone to come? Yes. Hmm. What's the time? Five past nine. Oh. I think the doctor was right, you know. Yeah, saying that I was mad. No, though we are behaving very strangely. No, I just agree with him. I don't think anyone will come. Ah, oh. come in. Ah, Le Duke. <laughs> Good morning, Monsieur. Um, are you feeling better? Oh, fine, thanks. Except for my back, which is as stiff as a poker. Have you seen my notice? What notice? Oh, I'm holding a reception here. I've even invited the madman. Hmm. Come in. Ah, Monsieur the Proprietor, what can I do for you? It's about that notice. Are you something to tell me? If I'd had anything to tell the police, I wouldn't have waited until you offered a reward. Now, what I wanted to ask was whether we were to show up everybody who came. Yeah, by all means. 
He'll be back again presently. What for? Oh, hanged if I know, but he'll come all right when everybody's here. He'll find some pretext or other. Now, what time does the prosecutor go to work? Nine, I suppose. Mm, I shouldn't be surprised if he looked in on us at his way. As for the doctor, you can take it from me, he's dashing round the wards as fast as his legs will carry him. And then, if the police inspector turns up, it'll complete the list. What list? Oh, the prosecutor, the inspector, the doctor, the proprietor of the hotel, and you. He's still on that tack. Now, look here, <laughs> make <Macri. laughs> <coughs> Come in. Oh, good morning, Monsieur Duarceau. Good morning. I heard about your notice, mm -hmm. and I thought I'd better see you first. Of course, it's understood you're acting in a private capacity. Even so, I should have liked to have been consulted, considering that this is a case that's being investigated officially. Well, did you take the prosecutor's hat and stick? Oh, Do sit down. Yes. I... Come in. Ah, doctor. Huh. Quite a council of war. Yes, indeed. Eh? Yes? It's one of the chambermaids who wants a word, Chief Inspector. Mm. Uh, thought I'd best bring her up myself. Yes, of course. Uh, come in, uh, Rosalie, isn't it? Y yes, sir. Now, uh, sit down. Mm. Uh, you're <coughs> the girl who was attacked? Hmm? Yes. He came up behind me. I, I was walking back from my brother's place, and, and I felt a hand slipping round under my chin, and over I went. But I bit him for all I was worth. Did you notice anything about him? There was a gold ring on one of his fingers. Did you see him? Not properly. He dashed off in the trees, so I only saw his back. You wouldn't be able to recognise him, then? No. Would you be able to recognise the ring? No. And you've no idea who it was that assaulted you? No. Mm. I'll give her a hundred francs, will you? <coughs> mm. Now, you don't mind acting as my secretary, do you? Uh, uh, no. Oh, I... Thank you, sir. Next, please. If we handed out money like that, we'd have the council down on us in no time. You're really expecting to find something out, Chief Inspector? Oh, dear me, no, nothing at all. Well, in that case, I... I told you the madman might be coming, if not several madmen. Do you think I was mistaken? I must see my brother. Yes. Hmm? Yes, A moment, yes, gentlemen, I don't think we're finished yet. Jacques! Francoise, what is it? What's happened? Your sister-in-law, Doctor. I've seen him. He tried it's to... It's all right, Francoise. It's all right. It was over in the Moulin Neufwood. I was walking along... I and... thought we'd find out something. You saw him, I suppose? Not very well. I, I don't know how I managed to shake him off. He must have tripped. Anyway, he loosed his grip for a moment and I broke free. I hit him. And what did he look like? I don't know. Some sort of a tramp, old clothes... One thing I'm sure of. It was no one I'd ever seen before. He ran away? I heard a car passing along the road. He must have heard it too. He disappeared into the woods. I didn't stop running all the way here. Yeah, wouldn't it have been quicker to go home? I knew there was nobody there except my sister. This proves one thing, anyhow. The madman didn't accept your invitation after all. I suppose you don't want us anymore. Excuse me. Uh, Megre. Oh, yes, he is. It's for you, Doctor. Oh, thank you. Prevo here. I see. Yes, thank you. I'll be there. They found him. Who? Hmm. The man, the, the madman, or rather his corpse, in the Moulin Neuf Wood. They think he's been dead several days. In that case, who was it attacked you, Mademoiselle Francoise? Did you manage to see much? Oh, yes. The gendarme let me get quite close. He was lying at the foot of a tree. Patent leather boots? Yes, uh, and thick grey socks, hand-knitted. Mm. How old? Middle-aged or elderly, but I really couldn't say. He's been lying there at least a week. Uh, that's what they were saying, anyway. Nobody recognised him, so he seems to be a stranger. Mm. Was he wounded? Mm. A huge hole in the side of his head. How was he dressed? In black, a black overcoat. It was horrible. But if, if you want me to go back... No, I... no, my dear. Thank you. <laughs> Come in. Ah, oh, good evening, Le Duke. Good evening, monsieur. Madame Maigret. Do sit down. Oh, uh, thank you. Well, well. So, there we are. Hmm? Mm. Please? Well, that's not... Oh, come on, you all are. 
You, the doctor, the prosecutor, the police inspector, all of you delighted at the way I've been made a fool of. <laughs> that troublesome detective from Paris who thought he'd chuck his weight about, thought himself very clever, where still other people began to think he might be, and some people began to get quite nervous about it. But that's all over now. He's merely made an ass of himself and serve him right. You admit, then, that... Uh, that I was mistaken? Well, they found the man, haven't they? And he corresponds to your description of the man in the train. There's a bullet hole in the side of his head, and it seems to have been fired at close quarters. Yes. So close that Monsieur Dioso and the police agree that everything points to suicide. They think it was quite a week ago, perhaps immediately after he shot you. They found a gun beside him, then? Eh? Uh, oh, no. That is the only snag. Mm. There was a revolver in his pocket, and with only one cartridge fired. Yeah, the one that nearly did for me. Well, that's what they want to find out. Certainly, if it's suicide, it goes a long way towards clearing up the case. Realising someone was after him, he saw the game was up and... Um... And uh, if it's not suicide? Oh, well, there are other possible explanations. He may have assaulted someone who was armed, someone who killed him quite properly in self-defence, but was nevertheless too frightened to say anything about it. It would be just like these country people. Hmm. And Francoise, what about her little adventure this morning? We hadn't forgotten that. We think it might have been no more than a... A spiteful, practical joke. I see. What everyone wants is to get the case over and done with as speedily as possible. No, it's not that. But you must see there's no point in dragging things on now. Well, there's still that second-class ticket I told you about. Somebody will have to find an explanation for that. Now, how did it jump out of a dead man's pocket into a corridor at the Hotel d'Angleterre? Do you want some good advice? To let the whole thing drop. That's it, isn't it? Mm. To get well and then clear out of Bergerac as soon as I'm fit to travel. And come and spend a few days with me as you were intending to do in the first place. I've spoken to Dr. Rivo about it, and he says that with proper precautions, there's no reason why you shouldn't be moved now. What does the prosecutor say? I don't understand. Well, I'm sure he had something to say about it. Didn't he say that I had no right whatever to poke my nose into the case? Now, you must realise that according to the regulations... If Look, uh, I, I may as well put it plainly. With that little comedy of yours this morning, you've succeeded in putting everybody's back up. Once a week, the prosecutor has dinner with the prefect of police, and he says that he'll speak about you so that you have your knuckles wrapped by your superiors in Paris. Yes. What irritated them more than anything was the way you tried to, to chuck those hundred franc notes about. They say... That, that I'm encouraging the dregs of the population to wag their tongues. How did you know? That I'm inciting them to sling mud at respectable people. If only you had some real idea to work on, I'd feel differently about it. But, but I haven't. Or rather, I've four or five. Two of them looked very promising this morning, then all of a sudden they went up in smoke. You see... So what about it? Will you come over to my place? Well, I'd love to. We both would. But not till it's all over. <laughs> but now that the madman's dead... Is he? Now, you run along, and if they ask you what I intend to do, say you don't know. Can't you persuade him, Madame Maigret? I'm sure he's wrong. I'm not as sure as you are. Good night. <sighs> Good night. <laughs> Thank you, my what dear. What for? What you said to Le Duc. I was almost beginning to doubt myself. Of course you're not wrong. Shall I fill your pipe for you? Ah, thank you. What's for supper? Wait and see. Uh, come in. Ah, good morning, Le Duc. Good morning. Look, Jules, hmm? I met the prosecutor in the street and he gave me some extraordinary news. I, I went to the police station to make sure it was true. Oh, let's hear it. They sent the fingerprints to Paris, as a matter of course, uh, and the answer has just come. Well, go on. The dead man, the man who jumped out of the train, he died years ago. What are you talking about? Well, officially, this corpse that's lying in the mortuary has been a corpse for years. Hmm? He was a man called Samuel who was condemned to death in Algiers. And executed? No. No, he was supposed to have died in hospital a few days before his execution date. And what else do the police know about him? Well, they don't know exactly where he came from. Somewhere in Eastern Europe. He had a business in Algiers. What sort of business? 
postage stamps. Oh, that was only a cover for another business, of course. But it was so well done that though the police were watching him, they didn't find out anything until he was on trial for murder. Then it came to light. His real business was supplying forged passports, immigration papers and labour permits. He had a whole network of agents in Vienna, Bucharest, Warsaw, all over the shop. Mm, strange. Very, very strange. Why so strange, Jules? No, oh, not his profession, but to run up against it in a place like Bergerac. It all started off as an ordinary provincial case, the local maniac of a small country town. Suddenly, there was all the underworld, Warsaw to Algiers. But people like Samuel, you find them everywhere. It's not a question of race, it's a question of species. Barmen in Scandinavia, gangsters in America, head waiters in Germany, wholesalers in North Africa. They see to everything for a price. And the price, as far as Samuel was concerned, was murder. There was a murder, you say? A double one. Two men from Berlin found lying dead on a bit of waste ground. There was a lot of nosing around. They found out about Samuel and his two agents. That's what the men were. The idea was they'd come to complain of something. No doubt he was doing them out of their commissions. Perhaps they threatened him. So he did away with them. It took a long time to get sufficient evidence against him, but in the end they did. And he was condemned to death. He fell ill, however. So seriously that he was moved from the prison infirmary to the town hospital where he was supposed to have died a few days later. And? Well, that's all anyone knows. Hmm. I wonder if your soul's ever been to Algiers. I'll shut that window, Jules, hmm? and get pneumonia. Oh, yeah. Well, I talked to as many people as I could this morning, but most of them know I'm your wife and they shut up like clams. But I did my best. Mm, you always do. No. Now, what do they think about the case now? Oh, they don't know what to think. Some say that Samuel had nothing to do with it at all, that he just wanted to kill himself. First he tries throwing himself out of a train, but his nerve fails him, he hangs on. And in any case, the train isn't going fast enough. In the end, he succeeds with a revolver. And naturally, they expect the murders to go on. Have you been past the doctor's house again? Yes, but there was nothing to see. I was told something, but well, it may be of no importance at all. Two or three times a woman has visited the house, and she's thought to be Dr. Rivo's mother-in-law. A middle-aged woman, they say, and decidedly common. Well, nobody knows anything about her or where she lives, and she hasn't been seen for two years. Well, what's her name? Madame Beausoleil. <laughs> Beausoleil, what a gorgeous name. Yes. Now, my dear, there's a very boring job for you to do. What? I want you to go downstairs and find out the number of every medical school in the country and then telephone each in turn. Ask for the registrar's office and inquire whether anyone of the name of Jacques Riveau is on their list of qualified men. Where is the telephone downstairs? There's a box in the lounge, but it doesn't stop people hearing every word you say. Oh, splendid. But you don't mean to say that Revo isn't a... Good heavens. Mm. Uh, will you get me Inspector Leduc, please? Now run along, it'll be too late. Why can't I telephone from up here? Because I want to make a couple of calls and you're the only one who's mobile. <laughs> Go on. All right. Mm. Uh, Leduc. Uh, tell me something. Do you know if Monsieur Diorto often dines with the Rivos? Oh, every Monday, you're sure? No, I don't doubt your word. Thank you. Uh, tomorrow, yes. Mm. Monday night. Clean white cloth, a table for four. Monday night. And it was the following night I travelled down from Paris with Samuel. Only I didn't know it then. And then the night after that, or rather early Wednesday morning, Samuel was killed. Uh, police judiciaire? Ah, uh, did you find out if Dr. Evo received a call from Paris last Tuesday week? Uh, you did, good. 
At two in the afternoon, yes. The restaurant des quatre, place de la Bastille, a nine minute call. Right. Thank you. Hmm. The train left at five forty. Why did he jump? Was it to escape from somebody or to meet somebody? That's the problem. Jules, hmm? we must call in another doctor at once, a real one. It, it, it's simply monstrous, it's a crime. And to think, how do you feel? Well, all right, why? No one has ever qualified under the name of Jacques Riveau. Ah. He simply isn't a doctor. Hmm. Every register has been searched. And now we're getting to the bottom of it. That temperature of yours that wouldn't go down. Well, of course the wound wouldn't heal. Mm, it was to meet somebody. Mm, yes? Good evening, Chief Inspector. Ah, good evening, Monsieur Dorso. Uh, won't you sit down? Ah, thank you. I must confess I've been feeling a bit guilty about you. <laughs> that surprises you, does it? I couldn't help reproaching myself for having been rather curt. Though I must admit that your own manner is sometimes rather <laughs> disconcerting. Oh, I apologise. So I thought I'd look in to tell you how we were getting on. In two or three days at the outside, we'll have the case finished and filed. The facts speak for themselves. We must keep to the point. How Samuel dodged execution and had somebody else buried in his place, that's for the Algiers people to go into, if they think it worthwhile. Which I don't for a moment suppose they will. You think Samuel escaped from Algiers, came to France, to Bergerac, committed a couple of murders and then shot himself? Hmm? Exactly. And the fact that no revolver was found by his side doesn't bother me in the least. There are dozens of cases on record where the same things happened. Somebody passed and picked it up. A tramp, perhaps, or a child, and never said a word about it. Too scared to come forward. You think so? Yes. Hmm. The important thing in this case was to make sure the gun had been fired close to the head. And the post-mortem leaves no doubt on that point. And there I'm sure the case will rest. So what are your plans now? Oh, the same as ever. You mean to arrest the murderer, of course. You're very obstinate, Inspector. Oh, I know. I think I should warn no, you. I shouldn't bother if I were you, Monsieur Dorso. Warnings are one of the few things I very seldom heed. <laughs> Good day, Inspector. Hmm? Madam Mabry. Good day. <clears throat> Now, that maid, what was her name? Rosalie. That's it. Is she anywhere around? I expect so. Shall I go and find her? Would you mind, my dear? Now, I only wanted to ask you one simple question, Rosalie. Have you ever worked at Monsieur Dorsault's? I was uh, two years with him. As a housemaid? Yes. So you went all over the house, polishing the floors and dusting? I did the rooms. Exactly, you did the rooms. And in doing the rooms, you must have found out a thing or two. Hmm? How long ago was it? Oh, it's a uh, year last month that I left the place. Did the prosecutor often have women visitors? I don't know. Oh, yes, you do. Now, come on, speak out. There's nothing to be frightened of. Wouldn't do anybody any good. What would? Well, if I did speak out. Well, you see... <laughs> There's my young man, Albert. I would spoil his chances. He, he's trying to get a government job, and if the prosecutor was against him, well, see what I mean. So there was a lady visitor now and again? No, no, there wasn't. Oh, come on now. There's a little bit of scandal somewhere, isn't there? Oh, and everybody knows about it. You can't keep things dark forever. Oh, it was a good two years ago. A parcel came from Paris, but... When they came to look at it, the label was half torn away and they couldn't tell who it was for and there was no sender's name on it either. Well, they waited a week, thinking someone might turn up to claim it. Then they opened it. You'll never guess what they found. Mm, well, I think perhaps I can. Photographs. Mm. But um, not ordinary ones. Um, I hardly know how to say it. Uh, women um, with no clothes on. And not alone, either. And um, see what I mean? Yeah. Go on, Rosalie. And, and then one day, another parcel came, just the same as the first one. Same paper, same string, same label as the bit that had been left before. Guess who it was addressed to? Monsieur Duorso, if you please. Mm. Now, listen. 
Not a word you say here will ever be repeated. When you heard what you just told me, mm. you went and had a look at the books in his study, didn't you? Who told you? Oh, well, since you know it already, um, yes, I did. A lot of the bookcases have doors to them with sort of wire netting, and they're always kept locked. Only I once found one where the key had been left in the lock. And what did you find? You know very well what I found. Oh, it, it, it was so awful. I, I had nightmares for a week. I couldn't endure Albert coming anywhere near me. Big books, were they? Handsome books? Uh, y yes, but oh, oh, they were all sorts of terrible ones. Well, things you, you'd you never think of. Well, thank you, Rosalie. If your wife hadn't been here, I, I should never have dreamt of talking about such things. Mm. Did Dr. Revo often come to the house? Uh, oh, hardly ever. He used to telephone. Nor any one of his family? No. Oh, except, of course, for Mademoiselle Francoise, the time she was acting as his secretary. But the prosecutor? Yes. Well, how long did that last? Oh, about uh, six months. Uh, after that, she went off to her mother's in uh, Paris or Bordeaux. I'm not sure which. And it was ever so long before we saw her in the town again. And uh, Monsieur D'Orso never overstepped the mark in his dealings with you? He'd have caught it if he had. Well, Rosalie, thank you for what you've told me. Now, don't be frightened. You won't get into any trouble over it, and uh, Albert will never know you came here. Oh, <laughs> Thank you, Monsieur. Oh, uh, uh, Inspector. No, Monsieur will do. Oh, dear, oh, dear. To think an educated, intelligent man, and in such a responsible job, mm, too. I know, my dear, I know. But now, would you take down an advertisement? I want you to put in the Bordeaux papers for me. Of course. Are you ready? Uh, yes. Now, uh, a certain Madame Beausoleil, formerly of Algiers, now believed in Bordeaux, right, is urgently requested mm -hmm. to present herself at once at the following address, where she will learn something to her advantage. Right. Maigret, solicitor... Hotel d'Angleterre, Bergerac. Ah, Madame Beausoleil, please take a chair. Um, and you too, Mademoiselle Francoise. I warn you, I shall complain. It's unheard oh, of. Calm yourself, Mademoiselle, and forgive me for wanting to see your mother. Who said she was my mother? Well, I took it for granted, the fact that you went to meet her at the station. Does somebody mind telling me what this is all about, being picked up at the station like that? Are you a solicitor or a policeman? A policeman. I know your face, madame. Were you ever a singer? Oh, yes, monsieur. I sang at Olympia. Of course. I remember the name, Josephine. <laughs> yes, how nice of you to remember. But the doctors recommended a warmer climate, and I went on tour. Italy, Turkey, Syria, Egypt. And you pitched up in Algiers? Yes. I had my first daughter in Cairo. Who was her father? An English officer. Your second girl, Francoise, was perhaps born in Algiers. Yes, and that was the end of my theatrical career. I was ill for quite a long time, and though I got over it, I never recovered my singing voice. And so then... Her father looked after me right up until the day he was recalled to France. He was in the customs. The inspector has no right to question you, Mother. Don't answer another word. Madame, but... you're quite at liberty to speak or not, just as you think fit. Don't say anything, Mother. You see, Inspector, what can I do? Come in. Madame Rivo. Excuse me, Inspector, but I heard my mother and sister were here. Who told you? Who? It was someone, uh, someone I met. You haven't seen your husband? No. Give me that pipe, Jules. You've had quite enough. Huh? Madame Rivo has just passed Francoise a note. Ah. Uh, Mademoiselle Francoise, that note, please. Oh. Oh. Where's she gone? Madame Rivo, when did your husband give you that note? What note? Oh, never mind. Louise, can you see the back of the hotel from that landing window? I think so. Well, go out and watch and tell me if anything happens. I think the Duke's got them. The doctor's car was at the back of the hotel, and Francois was just getting into it when the Duke drove up. They saw him and dashed into the hotel. Le Duke followed them. What's happening? Oh, the note. It told her to join him. 
A minute more and they might have made it. Jules, what? it's terrible. Well, what is it? They're dead. Oh, no. huh? Both of them. Oh, it isn't true. We dashed up here after them, but they had time to slip into one of the rooms and lock the door behind them. Then there were two shots. When we broke down the door, they were both dead. Someone's telephoning the hospital. Well, I'm very sorry, madame. She was your favourite, wasn't she? Of course. She had the looks. When the doctor married her sister, she was too young, barely 13. But later, he fell in love with her, and then she had the child. What child? A daughter. Monsieur D'Urso's daughter. Ah. Was Dr. Rivo practising in Algiers, madame? Yes. What was his connection with this man, Samuel? He was his son. Son? And he arranged his father's escape from the hospital. That's right. There were only two patients in that wing of the hospital. One night, Rivo set the place on fire. And it was the other man who was left in the flames and afterwards given out to be Samuel. After that, Jacques married my elder daughter. And he brought the three of you to France? Yes. And changed his name to Rivo. Samuel was shipped off to America and told never to come back. Yes. He was strange in the head even then. They said the trial had unhinged him. Oh, why did he have to come back? All this need never have happened. It need never have ended like this. It need never have started, of course, if Samuel hadn't murdered his associates. And his son hadn't helped him escape. And then fallen in love with his wife's sister. Mm. Duorso discovered something about the doctor's past life. After that, there was nothing anyone could do. Events just ran their course. That child Francoise had, do you believe it was Duorso's? Not for a moment. They had an affair, of course, engineered by Rivaux. He knew of the prosecutor's taste in pornography, thought he'd be easy game for Francoise, and he was. So, when she became pregnant, by Rivo, I imagine, she convinced Duraso that the child was his, and used that to ensure he didn't delve any deeper into Rivo's past. But Samuel suddenly popping up in Bergerac, when he was supposed to be safely away in America, must have put the cat among the pigeons. Mm. He'd been suspected of two murders over there. Both strangulations, both found with a needle stuck through the heart. So he fled the country. And when he repeated the whole mad business over here, Rivo decided to get rid of him. Nothing was to stand between him and his ambition. Certainly not a criminal lunatic of a father. So when Samuel insisted on coming down here again, his son told him that the police in Bergerac were waiting for him. He was to jump from the train before it reached the station. Rivo must have been surprised to see two of you. Mm. But he killed Samuel just the same and emptied his pockets of everything that could identify him, including a railway ticket. <laughs> I may be wrong, but I can't help thinking that one day he'd have shoved his wife off into a better world too. And then he could have married Francoise, the girl he loved who'd given him a daughter, the girl who was ready to do anything for him to simulate that faked attack in the wood in order to clear him of suspicion, and finally to die with him rather than lose him. Yes. Did you ever take your holiday with Le Duc? No. I didn't fancy staying on after that. At least Louise didn't. I got myself out of bed that night, and we had our last dinner ever at the Hotel d'Angleterre. Truffe en serviette, foie gras, and a bottle de Don Perignon. But you don't like champagne. I know, but seeing my wife had done all the donkey work on this case, I thought she deserved the sort of meal she likes for once. Did she enjoy it? Yes. But I think she enjoyed the journey back home even better. She's not really cut out to be an inspector. <laughs> In Maigret and the Madman of Bergerac by Georges Simenon, translated by Geoffrey Sainsbury and adapted for radio by Aubrey Woods.
Maigret was played by Maurice Denham and Simonon by Michael Goff. Madame Maigret, Irene Sutcliffe, Du Orso, Malcolm Hayes, Le Duc, Timothy Bateson, Dr. Rivo, Gavin Campbell, Madame Rivo, Anne Rosenfeld, Francoise, Jane Knowles, Madame Beausoleil, Joyce Latham, Rosalie, Nicolette McKenzie, Hotel Proprietor, Geoffrey Siegel. The play was produced and directed by Betty Davis. Simonon's Maigret, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simonon. I've always felt grateful, Jules, to whatever ministerial deity was responsible, that you were never transferred to the Rue des Saussets. Why exactly, Georges? Because I've never really appreciated the way security chaps work. <laughs> oh, that's an understatement, if ever there was one. You know, I once said that security's methods reminded me of a lot of crabs crawling and scratching about in the basket. I hope you didn't say it to one of them. Yes, but he'd left the Rue des Saussets by then. Like so many, he had to leave or face being kicked out. Benoit was his name. Now, that was the one time I found myself involved in security and hence in politics. The missing report business, was that it? It was. I arrived home one evening after dinner with my chief and Lucan Jean-Vier, one of our informal get-togethers, and I was feeling nice and mellow. I asked Louise about phone calls, more or less as a formality. <laughs> Maurice Denham as Jules Maigret, Michael Goff as Georges Simonon, and Peter Pratt as Auguste Poin in Maigret and the Minister, translated by Maura Budberg and adapted for radio by Frederick Bradnell. And no phone calls, I hope, darling? Yes, I'm afraid there was one. Oh, you sound serious. Well, you've time for a cup of coffee. Take your coat off for a minute. It's only half past ten, and I said I didn't expect you back until eleven. Well, I'm still waiting to hear who it was ringing. A minister. A priest? <laughs> no, no, of course not. Poin, I think he said. The minister of public works. That's right. Auguste Poin. He phoned here himself. He wanted to speak to you personally. He asked if I was alone or not, and he said his call was to be kept secret. Was it indeed? Did he say where he was phoning from? Yes, a public call box. Honestly, Jules, I could hardly believe my ears. A minister of the Republic creeping out and making a phone call from some scruffy box on the corner of a street. Well, it can happen. Where does he want to see me? Well, not at the ministry, but at his private apartment at uh, 27 Boulevard Pasteur. Do you think it's a hoax? Well, it's a bit out of the ordinary, but it's no hoax. You'll have some coffee No, before. I'll have a glass of slow gin and then I'll be on my way. The sooner this is over, the better. Can I offer you a cigar, Megri? Well, I'd prefer my pipe, Your Excellency, if I may. Try some of this tobacco. Oh, thank you. Look, Megri, between men like us, there's no point in the usual formalities. I'm in terrible trouble. Nobody knows it yet, neither the President nor my wife come to that. I've come to you first. I know what I'm doing is irregular, and you're under no obligation to help me. Will you have a drink? Oh, well, uh, thank you, Your Excellency. Good. I think that the use of my title is not necessary at the moment. Very well, monsieur. These are some homemade spirits. My father distills some every autumn. This bottle must be 20 years old. Will you try it? I shall be delighted. 
Do you read the newspapers, Megre? No, when the world of crime allows me the time to do so. Mm. Your health. Ah, thank you. And yours. Mm -hmm. mm. This was in the Globe a few weeks ago. I've marked the paragraph. Ah. Will someone one day decide, under pressure of public opinion, to reveal the contents of the Kalam report? When revealed, it's likely to bring the government down, some people think. So when will it be published? Hmm. The Kalam report. On what, monsieur? A report written by a distinguished engineer, Julien Kalam, who died a couple of years ago, on the building of the Clairfont Sanatorium. The Clairfont Sanatorium for Abandoned Children. The same. The place that last winter saw one of our most terrible disasters. A whole wing of the place came down, do you remember? Yes, 100 or more children died in the... 128. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, it was built high up in the Haute Savoie, and there was some disagreement as to whether it was in the right place. Correct. And how it should be built, the design and materials. Kalam was asked to consider the whole question, study the project and the site as an impartial expert, which he did. The report was the result, and it was never published. Now, what happened at Clairefont? The snow melted early, very early. A subterranean river, it wasn't marked on the maps, but people knew of it, swelled and undermined the foundations of that wing of the building. They built over an underground stream. Well, who was the builder, monsieur? Nico and Sauvegrain. Arthur Nico, in fact. Ah, oh, yes, I have heard of him. It's a very large firm, I believe. Oh, very. And monsieur Arthur Nico is a very powerful man. Now, I assume that the report made by Julien Calam was against building the sanatorium where it was built. Most emphatically. Mm. And against many of the constructional ideas being mooted at the time, but the report was ignored. I was not in office then, so I have no knowledge of the whys and wherefores of this. And Artur Nikou put his building up. The report is therefore, Your Excellency, like a stick of dynamite with a slow fuse. The report is... I'll come to that shortly. Soon after that short but portentous piece appeared in the Globe, I was asked by the President to mount a search for the Kalam report within my ministry. Briefly, it wasn't where it should be, in the archives of the Chamber of Deputies, nor was it within the civil engineering branch, and although my ministry was turned inside out, it wasn't there either. Uh, another glass? Oh, well, thank you. The taste is very delicate. Mm. Yesterday morning, a man called Peekmal turned up. He looked like an anarchist with a brown paper parcel under his arm containing a bomb. Actually, he was a supervisor at the School of Civil Engineering, and the parcel contained a carbon copy of the Kalam report. Where did this happen? Where? Uh, at the ministry in my room. And were you alone, monsieur? My secretary, Mademoiselle Blanche, showed him in and then left the room. My parliamentary private secretary was in an outer room where there were various people waiting to see me. Peekmel asked me to open the parcel, or almost ordered me to. I did, and saw what it was. He said he wanted a receipt, so I wrote one out for him. Where did he say he'd found the report? In the attics of the School of Engineering. But hadn't they been searched previously when you were looking? Yes, of course they had. Perhaps he'd had it under his bed for years. Is it authentic, would you say? It was an unsigned carbon with Kalam's name and qualifications on the last page with a date. Later that day, I read it through. I'm sure it's a copy of the original report, and it would have caused an explosion if it had been published after the disaster. Julien Kalam prophesied the disaster. Almost to the fine print. You kept the report with you? I brought it back here to this apartment that night. I placed it in the desk over there and locked it. I had to speak to the president, and I couldn't do so last night. He was away, and quite frankly, I don't trust telephone calls, as no doubt your wife has surmised. So I waited until this afternoon when I could speak to him in private. I told him of the carbon copy, and he asked me to bring it personally to his study. I came back here to collect it. And it was no longer in your desk? It was no longer in my desk. And the lock? Had it been tampered with? I don't think so. See for yourself. Ah. 
Uh, I'm very bad with this sort of thing, but I'd say that this lock could be opened with a decent hairpin. Now, beside the president and what's his name... Big one. Mm. They alone knew I had the report. Do you understand, Maigre? I find myself quite alone. I dare not open my mouth. Who would believe my story? Who would believe that I held the report in my hands? Had it with me for some 24 hours and then had it stolen from my apartment. And, and there's this. At least three times in the last few years I've been invited by Arthur Nikou, the builder, to his house in Samoa. Last Christmas my wife received a solid gold pen from Nikou with her initials on it. I was furious, wanted her to send it back, but I was told that Niku sent dozens of such gifts to the wives of his acquaintances each Christmas, and my wife liked the pen, so like a fool I relented. <laughs> it would look nice in the press, wouldn't it? Minister's wife received gold pen gift from Niku. Your Excellency, about peak mile. Isn't it strange that he brought the report to you and didn't hand it over to his school director? It's as if he knew how important it was, isn't it? I think so, yes. Unless somebody told him to take it to you. Yes. I think I see the point you're getting at. I don't like it. No, nor do I, Your Excellency, but I'm trying to look at the situation from different angles. Now... Who besides yourself has the key to this apartment? My wife, of course. Oh, she's in the country at present. My secretary, Blanche Lamotte. Has she worked for you long? Since she was 17, straight from school. Uh, she now must be 40, 42. Tell me, after Picmal handed the report to you and left, did you have it in your hand when she came back? I think I did. I think I walked around with it in my hand for some time before I put it in my case. I trust her entirely, Major. Thank you. You see, all I'm doing is to try to find my way. Now, does anybody else have the keys? Yes, my parliamentary private secretary, Jacques Fleury. And have you known him long, monsieur? He's my age, and I've known him since we were at the Lycée together. What sort of person is he? Odd. Rich parents, but he never did anything with his life. He's a typical amiable failure. But he does know the jungle of our political system as well as any man. I need that sort of knowledge. I'm a provincial lawyer become cabinet minister, Maigre. I'm not a politician in the wheeler-dealer sense. And Fleury is a man I can relax with. Do he and Blanche get on well? On the surface, it's cordial enough. Deep in her heart, Blanche can't stand him, I'm sure. She's a bourgeoise through and through, and Fleury is the sort of person... Yes, the bourgeoisie can be unrelenting. So? Where have we got, Maigre? To this hypothesis, Your Excellency. Quite out of the blue, you're presented with a copy of the Kalam report, which seems genuine and which disappears immediately afterwards. Now, this seems to me to be a way of discrediting you and the government by claiming that the report was in your hands, but has been suppressed or conveniently lost. Now, all I have to do is to find the thing and the thief who took it. And I have to tell the President that it's been stolen. Late though it is, I should go there now. Thank you, Maigret, you've eased my mind. I'm in your hands. My poor old friend. A cabinet minister's fate placed in your hand. I must admit, on my way home, I did wonder what had hit me. I take it that you felt you could trust Poirin? Oh, yes. He was no double-dealing politician, Georges. There was a strong affinity between us. We came from the same sort of country background. We were of the same age and size. And I had the curious sensation that if I'd had a brother, he would have been not unlike Auguste Poirin. I think he realised the affinity, too. And the people around him? Were they to be trusted? Mm. Somebody, Jules, borrowed the keys to that apartment, didn't they? Knowing the report was there and knowing that the desk could be easily opened. All very true, Georges. But I also thought some of the clues lay with the man Picmal. I put old Luca onto him. I got Jean Vier to look into Mademoiselle Blanche and La Pointe to dig around Jacques Fleury. And once I set them on their ways, I picked up the newspapers on my desk to see if there was anything on the disaster or the report in them. There was. 
Hmm, is it true that the Clairefond Sanatorium was not born in the minds of those concerned with the plight of children, but in the mind of a builder in concrete? Hmm, tough stuff. What paper? Ah, the globe again. Mascalin's mouthpiece. Mascalin, the deputy. I wonder. What else? Hmm, <laughs> fat checks to officials. Julien Calam foresaw the disaster. Is it true that the Calam report vanished? Is it true that 30 officials live in terror of the report being found? Is it true that it has been found? Hmm, they are onto something. And this. We want to know is the Calam report still in the hands of the person? To whom it was given recently, or has it been destroyed? Where is the Kalam report? <sighs> Poor Auguste Point. Where the hell has got it in for him? Joseph Masculin? Why? Come in. Oh, hello, jean -Vier. You're back quickly. <laughs> What's up? Uh, I went to Mademoiselle Lamotte's apartment building, Chief. Mm. I asked the concierge if Mademoiselle Lamotte was at home. And I thought she gave me an odd look, but I went on and said I was an inspector from an insurance company. And then the concierge began laughing at me. Mm -hmm. Well, I tried to ignore this. So she said, how many different branches of the police are there in Paris? And don't you ever tell each other what you're each up to? Security and uh, who else? As I left, well, there was no point in going on, was there, Chief? No, no point. As you left, what? There was a man coming round the corner and about to cross over the road, as if he were making for the entrance to the apartments. Only he suddenly swerved away. I reckon it was when he saw me. I think I know him by sight. Uh, he was from the Rue des Saucets, do you mean? I don't know. I seem to remember him in some security business. But if he was security, he wouldn't bother to stay out of my way, would he? No, if he knew you, he'd probably grin and go on with his job. What was he like? About 40, growing fat, round face, red neck, and he was smoking a cigar. Well, the description would fit most of the Rue des Saucet inspectors, wouldn't it? <laughs> Except for the cigar. <laughs> yes, I wonder. Listen, go and speak nicely to old Chabot in records. Ask him to show you photos of those chaps who've left the security branch these last uh, couple of years. See if you can trace your man. All right, Chief. Uh, and uh, do I still try to find out anything on Blanche Lamotte? You oh, better leave it alone for the moment. Uh, I don't suppose there's any point in my asking you what it's all in aid of. None at all, jean vierre my lad. Right, Chief. Now I'm going across the road for a glass of beer and to await what you call La Pointe Fine. There you were. If you turn the music off, you won't have to lip read. I think I'm a wee bit deaf. And at my age, that's serious. <laughs> um, you are Jacqueline Page, the actress. Oh, you've made my day. Who are you, you lovely man? Um, that I'm Inspector Lapointe of the Quai des Orfèvres. And I'm making some inquiries of a routine, routine nature. nature and... About Jacques Fleury. Does this happen often? That I join in the chorus that poor old Jacques is inquired into. That Monsieur Fleury is investigated. Twice yesterday, two at a time. <sighs> oh dear. I feel rather a fool. I mean, I mean, nobody tells anybody else what's going on. I told Jacques last night, and he said they were from Rue des Saucets. So, you're different. You're from the other place. And you're younger and rather dishy, really. Come and sit down on the couch beside me. Ah. Uh... Oh, do come on. I won't bite you. <clears throat> Not at once. What did they want to know? What do you want to know, Inspector Lapointe? Well, who are the sort of people he associates with? Are they respectable, <laughs> for instance? <laughs> are you sitting on your pistol by any chance, Inspector? <laughs> I don't carry a pistol, Mademoiselle. Oh, you look so uncomfortable. Do relax. What sort of people does Jacques associate with? He associates with me, monsieur, and I'm young enough to be his daughter, and I can assure you, not at all respectable. You have friends in common, mademoiselle. Oh, yes, lots, and a jolly bad crowd they are. Film people, models, musicians, journalists, radio and television directors, all the riffraff of Paris. And, of course, Jacques has his connections on the senior side of politics. He keeps those to himself. Is he sometimes short of money, temporarily? Oh, Charlie, he's always short of money. 
He does have a wife, you know, and two kids out in the suburbs somewhere. But in his job, people give him credit, give him a lot for nothing. I don't, of course. I'm expensive to run. Yes. Does he talk about his work to you? Not much. Belly aches sometimes about the hours. The last two from the security mob wanted to know if he brought documents home here and worked on them in the evenings. And what did you tell them? That we had better things to do in the evenings than look at documents. <laughs> it serves them right for asking. <laughs> <laughs> but he's not in any trouble, is he? Real trouble. He hasn't been stupid, has he? Oh, no, no, mademoiselle. To be honest with you, I don't know myself what it's all about. Can I get you a drink? You must stay for a while. I get so lonely. <laughs> so there you have it, Chief. <laughs> well, it's all we got for you to laugh, Luca. But you really was quite a handful. Lucky devil. I must say, Chief, Jacques Fleury doesn't match up with my idea of a PPS. No, young mistress, shorter money, fast friends. He's bloody good material for a little corruption, Chief, I think. Yes, I wonder how much. Oh, never mind. Anything else, Lapont? No, not really. I suppose security are keeping a watch on Jacqueline's place for their own reasons. Was there somebody outside? Yes, I think so. He moved off when I came out. What uh, was he like? Forty or so. Fat but strong-looking. Fat face. Had a cigar. Whoever he is, he certainly gets aroused. He is security, isn't he? On the other hand... Why did he move off? Yeah. And he did the same thing to Jeanvier earlier this morning. No, I think he may once have been with the Rue des Saucer, but... Is now a sort of freelance. He matches up with the description given me of the chap who went off with Peekmal an hour ago. Mm, uh, tell me from the beginning, Luca. You got into Peekmal's room, I gather. Well, it wasn't difficult. I took a room at the hotel, and with a little manipulation, my room key opened Peekmal's room. Would it probably have opened any room? Now drink your beer and shut up, Lapointe. No. Go on, Luca. A bachelor den of a certain sort. One extra suit, one old toothbrush. A comb with half his teeth missing, a few old shirts. He doesn't bother about his appearance, for sure. A lot of books, and there was a cardboard box in one of the drawers full of membership cards. Mm. I don't think there was any party or society he hadn't belonged to at one time. The Cross of Fire, Action Francaise, Communist Party, International Theosophy League. See what I mean? Mm. Oh, yes, and, and some books on yoga, one of which I picked up and shook. I don't know why. Yes, it's a sort of instinct. I've done it myself. The point. Sorry, Chief. But this fell out of it, Chief. Oh, thank you. Chamber of Deputies, dear sir, thank you for your note. I'm greatly interested in what you tell me, and we'll be glad to see you tomorrow around 8 p.m. at the Brasserie du Croissant au Montmartre. I beg you not to mention the matter in question to anybody until then. Address to H. Pitmile and dated... Last Thursday, that's five days ago, signed. Yes, hard to tell. But I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't Joseph Mascola. Thank you, Luca. But later, I rang the engineering school and asked where I could find Monsieur Piquemal at lunchtime. I said it was a friend. They told me he always went to a cafe, but they gave me lousy directions. I got there late. I couldn't see anybody who looked like your description of him, so I asked the lady at the desk who told me he just left with a man. She'd noticed because in all the years Pete might have been coming to the cafe for lunch, this is the only time she could remember him not leaving alone. And the man was fat, forty, round faced. I'm afraid she thought he looked like a gopper. Only he smoked a cigar. Uh. Evidently, he came in after Pete Mal, went up to him, and after a short conversation, they left together. Mm. Luca, you have the number of the school. Ring and ask to speak to Pete Mal. If he's there, put the receiver down. Yes, Chief. But mm. you don't think he will. Oh. This is important, isn't it, Chief? Mm, in a way it is. For one man it is, and it isn't murder. And if we don't succeed, the government could fall. I see. Government could fall? Is that all? <laughs> hell's bells. As you say, hell's bells. A cabinet minister is being set up as a scapegoat. It's quite a cunning plan with all sorts of advantages for the person setting it up. Mm. Jack Fleury is part of the plan, I'm sure. Sooner or later, we'll have to take him in and ask him some questions. Yes, Luca? Hasn't been seen since he went to lunch. Mm. They can't imagine what's happened to him. It's the first time in 20 years that our Monsieur Piquemal has not turned up for his lecture, and without a word of explanation. They wonder if he's had an accident. No, I don't think it was an accident. Piquemal is operating under his own steam, but with help. 
And while I'm on the subject, Luca, there's a Madame Calam, the widow of one Julien Calam, living at 77 Boulevard Raspail. Now go and have a word with her. Ask her if Pete Mal called to see her recently and if he wanted to see her late husband's papers. Madame Calam. Mm. So, this is the missing Calam report we're looking for, is it? The Calam report? The Clairefond disaster business? You've guessed it. But I didn't tell you. Le Pointe, I want you to go to the Boulevard Pasteur, where our minister has an apartment. Question the tenants on his floor, will you? Yes. Maybe somebody saw a man going into number 27 on Tuesday morning and can give us a description. Yes, Chief. Yes, the poor wretched minister is waiting to see me, besieged by the press and with the president breathing down his neck. What's he like, Chief, this minister? Hmm? Well, he's rather like me. Only I'm not in politics. Hello, Chief Inspector. So, you're in on it, are you? In on what? That's what we'd like to know. Ah, oh, Chief Inspector Magret. I'm Jack Fleury. The Minister is waiting to see you. Now you've told them, Mr. Oh, Fleury. Oh, so you are in on it, Magret. Yeah, Chief Inspector. Come on, get me out of here. I think why we don't kick them out. I mean... Come on, give us a break. Chief Inspector Magret, Your Excellency. Do you want me to stay? No, Jack. Come and sit down, Magret. Oh, thank you. I'll be in the other office, then, where there are no reporters. Well, Magre, as you can see, the hounds are baying, eh? and the President won't accept my resignation. Uh, we found this letter in Pete Mal's hotel room. Thank you. So, Pete Mal got in touch with Masculine, did he? So it seems, Your Excellency. Now, Pete Mal has, I suspect, gone into hiding with somebody looking after him. Hiding from what? Well, for my chaps and myself, we'd like a talk with him, you know. I'm sure you would. I find myself surprisingly calm, Megri. I'm likely to be run out of political life in the next 48 hours, disgraced and so on. And somehow I don't care. Well, in 48 hours, I should be able to discover who stole the report. It's your job to hold out until then, Your Excellency. I will, Megri, I will. 48 hours, eh? So Masculin has been behind this from the beginning. Yes, Masculin, the professional crusader. The obvious person for a nutcase, if you'll excuse the expression, to turn to. Peak Mal would never trust authority. One can't blame him, not entirely. And Masculin sent him to me with the report. He did. I'm sure he took a photocopy of the thing first. Then he'll probably challenge the government quite soon. Well, unless he prefers to profit from what he knows to increase his influence, Your Excellency. I thought you knew little of politics. Well, I'm learning. I've discovered how important the masculines of this world are. Now, I'd say he has a passion for power, and he's used his reputation as a merciless crusader for truth and justice as a base for his power. That's quite true. He set me up, as you say, didn't he? Mm. I have the feeling that there's a personal element in this. Is there? I once snubbed him in public a long time ago, but it's not the kind of thing he'd forget or forgive. You think he took a photocopy? Yes, he would. The masculines of my world live by the photocopy and the tape recording, which means even if we find the stolen carbon, masculine will still have the material. If I can get the report back, that won't matter, Your Excellency. You'll be in the clear. And the government will have to publish or... Well, surely it should be published, Your Excellency. If I were allowed the decision, Maigre, but I'm not. Mm. No, thank you for giving me your time. Thank you, Maigre. Do your best. Hold out for 48 hours. I can't promise you to find the report, but I'll be damned if I don't put my hand on the person who got into your apartment and stole it. <laughs> that at least is my profession. Fine words, Jules. Could you do it? I was pretty sure, you know, Georges. So they weren't empty words. And you had the Maigre team rushing around in all directions. Not in proper directions, please, Georges, and to a purpose. First, Jean Vier came up with a name and a picture of our gentleman with the cigar. He was one Benoit. Do you recall him? Benoit? But of course. He had to leave security after a very unsavory business that was also political. Girls and secrets, wasn't it, in some way? Yes, it was, and Benoit was lucky not to be behind bars for a few years. Now he was out of the police and working as a private dick. 
He was seen going into Auguste Poin's apartment, by the way, on the morning in question. La Pointe found an eyewitness? <laughs> the ladies like La Pointe. And this lady, who lived on the same floor as the minister, wouldn't, I'm sure, have remembered nearly so well without La Pointe's gentle attentions. And we showed her a picture of Benoit. She was sure it was the one. And Luca was visiting Madame Calam, wasn't he? He was. That's where Picmal found his copy of the report, all right. You mean, while the whole government machine was looking for the thing, it was with Madame Calam, or a copy was? How obvious. Mm, it was, wasn't it? Among the late professor's papers. The Peak Miles studied under him at one time, and he presented himself at the widow's apartment and asked to look for some old study papers. She let him help himself. So a lot of things were tied up. All you had to do was find Benoit and Peak Mile. Now, Jean Vier was pretty sure he knew where they were. Somebody had tipped him the wink. Before we picked him up, I had to meet Joseph Masculin just for the sake of it. I knew he lunched each day at a particular restaurant, so I decided to do the same. May I join you, Chief Inspector? Ah, yes, monsieur. You know who I am, I'm sure? I do, Monsieur Masculin. I was going to phone you today, but seeing you here... Well, I came here hoping to have a word with you. I saw in the press this morning that you're working on the missing Kalam report. Yeah, the stolen Kalam report. You know it's been stolen, do you? I know that the carbon copy Peak Mal obtained from Madame Kalam has been stolen. I believe I know how and by who. Peak Mal wrote to me. Mm, I know he did. Presumably he brought the copy to you. He left it in my office with my secretary. I didn't touch it, Chief Inspector. I don't play with dynamite. I told him to take it to the Ministry concerned. And did you think he would? With his sort, there's no knowing. With his sort, it's necessary to watch what they do, yes, monsieur? If you mean what I think you mean, Chief Inspector, then I think you're being rather foolish. Hmm. I'm not the man to make an enemy of. Yes, so I've been told. I find it strange, Monsieur Mescalin, that knowing the importance of Pigmal's find, you didn't contact the Ministry yourself at once. The trouble it would have saved. I'm a busy man, Chief Inspector. I haven't the time to deal personally with many things brought to me by the public. And yet you knew this was political dynamite? And there wasn't another copy of it to be found anywhere because the other copies had probably been destroyed to save a lot of necks? Really, monsieur, you surprise me. If you choose not to believe me, Maigret, that is your privilege. <laughs> if you choose to believe I'm a fool and swallow any old cock and bull story because it comes from a man of some importance, that is your privilege. I don't think this little talk is going to do you any good, Megre. No, it's ruined a good meal. All right, Jean Vier, my boy, where are you taking me? Saint Paul, Chief. It's about five kilometers. A small village on the bank of the Seine, if my memory serves me right. Mm. Good for fishing. Rod fishing, Chief. Oh, rod fishing, Jean Vier. Uh, Eugène Benoit is a great angler. He has a hut just outside the village, near the floodgate. A water bailiff's hut. He spends quite a few weekends in it. He left for it yesterday with a chap answering to Peak Mal's description. Mm, good. I should have thought the Masculin, or whoever else it is employing Benoit, might have found a more comfortable place to hide out in. Somewhere in Paris, Chief. We'd never have found them. Oh, true. Now, I don't think their employer wants to get too near the action. Probably told Benoit to arrange it himself, which he did in his own simple way. Mm. Oh, we're coming near the village, aren't we? Yeah, we are. It'll be dark by the time we make the hut, if I can find it. That must be it, Chief. Yeah. There's a light in the window. It's a decent size, Dad, I must say. Oh, there's the path. I'll pull in here. seem to be curtains to that window. Come on, then. Right, Chief. Uh, 
Do you think he'll give trouble? Well, I hope not. He was a tough character, I seem to remember, but I'm not up to a brawl these days. <laughs> Quiet now. Ah, there's a bench beneath the window. Yeah, get on it and have a look. Right. Carefully. Oh, what a godforsaken hole. Both there. Hmm? Big Mal seems to be reading some thick document. Benoit's playing patience. Is there much of a fire? Fire? There's a stove. Well, keep between it and Big Mal. I'm sure it's the Kalam report he's reading. Let's go. Wait for it. Who are you? I'll give you two guesses, Benoit. Maigret. I thought it might be. Monsieur Pigmal, may I have the report, please? <laughs> it's mine. It's mine. <laughs> now, you know, now, now, come on, now, give it to me. We don't want it put up, do we? Come on, now. Oh, give Christ. it to him, Pigmal. Stop oh, being such a bloody oh, fool. Oh, here you are. Your bosses will burn it. There'll be no justice. You wait and see. It won't matter to you, Pigmal, if it's burned. Joseph Maskelyne took a copy of it, and that he won't burn, I'm sure. Oh. Remember when I go out for sentence, Maigret, I helped to save the report I pinched. Mm, I suppose our engineering supervisor came of his own free will, did he? He begged to come. He was rather scared. What of? I'm not quite sure. Well, so would you be, if you found yourself the instrument of a justice that hundreds are trying to avoid. Mm, he goes on like that all the time. I keep trying to get it into his head that he's only got himself mixed up in some typical political chicanery. Oh, I suppose Mescala employs you to do his dirty work. <laughs> I've never even heard of the man. And one day, Maskelyne will get his comeuppance, but not this time. Who gave you the keys to the minister's apartment? Why ask me when you know? Uh, you had the wretched man in your pocket. Money or sex? Which? Well, some of both is enough to ruin him. Now he's going to be ruined anyway. Still, he was useful at the time. Did you know, Benoit, that we were on your tail? I nearly knocked into you in the street, didn't I? When I was trying to discover what Mademoiselle Lamotte knew. Knew about what? Whether or not Poin was going to acknowledge that the report had been nicked. Some politicians would have said it was mislaid and sworn in their mother's grave that it would come to light. But not Auguste Poin. All right, dampen down the fire, jean -Vier. Let's get back to Paris. And give me that report. Have you arrested me too? Well, have you? No, Monsieur Pigmel, I have released you. Come and sit down, Maigret. Thank you, Your Excellency. <laughs> well, 48 hours is almost up. I know. I've come to return the Kalam report to you. You found the copy that was stolen from my apartment? Yes, but I'm afraid... Where's the report now? You have it with you? Well, I left it with Monsieur Fleury on my way in. Let's have Fleury in then with the thing. No, before you have him in, may I tell you what I must about Fleury? Huh? It's unpleasant. Oh. Go on. Well, I'm afraid I shall have to take him to the quay and charge him. I felt that you should know first. I think you had some idea. I knew somebody who had access to my apartment must have been involved in the theft. Did Jacques do it? No, Your Excellency. An ex-security man called Benoit actually did the job with Fleury's keys. Benoit is, I'm sure, employed by Masculine to do his dirty tricks, only he won't admit it and never will. We couldn't make it stick if he did. Maigre, you've left Fleury out there with the rip I'm not alone, monsieur. Inspector Luca is with it. Ah, uh, of course. You're charging Benoit? I have already. He'll plead guilty to housebreaking. The purpose of the housebreaking will not have to be defined in court. He'll get a couple of years. No doubt he's been paid well for it. Wasn't he meant to destroy the report? Surely he was. Mm, by what he doesn't say, yes, I think he was. I think he's getting a bit of his own back on Masculine, to put it in the simplest terms. And, of course, Pigmal wanted to read it again. Pigmal was with this man, Benoit. Well, Pigmal had gone into hiding as an instrument of justice. He felt insecure. An instrument of justice, Pigmal. Mm. And the Masculine wanted him out of the way. He's now free, with nothing to charge him with. Thank God. He'd love to be a martyr. Let's get it over and done with. Mm. Do come in, Jacques, and bring the report. So much of this is my fault. Your Excellency. 
Why did you have to do it, Jacques? Your Excellency? We picked up your friend Benoit last night. He still had the report. I shall have to take you from here and charge you with conspiring to cause a crime to be committed. Is that all, Chief Inspector? Not betrayal of my appointment and my old friend. You should. I deserve more than just a criminal charge. Why did you have to betray, Jacques? There may be some security charge, Fleury. That's not up to me. But I can't charge you with moral turpitude, thank the Lord. I'm sorry, Auguste. Benoit had me in his pocket. I swear to you, I didn't know what he was after. It would have made no difference. You'd still have given him the keys, wouldn't you? Yes, I had no choice. Or rather, I wouldn't make the choice. What a ghastly mess I've made of my life. Do take me away, Chief Inspector. If I stay here any longer, I'll burst into tears. Luca is all yours. Right, Chief. Let's leave the building as if we're just going out for a beer, eh? I should have dismissed him months ago. I'd been told various things. I knew he couldn't be trusted. I could have saved him. He could have saved himself, too. In a few months, when all this is forgotten, I'll... Hand in my resignation, Megri. Go back to my sleepy provincial town and practice law again. I think you'll be happier, monsieur. Thank you, Megri. Thank you for everything. Well, I was only doing my job. The essential thing is, Your Excellency, the report is back with you. You cannot be made the scapegoat. No. Thank God. And masculine? One day. Hmm? Mm. One day he'll get to what's coming to him, I'm sure. Yes. I'm not very good at expressing myself in some ways, Megri. Only, do keep in touch. When I resign, come and stay with us. There aren't many people I've found to like in Paris. Nor I, Your Excellency. But now and again, luckily, one adds to the number. Well, Jules, so you wrapped it up. Or did you? Well, I only wrapped up the immediacies, Georges. The rest was a long story. Some of which I know nothing of, and none of which was a police matter, I'm glad to say. I seem to remember something connected with Joseph Masculin. Didn't he find himself in court? What was it? Well, I can't recall in detail, but he took on more than he could chew, and the rich and the important turned and smote him. That was it. The Lyon industrial people. He was made to look a fool and fine. Mm, so there was only a slow eclipse for him, no martyrdom. And the others? The Picmal moved off somewhere. He probably imagined he was some sort of prime target. Fleury killed himself, finally. Benoit is to be seen doing his shady work in dark corners still. He got two years. He was out in one. Auguste Poin, I visit from time to time in his pleasant house in a sleepy town. They didn't publish the report, did they? No. So he had a chance to resign on a principle. And the report has been forgotten, eclipsed by other scandals. Such is our political life. Which Poin is happily out of and should never have been in. He was too nice a man, Jules, and he didn't want to hurt his old friend. And he didn't understand that he could be used. He had honour, where well, there's precious little honour. A nice man and a good friend. In Maigre and the Minister by Georges Simonon, translated by Moura Budberg and adapted for radio by Frederick Bradman, Maigre was played by Maurice Denham, Simonon by Michael Goff, and Auguste Point by Peter Pratt. Jean Vier, Sean Barrett, La Pointe, John Rye, Lucas, Brian Haynes, Madame Maigre, Irene Sutcliffe, Jackie, Shirley Dixon, Fleury, Rod Beecham, Masculin, Timothy Bateson, Benoit, Bruce Beebe, Picmal, Walter Hall. The play was produced and directed by Betty Davis.
I think he realised the affinity too. And the people around him, were they to be trusted? Mm. Somebody, Jules, borrowed the keys to that apartment, didn't they? Knowing the report was there and knowing that the desk could be easily opened. All very true, Georges. But I also thought some of the clues lay with the man Piquemal. I put old Luca onto him. I got Jean Vier to look into Mademoiselle Blanche and Lapointe to dig around Jacques Fleury. And once I set them on their ways, I picked up the newspapers on my desk to see if there was anything on the disaster or the report in them. There was. Hmm, is it true that the Clairefonds Sanatorium was not born in the minds of those concerned with the plight of children, but in the mind of a builder in concrete? Hmm, tough stuff. Not paper. Ah, the globe again. Masculin's mouthpiece. Mascala, the deputy. I wonder. What else? <laughs> Fat checks to officials. Julien Calam foresaw the disaster. Is it true that the Calam report vanished? Is it true that 30 officials live in terror of the report being found? Is it true that it has been found? Hmm, they are onto something. And this. We want to know, is the Kalam report still in the hands of the person to whom it was given recently, or has it been destroyed? Where is the Kalam report? <sighs> Poor Auguste Point. Who the hell has got it in for him? Joseph Mascara? Why? Come in. Oh, hello, jean Vier. You're back quickly. What's up? Uh, I went to Mademoiselle Lamotte's apartment building, Chief. Mm. I asked the concierge if Mademoiselle Lamotte was at home. I thought she gave me an odd look, but I went on and said I was an inspector from an insurance company. And then the concierge began laughing at me. Uh -huh. Well, I tried to ignore this. So she said, how many different branches of the police are there in Paris? And don't you ever tell each other what you're each up to? Security and uh, who else? As I left, well, there was no point in going on, was there, Chief? No, no point. As you left, what? There was a man coming round the corner and about to cross over the road as if he were making for the entrance to the apartments. Only he suddenly swerved away. I reckon it was when he saw me. I think I know him by sight. Uh, he was from the Rue des Saucets, do you mean? I don't know. I seem to remember him in some security business. But if he was security, he wouldn't bother to stay out of my way, would he? No, if he knew you, he'd probably grin and go on with his job. What was he like? About 40, growing fat, round face, red neck, and he was smoking a cigar. Well, the description would fit most of the Rue des Saucets inspectors, wouldn't it? <laughs> Except for the cigar. <laughs> yes, I wonder. Listen, go and speak nicely to old Shabo in records. Ask him to show you photos of those chaps who've left the security branch these last uh, couple of years. See if you can trace your man. All right, Chief. Uh, and uh, do I still try to find out anything on Blanche Lamont? You oh, better leave it alone for the moment. Uh, I don't suppose there's any point in my asking you what it's all in aid of. None at all, jean vier my lad. Right, Chief. Now I'm going across the road with a glass of beer and to await what you call or Lapointe find. There you were. If you turn the music off, you won't have to lip read. I think I'm a wee bit deaf. And at my age, that's serious. <laughs> um, you are Jacqueline Page, the actress. Oh, you've made my day. Who are you, you lovely man? Um, that I'm Inspector Lapointe of the Quai des Orfèvres, and I'm making some inquiries of a routine, routine nature, nature about Jacques Fleury. Does this happen often? 
that I joined in the chorus that poor old Jacques is inquired into. That Monsieur Fleury is investigated. Twice yesterday, two at a time. Oh, dear. I feel rather a fool. I mean, I mean, nobody tells anybody else what's going on. I told Jacques last night, and he said they were from Rue des Saucets. So, you're different. You're from the other place. And you're younger and rather dishy, really. Come and sit down on the couch beside me. Ah. Uh, Oh, do come on. I won't bite you. <clears throat> Not at once. What did they want to know? What do you want to know, Inspector Lapointe? Well, who are the sort of people he associates with? Are they respectable, <laughs> for instance? Are you sitting on your pistol by any chance, Inspector? <laughs> I don't carry a pistol, Mademoiselle. Oh, you look so uncomfortable. Do relax. What sort of people does Jacques associate with? He associates with me, monsieur, and I'm young enough to be his daughter, and I can assure you, not at all respectable. You have friends in common, mademoiselle? Oh, yes, lots, and a jolly bad crowd they are. Film people, models, musicians, journalists, radio and television directors, all the riffraff of Paris. And, of course, Jacques has his connections on the senior side of politics. He keeps those to himself. Is he sometimes short of money, temporarily? Oh, Charlie, he's always short of money. He does have a wife, you know, and two kids out in the suburbs somewhere. But in his job, people give him credit, give him a lot for nothing. I don't, of course. I'm expensive to run. Yes. Does he talk about his work to you? Not much. Belly aches sometimes about the hours. The last two from the security mob wanted to know if he brought documents home here and worked on them in the evenings. And what did you tell them? That we had better things to do in the evenings than look at documents. <laughs> it serves the right for asking. <laughs> but he's not in any trouble, is he? Real trouble. He hasn't been stupid, has he? Oh, no, no, mademoiselle. To be honest with you, I don't know myself what it's all about. Can I get you a drink? You must stay for a while. I get so lonely. Oh. <laughs> so there you have it, Chief. <laughs> it's all worth you to laugh, Luca. But you really was quite a handful. A lucky devil. I must say, Chief, Jacques Fleury doesn't match up with my idea of a PPS. No, young mistress, short of money, fast friends. He's bloody good material for a little corruption, Chief, I think. Yes, I wonder how much. Oh, never mind. Anything else, Lapointe? No, not really. I suppose security are keeping a watch on Jacqueline's place for their own reasons. Was there somebody outside? Yes, I think so. He moved off when I came out. What uh, was he like? Forty or so. Fat but strong-looking, fat face. Had a cigar. Whoever he is, he certainly gets around. He is security, isn't he? On the other hand... Why did he move off? Yeah. And he did the same thing to Jeanvier earlier this morning. No, I think he may once have been with the Rue des Saucets, but is now a sort of freelance. He matches up with the description given me of the chap who went off with Piquemal an hour ago. Mm, uh, tell me from the beginning, Luca. You got into Piquemal's room, I gather. Well, it wasn't difficult. I took a room at the hotel, and with a little manipulation, my room key opened Piquemal's room. Well, it'd probably have opened any room. Now, drink your beer and shut up, Lapointe. Oh. Go on, Luca. A bachelor den, of a certain sort. One extra suit, one old toothbrush, a comb mm. with half his teeth missing, a few old shirts. He doesn't bother about his appearance, for sure. A lot of books. And there was a cardboard box in one of the drawers full of membership cards. Mm. I don't think there was any party or society he hadn't belonged to at one time. Cross of Fire, Action Francaise, Communist Party, International Theosophy League. See what I mean? Mm. Oh, yes, and, and some books on yoga, one of which I picked up and shook. I don't know why. Yes, it's a sort of instinct. I've done it myself. Point. Sorry, Chief. But this fell out of it, Chief. Oh, thank you. Chamber of Deputies, dear sir, thank you for your note. I'm greatly interested in what you tell me, and we'll be glad to see you tomorrow around 8 p.m. at the Brasserie du Croissant au Montmartre. I beg you not to mention the matter in question to anybody until then. Address to H. Pitmal, and dated last Thursday. That's five days ago. Signed? Yes, hard to tell. But I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't Joseph Mascola. Thank you, Luca. But later, I rang the engineering school and asked where I could find Monsieur Piquemal at lunchtime. I said it was a friend. They told me he always went to a cafe, but they gave me lousy directions. I got there late. I couldn't see anybody who looked like your description of him, so I asked the lady at the desk, who told me he just left with a man. 
She'd noticed because in all the years Pete might have been coming to the cafe for lunch, this is the only time she could remember him not leaving alone. And the man was fat, 40, round face? I'm afraid she thought he looked like a copper, only he smoked a cigar. Uh. Evidently, he came in after Pete Bell, went up to him, and after a short conversation, they left together. Hmm. Luca, you have the number of the school. Ring and ask to speak to Pete Mal. If he's there, put the receiver down. Yes, Chief. But mm. you don't think he will be? No. Oh. This is important, isn't it, Chief? Mm, in a way it is. For one man it is, and it isn't murder. And if we don't succeed, the government could fall. I see. Government could fall? Is that all? <laughs> hell's bells. As you say, hell's bells. A cabinet minister is being set up as a scapegoat. It's quite a cunning plan with all sorts of advantages for the person setting it up. Mm. Jack Flurry is part of the plan, I'm sure. Sooner or later, we'll have to take him in and ask him some questions. Yes, Luca? Hasn't been seen since he went to lunch. Mm. They can't imagine what's happened to him. It's the first time in 20 years that our Monsieur Peekman has not turned up for his lecture and without a word of explanation. They wonder if he's had an accident. No, I don't think it was an accident. Peekmal is operating under his own steam, but with help. And while I'm on the subject, Luca, there's a Madame Calam, the widow of one Julien Calam, living at 77 Boulevard Raspail. Now go and have a word with her. Ask her if Peekmal called to see her recently, and if he wanted to see her late husband's papers. Madame Calam. Mm. So, this is the missing Calam report we're looking for, is it? The Calam report? The Clairefond disaster business? You've guessed it. But I didn't tell you. Le Pointe, I want you to go to the Boulevard Pasteur, where our minister has an apartment. Question the tenants on his floor, will you? Yes. Maybe somebody saw a man going into number 27 on Tuesday morning and can give us a description. Yes, Chief. Yes, the poor wretched minister is waiting to see me. He was sieged by the press and with the president breathing down his neck. What's he like, Chief, this minister? Hmm? Well, he's rather like me. Only I'm not in politics. Hello, Chief Inspector. So, you're in on it, are you? In on what? That's what we'd like to know. Ah, oh, Chief Inspector Magret. I'm Jack Flory. The Minister is waiting to see you. Now you've told them that you're Flory. Oh, so you are in on it, Magret. Yeah, Chief Inspector. Come on, well, get me out of here. I think why we don't kick them out. I mean, come on, give us a break. Chief Inspector Magret, Your Excellency. Do you want me to stay? No, Jacques. Come and sit down, Megre. Oh, thank you. I'll be in the other office, then, where there are no reporters. Well, Megre, as you can see, the hounds are baying, yeah. and the President won't accept my resignation. Uh, we found this letter in Pete Mal's hotel room. Thank you. So, Pete Mal got in touch with Masculin, did he? So it seems, Your Excellency. Peak Mile has, I suspect, gone into hiding with somebody looking after him. Hiding from what? Well, from my chaps and myself. We'd like a talk with him, you know. I'm sure you would. I find myself surprisingly calm, Megri. I'm likely to be run out of political life in the next 48 hours, disgraced and so on. And somehow I don't care. Well, in 48 hours, I should be able to discover who stole the report. It's your job to hold out until then, Your Excellency. I will, Megri, I will. 48 hours, eh? So Mascala has been behind this from the beginning? Yes, Mascala, the professional crusader. The obvious person for a nutcase, if you'll excuse the expression, to turn to. Peekmal would never trust authority. One can't blame him, not entirely. And Mascala sent him to me with the report. He did. I'm sure he took a photocopy of the thing first. Then he'll probably challenge the government quite soon. Well, unless he prefers to profit from what he knows to increase his influence, Your Excellency. I thought you knew little of politics. Well, I'm learning. I've discovered how important the masculines of this world are. Now, I'd say he has a passion for power, and he's used his reputation as a merciless crusader for truth and justice as a base for his power. That's quite true. He set me up, as you say, didn't he? Mm. I have the feeling that there's a personal element in this. Is there? I once snubbed him in public a long time ago, but it's not the kind of thing he'd forget or forgive. You think he took a photocopy? 
the yes, he would. The masculines of my world live by the photocopy and the tape recording, which means even if we find the stolen carbon, masculine will still have the material. Mm, if I can get the report back, that won't matter, Your Excellency. You'll be in the clear. And the government will have to publish, or... Well, surely it should be published, Your Excellency. If I were allowed the decision, Magre, but I'm not. Mm. No, thank you for giving me your time. Thank you, Magre. Do your best. Hold out for 48 hours. I can't promise you to find the report, but I'll be damned if I don't put my hand on the person who got into your apartment and stole it. That at least is my profession. Fine words, Jules. Could you do it? I was pretty sure, you know, Georges. So they weren't empty words. And you had the Maigret team rushing around in all directions. No, in proper directions, please, Georges, and to a purpose. First, Jean Vier came up with a name and a picture of our gentleman with the cigar. He was one Benoit. Do you recall him? Benoit? But of course. He had to leave security after a very unsavory business that was also political. Girls and secrets, wasn't it, in some way? Yes, it was, and Benoit was lucky not to be behind bars for a few years. Now he was out of the police and working as a private dick. He was seen going into Auguste Poin's apartment, by the way, on the morning in question. La Pointe found an eyewitness? <laughs> the ladies like La Pointe. And this lady, who lived on the same floor as the minister, wouldn't, I'm sure, have remembered nearly so well without La Pointe's gentle attentions. And we showed her a picture of Benoit. She was sure it was the one. And Luca was visiting Madame Calam, wasn't he? He was. That's where Pigmal found his copy of the report, all right. You mean, while the whole government machine was looking for the thing, it was with Madame Calam, or a copy was? How obvious. Mm, it was, wasn't it? Among the late professor's papers. The Peak Mile studied under him at one time, and he presented himself at the widow's apartment and asked to look for some old study papers. She let him help himself. So a lot of things were tied up. All you had to do was find Benoit and Peak Mile. Now, Jean Vier was pretty sure he knew where they were. Somebody had tipped him the wink. Before we picked him up, I had to meet Joseph Masculin just for the sake of it. I knew he lunched each day at a particular restaurant, so I decided to do the same. May I join you, Chief Inspector? Ah, yes, monsieur. You know who I am, I'm sure? I do, Monsieur Masculin. I was going to phone you today, but seeing you here... Well, I came here hoping to have a word with you. I saw in the press this morning that you're working on the missing Kalam report. Yeah, the stolen Kalam report. You know it's been stolen, do you? I know that the carbon copy Peak Mal obtained from Madame Kalam has been stolen. I believe I know how and by who. Peak Mal wrote to me. Mm, I know he did. Presumably he brought the copy to you. He left it in my office with my secretary. I didn't touch it, Chief Inspector. I don't play with dynamite. I told him to take it to the Ministry concerned. And did you think he would? With his sort, there's no knowing. With his sort, it's necessary to watch what they do, yes, monsieur? If you mean what I think you mean, Chief Inspector, then I think you're being rather foolish. Hmm. I'm not the man to make an enemy of. Yes, so I've been told. I find it strange, Monsieur Masculin, that knowing the importance of Pigmal's find, you didn't contact the Ministry yourself at once. The trouble it would have saved. I'm a busy man, Chief Inspector. I haven't the time to deal personally with many things brought to me by the public. And yet you knew this was political dynamite? And there wasn't another copy of it to be found anywhere because the other copies had probably been destroyed to save a lot of necks? Really, monsieur, you surprise me. If you choose not to believe me, Maigre, that is your privilege. <laughs> if you choose to believe I'm a fool and swallow any old cock and bull story because it comes from a man of some importance, that is your privilege. I don't think this little talk is going to do you any good, Maigre. No, it's ruined a good meal. All right, Jean Vier, my boy. Where are you taking me? Seine Port, Chief. It's about five kilometers. A small village on the bank of the Seine, if my memory serves me right. Mm. Good for fishing. Rod fishing, Chief. Uh, rod fishing, Jean Vier. Uh, Eugène Benoit is a great angler. 
He has a hut just outside the village, near the floodgate. A water bailiff's hut. He spends quite a few weekends in it. He left for it yesterday with a chap answering to Peekmal's description. Good. I should have thought the Masculin, or whoever else it is employing Benoit, might have found a more comfortable place to hide out in. Somewhere in Paris, Chief. We'd never have found them. Oh, true. No, I don't think their employer wants to get too near the action. Probably told Benoit to arrange it himself, which he did in his own simple way. Mm. Oh, we're coming near the village, aren't we? Yeah, we are. It'll be dark by the time we make the hut, if I can find it. That must be it, Chief. Yeah. There's a light in the window. It's a decent sized hut, I must say. Oh, there's the path. I'll pull in here. seem to be curtains to that window. Come on, then. Right, Chief. Uh, do you think he'll give trouble? Well, I hope not. He was a tough character, I seem to remember, but I'm not up to a brawl these days. <laughs> Quiet now. Ah, there's a bench beneath the window. Yeah, get on it and have a look. Right, right. carefully. Oh, what a godforsaken hole. Both there. Hmm? Big Mal seems to be reading some thick document. Uh, Benoit's playing patience. Is there much of a fire? Fire? There's a stove. Well, keep between it and Big Mal. I'm sure it's the Kalam report he's reading. Let's go. Wait for it. Who are you? I'll give you two guesses, Benoit. Megre. I thought it might be. Monsieur Pigmal, may I have the report, please? It's mine. It's mine. <laughs> no, you know, now, now, come on now, give it to me. We don't want it burnt, do we? Come on now. Oh, give Christ. it to him, Pigmal. Uh, Stop uh, being such a bloody uh, fool. Oh, uh, here you are. Your bosses will burn it. There'll be no justice. You wait and see. It won't matter to you, Pigmal, if it's burned. Joseph Mascalin took a copy of it, and that he won't burn, I'm sure. Oh. Remember when I go out for sentence, May Gray, I helped to save the report I pinched. Mm, I suppose our engineering supervisor came of his own free will, did he? He begged to come. He was rather scared. What of? I'm not quite sure. Well, so would you be, if you found yourself the instrument of a justice that hundreds are trying to avoid. Mm, he goes on like that all the time. I keep trying to get it into his head that he's only got himself mixed up in some typical political chicanery. Oh. I suppose Mescala employs you to do his dirty work. <laughs> I've never even heard of the man. And one day, Masculin will get his comeuppance, but not this time. Who gave you the keys to the minister's apartment? Why ask me when you know? Uh, you had the wretched man in your pocket. Money or sex? Which? The sum of both is enough to ruin him. Now he's going to be ruined anyway. Still, he was useful at the time. Did you know, Benoit, that we were on your tail? I nearly knocked into you in the street, didn't I? When I was trying to discover what Mademoiselle Lamotte knew. Knew about what? Whether or not Poin was going to acknowledge that the report had been nicked. Some politicians would have said it was mislaid and sworn in their mother's grave that it would come to light. But not Auguste Poin. All right, dampen down the fire, jean -Vier. Let's get back to Paris. And give me that report. Have you arrested me too? Well, have you? No, Monsieur Pigmel. I have released you. Come and sit down, Megre. Thank you, Your Excellency. <laughs> well, 48 hours is almost up. I know. I've come to return the Kalam report to you. You found the copy that was stolen from my apartment? Yes, but I'm afraid... Where's the report now? You have it with you? Well, I left it with Monsieur Fleury on my way in. Let's have Fleury in then with the thing. No, before you have him in, may I tell you what I must about Fleury? Huh? It's unpleasant. Oh. Go on. Well, I'm afraid I shall have to take him to the quay and charge him. I felt that you should know first. 
I think you had some idea. I knew somebody who had access to my apartment must have been involved in the theft. Did Jacques do it? No, Your Excellency. An ex-security man called Benoit actually did the job with Fleury's keys. Benoit is, I'm sure, employed by Masculin to do his dirty tricks, only he won't admit it and never will. We couldn't make it stick if he did. Maigret, you've left Fleury out there with the rip I'm not alone, monsieur. Inspector Luca is with it. Ah, uh, of course. You're charging Benoit? I have already. He'll plead guilty to housebreaking. The purpose of the housebreaking will not have to be defined in court. He'll get a couple of years. No doubt he's been paid well for it. Wasn't he meant to destroy the report? Surely he was. Mm, by what he doesn't say, yes, I think he was. I think he's getting a bit of his own back on Masculine, to put it in the simplest terms. And, of course, Peekmal wanted to read it again. Peekmal was with this man, Benoit. Well, Peekmal had gone into hiding as an instrument of justice. He felt insecure. An instrument of justice, Peekmal. Mm. And the Masculine wanted him out of the way. He's now free, with nothing to charge him with. Thank God. He'd love to be a martyr. Let's get it over and done with. Mm. Do come in, Jacques, and bring the report. So much of this is my fault. Your Excellency. Why did you have to do it, Jacques? Your Excellency. We picked up your friend Benoit last night. He still had the report. I shall have to take you from here and charge you with conspiring to cause a crime to be committed. Is that all, Chief Inspector? Not betrayal of my appointment and my old friend. You should. I deserve more than just a criminal charge. Why did you have to betray, Jacques? There may be some security charge, Fleury. That's not up to me. And I can't charge you with moral turpitude, thank the Lord. I'm sorry, Auguste. Benoit had me in his pocket. I swear to you, I didn't know what he was after. And it would have made no difference. You'd still have given him the keys, wouldn't you? Yes, I had no choice. Or rather, I wouldn't make the choice. What a ghastly mess I've made of my life. Do take me away, Chief Inspector. If I stay here any longer, I'll burst into tears. Luca is all yours. Right, Chief. Let's leave the building as if we're just going out for a beer, eh? I should have dismissed him months ago. I'd been told various things. I knew he couldn't be trusted. I could have saved him. He could have saved himself, too. In a few months, when all this is forgotten, I'll hand in my resignation, Megre. Go back to my sleepy provincial town and practice law again. I think you'll be happier, monsieur. Thank you, Megre. Thank you for everything. Well, I was only doing my job. The essential thing is, Your Excellency, the report is back with you. You cannot be made the scapegoat. No. Thank God. And masculine? One day. Yeah. Mm. One day he'll get what's coming to him, I'm sure. Yes. I'm not very good at expressing myself in some ways, Megre. Only do keep in touch. When I resign, come and stay with us. There aren't many people I've found to like in Paris. Nor I, Your Excellency. But now and again, luckily, one adds to the number. Well, Jules, so you wrapped it up. Or did you? Well, I only wrapped up the immediacies, Georges. The rest was a long story. Some of which I know nothing of, and none of which was a police matter, I'm glad to say. I seem to remember something connected with Joseph Masculin. Didn't he find himself in court? What was it? Well, I can't recall in detail, but he took on more than he could chew, and the rich and the important turned and smote him. That was it. The Lyon industrial people. He was made to look a fool and fine. Mm, so there was only a slow eclipse for him, no martyrdom. And the others? A peak mile moved off somewhere. He probably imagined he was some sort of prime target. Fleury killed himself, finally. Benoit is to be seen doing his shady work in dark corners still. He got two years. He was out in one. Auguste Poin, I visit from time to time in his pleasant house in a sleepy town. They didn't publish the report, did they? No. So he had a chance to resign on a principle. And the report has been forgotten. Eclipsed by other scandals. 
Such is our political life. Which Pry is happily out of and should never have been in. He was too nice a man, Jules, and he didn't want to hurt his old friend. And he didn't understand that he could be used. He had honor, where、well, there's precious little honor. A nice man and a good friend. In Maigret and the Minister by Georges Simenon, translated by Moura Budberg, and adapted for radio by Frederick Bradman, Maigret was played by Maurice Denham, Simenon by Michael Goff, and Auguste Poin by Peter Pratt. Jean Vier, Sean Barrett, La Pointe, John Rye, Luca, Brian Haynes, Madame Maigret, Irene Sutcliffe, Jackie, Shirley Dixon, Fleury, Rod Beecham. Masculin, Timothy Bateson, Benoit, Bruce Beebe, Picmal, Walter Hall. The play was produced and directed by Betty Davis. Fired at close quarters. Yes, so close that Monsieur Dussau and the police agree that everything points to suicide. They think it was quite a week ago, perhaps immediately after he shot you. They found a gun beside him, then?、Eh? Oh no, that is the only snag.、Mm. There was a revolver in his pocket, and with only one cartridge fired. Yeah, the one that nearly did for me. Well, that's what they want to find out. Certainly, if it's suicide, it goes a long way towards clearing up the case. Realizing someone was after him, he saw the game was up, and、um... and、uh, if it's not suicide, oh, well, there are other possible explanations. He may have assaulted someone who was armed, someone who killed him quite properly in self-defense, but was nevertheless too frightened to say anything about it. It would be just like these country people.、Mm. And Francoise, what about her little adventure this morning? We hadn't forgotten that. We think it might have been no more than a. A spiteful practical joke. I see. What everyone wants is to get the case over and done with as speedily as possible. No, it's not that. But you must see, there's no point in dragging things on now. Well, it's still that second-class ticket I told you about. Somebody will have to find an explanation for that. Now, how did it jump out of a dead man's pocket into a corridor at the Hotel d'Angleterre? Do you want some good advice? To let the whole thing drop. That's it, isn't it?、Mm. To get well and then clear out of Bergerac as soon as I'm fit to travel, and come and spend a few days with me as you were intending to do in the first place. I've spoken to Doctor Rivo about it, and he says that with proper precautions, there's no reason why you shouldn't be moved now. What does the prosecutor say? I don't understand. Well, I'm sure he had something to say about it. Didn't he say that I had no right whatever to poke my nose into the case? Now you must realize that according to the regulations, if Look,、uh, I I may as well put it plainly, with that little comedy of yours this morning, you've succeeded in putting everybody's back up. 
Once a week, the prosecutor has dinner with the prefect of police, and he says that he'll speak about you so that you have your knuckles wrapped by your superiors in Paris. Mm. What irritated them more than anything was the way you tried to to chuck those hundred-franc notes about. They say that that I'm encouraging the dregs of the population to wag their tongues. Mm. How did you know? That I'm inciting them to sling mud at respectable people. If only you had some real idea to work on, I'd feel differently about it. but... But I haven't. Or rather, I have four or five. Two of them looked very promising this morning, then all of a sudden they went up in smoke. You see? So what about it? Will you come over to my place? Well, I'd love to. We both would. But not till it's all over. <laughs> but now that the madman's dead... Is he? Now, you run along, and if they ask you what I intend to do, say you don't know. Can't you persuade him, Madame Megri? I'm sure he's wrong. I'm not as sure as you are. Good night. Good night. (laughs) Thank you, my dear. What for? What you said to Leduc. I was almost beginning to doubt myself. Of course you're not wrong. Shall I fill your pipe for you? Ah, thank you. What's for supper? Wait and see. Come in. Ah, good morning, Leduc. Good morning. Look, Jules, hmm? I met the prosecutor in the street, and he gave me some extraordinary news. I, I went to the police station to make sure it was true. Oh, let's hear it. They sent the fingerprints to Paris, as a matter of course, uh, and the answer has just come. Well, go on. The dead man, the man who jumped out of the train, he died years ago. What are you talking about? Officially, this corpse that's lying in the mortuary has been a corpse for years. Hmm? He was a man called Samuel, who was condemned to death in Algiers. And executed? No. No, he was supposed to have died in hospital a few days before his execution date. And what else do the police know about him? Well, they don't know exactly where he came from. Somewhere in Eastern Europe. He had a business in Algiers. What sort of business? Postage stamps. Oh, that was only a cover for another business, of course. But it was so well done that though the police were watching him, they didn't find out anything until he was on trial for murder. Then it came to light. His real business was supplying forged passports, immigration papers and labour permits. He had a whole network of agents in Vienna, Bucharest, Warsaw, all over the shop. Mm, Strange. Very, very strange. Why so strange, Jules? No, not his profession, but to run up against it in a place like Bergerac. It all started off as an ordinary provincial case, the local maniac of a small country town. Suddenly, there was all the underworld, Warsaw to Algiers. But people like Samuel, you find them everywhere. It's not a question of race, it's a question of species. Barmen in Scandinavia, gangsters in America, head waiters in Germany, wholesalers in North Africa. They see to everything for a price. And the price, as far as Samuel was concerned was murder. There was a murder, you say? A double one. Two men from Berlin found lying dead on a bit of waste ground. There was a lot of nosing around. They found out about Samuel and his two agents. That's what the men were. The idea was they'd come to complain of something. No doubt he was doing them out of their commissions. Perhaps they threatened him. So he did away with them. It took a long time to get sufficient evidence against him, but in the end they did. And he was condemned to death. He fell ill, however, so seriously that he was moved from the prison infirmary to the town hospital, where he was supposed to have died a few days later. And? Well, that's all anyone knows. Hmm. I wonder if your soul's ever been to Algiers. I'll shut that window, Jules, and hmm? get pneumonia. Oh, yeah. Well, I talked to as many people as I could this morning, but most of them know I'm your wife, and they shut up like clams. But I did my best. Mm, you always do. Now. now, what do they think about the case now? Oh, they don't know what to think. Some say that Samuel had nothing to do with it at all, that he just wanted to kill himself. First he tries throwing himself out of a train, but his nerve fails him. He hangs on. And in any case, the train isn't going fast enough. In the end, he succeeds with a revolver. And 
Naturally, they expect the murders to go on. Have you been past the doctor's house again? Yes, but there was nothing to see. I was told something, but well, it may be of no importance at all. Two or three times a woman has visited the house, and she's thought to be Dr. Rivo's mother-in-law. A middle-aged woman, they say, and decidedly common. Well, nobody knows anything about her or where she lives, and she hasn't been seen for two years. Well, what's her name? Madame Beausoleil. <laughs> Beausoleil, what a gorgeous name. Yes. <laughs> now, my dear, there's a very boring job for you to do. What? I want you to go downstairs and find out the number of every medical school in the country, and then telephone each in turn. Ask for the registrar's office, and inquire whether anyone of the name of Jacques Riveau is on their list of qualified men. Where is the telephone downstairs? There's a box in the lounge, but it doesn't stop people hearing every word you say. Oh, splendid. But you don't mean to say that Rivo isn't a... Good heavens. Mm. Uh, will you get me Inspector Le Duc, please? Now run along, it'll be too late. Why can't I telephone from up here? Because I want to make a couple of calls and you're the only one who's mobile. <laughs> Go on. All right. Hmm. Uh, Le Duc, uh, tell me something. Do you know if Monsieur Diorto often dines with the Rivos? Oh, every Monday, you're sure? No, I don't doubt your word. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, tomorrow, yes. Mm. Monday night, clean white cloth, a table for four. Monday night. And it was the following night I travelled down from Paris with Samuel. Only I didn't know it then. And then the night after that, or rather early Wednesday morning, Samuel was killed. Uh, police judiciaire. Ah, uh, did you find out if Dr. Rivo received a call from Paris last Tuesday week? Uh, you did? Good. At two in the afternoon, yes. The restaurant des Quatre, Place de la Bastille, a nine-minute call. Right, thank you. Hmm, the train left at 5.40... Why did he jump? Was it to escape from somebody or to meet somebody? That's the problem. Jules, hmm? we must call in another doctor at once, a real one. It, it, it's simply monstrous. It's a crime. And to think... How do you feel? Well, all right. Why? No one has ever qualified under the name of Jacques Riveau. Ah. He simply isn't a doctor. Hmm. Every register has been searched. And now we're getting to the bottom of it. That temperature of yours that wouldn't go down. Well, of course the wound wouldn't heal. Mm, it was to meet somebody. Mm, yes? Good evening, Chief Inspector. Ah, good evening, Monsieur Dorso. Uh, won't you sit down? Ah, oh, thank you. I must confess I've been feeling a bit guilty about you. That surprises you, does it? I couldn't help reproaching myself for having been rather curt. Though I must admit that your own manner is sometimes rather <laughs> disconcerting. Oh, I apologise. So I thought I'd look in to tell you how we were getting on. In two or three days at the outside, we'll have the case finished and filed. The facts speak for themselves. We must keep to the point. How Samuel dodged execution and had somebody else buried in his place, that's for the Algiers people to go into, if they think it worthwhile. Which I don't for a moment suppose they will. You think Samuel escaped from Algiers, came to France, to Bergerac, committed a couple of murders and then shot himself? Hmm? Exactly. And the fact that no revolver was found by his side doesn't bother me in the least. There are dozens of cases on record where the same things happened. Somebody passed and picked it up. A tramp, perhaps, or a child, and never said a word about it. Too scared to come forward. You think so? Yes. Hmm. The important thing in this case was to make sure the gun had been fired close to the head. And the post-mortem leaves no doubt on that point. And there, I'm sure, the case will rest. So, what are your plans now? Oh, the same as ever. You mean... To arrest the murderer, of course. You're very obstinate, Inspector. Oh, I know. I think I should warn no, you. I shouldn't bother if I were you, Monsieur Dorso. Warnings are one of the few things I very seldom heed. 
Good day, Inspector. Mm. Madam Mabry. Good day. <clears throat> Now, that maid, what was her name? Rosalie. That's it. Is she anywhere around? I expect so. Shall I go and find her? Would you mind, my dear? Now, I only wanted to ask you one simple question, Rosalie. Have you ever worked at Monsieur Duorso's? I was uh, two years with him. As a housemaid? Yes. So you went all over the house, polishing the floors and dusting? I did the rooms. Exactly, you did the rooms. And in doing the rooms, you must have found out a thing or two. Hmm? How long ago was it? Oh, it's a uh, year last month that I left the place. Did the prosecutor often have women visitors? I don't know. Oh, yes, you do. Now, come on, speak out. There's nothing to be frightened of. Wouldn't do anybody any good. What would? Well, if I did speak out. Well, you see... <laughs> There's my young man, Albert. I would spoil his chances. He, he's trying to get a government job, and if the prosecutor was against him, well, see what I mean. So there was a lady visitor now and again? No, no, there wasn't. Oh, come on now. There's a little bit of scandal somewhere, isn't there? Oh, and everybody knows about it. You can't keep things dark forever. Oh, it was a good two years ago. A parcel came from Paris, but... When they came to look at it, the label was half torn away and they couldn't tell who it was for and there was no sender's name on it either. Well, they waited a week, thinking someone might turn up to claim it. Then they opened it. You'll never guess what they found. Mm, well, I think perhaps I can. Photographs. Mm. But um, not ordinary ones. Um, I hardly know how to say it. Uh, women um, with no clothes on. And not alone, either. And um, you see what I mean? Yeah. Go on, Rosalie. And, and then one day, another parcel came, just the same as the first one. Same paper, same string, same label as the bit that had been left before. Guess who it was addressed to? Monsieur Du or so, if you please. Mm. Now, listen. Not a word you say here will ever be repeated. Oh. When you heard what you've just told me... Mm. You went and had a look at the books in his study, didn't you? Who told you? Oh, well, since you know it already, um, yes, I did. A, a lot of the bookcases have doors to them with sort of wire netting and they're always kept locked. Only I once found one where the key had been left in the lock. And what did you find? You know very well what I found. Oh, it, it, it was so awful. I, I had nightmares for a week. I couldn't endure Albert coming anywhere near me. Big books, were they? Handsome books? Uh, y yes, but... Oh, oh, they were all sorts of... Terrible ones. Well, things you... You'd never think of. Well, thank you, Rosalie. If your wife hadn't been here... I, I should never have dreamt of talking about such things. Mm. Did Dr. Evo often come to the house? Uh... Oh, hardly ever. He used to telephone. Nor any one of his family? No. Oh, except, of course, for Mademoiselle Francoise, the time she was acting as his secretary. But the prosecutor? Yes. Well, how long did that last? Oh, about uh, six months. Uh, after that, she went off to her mother's in uh, Paris or Bordeaux. I'm not sure which. And it was ever so long before we saw her in the town again. And uh, Monsieur D'Orso never overstepped the mark in his dealings with you? He'd have caught it if he had. Well, Rosalie, thank you for what you've told me. Now, don't be frightened. You won't get into any trouble over it, and uh, Albert will never know you came here. Oh, thank you, Monsieur. Oh, uh, uh, Inspector. No, Monsieur will do. Oh, dear, oh, dear. To think an educated, intelligent man, and in such a responsible job, too. Mm, I know, my dear, I know. But now, would you take down an advertisement? I want you to put in the Bordeaux papers for me. Of course. Are you ready? Uh, yes. Now, uh, a certain Madame Beausoleil, formerly of Algiers, now believed in Bordeaux, right, is urgently requested... Mm -hmm to present herself at once at the following address, where she will learn something to her advantage. 
Right. Maigret, solicitor, Hotel d'Angleterre, Bergerac. Ah, Madame Beaujolais, please take a chair. And you too, Mademoiselle Francoise. I warn you, I shall complain. It's unheard of. Calm yourself, Mademoiselle, and forgive me for wanting to see your mother. Who said she was my mother? I took it for granted. The fact that you went to meet her at the station. Does somebody mind telling me what this is all about, being picked up at the station like that? Are you a solicitor or a policeman? A policeman. I know your face, madame. Were you ever a singer? Oh, yes, monsieur. I sang at Olympia. Of course. I remember the name Josephine. Yes, how nice of you to remember. But the doctors recommended a warmer climate, and I went on tour. Italy, Turkey, Syria, Egypt. You pitched up in Algiers? Yes. I had my first daughter in Cairo. Who was her father? An English officer. Your second girl, Francoise, was perhaps born in Algiers. Yes, and that was the end of my theatrical career. I was ill for quite a long time, and though I got over it, I never recovered my singing voice. So then... Her father looked after me right up until the day he was recalled to France. He was in the customs. The inspector has no right to question you, Mother. Don't answer another word. Madame, you're quite at liberty to speak or not, just as you think fit. Don't say anything, Mother. You see, Inspector, what can I do? Come in. Madame Rivo. Excuse me, Inspector, but I heard my mother and sister were here. Who told you? Who? It was someone... Uh, someone I met. You haven't seen your husband? No. Give me that pipe, Jules. You've had quite enough. Huh? Madame Rivo has just passed Francoise a note. Oh. Uh, Mademoiselle Francoise, that note, please. Oh. Oh. Where's she gone? Madame Rivo, when did your husband give you that note? What note? Oh, never mind. Louise, can you see the back of the hotel from that landing window? I think so. Well, go out and watch and tell me if anything happens. I think the Duke's got them. The doctor's car was at the back of the hotel, and Francois was just getting into it when the Duke drove up. They saw him and dashed into the hotel. Le Duc followed them. What's happening? Oh, the note. It told her to join him. A minute more, and they might have made it. Jules, it's terrible. Well, what is it? They're dead. Oh, no. huh? Both of them. Oh, it isn't true. We dashed up here after them, but they had time to slip into one of the rooms and lock the door behind them. Then there were two shots. When we broke down the door, they were both dead. Oh. Someone's telephoning the hospital. Well, I'm very sorry, madame. She was your favourite, wasn't she? Of course. She had the looks. When the doctor married her sister, she was too young, barely 13. But later, he fell in love with her, and then she had the child. What child? A daughter. Monsieur D'Orso's daughter. Uh, was Dr. Rivo practising in Algiers, madame? Yes. What was his connection with this man, Samuel? He was his son. Son? And he arranged his father's escape from the hospital. That's right. There were only two patients in that wing of the hospital. One night, Brivo set the place on fire, and it was the other man who was left in the flames and afterwards given out to be Samuel. After that, Jacques married my elder daughter. And he brought the three of you to France? Yes, and changed his name to Rivo. Samuel was shipped off to America and told never to come back. Yes. He was strange in the head even then. They said the trial had unhinged him. Oh, why did he have to come back? All this need never have happened. It need never have ended like this. It need never have started, of course, if Samuel hadn't murdered his associates. And his son hadn't helped him escape. And then fallen in love with his wife's sister. Mm. Duorso discovered something about the doctor's past life. After that, there was nothing anyone could do. Events just ran their course. That child Francoise had, do you believe it was Duorso's? Not for a moment. They had an affair, of course, engineered by Rivaux. He knew of the prosecutor's taste in pornography, thought he'd be easy game for Francoise, and he was. So, when she became pregnant, by Rivo, I imagine, she convinced Duraso that the child was his, and used that to ensure he didn't delve any deeper into Rivo's past. 
But Samuel suddenly popping up in Bergerac when he was supposed to be safely away in America must have put the cat among the pigeons. Mm. He'd been suspected of two murders over there. Both strangulations, both found with a needle stuck through the heart. So he fled the country. And when he repeated the whole mad business over here, Rivo decided to get rid of him. Nothing was to stand between him and his ambition. Certainly not a criminal lunatic of a father. So when Samuel insisted on coming down here again, his son told him that the police in Bergerac were waiting for him. He was to jump from the train before it reached the station. Rivo must have been surprised to see two of you. Mm. But he killed Samuel just the same and emptied his pockets of everything that could identify him, including a railway ticket. <laughs> I may be wrong, but I can't help thinking that one day he'd have shoved his wife off into a better world, too. And then he could have married Francoise, the girl he loved who'd given him a daughter, the girl who was ready to do anything for him, to simulate that faked attack in the wood in order to clear him of suspicion, and finally to die with him rather than lose him. Yes. Did you ever take your holiday with Le Duc? No. I didn't fancy staying on after that. At least Louise didn't. I got myself out of bed that night, and we had our last dinner ever at the Hotel d'Angleterre. Truffe en serviette, foie gras, and a bottle of Don Perignon. But you don't like champagne. I know, but seeing my wife had done all the donkey work on this case... I thought she deserved the sort of meal she likes, for once. Did she enjoy it? Yes. But I think she enjoyed the journey back home even better. She's not really cut out to be an inspector. In Maigret and the Madman of Bergerac, by Georges Simenon, translated by Geoffrey Sainsbury, and adapted for radio by Aubrey Woods. Maigret was played by Maurice Denham, and Simenon by Michael Goff. Madame Maigret, Irene Sutcliffe, Du Orso, Malcolm Hayes, Le Duc, Timothy Bateson, Dr. Riveau, Gavin Campbell, Madame Riveau, Anne Rosenfeld, Francoise, Jane Knowles, Madame Beausoleil, Joyce Latham, Rosalie, Nicolette McKenzie, Hotel Proprietor, Jeffrey Siegel. The play was produced and directed by Betty Davis. Simonon's Maigret, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simonon. I've always felt grateful, Jules, to whatever ministerial deity was responsible, that you were never transferred to the Rue des Saussets. Why exactly, Georges? Because I've never really appreciated the way security chaps work. <laughs> oh, that's an understatement, if ever there was one. You know, I once said that security's methods reminded me of a lot of crabs crawling and scratching about in the basket. I hope you didn't say it to one of them. Yes, but he'd left the Rue des Saussets by then. Like so many, he had to leave or face being kicked out. Benoit was his name. Now, that was the one time I found myself involved in security and hence in politics. The missing report business, was that it? It was. I arrived home one evening after dinner with my chief and Lucan Jean Vier, one of our informal get togethers, and I was feeling nice and mellow. I asked Louise about phone calls, more or less as a formality. <laughs> Maurice Denham as Jules Maigret, Michael Goff as Georges Simenon, 
and Peter Pratt as Auguste Poin in Maigret and the Minister, translated by Maura Budberg and adapted for radio by Frederick Bradman. phone calls, I hope, darling. Yes, I'm afraid there was one. Oh, you sound serious. Well, you've time for a cup of coffee. Take your coat off for mm. a minute. It's only half past ten, and I said I didn't expect you back until eleven. Well, I'm still waiting to hear who it was ringing. A minister. A priest? <laughs> no, no, of course not. Point, I think he mm. said. The minister of public works. That's right. Auguste Point. He phoned here himself. He wanted to speak to you personally. He asked if I was alone or not, and he said his call was to be kept secret. Was it indeed? Did he say where he was phoning from? Yes, a public call box. Honestly, Jules, I could hardly believe my ears. A minister of the Republic creeping out and making a phone call from some scruffy box on the corner of a street. Well, it can happen. Where does he want to see me? Well, not at the Ministry, but at his private apartment at uh, 27 Boulevard Pasteur. Do you think it's a hoax? Oh, it's a bit out of the ordinary, but it's no hoax. You'll have some coffee No, before. I'll have a glass of slow gin and then I'll be on my way. The sooner this is over, the better. Can I offer you a cigar, Megri? Well, I'd prefer my pipe, Your Excellency, if I may. Try some of this tobacco. Oh, thank you. Look, Maigre, between men like us, there's no point in the usual formalities. I'm in terrible trouble. Nobody knows it yet, neither the President nor my wife come to that. I've come to you first. I know what I'm doing is irregular, and you're under no obligation to help me. Will you have a drink? Oh, well, uh, thank you, Your Excellency. Good. I think that the use of my title is not necessary at the moment. Very well, Monsieur. These are some homemade spirits. My father distills some every autumn. This bottle must be 20 years old. Will you try it? I shall be delighted. Do you read the newspapers, Megri? No, oh, when the world of crime allows me the time to do so. Mm. Your health. Ah, thank you. And yours. Mm -hmm. mm. This was in the Globe a few weeks ago. I've marked the paragraph. Ah. Will someone one day decide, under pressure of public opinion, to reveal the contents of the Kalam report? When revealed, it's likely to bring the government down, some people think. So when will it be published? Hmm. The Kalam report. On what, monsieur? A report written by a distinguished engineer, Julien Kalam, who died a couple of years ago. On the building of the Clairefonds Sanatorium. The Clairefonds Sanatorium for Abandoned Children. The same. The place that last winter saw one of our most terrible disasters. A whole wing of the place came down, do you remember? Yes, 100 or more children died in there. 128. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, it was built high up in the Haute Savoie, and there was some disagreement as to whether it was in the right place. Correct. And how it should be built, the design and materials... Kalam was asked to consider the whole question, study the project and the site as an impartial expert, which he did. The report was the result, and it was never published. Now, what happened at Clairefont? The snow melted early, very early. A subterranean river, it wasn't marked on the maps, but people knew of it, swelled and undermined the foundations of that wing of the building. They built over an underground stream. Well, who was the builder, monsieur? Nico and Sauvegrain. Arthur Nicou, in fact. Ah, oh, yes, I have heard of him. It's a very large firm, I believe. Oh, very. And Monsieur Arthur Nicou is a very powerful man. Now, I assume that the report made by Julien Calam was against building the sanatorium where it was built. Most emphatically. Mm. And against many of the constructional ideas being mooted at the time, but the report was ignored. I was not in office then, so I have no knowledge of the whys and wherefores of this and Arthur Nikou put his building up. And the report is therefore, Your Excellency, like a stick of dynamite with a slow fuse. The report is... I'll come to that shortly. Soon after that short but portentous piece appeared in the Globe, I was asked by the President to mount a search for the Kalam report within my ministry. Briefly, it wasn't where it should be, in the archives of the Chamber of Deputies. 
nor was it within the civil engineering branch, and although my ministry was turned inside out, it wasn't there either. Uh, another glass? Oh, well, thank you. The taste is very delicate. Mm. Yesterday morning, a man called Peekmal turned up. He looked like an anarchist with a brown paper parcel under his arm containing a bomb. Actually, he was a supervisor at the School of Civil Engineering, and the parcel contained a carbon copy of the Kalam report. Where did this happen? Where? Uh, at the ministry in my room. And were you alone, monsieur? My secretary, Mademoiselle Blanche, showed him in and then left the room. My parliamentary private secretary was in an outer room where there were various people waiting to see me. Peekmel asked me to open the parcel, or almost ordered me to. I did, and saw what it was. He said he wanted a receipt, so I wrote one out for him. Where did he say he'd found the report? In the attics of the School of Engineering. But hadn't they been searched previously when you were looking? Yes, of course they had. Perhaps he'd had it under his bed for years. Is it authentic, would you say? It was an unsigned carbon with Kalam's name and qualifications on the last page with a date. Later that day, I read it through. I'm sure it's a copy of the original report, and it would have caused an explosion if it had been published after the disaster. Julien Kalam prophesied the disaster. Almost to the fine print. You kept the report with you? I brought it back here to this apartment that night. I placed it in the desk over there and locked it. I had to speak to the president, and I couldn't do so last night. He was away, and quite frankly, I don't trust telephone calls, as no doubt your wife has surmised. So I waited until this afternoon when I could speak to him in private. I told him of the carbon copy, and he asked me to bring it personally to his study. I came back here to collect it. And it was no longer in your desk? It was no longer in my desk. And, and the lock? Had it been tampered with? I don't think so. See for yourself. Oh. Uh, I'm very bad at this sort of thing, but I'd say that this lock could be opened with a decent hairpin. Now, beside the president and what's his name... Big man. Mm. They alone knew I had the report. Do you understand, Magray? I find myself quite alone. I dare not open my mouth. Who would believe my story? Who would believe that I held the report in my hands? Had it with me for some 24 hours and then had it stolen from my apartment. And, and there's this. At least three times in the last few years I've been invited by Arthur Niku, the builder, to his house in Samoa. Last Christmas, my wife received a solid gold pen from Niku with her initials on it. I was furious, wanted her to send it back, but I was told that Niku sent dozens of such gifts to the wives of his acquaintances each Christmas, and my wife liked the pen, so like a fool, I relented. <laughs> it would look nice in the press, wouldn't it? Minister's wife received gold pen gift from Niku. Your Excellency, about Peekmal. Isn't it strange that he brought the report to you and didn't hand it over to his school director? It's as if he knew how important it was, isn't it? I think so, yes. Unless somebody told him to take it to you. Yes. I think I see the point you're getting at. I don't like it. No, nor do I, Your Excellency, but I'm trying to look at the situation from different angles. Now, who besides yourself has the key to this apartment? My wife, of course. Oh, she's in the country at present. My secretary, Blanche Lamotte. Has she worked for you long? Since she was 17, straight from school. Uh, she now must be 40, 42. Tell me, after Peekmal handed the report to you and left, did you have it in your hand when she came back? I think I did. I think I walked around with it in my hand for some time before I put it in my case. I trust her entirely, Magri. Thank you. You see, all I'm doing is to try to find my way. Now, does anybody else have the keys? Yes, my parliamentary private secretary, Jacques Fleury. And have you known him long, monsieur? He's my age, and I've known him since we were at the Lycée together. What sort of person is he? Odd. Rich parents, but he never did anything with his life. He's a typical, amiable failure. 
but he does know the jungle of our political system as well as any man. I need that sort of knowledge. I'm a provincial lawyer become cabinet minister, Magray. I'm not a politician in the wheeler dealer sense. And Fleury is a man I can relax with. Do he and Blanche get on well? On the surface, it's cordial enough. Deep in her heart, Blanche can't stand him, I'm sure. She's a bourgeoise through and through, and Fleury is the sort of person... Yes, the bourgeoisie can be unrelenting. So? Where have we got, Magray? To this hypothesis, Your Excellency. Quite out of the blue, you're presented with a copy of the Kalam report, which seems genuine and which disappears immediately afterwards. Now, this seems to me to be a way of discrediting you and the government by claiming that the report was in your hands but has been suppressed or conveniently lost. Now, all I have to do is to find the thing and the thief who took it. And I have to tell the President that it's been stolen. Late though it is, I shall go there now. Thank you, Magray. You've eased my mind. I'm in your hands. My poor old friend, a cabinet minister's fate placed in your hands. I must admit, on my way home, I did wonder what had hit me. I take it that you felt you could trust Poirin? Oh, yes. He was no double-dealing politician, Georges. There was a strong affinity between us. We came from the same sort of country background. We were of the same age and size. And I had the curious sensation that if I'd had a brother, he would have been not unlike Auguste Poirin. 